And now, Mystery Theater. As the poet says, let us fill the cup. What are you having? How about equal parts suspense and mystery with just a dash of terror and chill to taste? So, they say that a lie is only the truth in masquerade. But does the opposite also hold? Can we say that the truth is a lie in masquerade? What is masquerade? Well, for that matter, what is reality? Who are we? Who do we really see when we look in the mirror? The image that gazes steadily back at us, that anticipates our every move, our every breath. Who is it? Or what is it? Darling. Hello, dear. Dinner ready? No. Oh, you plan for us to dine out? No, Gerald. Well, why isn't dinner ready, then? I haven't had a chance to prepare it. I was busy. Doing what, Cecily? Oh, learning how to load. What, what are you doing with that pistol? Learning how to aim. Cecily, don't point that at me. And learning how to fire. Uh, uh, why, Cecily? What? Uh. <laughs> mystery drama, The Many Names of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Alexander Scorby. You know how it is with some people. They go along for years in a groove, a routine, or a rut. Characterize it any way you like. 10, 20 years, the same job, the same apartment, same wife. It might just occur to a man to ask himself, is this all I have to look forward to? There are those men who ask this question and keep asking it. But these are the men who rarely do anything about it. It's the men who don't ask, who seemingly plod along contentedly and quietly. Oh, yes, look out. Look out for Gerald Furlong, who fills all the specifications we have just stated. Mr. Furlong. Yes? Good morning. My name is Helene LaRue. Yes? I'm your new secretary. Oh. Mr. Spruan, if you know him, the personnel manager. Yes? Well, when I heard that old lady McKay... Uh, oh, I beg your pardon. Miss McKay was leaving. I asked for the job. And he said I could have it unless you had someone else in mind. Well, I... Uh... Actually, I'm the best typist in the pool. Are you? Oh, yes. You can check it. Everybody always asks for me. Yes, but I don't... Of uh... course you don't know. How could you? Unless we try it. What have you got to lose? Well... Then it's settled. Now, all you have to do is sign this memo. What memo? The memo to Mr. Spruance, which says you authorize my appointment as your secretary. Yes, but I... Uh... Well, now, I don't want you to think I'm pushing you or taking too much on myself. But a good secretary handles all the details, ties up all the loose ends, keeps the desk clear. And as soon as you sign that, I can call Mr. Spruance's secretary. All right. Ah, that's it. Yes, sir. Oh, Mr. Furlong, you do have a bold, strong handwriting. Unusual, sir, but that's to be expected. Expected? Oh, yes. You see, your name is Gerald. Yes. And do you know what the name Gerald means? No. Well, it's an old German name. It means strong leader of an army. Hello? Hello, this is Elaine LaRue. Tell Mr. Spruance that Mr. Furlong wants me to be his secretary. The memo's on its way. Thank you. Well, strong leader of an army. Uh, 
Don't you feel like one? I'm afraid I don't live up to my name. Oh, you just think you don't. My dear young lady, I know I don't. Don't call me that. Your dear young lady. Why, does it offend you? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. When you call me your dear young lady, you're putting yourself down. I'm afraid I don't understand. You make yourself sound like an old man. Uh, and you're not. You see, I worked in personnel. I had to check everyone's records. Now, Miss LaRue, those records are highly confidential, and they're... Alan, no... you're only 45. It's true that you look 55. No. Now, Miss LaRue, one thing I frown upon in this office is the discussion of personal matters. Of course, of course. If you went about things differently, uh, <clears throat> you would look 35. Miss LaRue, I have some letters to dictate. Yes, sir. This is to, uh, to Mr. Oliver Stevens at Carpenter and Stevens. Uh, you'll find the address in the files. Dear sir, pursuant to, uh... Yes, sir. Uh, read that back, huh? All you said was, uh, dear sir... Pursuant to... Oh, yes, yes. Uh, pursuant to our agreement, I must inquire of you, uh... uh Miss LaRue. Yes? You know, you've gotten off here on the wrong foot. But, Mr. Furlow... I dislike flattery. I intensely dislike it. I despise it. But I... uh, Please do not interrupt me. I am not a fool. Oh, I never said you were. Your flattery is doubly obnoxious because it's it, it's so, so... So what, Mr. Furlow? Because it's so extravagant, so obvious. Oh, but I wasn't... I, I might tolerate flattery that's that's clever. But you, my dear young lady, are ludicrous. There you go again. Calling me your dear young lady. I'll call you anything I like. I'm your employer. Well, why am I ludicrous? Now, how can you tell me that I could look like a man of 35? Because it's true. Do you know what 35 is? I know what it looks like. Thirty-five. That, that, that's, that's another world, another another generation. I know. Tell me that I could look thirty-five again is, is... Well, it's an insult to my intelligence. I could make you look thirty-five. What did you say? Well, you'd have to dress differently, wear colors, let your hair grow well, long. Miss LaRue, this conversation has become far too well, personal. We can end it any time you say. Uh, <clears throat> now, pursuant to our agreement, I must inquire of you if you feel obligated to provide financing for... Yes, Mr. Furlong. At, at the risk of sounding foolish, why did you say I could look 35? I learned something about you, Mr. Furlong. How could you learn anything about me in so short a time? Well, I learned that you're a man who fights against his name. I haven't the faintest idea of what that means. Your name, Gerald, strong leader of men. Oh. Oh, why do you fight it? Why do you deny it? It's what you were meant to be. Really? It's true. Who says so? I do. And how would you know? Because I believe in nominology. <laughs> oh, it's the science of names. I believe that our names tell us what we are. I think that's ridiculous. Do you? Well, I think birth itself is a mysterious happening. And that parents unconsciously have an insight into what their child could be, and they name him accordingly. They might not even be aware of it. Gerald. Well, I'm certainly not a strong leader of men. But you could be... You have it in you. It's ridiculous. Oh, you said that before. I'll say it again. Why is it any more ridiculous than any other belief? Why is it any more ridiculous than, say, astrology? Tell me, uh, what does Helene mean? Light. Hmm? A torch from the Greek. Light? Yes, light. Have I brought you any? How's the fish, dear? Oh, a bit bland. Bland? Huh? That's odd. 
It's been prepared exactly as usual, and you never complained before. Well, it just happens to lack taste. But you have to watch your intake of salt. Why? Why? Well, it's just the prudent thing, isn't it? That's what you always say. Yes, I suppose so. Did they replace Miss McKay? Yes. I hope they gave you a mature woman. You can't stand those flighty young girls. What's your new one like? Well, I really haven't noticed yet. Oh? How is that possible? Oh, look, Cecily, my dear, I have too much to do. I simply can't bother to note those things that have nothing to do with business. You are overworked, dear, that's true. I'm aware that I have a secretary, that I dictate letters to her, that she has a name, in this case. Uh, what she looks like? Well, I, I simply couldn't remember. Poor dear. Cecily, tell me something. How old do I look to you? Why? Oh, well, just curious. I hadn't thought about it. Well, you don't have to think about it. Just tell me. Well, darling, you look your age. Do I? If anything, a bit older. Really? And that's been responsible for your success. A man who heads up a trust department who's responsible for other people's money can only inspire confidence if he looks mature and... And, uh... Settled, huh? Oh, yes, dear, and you certainly do. Is it possible that... Is it possible that anyone could ever take me for, say, 35? <laughs> 35? Oh, darling, I... I don't see how... Why do you ask? Oh, no reason. Are you sure? No, no, please, forget it. I simply can't imagine why you'd even ask such a strange question. Especially... Especially what? what? Especially since you're not in the habit of asking idle questions. Coffee? No, no, darling. If you'll excuse me, I'll go to the library. I have some work. Well, Gerald, this, this goes against everything you ever... Why, well, you made it almost a religion not to bring work home from the office. Yes, dear, I know. But every religion encounters a bit of heresy now and then. But don't stay up too late. No, dear. I just have a few things to check out. Miss uh, LaRue? Oh, good evening, Mr. Furlong. Good evening. I was waiting for your call. But what do you mean you were waiting for my call? Well, then I was right. You did call, didn't you? Well, yes. However, my secretary has to expect to work all hours, and if you object, then perhaps you'd better resign. Oh, I don't mind. I don't mind at all. You have such a fascinating voice. Now, see here, Miss LaRue, this is a business call. Of course it is. Look, I had so many things to do today that I, I can't recall if I sent a letter to Mr. Oliver Stevens. Ah, uh, Mr. Oliver Stevens of Comptor and Stevens. That's right. Because if I forget to write one... Well, you did, I, Mr. Furlong. You dictated it, and I typed it and mailed it. Good. That is a relief. Otherwise, I'd have to call him this evening and explain that he shouldn't expect to... No, the letter went out. Well, that's... Well, that's what I, I, I wanted to know. Is there anything else? No, I, I can't think of anything. Oh, then, good night, sir. Good night. Uh, oh, uh, just another minute. C could you tell me what... what what the name Cecily means? Cecily? Mm hmm Oh, yes, sir. That's um, a Latin name. It means one who is in the dark or blind. <laughs> Dear, did I wake you? I'm sorry. Oh, working at night's the worst thing in the world for your nervous system. Yes, dear, I'll just brush my teeth and get right to bed. Gerald. Gerald. Who's there? Gerald. Who's talking to me? Don't you see me? What is all this? I, I must be having an hallucination. Look in the mirror, Gerald. Who do you see? I see myself. Oh, you see me. But, but, but 
Who are you? The image you cast in the mirror. That's me, isn't it? No. That's me. I can't believe this. I'm... You're what? What? Drunk? You never drink? Mad? You're the sanest man in the city. I'm seeing things. Why? What's happening to me? That's it, Jerry. What is happening? I've gone mad. You will be. Soon, Jerry. Unless you fire that girl. Which girl? Oh, don't play games with me. I've looked at your face for the last 45 years. You have no secrets from me. Why should I fire her? You know why. You don't know what you're talking about. If you don't get rid of her, you're headed for ruin, disgrace, death. How can you say that? It's true. You know it's true. Don't you, Gerald? Deep down, way down, don't you know where it must end? How it must end? Yes. Use your common sense and fire her. First thing in the morning. First thing in the morning, I'll fire her. You look in the mirror, and a perfect stranger starts to talk to you. He wears your face, but you know he isn't you. He knows every thought in your head, and every emotion in your heart. But you know he isn't you. Who is he? We shall acquire some new insights when I return shortly with Act Two. If... There's a face that looks back at our own each time we gaze into a mirror. But is it always the same face? The quick answer, the automatic answer is yes, certainly, of course. This teaches that we should never answer anything without pausing for thought. We might get the same surprise that happened to Gerald Furlong. It was the same face, but it wasn't his. Good morning, Mr. Furlong. Good morning, Mr. LaRue. Come into my office, please. Yes, sir. Now, Miss LaRue, I have something to tell you. Oh, I know. You want to fire me. Well, I've been thinking. A, a man and his secretary, they, they spend considerable time together, and therefore they should have similar temperaments. Mm, and you're too busy thinking to have fun. Obviously, we don't have a similar temperament, Miss LaRue. Very well. I'll go back to the pool, and you can get yourself another dried-up old maid to match the one you've got at home. Now, see here. Yes, what is it you want me to see? How, how did you know... How did you know I was going to fire you? Well, you keep fighting your name. You're not a Gerald. Look, what are you fighting? You know, you never had a good time in your life. Why should you care? Because I'm in love with you. That's impossible. We don't know each other. We, we, we have nothing in common. Oh, that's all nonsense. You fall in love because you hear a certain tone in somebody's voice. You see a certain light in someone's eye. But how can such a love be lasting? Oh, who says love has to last? You know, love comes and goes. Love is. And then one day, it just isn't. And it's gone. And nobody knows why, and it doesn't matter, because sooner or later it will come again with someone else. You're a strange girl. Oh, we're all strange. We, look, look, we, we can't talk here. I, I'll take you, take you out to lunch. No, 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 no lunch. Why not? Because you must lose weight. I'll take you shopping. <laughs> I like that jacket and with the aqua shirt. Oh, but I only wear white shirts. Oh, that's all in the past, darling. Now look at yourself in no, the mirror. No, no. No? Absolutely not. But how can you tell if... I just don't want to. I insist now. Come on. Look in the mirror. Have you ever seen anything so... Well, it's... Uh... It's a work of art. Gerald. No. Gerald. 
world. This face, this face, you see it. It isn't my face anymore. Gerald, don't. Don't kill me. I'm not killing you. What are you saying, darling? Darling. Already? Look, darling, I... You can't do away with me, Gerald. We've been together too long. We built up our whole world together. You just can't get rid of me and get another image. Well, what do you think, darling? Fire her, you fool. Get rid of her. Walk out of here before it's too late. Save yourself. I think... What's there to think about? He'll take it. And now, for some sportswear. Good morning, darling. Morning. Bacon is ready. Will you have two eggs? We have cereal. Uh, just a cup of coffee. But you must have breakfast. No, no, I'm fine. Just coffee. Darling, where did you get that suit? Oh, uh, I did some shopping last week. You like it? Well, it, it looks a bit... Uh, yes? Young for you. Young? And that shirt and the tie. Well, those colors are quite violent. Violent? It's hardly the image for a trust officer. And besides, dear, middle-aged men who strive for a juvenile look only succeed in making themselves appear ludicrous. Which is how I appear to you. Oh, no, no, I didn't mean that. I only... Oh, look, look, we shouldn't quarrel, especially today. I, I have to go to Chicago. Oh? No, just for a few days. We have to investigate a financial... But you, you'll never travel, dear. Well, I can't refuse this client. No, I suppose not. I'll cut the trip as short as I possibly can. Yes, dear. Well, how do you like it? I must say, it's convenient to the office. Well, the rent was higher than you said you could go, but... It's all right. Come here. Mm. Oh. I must say, you learn fast. <laughs> I didn't have to learn. I always knew it. It was just out of practice, that's all. Let me show you what I bought me this afternoon. Look, I hope your account isn't overdrawn oh, again. Oh, it was a steal. My first mink cape. Oh. Was it necessary? No, that's not my Gerald. The king of the army. It's the old trust officer speaking. Oh, I just asked. Don't you want me to keep warm? Of course. That's better. What would you like to do tonight? Oh, what are we supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to be taking a client to a long and involved business dinner. Oh, well then let's go to the High Hat Club. Hmm? I think I heard of that place. What would you hear? I don't think it's the kind of establishment I should be seen at. Then what are we waiting for? My turn again. I'll bet. Marty! Hi. Hi. Gerald, this is Marty Trainer. He owns the place. Gerald Furlong. How do you do? Oh, Furlong, huh? That's a uh, good name for a horse player. Oh, he doesn't have to play with the horses, Marty. He's too skillful with the time. I'm afraid it's beginner's luck. <laughs> when you're hot, you're hot. You're on a streak riding. I will. Bet it all. Hey! You won, <laughs> darling. You won. Let, you won. Let it ride. Darling, it's getting late. Yes, I know. You should be getting home. Oh, I wish I didn't have to go. So do I. You know the right thing to do? Mm. I should divorce Cecily and we ought to get married. Why should we get married? Because we're in love. <laughs> oh, weren't you in love with Cecily once? Well... Yes. Ah, and that's why you married her, but it didn't help. It didn't keep your love alive. You and I will we'll be different. No, we won't. We may love each other till the day we die, and we may fall out of love tomorrow morning. But I want us to keep our love. Oh, love can't be a guaranteed investment. Isn't the here and now? I'd better take a pill or see a doctor. Why? I'm the one who's sick. You're killing.
telling me. No, no, don't turn your face away. Look in the mirror. Look at me. I'm looking. Don't you see how I've changed? You, I, I look, we, we've never looked so good. Soon, you'll have a new image. And what becomes of me? I'll be dead. Frankly, I couldn't care less. But I'm the only image you're comfortable with. I'm the only image you can live with. I used to think so. I'm learning different. You're a fool. Get rid of her. Oh, no. She'll get tired of you sooner or later. And then what would you have? Elaine's what I've always wanted. I never had the nerve to let myself believe it. You can't afford her. Who says so? The apartment, the clothes, the gifts, the jewels. And now the gambling. Who knows more about gambling than I do? Haven't I gambled with investments all my life? <sighs> Thing. Except this time I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying life. It can turn all at once. It can sweep you away swiftly, suddenly, like a tidal wave. Gerald, get rid of her. You'll never know what hit you. No. She, she'll kill both of us. I don't care. I don't care. Gerald. What, uh, what do you want? I thought I heard you talking to someone. You what? I heard you talking to someone. Oh, come on. that That's ridiculous. I thought so, too, at first. But lately it seems... Well, you seem to be having angry conversations. Indeed. About what? I don't know, but I'm sure I hear voices. You sure you're all right, dear? Is, is something wrong? No. That no sounds like yes. Oh, I suppose I'm a little bit lonesome these days. I see so little of you. Look, darling, things are becoming impossible at the office. You know, the way the market is behaving. I know, I know. There are terrible pressures on you. Why don't you quit? Quit? Yes, dear, quit. Find something else. It isn't easy to get a new job at 45. But you don't look 45. You look at least 10 years younger. Well, how would we make out while I was looking around? Well, you've been very judicious with our money. We should have quite a bit put by. Cecily... We don't have. In the present market, our holdings have... Well, they haven't done well. They've lost. They've lost considerable value. Oh. It's my fault. I, I'm sorry. Well, there's my inheritance. Oh, no, no, no. no we couldn't... It's $50,000. No, 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 no. We, we must never touch it that. It could help ease us along. Cecily. Oh, Cecily. You, you're too good to me. Don't say that. I love you. Let's start life all over. Is it something to think about? Yes, it, it is something to think about. Where are we going? The usual place. Ah. What does that mean? Oh, you just said the usual place, which means our lives are becoming predictable. Well, don't you enjoy it there? Tonight, I'd like to go dancing. Play of dancing? Marty hires the best band in town. How would you know? You never danced to well, it. If you want to dance tonight, that's what we'll do. Let's go somewhere else. Why? Because if we go to Marty's, you'll get involved in a card game. No, I won't. I, I promise you. Oh, you make that promise every night, and you break that promise every night. Well, tonight will be different. You'll see. Gerald. I want to go home. Darling, we, we, we can't go just yet. I see no reason why we can't do anything we please any time we want to do it. I've lost too much money. So what? It's only money. I can't quit now. Oh, this place is becoming a bore. I can't afford to. And you're becoming a bore, too. Don't say that. Uh, but I love you. Do you understand? Well, I love you, too. Just another half hour. Uh, Mr. Furlong. Yes, Marty. Do we again? No, Gerald, no. Don't play with him, please. You can't beat him. What are you talking about? The cards are going to come my way. I can feel it. You can't beat him. His name is Martin. What? After Mars, the god of war. He's a child of Mars. Gerald, let's leave now. Sure, sure. Look, all I need is just one good part. Gerald, don't play with him. All right, you go get your coat and meet me here. Oh, Well, Mr. Furlong, just you and I left, huh? So, no fight for the pot. I believe you were the opener. 500. Oh, a very good bet. I think I'll raise. Make it a thousand. And a thousand better. A man with confidence. However, another thousand. A thousand to you again, Marty. 
Well, I must respect that. I call. You should. I have a full house. An excellent hand. Good enough to win most of the time, but not good enough this time. What are you... I have four little juices. Oh. So, let's see. In the pot where your overall bets are $5,500 and added to your previous indebtedness, we have uh, <clears throat> a total of 35000 What? That's impossible. I have your markers here, Mr. Furlong. Care to check the arithmetic? Well, no, I... Look, I, I don't carry $35,000 around with me in cash. Who does? We can wait. Till tomorrow. Gerald? Are we ready to go? Gerald! Yes. Yes, Elaine. We're ready to go. He says he's ready to go. But the question is, where? Where do you go when you've just lost $35,000 that you don't have? Where do you go? And what do you do? Well, this could be as good a time as any for Gerald to find out if he can live up to his name. Strong leader of men. We'll know everything when I return shortly with Act Three. It's not the first time, it won't be the last time, a man will seek to change his image. But is an image like a shoe, a coat, a tie, something a man may take off and cast aside? Can an image refuse to be changed? Can it fight back? It's very late at night, after a disastrous evening, and Gerald Furlong is once again confronting an image in the mirror. The image he seeks to change. And until recently, it was such a quiet, unobtrusive, submissive image. Now will you leave her, Lane? No. She's ruined you. I can't blame her. Tell Cecily. Confess. Why? Where else could you get the money? The money? The $35,000 you gambled away. I'll... I, I, I... You what? You counted on Cecily's money. You knew it was there. That's why you gambled. That's a lie. Ah, you're talking to me. I can raise it. Where? How? She. She loves me. She'll let me have it. That's what I've been telling you. Confess to Cecily. Confess everything. No, not Cecily. Elaine. <laughs> Elaine, I, I'm I'm in over my head. Please help me. Of course. I knew you would. That's what love is. Now, your necklace, your bracelet, and the furs. Now, well, you want me to sell them? We can raise quite a bit of money. Maybe not all of it, but enough to, to give me breathing room. I see. I'll, I'll make it up to you later. Darling, I won't do it. But you... We're... We're in love. Yes? You said you'd help me. Help you in the right way. The way you should be helped. What do you mean? The way a man named Gerald should be helped. I don't understand. Gerald, strong leader of the army. Are you going to bow down before the demands of a cheap gambler? I, I lost the money. Well, how do you know you lost it, honestly? How do you know the cards weren't fixed? I don't. Well, stand up to him. Refuse to pay him. What? But, but he'll... He'll what? Gambling's against the law here. His club is illegal. He has no claims on you. He can't go to court about it. Yes, but still... Still! Are you going to hold still? Be Gerald. This is how I love you. This is how I help you. Yes. Yes, he has no legal claim. You're, you're right. You're right, Mr. Furlong. Absolutely right. I have no legal recourse. Then I shall say good day to you, sir. But I have other alternatives. Yes, I can imagine. Huh. Can you? I can imagine that you'll try to frighten me with your uh, underworld connections. <laughs> underworld connections? You've seen too many movies. You think you can scare me with strong-arm tactics? I'm not afraid of you. Why should you be? Or anyone else. I've been in a war. I know how to use a weapon. I have one in my house. I can defend myself, and I will. 
Now, you are a trust officer for an important brokerage house, huh? Oh, I see. Blackmail. <laughs> I'm not afraid. I'll deny I was ever in here. <laughs> you can't. You see, we have proof. <laughs> what do you mean by proof? Well, now, when I press this button, that white screen comes down from the ceiling. And another button. And we have a projector. And now we have a motion picture, and look who the hero is. Oh, why, it's you. I, I don't believe it. Ah, oh, Mr. Furlong, isn't it true? One picture is worth a thousand words. How well you, you photograph. I mean, there you are, betting, raking in the money. Oh, you are a gambler, sir. That's obvious. How you relish what you're doing, huh? Well, have you seen enough? What will you do with it? Show it to my... my, my management people? Oh, yes. Well, it won't do you any good. They'll fire me. That won't get you your money. Oh, yes, it will. What do you mean? They're not responsible now, for listen, what I... Now, listen, we exhibit this little documentary. We tell your management, unless they make good on your debt, we will show the picture to their clients. We will say to them, here. Here is how a man who handles your money amuses himself in his spare time. Is he doing this with your money? I think your management will pay us off, don't you? Would you violence? Who needs violence when this kind of persuasion is so much more, uh, persuasive? I need time. Of course. Take a few days, take a week, even more, and think about it. I'm sure something will occur to you. Elaine? Elaine? What the... The place? It's empty. What happened? She's gone. She's disappeared and she took everything. What's this paper? Darling. Love comes, love goes. And for us, it's over. Think about me as I shall think about you. And remember always. Remember your name is Gerald. Strong leader of a host. Gone. She's gone. Of course she's gone. What did you expect? Where are you? Where do you think I am? Look in the mirror. The mirror? What small mirror with a pearl encrusted border? She was going to take it along with everything else, but she forgot. Well, what are you going to do now? No. No, I'm I'm going to It's not too late. Get down on your knees to Cecily. Pray to her to forgive you. Never. No, not to her. Not to Cecily. You can't afford to have pride. I'll get the money somehow. Oh, no. Not that way. I know what you're thinking. Look, it's the only way. I won't let you. I won't let you kill her. I'll stop you. It, it'll be a burglar. No. Yes, a burglar. And and, and he killed her. No. No, Th Gerald. That's how it happened. I've got the gun at Don't home. do it, Gerald. She'll be angry, but in the end, she'll forgive you. They'll have an alibi. They'll never be able to prove Gerald, it. Gerald, don't. Don't kill her for her money. I have to. I won't let you. You can't stop me. I can warn Cecily. How could you? You, you, you can't. I'll stop you. I'll kill you first. Cecily? Cecily, where are you? Here. I'm here, darling, in the living room. Oh. How are you? As well as can be expected. What does that mean? Considering that my husband has... A. Deceived me with another woman. B. Squandered every dollar he has in the world. And C. Plans to murder me for my inheritance. I don't feel too badly. What on earth are you... Is it true? Look, uh, where, where could you possibly get such a crazy you, idea? You told me. I told you? Yes. Strangest thing happened. I was sitting at the mirror combing my hair. And I looked in the mirror and it wasn't my face at all, but yours. That's... that's impossible. And you started to talk to me. And you told me everything, including the fact that you want to kill me. No, it, it isn't true. Look, how, could you, how could you see my face in the mirror? But I did. And you spoke to me. It could have been a dream. Perhaps. 
What does it matter? Darling, I... I love you. Why, why would I... I suppose I've been blind, but no more. I wish I could convince you. What are you looking for in that drawer? Uh, for, I'm not looking for anything. That's not true. You were looking for this. But, Cecily, don't. You... You couldn't shoot me? No, I couldn't. I'm not like you. Then, wh wh why are you pointing that pistol at me? Get out. Get out? This is no longer your home. I'm no longer your wife. And I'm holding this gun because as long as I hold it, you won't be able to kill me. Cecily, you're mad. It's all in your imagination. Stay just where you are. Well, we've been married 22 years. We, we, we love each other. Not another step, I warn you. Cecily, you wouldn't shoot me. You couldn't. Stop. Give me that gun. No. 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 Drop it. No, no you off. want to kill me. Help. Shut up. Help me, somebody. He wants to kill me. I'll, I'll help you. Keep out of this. You keep out of it. Help me. Get back. Back in the mirror where no. you belong. No, I don't. I don't belong there anymore. You have another Get image. Get away. Let her go. Let her Gerald. Uh, Gerald. He, he saved you, Cecily. He saved you. Gerald. He's a better man than I am. Who? Look in the mirror. Let me get a doctor. Look in the mirror, in the mirror. Do you see him? Him? I don't see him. Then... He's gone, too. He's... gone. Gerald? Oh, Gerald? They're both gone. Gerald and the image. I know we have the realists in the house and the psychologists who will tell us that they can reduce it all to a matter of the inner self. Split personality. Guilty conscience. Well, to each his own. It could have been an image acting independently. Proof, absolute proof is missing for both sides. I'll return in a few minutes. French philosopher once said, we leave a part of ourselves behind us each day. That's true. But where do we leave it? Sometimes a very close and introspective look in the mirror might help us arrive at the answer. Answers. So much in demand and so short in supply. However, we do have the full answer for your mystery, suspense, and excitement needs right here. Our cast included Alexander Scourby, Laurie March, William Redfield, and Marion Haley. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I'm E.G. Marshall. Sit down. Anywhere you like. I have a small confession to make. I am crazy about ghosts. And I cannot for the life of me comprehend why anyone should be afraid of them. What, after all, what do ghosts do? 
They haunt, that's all. To haunt means to visit, to frequent. In short, to hang around. What's so scary about that? A hopeful lover hangs around a lot. If an inspiring lover or a wistful compatriot can hang around without inspiring fear, why not an anxious ghost? Is it... Is it really you, Paul? Yes, Melba. It is I. Oh, Paul. Don't cry, Melba. I can't... I can't help it. All right, dearest. Go ahead and cry. Paul. Paul, tell me something. What? Are you happy where, where you are? I'm really sorry you asked me that, Melba. Our mystery drama, Ghost Talk, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Lenka Peterson and Elliot Reed. Yes, ghosts haunt places. Traditionally, they haunt large, decrepit mansions with long halls, extensive staircases, and musty attics. But these big old edifices have all disappeared from our landscape, and it is more than likely that the ghost of today has to restrict himself to one-bedroom apartments with bath, kitchenette, and dining area. Poor ghosts. Will they give up haunting altogether? Or will he do what we have done? Adjust. Melba, you have my number? Yes, Leonard. Both at home and at the office. If there's anything I can do, Melba, anything at all... I'll call you. Bless you, my dear. Oh, Paul. Where are you? Where? all gone. Leonard Whipple was the last to leave. I'm all alone. No, I'm not crying. I'm trying to be brave and calm and, and remember everything you told me. Leonard said to call him if I needed anything, but I'm, what does that mean? I need my husband. I need Paul. Oh, no, Irene, I couldn't go to the movies. No. I'll just sit here and think about Paul. All the beautiful memories. Twenty-two years of beautiful memories. You know, Irene, I keep thinking all the time of what you said to me after the funeral. You said, Paul will never be really dead as long as he's remembered. I keep saying that over and over. Paul isn't really dead, as long as he's remembered. I want to thank you, Irene, for that beautiful thought. It means everything to me. Oh, Melba. Melba. How goes it, Paul? Hello. It's Bruce, isn't it? I'm new here. I haven't got everybody straight yet. (laughs) You never will. It doesn't matter. Yes, I am Bruce. Mind if I join you? I wish you would. You had a particularly beatific expression on your face just now as I was floating by. Uh, I was thinking of my wife. My wife, Melba. Why? Why? Well, actually, because she was thinking of me. Remembering our wedding day, I was touched. You're really very new here, aren't you? Oh, yes, very. At the start, everybody is either touched that they're remembered, apprehensive that they won't be, or furious that they're not. Melba feels that no one is really dead as long as he's remembered. Is that what you want to be? Not really dead? It sounds nice. Well, it isn't. 
I don't know how you can say that. Because I happen to know, from bitter personal experience. My sainted mother remembered me every day of her life after I died, till the day she died and joined me here. Since her arrival, I'm happy to say, we've exchanged precisely six words. A while back, she had the grace to apologize. I'm sorry, son, I didn't understand. Those were the six words. Sorry for what? For remembering me. What was she supposed to do? Well, forget, for goodness sakes. I wouldn't expect her to forget immediately, of course. That would be unreasonable. But as soon as possible, put me out of her mind. My life on earth was over. Well, I'm sure she meant well, your mother. After you're here a while, you'll realize that everybody doesn't mean well. And quite often does a lot of harm. But your mother loved you. Then why not leave me alone to enjoy myself? Why wake up in the middle of the night to remember how handsome I looked the day I graduated from dental college? So inconsiderate. Why was it inconsiderate? Because, my dear fellow, if she kept it up long enough, I'd have to stop whatever I was doing and go visit her. Visit her? How could you do that? How? Well, the way it's always done. As a ghost, of course. Irene? It's me. Oh, all right, I guess. Leonard was here. We sent out for Chinese food. He left about an hour ago. Oh, I'm just sitting here and remembering. I got out the old picture album to show Leonard. <laughs> I don't think Leonard cares too much for travel. I wasn't sorry when he left. Looking at the snapshots and remembering the beautiful life I had with Paul, it seemed to bring him closer. Oh, I mean it, Irene. A couple of times, I, I felt as though he was right here in the room with me. Honestly. <laughs> Oh, Bruce. That you, Paul? I had a terrible time finding you. Well, now you have. I asked everybody where you were and nobody knew, and then Salome said, oh, he's probably out strolling among the stars. That's his favorite pastime. But I had no idea how many stars there are. You still haven't any idea. Actually, neither have I, and I've been here heaven knows how long. So far, this is my favorite galaxy. But, of course, I haven't seen them all. Has anyone, do you think? Oh, I suppose he has. He must have seen everything since the beginning of time. And before that? Ah, uh, yes. What made you come looking for me? Something special? Bruce, I can't get a moment to myself on account of Melba. Your wife. You know what she did. She got out an old snapshot album and started looking over all the pictures we took on our vacations, birthdays, Christmases. Typical. They all do it. The worst part is she showed all these pictures to a friend of mine, of hers, ours, Leonard Whipple. He couldn't have cared less. She's really hanging on to you, isn't she? It's very nice of her and all that, but it's... It, it's terribly exciting for me being here. Everything's so completely different. Oh. 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 There she goes again, hear her. Oh, Paul, dear. Dear Paul. Hear that? Vaguely. She just keeps after me and keeps after me. Well, what me. about this Leonard Whipple? Well... He's a very nice guy, but he's not going to hang around much longer if she makes him look at pictures of our honeymoon in the Grand Canyon. Hmm. You couldn't just ignore her, I suppose. Well, she's my wife, and I love her. I mean, she was my wife, and I did love her. But now, things are different. I'd say so. <gasps> well, for goodness sake, look there. If it isn't him. Him? You mean it? Really? Him? I haven't seen him in eons. I never have. Uh, sir? Sir, please? Hmm? No. Yes, yes, it's Bruce. Yes. Am I right? Yes, sir. And this is Paul. He's new. I know. Hello, Paul. I... I'm really thrilled to meet you, sir. The galaxy is looking well, don't you think? I love this galaxy, sir. You set it out so neatly. Hmm. There's one star I've been concerned about. I think it's beginning to twinkle out. Uh, sir, as long as we were so fortunate as to run into you like this, could we have your advice about something? You know I dislike giving advice. It's for me, sir. I don't know what to do about my wife. Is she here? Oh, no. 
she's with the living on Earth. Oh. And she's grieving. Well, that's to be expected. She'll stop after a while. She doesn't show any signs of stopping. I, I was wondering if I shouldn't, you know, appear to her. Bruce says it's a simple procedure. Well, you could do that, of course. I never thought very highly of that ghost business, so theatrical. Huh? But if it'll make her feel better? I suppose we do owe a measure of responsibility to the living. You think I could go back for a short visit? You're free to do as you like. If I were to tell you what to do, you wouldn't be free anymore, would you? Well, if you just tell me what you think. No, I really can't do that. That would be tantamount to telling you what to do because of me being who I am. You see, you think I have all the answers. Everybody thinks so. Well, I don't. There are countless things I haven't found answers to. <laughs> However, like everyone else, I keep trying. Now, uh, I really have to go to see if that poor star is feeling any pain. You'll both excuse me? He wasn't much help. Well, that's his way. Oh, dear. Oh, there she goes again. Bruce, I'm going to turn ghost and visitor. At least you've made a decision. How do I go about it? Well, there are no hard and fast rules. Actually, not many of us do it. It's, it's, it's considered kind of freaky. Freaky? Look how many of us there are and how few of them. If we all took to ghost walking, we'd have them outnumbered trillions to one. I don't care. I want to do it. I just need to know how. Well, you can do it in the old-fashioned way. Clanking chains, winds whistling through the trees, moon behind black clouds and all that. I don't think Melba would go for that. Well, then there's the crying, sobbing type of ghost. Inconsolable weeping. Since I don't feel particularly inconsolable... Well, then there's the ghost that flits through the halls, appearing and disappearing. Now you see it, now you don't. No, we don't have a hall, just a rather small foyer. Mm. Uh, can't I just appear in some simple, straightforward way, just say... Here I am, dear. You wouldn't want to start with one weird, uncanny shriek. I wouldn't know how. Or a sardonic laugh. Well, what would I be laughing at? Oh, life, death, anything in between. Well, if you don't want to do any of those things, things which he calls theatrical, then just appear. That's more my style, I think. But wrap a bit of vapor around you. After all, they need something to identify you by. And don't stay too long. And above all... Don't let it depress you. Why should it depress me? <laughs> You'll find out, my friend. You'll find out. It never occurred to me that a visitation by a ghost could be depressing. Take now that well-known ghost of Hamlet's father, speaking spookily from the battlements at Elsinore. Of course, he didn't sound happy. How could he when his own brother had just killed him and promptly married his widow? He sounded angry, yes. Vengeful, yes. But depressed? No. And certainly not depressing. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Our moribund hero, Paul, has decided to return to Earth as a ghost and haunt the three-room apartment where he once lived with his wife, Melba. He has simply draped what remains of him in a shred of celestial vapor. And now, as he gazes through the living room window of what used to be his own tenth-floor apartment, he can scarcely be distinguished from the melting moonlight that floods the room inside. Nothing's changed. She hasn't changed a thing. Let's take our coffee into the living room, Leonard. Good idea. I think I picked the wrong time. Bring in that plate of cookies, will you? Right. Not those same old oatmeal things. I've always been crazy about oatmeal cookies. They were Paul's favorites. Set them down there. Mm -hmm. Cream in your coffee? Sugar? Uh, black, please. No sugar. That's the way Paul took his... His after-dinner coffee in the morning, cream and sugar, yes, but after dinner, nothing. Is that so? And milk in his tea. 
You don't say. That's the English way, you know. Milk and tea. I didn't know Paul was English. He wasn't. Oh, I see. Oh, way back, five, six generations, he was English, but... I, myself, was born in Wales. Is that so? Oh, well, that's near England. Richard Burton is Welsh, you know. For goodness sakes! Why, didn't you know that? The last movie Paul and I saw together had Richard Burton in it. I I wanted to show you something fascinating. Paul's World War II uniform. I've saved it all these years. Uh, no, I don't... Uh, not tonight. And his captain's bars. Some other time. I, I've really got to be moving on. Oh, if you really have to. Such a beautiful night. I think I'll walk home. Yes, a beautiful night. Oh, just look at the moonlight streaming through that window. Care to walk a ways with me? In the moonlight? Oh, no, I don't think so, Leonard. I have a lot of things to do here. Yeah, well, if there's anything you need, you have my number. Yes. At home and at the office. Good night, Melba. Thanks for dinner. Thank you for bringing all that fried chicken. Oh, it, it was nothing, really. Good night. Good night, Leonard. Oh, Paul. Dear Paul. I need you, Paul. Melba. Oh, I need you so. I'm right here. What was that? I said, I'm here. Paul? Yes, me, Paul. But, but, where? By the window, dear. I can't see you. I'll step inside. That'll be better. Oh, I see. I, I see something. You see me. I dare say I've changed somewhat. Paul. Can that be you? It is. I. Really you? Well, fairly really. Everything considered... As real as I can get. Oh, I, I can't believe it. Believe it, Melba. Oh, Paul. How are you? Oh, never mind about me. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. Really? All right? Everything considered. Everything considered, I'm better than all right. Paul, tell me. Are you happy? Happy? I must know. Are you happy? I'm sorry you asked me that question. Why should you be sorry? Happy just isn't a word we use. Why not? Because it... It doesn't mean much once you've died. Oh, Paul, you're not saying you're unhappy. No, I'm not saying that. Then what are you saying? Look, Melba, I didn't really come here to talk about me. What about you? Well... Naturally, I'm not happy. Why not? Without you? What about Leonard Whipple? Oh, him. What's the matter with Leonard? Well, nothing's the matter with him. He's just not you. Well, I'm not me either. Not the way I was before oh, I... Oh, but I remember you the way you were. And as long as I remember... Melba, honey, I don't even remember me the way I was. You don't? Not very well. You remember me, don't you? Sort of. Sort of? Well, you were my wife. I'm still your wife. Not exactly. There will never be anyone for me but you. Never, I swear it. Please, Melba. We are man and wife forever, for eternity. And now that I know you can return to me, not in the flesh perhaps, but even like this. It's strange. It's weird, but it's enough for me. I can live on as your wife and on and on till I join you. Melba, you don't know what you're saying. Oh, I knew you could never really die as long as I remembered you. And you see, here you are, living on. Hello, Irene, me. Guess what? You'll never guess. Paul was here. Yes. Yes, yes. Right here in this living 
room. All right, then, his ghost, whatever. Well, he looked different. Yes, yeah, sort of steamy. Kind of like a, a street light on a foggy night. But I knew it was Paul, all right. His voice and the things he said and the way he called me Melba, dear. Well, it, he didn't say too much. I, I asked him, was he happy? Because naturally I wanted to know, but he wouldn't say. He wouldn't say he wasn't unhappy either. Isn't that weird? He wanted to know about me. Am I happy? <laughs> Isn't that sweet? And he asked about Leonard Whipple. Imagine him knowing I've been seeing Leonard off and on. Of course, I told him Leonard doesn't mean a thing to me, that there could never be anyone else for me. I said, Paul, we are man and wife for eternity. I said, you can never truly die, Paul, as long as I remember you. And then, you know what, Irene? There was this big, great, big noise, a, a crash sort of... No, not like thunder, more like, like music, like a chord out of Beethoven or somebody. And all of a sudden, he was gone. But he'll be back. Like you said, no one is really dead as long as he's remembered. Sir. Oh, oh sir. May I speak with you? Hmm? No. Oh, it's uh, Paul, isn't it? Uh, sir, uh, could I have just a moment of your time? I have all the time in the world. I have all the time there is. But well, I don't quite know how much time there is, but I do know I have all of it. Uh, does that star look all right to you? Well, I, I wouldn't know. I, I don't quite know how a star is supposed to look. Please, sir. May, oh, may I... yes, 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 of course. You want to talk to me. Uh, what about? I, I've been back to the earth. My wife kept calling me. You said we owed some responsibility to the living, did so I... Did I say that? Yes, sir, you did. Hmm. I wonder if I was right about that. These earth trips can be very upsetting. Mine was. My wife wanted to know, am I happy? They're all so preoccupied with happiness, aren't they? I didn't know what to say to her. I, I couldn't answer her. This woman I'd been married to for half my life, I couldn't talk to her. It was as though we were living in two different worlds. Well? Oh, 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 yes, I, I see what you mean. Still, shouldn't I have been able to answer her? Well, what could you have said? Well, that... That happy is a word that doesn't mean anything anymore. Happy is nothing without unhappy. The way pleasure is nothing without pain. The way health is nothing without illness. Euphoria is nothing without depression. Oh, you know what I mean, sir. I do know, yes. It's ridiculous to say I'm happy when I'm never unhappy. What I am is... What you are is... What? What I am is... Free. Yes. I'm free. I'm Paul, and I'm free. And I'm free to be Paul, no more, no less than me. Me, Paul. Sir, why couldn't I be free like that before? Oh, dear, I ask myself that same question all the time. The only answer is that I miscalculated somewhere. And I did give those people the power to think, to reason, to figure out the sensible way to do things. Oh, why don't they use what I gave them? Why leave everything up to me? Theirs isn't the only planet in the universe, you know. I do have other things to look after, but the way they call out to me, they, they want me to do everything. But it's, it's, it's not right. It really is not right. No, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Well, what's done is done. They'll just have to muddle through the best way they can. Uh, now, about your wife. Uh, Melba, is it? Yes, sir. Hmm. Tell you what. Why don't you talk to Bruce about it? You two seem to get along so well. Yes, yes. Talk to Bruce. Now, excuse me, will you? Um, I really do have to go take a look at that poor star. Bruce, he just wasn't any help at all. Now, you listen, Paul. 
Suppose you had invented the greatest machine imaginable. One that would do, uh, oh, practically anything you can think of. How would you like it if somebody came running to you every time a bolt got loose and asked you to tighten it? But, Bruce, Mel says she's going to go on remembering me forever. We'll be man and wife forever, till she joins me here, and then we'll still be man and wife. Maybe once she gets here, she'll change her mind. But she's only 42. She'll be remembering me for years and years and calling for me, and I'll have to put on that vapor stuff and haunt the apartment. And, and Bruce, it's so hard to carry on a conversation with her now. It didn't used to be, but now... Well, you, you couldn't just ignore her. I love her, Bruce. Do you? Well... I did, for a very long time, right up to the moment I died. My last words were, I love you, Melba. At least, that's what I meant to say. I know I had it in my mind to say that, but I'm not positive I ever got around to saying it. Anyway, I can't just, just brush her off. My, my, you do have a conscience, don't you? Well, I hope so. It's a very fine thing to have, of course, but sometimes... Look. There's only one thing you can do. What? Get married. G married? To, to... To Melba? No, not to Melba, you idiot. How could you marry Melba? She's there and you're here. Some marriage that would be. But then, who... Whom would I marry? Oh, heavens to Betsy, Paul. The place is full of women. Have you ever seen Helen? Helen who? Helen of Troy, they call her. Actually, I've never met her myself, but from what they tell me... Marriages are made in heaven, so it's been said. There are those who consider this a profoundly true observation, while others think it one of the silliest statements ever made. I myself have no opinion, at least none that I care to express here. But no one, so far as I know, has ever claimed that people actually get married in heaven. Melba was a wonderful wife to Paul. But as his widow, she leaves something to be desired. Two things. She won't stop desiring him, and she won't leave him alone. In his desperation, Paul has gone to his kindred spirit, Bruce, for help. The only advice Bruce could offer was for Paul to marry again. Not his earthly wife, Melba but one of the heavenly creatures who, like Paul, expect to live on forever in whatever place it is they live on forever in. You've definitely burned yourself out, little one. Mm, too bad. Sir? Oh, sir. Now, oh, look, Paul, this dear little star has burned itself out. Well, I knew it wouldn't be long. Uh, sir... I did what you told me to. I talked to Bruce about my problem, and you know what he said? He said, get married. It married? He says the only way to make Melba forget me is for me to get married to someone else. Someone here. Where else? What do you think of the idea? Why do you keep asking me what I think? Can't you ever think for yourself? Well, I just thought... That... No, no, you didn't. You came running to me like all the others. I'm getting tired of it. Well, if you could give me a little advice... I gave you a little advice. I said, talk to Bruce. You talked to Bruce, and he told you what he thought you should do. Now, either do it or don't do it. Is it all right? Is uh, what all right? To get married. Here. Paul, the essence of this place is perfect freedom to do as you choose. It might work out, it might not. But that's true of everything, isn't it? It's certainly true of everything I do. Do many people get married here? Well, I don't know. I do know they don't come running to me to ask, is it all right? Bruce mentioned someone called Helen. Helen of Troy? Are you asking me to pick a wife for you? Now, what else do you want me to do? Tie your shoelaces? Help you with your arithmetic? Don't you people ever grow up? I'm sorry, sir. I don't care about your being sorry. That's too easy. I care about your achieving some measure of maturity. A bit of independence. A little simple sense. 
Is that asking too much? Tell me, is that really asking too much? Oh, sir, I... Sometimes I feel like giving up on the whole human race. You, you're not going to cry, are you, sir? Why not? Who has better reason to cry than I have? Nobody, I guess. Uh, however, we must all carry on, mustn't we? Never give up. That's my motto. Because if I gave up... Uh, don't oh, say it, sir. Please, don't say it. No. No, I won't say it. I wouldn't be so cruel, no matter how provoked. Now, Paul, I really must go to tend to that poor little star who, believe me, needs my help more than you do. Irene, it's me. Oh, just sitting around... Leonard asked me to go to that new steak place with him, but I said no. I didn't feel like it, that's why. Don't be silly. I like Leonard. He's a very nice man, but... Well, there's a beautiful moon out tonight. and I thought maybe... Oh, for heaven's sakes, what's that? Well, there was a terrible clanking noise just now. It scared me to death. Well, oh, how could it be the radiator? The heat's not turned on yet. Is there a storm coming up or something? Is that, that whistling sound, can't you hear it? Like a, like a terrible wind. Or maybe a hurricane. <laughs> what do you mean you don't hear anything? <gasps> what, there goes the moon. It must be a hurricane. I mean, the moonlight just stopped shining. How can it be shining where you are and not here? Oh, now it's shining here, too. <laughs> Irene, oh, are you there? Oh, are you crying about something? Oh, I thought you were. No, no reason, I just thought I heard... Well, I heard somebody crying. More than crying, really sobbing. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Something just ran through the room. How do I know what? It disappeared into the kitchen. <laughs> Irene, there's something here in the kitchen. It's, it's laughing, terrible laughing. It couldn't be Paul. Because, because it couldn't be. Paul doesn't behave that way. He just comes to the window and says, Here I am, Melba, dear. It couldn't be Paul. Here I am, Melba, dear. <gasps> he just said it. Here I am, Melba, dear. Melba, I'm here. Irene, I'm going to hang up. I've got to find out if it's Paul. And if it is Paul, I've got to know why he's behaving so peculiarly. No, no, don't come over. You, you might scare him away. I mean, after all, I'm used to these things and you're not. Bye, Irene. Hello, Melba. Paul, is it you? No, it's not Paul. <gasps> oh! Don't be frightened. I'm Bruce. Bruce? Who? I don't know any Bruce. I'm Paul's new friend. His best friend, actually. But why are you here? Why isn't Paul here? He couldn't make it tonight. Why not? Nothing's happened to him, has it? What could happen? Well, nothing, I suppose. Everything's already happened. Precisely. Well, then why isn't he here? I've thought about him and thought about him every single day and every time I woke up during the night. I've been over every moment of every day of every year we had together. That's just it. And I'm just about to start over at the beginning. Uh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Why not? He's not really dead as long as I remember him. He's not really alive either, is he? Well, no, but... Melba, you're wearing him out with all this remembering. Wearing him out? Yeah, back and forth, back and forth. It's very tiring, Melba. You mean he'd rather just stay where he is? I think so. Oh, nobody wants to be dead and forgotten. Wait till it's your turn. I certainly don't want to be. Wait, you'll find out. Nobody wants to be dead and forgotten. That's because they haven't tried it yet. You mean... To tell me that Paul wants to be forgotten? By me? If you think you could manage it. Forget 22 beautiful years? Oh, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't possibly. What about having 22 more beautiful years with somebody else? Like who? Well, 
I've heard nice things about a certain Leonard Whipple. Leonard Whipple? I've heard he's very devoted to you. But Leonard's not Paul. I mean, Leonard could never be Paul. But he could be Leonard, couldn't he? If you'd let him. Well, Paul is the only man for me. Always was, always will be, and that is that. Oh, Melba, Melba. Why do you say, oh, Melba, Melba, like that? Because you forced me to tell you something I really have no right to tell you. What? What is it? Hardly anybody knows about it. Just me. And Paul, of course. What is it? I shouldn't repeat it. Uh, no. My lips are sealed. I it's too private. Does it concern Paul? Is it about Paul? You won't mention it to a living soul? I won't mention it to anybody. What is it? Paul. Paul is getting married again. Paul? Is getting married again? Yes. Who, too? I think her name is Helen. Is she pretty? I've never met her, but I hear she's very pretty. <sighs> Young? I believe so. Oh, how could he? How could he? That's life, Melba. Life? Paul's not alive. No, but you are, Melba. Yes, I am. Make the most of it. That's my advice to you. Thank you, Bruce, for telling me what you told me. I really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. I don't suppose Paul would ever have told me himself. Oh, eventually he would have. Maybe. Maybe not. Well, if you see him, tell him I hope he's very happy with his Helen. I'll tell him. Nice to have met you, Melba. It's very nice to have met you, too, Bruce. I... Are you still sitting down or standing up? I can't quite tell. Does it really matter? Well, I'd just like to, I don't know, shake your hand or something. <laughs> Not necessary. Not necessary at all. I, I could see you to the door. No, let's just part this way. A fond adieu to you, Melba. A fond... Oh, he's gone. He just disappeared. Well... That's the way with ghosts. Oh. Who needs ghosts, anyway? With all their comings and goings. And the way they talk. Who can understand them? Hello? Irene? Irene, you are absolutely not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. You simply will not believe it. <laughs> Bruce. Bruce, where have you been? I've been looking all over for you. Even Salome didn't know where you were. Where were you? I went to see your wife. Melba? What for? To tell her you were getting married. Bruce, you had no right to do that. Here, we do as we choose. He told you that. How did she take it? Shocked, of course. Hurt. What you'd expect. You told me you were going to tell her. I knew you wouldn't let me. I wouldn't have. For one very good reason. It's not true. What's not true? That I'm getting married. You changed your mind? Not exactly. I asked Helen. Yes? She said absolutely not. She says she's not the marrying type. But you didn't stop right there, did you? There are others. I asked Catherine. Uh, uh, I can't pronounce her last name. She used to be an empress in Russia. She laughed, fit to kill. And so did Amy and Louise and Marie. Even Salome laughed at me. Are you upset? Well, nobody likes to be laughed at. Yes, I'm upset. But on the other hand, I'm relieved, too. Bruce, I really don't want to get married. I never thought you did. Everything's so nice here, so free and sort of uninhibited. So peaceful. Leonard, it's Melba. You don't mind my calling you at your office, do you? Oh, that's good. How was the new steak place? You didn't go? On account of me, you didn't go? Oh, well, I must say, Leonard... Oh, I, I spent the evening doing various things. Things that really needed to be done. Like 
I got all Paul's clothes together and packed them in boxes. Tomorrow I'll send them to some deserving charity. <laughs> Listen, Leonard, I was thinking, as long as you didn't go to that steak place, why don't you come over here tonight and I'll cook you the best steak you ever tasted. And hash brown potatoes. Would you like that? Ah, oh, good. Well, come early and we'll have a martini first. <laughs> Good for Melba, good for Leonard, and good for Bruce, and for Paul, too. Good for everybody who faces up to a problem and solves it the best way possible. The solution may not be a perfect one. Solutions seldom are. But at the very least, they are an attempt to use the sense we were born with. And that's all God asks of any of us. I'll be back shortly. You do realize, don't you, that the story I've just brought you was all pure fantasy. I don't know any more than you do what happens to us once we have resigned this terrestrial life, and you know as little as I do. Unless, of course, you are a ghost. Oh, if you are, I wish you'd get in touch with me. I have gobs and gobs of things I'm dying to ask you, like, uh, like, uh, well, well, for one thing, are you happy? Our cast included Lenka Peterson, Elliot Reed, Robert Dryden, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. And, as you may suspect, I have a tale to tell. A tale full of sound and terror and uh, signifying... Well, I'll have to leave that to you. And I also ask your indulgence when I personalize this strange riddle... ...because this story was brought directly to me... Ever since I've been your host on this series, I have the feeling that you expect me to be an expert on the macabre. But I must confess to a sense of surprise when I was buttonholed by a young man the other day who said, Excuse me, Mr. Marshall, but I have a coffin that I'm sure will interest you. You cannot frighten me. I am not leaving this graveyard until I get to the bottom of this. I warn you, your persistence will be your destruction. I still trust in the Lord. Where, where is that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it judgment day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise. The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. Our mystery drama, A Coffin for the Devil was especially adapted for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Keir DeLay. What do you do when a perfect stranger tells you he has a coffin which might interest you? My first instinct was to tell a young man that I wasn't in the market for coffins. But he quickly explained that he wasn't a salesman, but an avid listener to our series, and that he had a macabre story of a strange coffin that had been in his family for generations. I was intrigued. So the next night, I found myself in his old suburban house, drinking coffee with his wife, Cora, and his friend, Professor Gerald Barker, and looking at a large wooden box, which appeared to me to be a case for a bass fiddle. This box, although you may not believe it, Mr. Marshall, is a coffin. And this letter, which my wife, Cora, found in the attic, explains how it came in our family and also how it happens that I'm not today a mortician. It was written by my great-grandfather, whose name was also William Spindles. And the letter begins... <clears throat> I, William Spindles, swear this to be a true and honest account of the strange happenings that befell me when I was employed 
by Edward Rogers, The Undertaker, in the year 1851. The month was December, and Mr. Rogers and his good wife, paying pre-Christmas visits, had left me in charge of the shop. It was a cold night and blowing hard, but my good friend Richard Clay and I were snug enough with a big fire going in the stove. Only for you, William Spindles, would I spend a stormy night like this sitting in an undertaker's parlor. Ah, come on now, Dick. You've kept me company often enough to know that there's no harm in corpses. Well, it's not the corpses that worry me. It's it's their spirits that may be around. There's no such thing as spirits, Mr. Rogers says, that there's no harm in the dead. The harm is in people's minds. Oh, maybe, maybe. What's that? Someone's at the door. Come in. Oh, I don't like this. I'll see who it is. Come in, sir. Come in. You'll catch your death of cold standing out there. I'm sorry to disturb you on a night like this, but my need is urgent. I require a coffin. Yes, sir. Did you have a particular type in mind? Very or... particular. I know exactly what I need. Well, we have a complete stock in the next room. Now, if you'll follow me... No I... need. You won't have it in stock. We carry the most complete line in the state. That's why I have come here. Well, thank you. Now, if you'll tell me who the coffin is for, I'll be able to help you better. For me. For, for you? You mean it's for your own your own personal use? Exactly. Uh, I can see you're going to be busy, Bill, so I'll run along. Oh, no, 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 no need to leave, Dick. This gentleman will have to come back tomorrow and see Mr. Rogers, so I... I cannot return. Well, Mr. Rogers, the proprietor, and I honestly believe you'll be better served if you wait for him. I can draw you the way the coffin must be. Here. Here's $50. Will that cover it? But I... Uh, goodbye, Bill. I really must leave. Amy's expecting me. Is the $50 enough? It's not the money I was thinking of. It's the special requirements you mentioned. I'm not sure I can handle them. I said I'd draw it. Do you have paper? I guess so. I... Here's a pencil. I have my own. Now... The shape must be exactly like this. Just so. But that doesn't look like a coffin at all. It's it's more like the case for a musical instrument. I know my needs. Oh, never in my life have I seen or heard of a coffin such as you ask for. It but... must be exactly the way I've drawn it. Very well. Now, it must also have lids and hinges. Hinges? Right. Hinges. You see them here on the drawing. Yes, but you... And a lock on the inside. The... The inside? And a good quality lock. Secure. Nothing shoddy, you understand? I believe I do. Good. Now, if you have a tape measure, I want you to measure me around. But... But why? I mean, the drawing is... It's unusual. It's very clear. I want to make sure that you leave enough room for my arms. I really don't know how I'm going to explain this to Mr. Rogers. Show him the drawing. Now, take my measurements. Yes, sir. Uh, all right, now leave enough room for y your arms. Now, make sure that this is ready by Friday. But that's the day after tomorrow. I must have it. I'm sorry to be so particular, but I've been buried before. And this time, I want to have it my own way. What are you talking about? Dick told me about that strange man who came here. Dick was really scared. He said the man wanted to order his own coffin. That's right, but I'm sure it was some kind of practical joke. Well, I don't care what it was. I want you to find another job. I hate the idea of your being an undertaker. Lucy, we've been through this before, and this job is no different than any other except in people's minds. I'm sorry, Bill. I'm sorry. I'm just so frightened. All the way over here, I was just worried about you and... And, and scared, but... But I came anyway, and now... I'm... Oh, Bill, I don't think it's going to work. Oh, I'd like to punch Dick Clay right in the nose for frightening you like that. Oh, I... Don't blame Dick. It's not his fault. If he hadn't scared you, you wouldn't have... Yes, I would. Maybe I wouldn't have come here tonight, but... I hate what you're doing. I hate it. I know, honey. What do you want me to do? Quit. And do what? Oh, I don't care. What will we live on? Well, you'll find another job. Nowhere near as much money. I don't care about the money. Bill, can't you understand? 
I don't want hands touching me that have been touching death all day. <sighs> all right, Lucy. Uh, I'll speak to Mr. Rogers about leaving. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Now, what's all this about some excitement you had here last night? Oh, good morning, Mr. Rogers. I guess Dick Clay has been busy gossiping again. Well, I don't know whether it came from Dick or not. But I heard it from the barber, some ridiculous claptrap about a walking cadaver ordering its own coffin. Well, sir, what happened was unusual. How so? Take a look at this. Hmm? This is a drawing made by the gentleman who ordered this coffin. Hmm. Remarkable. It looks something like a carrying case for a the, the bass fiddle. Yes, sir, it looks that way to me also. It must be ready tomorrow evening. You're worried about something, aren't you, Bill? Yes, sir. Something to do with this special order? I suppose so, in a way. Mr. Rogers, I'm sorry to tell you that I'm going to have to leave here. What? You mean because of last night? Only partially. It's really because of Lucy. Oh, I suppose she's upset about the idea of marrying a mortician. Hmm? Uh, more than upset. She's... Well, she practically gave me a choice. Either this job or her. I wouldn't worry about that if I were you, Bill. Now, you're not me and you're not engaged to Lucy. I'm sorry, Bill. It's just that I've been there before. I had the same problem with Mrs. Rogers before we got married. Well, what did you do? Before I answer that, how do you feel about the business? I mean, would you stay on if Lucy would marry you? I think so. Bill, you know I have no son. No one to carry on. I've never said it, but I think you know how I feel about you and what hopes I have that you might be the one to carry on. Until today, I thought you felt the same way. I don't think I can change Lucy's mind. Of course you can't. But you just said that... You can't, but Mrs. Rogers can. Now, ask Lucy to talk with her, woman to woman. That's your best bet. My wife knows all the problems and she has all the answers. I never thought of that. All the same, I... I wish you'd been here last night. It was... Well, the only word I can use to describe what happened is weird. Because he ordered a coffin for himself? That, plus the way he came in and... And then the strange shape he insisted on. But most of all, because he appeared to be driven. Al almost as if he were compelled to do what he was doing. What he felt or didn't feel isn't important, Bill. What matters is whether you've changed the way you think about death. I don't follow you. You have to see dying for what it is, Bill. Life's ultimate destination. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's just an inescapable fact. In the course of my life, I've met a lot of people. And I'm good at judging them. And up until now, I've thought of you as a no-nonsense, feet-on-the-ground, level-headed young man. But, sir, you didn't see this man. You, you didn't hear the terrible desperation he had I've in his voice. I've seen and heard almost everything since I started some 18 years ago. This poor fellow who ordered his coffin from you last night was obviously deranged. No question about it. Deranged. I hope you're right, sir. Of course I'm right. What other conclusion can there be? The one I can't get out of my head. He told me he'd been buried once before. And this time, he means to have it his own way. Oh, very good. Very good indeed. You find that amusing? Now I understand everything. That coffin he ordered is nothing but a big fiddle case. Uh, a double bass box. And he must be a musician. They're the very devil for playing practical jokes. Don't you see? This is nothing but a practical joke. A joke on whom, sir? How should I know? Some fellow musician. No, I'm sorry, sir. I just can't believe that. Why not? Why wouldn't he have told me so? Why would he try to scare the daylights out of me and then pay fifty dollars? Fifty whole dollars, besides. Ah, well. I expect we'll have the answer to that tomorrow evening when he comes to get his coffin. That is, if he comes at all. Oh, he'll be here. I'm sure of that. I just pray that we won't be sorry when he comes. <laughs> When the reading stopped, I looked at the faces in that sane and sensible 20th century living room. Spindle's wife, Cora, was wide-eyed. Professor Barker's lips were pursed and his eyes were skeptical. My eyes were drawn automatically to the subject of the letter. The large, strangely shaped coffin that stood in the corner of the living room 
and I could understand the fear that had gripped that 19th century William Spindles. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. I suppose to the three inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, one could add the right of a man to order his own handmade coffin. Most of us, I believe, would find the thought distasteful, but the feeling that prevailed among us in the living room of William Spindles was one of curiosity. We were all anxious for him to continue reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather. I must confess that my work suffered during that day. My thoughts were not on what I was doing, but on what the evening would bring and what Mr. Rogers would make of the stranger when he came to call for his coffin. The day passed somehow. Bill, when did this customer of yours say he'd be back? Early in the evening. Matt, we'll give him another half hour and then we'll lock up. Uh, That won't help if he wants to pick it up. What does that mean, young man? Someone tampered with the coffin, and we don't know who... We only have Sam's word that the coffin was tampered with. But he's our best workman. Well, like everyone else around here, I'm sure he's been infected with the idea that there's something strange about this order for a coffin in the shape of a bass fiddle. At last, he's arrived. Those wraps didn't come from the door. Nonsense. Of course they did. It's cold out there. He wants to come in. I'll prove it to you. I'll open the door. No need. He's letting himself in. Sir? Sir? Sir, there... There's no one at the door. Get hold of yourself, Bill. Must have been a draft that blew the door open. I'll close it myself. Good evening, Uh, Mr. Rogers. Is my order ready? Well, good evening, sir. Come in, come in. The box you ordered is ready. Thank you. My dear sir, you really should wear a greatcoat and a muffler in this bitter weather. You catch cold. Where's my coffin? Ah, that's it, in the corner. Mm Mm-hmm. Satisfactory? Very satisfactory. Is there a good secure lock on the inside? You may open the lid and see for yourself. That way you can also test the hinges. Hmm. The make of the lock is unknown to me. Is it a good one? We never have had a single complaint about any of our coffins. So I'd heard. Now then, where would you like it sent? I'll take it with me. My dear sir... It's much too heavy for one man to carry. I'll manage. Perhaps you have a horse and cart outside. We can help you get it on. That won't be necessary. May I have your name? My name is of no importance. Sir, I'm a reputable undertaker. I must keep my records in order. Any name you choose will do. Come now, sir. I see through your little joke, and I don't disapprove, but you must... Joke? Mr. Rogers... If there's any joke being played here, it's on me. So, I'll take my coffin and be on my way. But, sir, you can't just walk out of here with a... Thanks to you for your efforts, and I wish you gentlemen good night's sleep. Sir, come back. Let him go. For the love of heaven, let him go, Mr. Rogers. He, He lifted that box as if it were as light as a feather. Get your coat. What for? To follow him, Bill. Couldn't you see the man is ill? We're the ones who are going to be ill if we follow him. Stop babbling and get into your coat. All right, I'll, all right, I'll go with you. I don't want you following that that spirit alone, but I tell you, he's not mortal. He is, he is, and he's sick, mentally ill. Hurry! How far do we follow him? As far as he goes. No, sir, I... I won't, because I believe his destination is hell. There he goes. Around the corner. Down Green Tree Lane. Oh, yeah, I see him. Where can he be heading? There are no houses after a block of Green Tree Lane. But there's the cemetery. Didn't I tell you he was deranged? The cemetery gate's locked. The locks never bothered spirits. Then he's no spirit. Didn't he ask for a lock on the coffin? Oh, let him go, Mr. Rogers, please. Hurry up, hurry up before we lose him. Mr. Rogers, if we do catch up to him, what in heaven's name do you want of him? Find out who he is where he lives, and get him safely home. Then I shall call a doctor to attend him. There he goes, heading directly for the cemetery gate. Confound it. What's happened to the moon? Uh, A cloud just passed in front of it. No matter. Even if we can't see him, we shall catch up when he finds the gate locked. (laughs) 
Here comes the moonlight, and here's the gate. Where did he go? Uh, he must have gone in. <coughs> Gate's locked. Uh, well, I have my key. You, you don't intend to go in, do you? Of course. Come on, come on. Uh, no, sir. There. There. Isn't that our man? Moving among the trees over there near the Addison Mausoleum? Mr. Rogers, I've had enough of this. I'm going home. And allow that poor soul to do himself some kind of mischief? Sir, that poor soul, as you call him, is a person I... I want nothing to do with. I don't know whether he's man, ghost, or devil, but whatever he is, and whatever his business is in the cemetery, I want no part of it. Bill, when a man's dead, he's dead. I've never seen a man or woman come to life again. I'm a God-fearing man, and I go by the Bible. Doesn't the good book say dust to dust? The Bible says a lot of things, but I remember no mention of men who can lift a heavy coffin as if it were a pillow and pass through locked gates without leaving a sound to say nothing of a man... Ordering his own coffin. Very well. Very well, Bill. You can stay or leave. I'm going after him. I beg of you. Close the gate. I beg of you, Mr. Rogers, leave this be and come home with me. Close the gate and make sure it's locked. At this point, Bill Spindle stopped reading and put down the letter. My reaction was shared by his wife, Cora, who almost screamed at him. Don't tell me the letter stops there, and we're not going to find out what happened. The, the reason I stopped is because the story my great-grandfather was telling up to now was his. But it now changes. At this point, he is writing not what he saw, but what he heard, as he puts it in the letter. Perhaps I was a coward, but I allowed Mr. Rogers to go on into the graveyard alone while I hurried home. So I warn the reader of this letter. This portion of my tale is written here as it was told to me by Mr. Rogers. The moon again had gone behind the clouds when young Spindles went hurrying off. But I thought I saw some light in or around the big Addison tomb. I started that way, and then I heard what seemed to be the voice of the man I was following. But it seemed to come from far off. Too far. You have come too far on a useless journey, Edward Rogers. Turn back before it's too late. Where are you, sir? Listen to me. Thrice they tried and thrice they died. Where are you? What are you doing with your coffin? Leave here, Edward Rogers. Your business with the dead is finished. You don't belong here. And what do you do here? I keep an age-old bargain. With whom? You must leave here. This place is dangerous for you. But not for you? Leave before it's too late. The Lord will protect me. Now let me help you. <laughs> don't you understand? You're ill. You need help. So be it, Edward Rogers. You want to join in a dance of death. The consequences will be on your head. Here. I show myself to you. Here I am. See if you can catch me. It was then that I started after him. I could see him almost clearly. He seemed to be heading for the Addison tomb. He was carrying the coffin, and I was certain I could overtake him. But he kept dodging behind headstones. I turned and twisted after him. And then my foot caught. I lost my balance and fell, hitting my head against the tombstone. Dick, wake up. Wake uh, up, man. Well, how uh, Bill? Bill, what do you want? Get dressed. You've got to come to the cemetery with me. What? The cemetery? Are you out of your mind? Mr. Rogers went in there after the man who ordered the coffin. He isn't home yet, and Mrs. Rogers is worried. Then take her. Come on, Dick. I'll be with you. I wouldn't care if the whole town was with us. What time is it? Four o'clock. It will soon be light. Please, Dick, you must. All right, all right. I'll get dressed, and I'll go with you, but we'll wait for the dawn. But Mr. Rogers may be in trouble. Bill, whatever has happened has happened. I'll go with you, but not until it's light. <laughs> Oh, my head. It hurts. Where... Where am I? Where you do not belong. Oh. It's you. Where's your coffin? Where it belongs. Good, good. Come, come. I'll take you home. You need more help than I do. I'll be all right. I was fortunate. It was just a glancing blow. I'll take you to the gate. See that you get there safely. You've changed. Why are you now worried about me? I admire your courage. You were concerned about me. Now I return the favor. No, no, no. You tried to frighten me before. For your own good. You're still in danger. From whom? From the damned. Sir, 
I don't know who you are or where you're from, but I'll swear you're of this world. There are no such things as ghosts. I know that's what you believe. I wish with all my heart that you were right. What's that music? Do you hear it? I do. What is it? It doesn't belong here in a graveyard. You're wrong. It's the only place it can be heard. And not by everyone. Come. Come, the gate is this way. No, no, I am not leaving until I get to the bottom of this. I warn you, your persistence will be your destruction. I still put my trust in the Lord. Where's that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it Judgment Day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise. The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. And quiet? And quiet. Oh, foolish man. I will not be able to protect you much longer. Go home now, while you can. I will, if you'll first allow me to take you to your home. Can't you understand? My home is here. Tommy Rot. I must go. I have work to do. You've been warned. My conscience is clear. As I turned my head to see where he went, I felt dizzy. The blow had evidently been more serious than I thought. When my head cleared, I could still hear the music. And I thought I saw a light. I walked toward the light. It seemed to come from the Addison tomb. As I approached, I could see that the door to the mausoleum was open. I was convinced that inside was the source of the music. It grew louder with every step I took. And then I found myself at the door to the tomb. And there, just inside, I saw the large coffin the stranger had ordered. The lid was wide open. But the moment I took one step inside, the lid slammed shut and the music stopped. I thought the coffin had been empty, but I couldn't be sure. I walked over to it and bent down and listened. I heard the key turn in the lock, and I called out, You mustn't lock yourself in. You mustn't. Please open the coffin. He wouldn't listen, so I determined to get the coffin open. When suddenly, there was a flash of light and a loud explosion. Bill, I can't see anyone in there. Mr. Rogers must have gone home. We can't see the whole cemetery from outside. We'll have to go in. The gate's locked. I have a key. Oh, look, do we really have to go on? It's practically daylight. There's nothing to be afraid of. Well, I hear you, but I'm still shivering. Yeah, it's the cold. Come on. Hey, you seem to know where you're going. Oh, I shouldn't have left him. If any harm has befallen him, I'll never forgive myself. Well, he shouldn't have been here at all. The last I saw of Mr. Rogers, he was heading for the Addison tomb. I have a feeling that if we find him at all, that's where he'll be. There's the tomb now. Oh, the door's open. Should it be? Uh, we'll find out. Wait. Wait. Suppose suppose there's something in that tomb that waited for Mr. Rogers, and now it's waiting for us. If you don't want to come in, you can wait here, but I'm going into that tomb. All right. All right. I'll come with you. Good Lord. There he is, lying across that coffin. And, and so still. Is he... Is he dead? I don't know. But there's only one way to find out. I can offer no explanation. But I can tell you that the words of a letter written more than 100 years ago had cast a spell over all of us. A spell that had transported us back to a small 19th century graveyard. I'll be back in a moment with the strange end to this strange tale. Like many time-worn sayings, the old adage, curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back, still contains more than a few grains of truth. Certainly all of us sitting in the William Spindle's living room that night were anxiously waiting for him to resume reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather, but he further whetted our curiosity by prefacing his reading with this explanation. I think it's important to tell you that this next portion of the letter is an eyewitness account not what was told to my ancestor, but what he experienced himself. So, uh, if you're all ready, I'll continue. After Mr. Rogers told me what had happened to him that night in the cemetery, 
I was still undecided about leaving the undertaking business, although my dear Lucy was at me every day to give my notice. And then, one morning, Mr. Rogers called me to his office. Sit down, Bill. I think we should have a talk. Yes, Mr. Rogers. My wife tells me that Lucy hasn't been to see her. Have you spoken again to Lucy about discussing your future here with Emily? No, sir. You still believe that our strange customer was a ghost? Let's say I'm still undecided. What's that? Probably someone who wants to see me. Come in. Should I get the door? Don't bother. I'll go. Good morning, gentlemen. It's you. It is indeed I. And I'm not sure how long I'll be permitted to stay. Long enough, I hope, to give me an explanation of your actions the other night. That is why I'm here. Good. Perhaps you'll start by telling me... I come here, sir, at great personal risk. I ask you to believe me. I beg you to listen and keep an open mind. I believe I'm a fair man. Since you're a native of this town, you must know of the Addison family. Of course. Old Thaddeus Addison owned the leather and dye plant. He did. And do you remember a young man named Tom Addison, one of Thaddeus's three sons? Mm, I never knew the young rascal. Everyone heard about him, of course. He was a ne'er-do-well who finally ran away. That's what my father wanted everyone to believe. Hold on. Are you trying to tell me you're Tom Addison? My father wanted me to go into the factory. I couldn't abide the thought. In all modesty, I had a great talent for music, particularly the bass. A talent which my father felt was foolishness. All of our quarrels came because I wanted to practice my music... And my father thought it was a waste of time and money. Then you are young, Addison. I am. And I am not. Not in the sense that you mean. I suppose you can explain that. The situation between my father and me became unbearable. He finally gave me an ultimatum. Either I go into the business, abandon my music, or he'd turn me out of the house. I really had no choice. I left. Mm -hmm. And what brought you back? The very same thing that took me away. Music. When my father disowned me, I wandered around the country trying to earn my living as a musician. It wasn't easy. One day, I found someone who valued my musicianship. I made a bargain with him. Who was he? He goes by many names. Take your choice. Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, or the Prince of Darkness. Rubbish. You believe in the Lord. Why do you find it so difficult to believe in the devil? I'm a God-fearing man. The devil has no power over me. Not unless you invade his realm, as you did the other night. All I did the other night was my duty, as an undertaker and as a man. How can I make you see the horrors that lie ahead of you if you will not listen? What will change your foolish obstinacy so that you can save yourself? Are you so insensible that if I tell you what I have suffered and am suffering... You'll still close your mind to what I say? I promise to listen, and I will. Ten years ago, I was in Chicago, living in a cold and miserable garret, hungry, alone, and with no hope of employment. In order to get something to eat, I knew I'd have to pawn my fiddle. Just before venturing out, I wanted to play it one last time, when suddenly, I thought I'd lost my mind because... Not only was I hearing my own instrument, but it was joined. Joined by a full symphony. And he was there. Satan? And he offered me the fulfillment of a dream. I would never have to worry about money again. And I could concentrate on my music. It dazzled me. The prospect of a life I'd always hoped for. And what did he ask in return? Your soul? Nothing so dramatic. What seemed a simple, harmless request. All he asked is that I play for him whenever and wherever he should ask. I hesitated, but only for a moment. How I wish I had thought longer on it, but I didn't. I agreed. And now I'm his forever. A member of his Orchestra of the Damned. And the letter closes as follows. That was the day I left the undertaking establishment of Edward Rogers. I have no way of knowing whether Mr. Rogers believed the story told by the man who claimed to be Tom Addison. I never saw nor heard from the stranger again. Nor do I know whether Mr. Rogers did. Signed, 
William Spindles. Now, what do you make of that? I'll take the ladies first. Cora, as my wife, what do you think? (laughs) There's one thing I know, darling. I'm glad you're not an undertaker, because if you were, I wouldn't be your wife. Ah, you feel the same way as my ancestors, girl. Lucy. Emphatically. Jerry, you're the scientist here. Well, history isn't a science, thank heaven, but I do have some questions. First, how did the coffin come into your possession? Well, that's simple. When Mr. Rogers died at the ripe old age of 89, he left a sizable bequest in his will to my great-grandfather with the proviso that we keep the coffin as a memento. But why would he do that? Now, that, Cora, is an excellent question. If he insisted that the coffin remain in your family as part of his bequest, I think he must have had a reason. In other words, you don't believe that the stranger was a ghost. Let's say I'm dead set against the idea of ghosts playing symphonic music in a graveyard at night. Well, I believe he was the ghost of Tom Addison. Well, how do you explain Rogers leaving the coffin to the Spindles family? Simple. Rogers was probably hurt by Bill's refusal to stay in the business, and he wanted the coffin to remind him. Sorry, darling, that won't work. If he was hurt, why also leave my ancestor a bundle? And believe me, it was a considerable sum. Well, then why did he, Bill? Mm, I'm stumped. (laughs) (laughs) It's too much for me. I still don't believe in ghosts, and I think I can prove to you that this man who ordered the coffin was flesh and blood. How? Well, I'm going to have to do a little research. When did you say all these things happened? Uh, The date, I mean. December 1851, why? Well, give me two days, and I'll let you know. Right, I have solved the mystery of our peculiarly shaped coffin. Good. How? I kept asking myself, why did this man go to all the trouble of ordering a coffin, which, to say the least, was strange, and also behave as if he wanted everyone to believe he was a ghost? But if you've forgotten Mr. Rogers' belief that he was crazy, I mean, wouldn't that account for all his behavior? Yes, that would, but I preferred to think of this fellow as a con man. You see? A really great con man who successfully conned your grandfather but had more difficulty with the undertaker. Why? Precisely. Why? Now, that's where this newspaper article comes in. Here. I made a copy at the library. Let me read it to you. The headline, Wells Fargo Payroll Stolen. Ah, then it goes on. Yesterday, the largest robbery in the history of the Wells Fargo Company was successfully perpetrated by three masked men who boarded the westbound Lackawanna Limited, entered the baggage car, and made off with more than $40,000 in $10, $20, and $50 bills. So, it goes into more detail, but there you have it. There you have it. You've lost me. Now, don't you see? The robbers needed a safe place to hide the money. And you think that they decided to use a coffin as a hiding place. Remember... Our man insisted on a strong lock on the inside. That's true, but... That would be one way of making sure that no one opened this peculiar coffin by mistake and found a wad of tens, twenties, and fifties that had been stolen from Wells Fargo. But according to the letter, Mr. Rogers found the coffin in the cemetery. And it was open, and and, and there was nothing in there. That's right, that's right. Rogers followed the stranger right from the funeral parlor to the cemetery. He wouldn't have had time to stash the loot in there. Uh, I think it's interesting, but rather far-fetched. Is it? Look how everything fits. All that uproar in the cemetery. All the warnings to Rogers telling him to keep away. Why? I'm sorry. You're so convinced your theory is right, you're not thinking straight. Once your man knows Rogers was going to interfere, he'd never have taken the chance of hiding anything there. Well, he may have had no choice. What do you mean? The money may have already been there. Look, have you forgotten that your grandfather's letter said that the workmen believed the coffin had been tampered with? Oh, Jerry, you're riding a hobby horse. You have a theory, and you're just going to see that everything fits. And you're not going to look at anything that doesn't. Now, wait a minute. What have I left out? Well, lots of things. Now, one, how in the world did our stranger lift this coffin and carry it off under his arm? Perhaps he didn't. (laughs) You mean you think Bill's grandfather made that part up? Well, let's leave that. Uh, Anything else? Well, lots. What about everything that happened to Mr. Rogers in the cemetery? The music, the open coffin. What's your explanation for that? Well, we know that Rogers fell down and hit his head. Oh, come off it, Jay. You're not going to try and tell us that he imagined those things as a result of hitting his head. Well, it's it's possible. Maybe, but... I don't believe it. The other explanation, which you refuse even to think about, Jerry, is that he was a ghost and that Mr. Rogers reported everything faithfully. 
That's the one I believe. Even if I prove to you that this strange-looking coffin has plenty of room for some kind of secret compartment and there may be money in it? Why don't we stop talking and see if you can prove what you think? All right, good idea. Come on. How do we go about finding a secret compartment? Well, we'll try tapping and listen for a hollow sound. Okay. Who wants to do the tapping? Me, let me. All right, go right ahead. Ah, it all sounds the same. You're too impatient. If there's a secret compartment, he'd make it hard to find. Right. Ah, dear. <laughs> it's a great theory, Jer. I'm afraid it's just a theory. Why don't you try down at the bottom where it's widest? Okay. There. <gasps> right there. Does that sound different? I think so. Go back there again, Cora. That's it. Uh, let's turn it upside down. Here. You have to let us do that, Cora. <sighs> That's got it now. Huh, now what? Well, I think we should have opened the lid first. Okay, let's open it. All right, now, put your hand down in there, Bill. Feel around carefully. I mean, um, around the joint in the wood. Yes. Do you feel anything? Nothing. I, I can't. <gasps> you ah. got it. You got it. Ah, Jerry was right. It's yes. a secret compartment. Well, is there anything in there? This. Money? A twenty-dollar bill? Well, there must be more. No, the, just the one bill. But wait, wait. Here's a note. <gasps> well, what does it say? Oh, wait a second. It's hard to read. Dear Bill, or descendants of William Spindles, you having found this secret hiding place should know by now that I was right when I insisted that there were no such things as ghosts. I was also right when I told you, Bill, that there was a fortune to be made in the undertaking business, as is proven by my bequest. God bless you and your family. Signed, Edward Rogers. What do you do when you discover that the fortune you expected turns out to be a single $20 bill? Well... If you're William Spindles, you advance the idea that Edward Rogers had indeed found the Wells Fargo loot in the coffin and taken all of it except the one bill. Is there another explanation? I think so. And I'll be back with it in just a moment. For what it is worth... I present you with this thought. There never was any Wells Fargo money in the coffin to begin with. Edward Rogers had obviously been a man of strong beliefs, and he took this way of proving to Bill Spindles or his children that there are no such things as ghosts and that there was money to be made in the undertaking business. Did the Spindles accept my explanation? I really don't know. How about you? Our cast included Keir DeLay, Marion Seldes, William Redfield, Peter Collins, and Nat Pullen. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. WCCO Radio, Las Vegas, for three days and three nights. G. Marshall. Welcome this time to a supernatural evil too monstrous to contemplate, and a spirit that hovers over all, the satyr. In the dictionary definition, a woodland deity represented as part human, part goat, 
noted for riotousness and lasciviousness. Not so terrifying in concept today, perhaps, but before the turn of the century, the Victorian era... No, Alfie, no. I'm in my own park. It mustn't be night off, so I've got to sneak in safe and sound without the mistress knowing. <laughs> See you Thursday night. Right, this rain, and keep your hands <laughs> yes. I'm still a decent girl, and that's what I'll stay till I'm married. Now, off you go. <laughs> Good night, Millie. Good night. <laughs> You'd waste <gasps> a lover's moon for convention's sake? Who's that? <gasps> you look like... Oh, you can't be... Oh, sweet Mary, protect me. Not against me. There is no protection against me. <laughs> mystery drama, The Death Wish, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Anne Petoniak and Court Benson. Another definition, just for the record, another dictionary, satiriasis, an abnormal sexual desire in men. But our story begins long before the terror of unbridled evil descended on the quiet, well-ordered life of the Haven. The great house was built by a long-deceased ancestor in the early 18th century. And at the time all this begins has changed little in a century and a half. Until a stone cast into its quiet waters from the outside sends ripples of excitement and speculation washing over the Cutler family. Belinda, come away from the window. But, Mother, I want to see him drive up in the carriage with Father. Don't press your nose against the glass. It only means extra work for the servants. Besides, they're not due for at least 15 minutes, even if the train was on time. I don't see why we have to saddle ourselves with someone extra in the house, particularly a man. That's just sour grapes, Barbara. Belinda, come away from the window. Oh, all right. But won't you please call me Linda? You were christened Belinda. I know. Grandmother was Bella. You're Beatrice. My brother is Bruce. My sister is Barbara. And I'm Belinda. Why do we all have to be bees? Because your grandfather's name was Brian and your father's name is Blake. It's all in the family. Papa's name was only accidental. The rest was all planned. Oh, what's in a name, as I've so recently found out? I'd rather you didn't bring up that subject in front of your young sister. Linda's nearly 18. For heaven's sakes, Mother. It isn't as though divorce was a dirty word or something. Don't delude yourself. In our society, Linda, it's a blot. Disgraceful. Right, Mother? I prefer not to discuss so intimate a subject openly. And your sister's name is Belinda. Oh, for God's sake, the old witch isn't alive anymore. Grandmother's done us all the harm she can. The hell with her. Oh, I don't like swearing either. And I don't like being without a man and being stuck at home again like a naughty child. I'm afraid we're all going to have to make some adjustments. God, I wish Bruce was here. I hope he knows how lucky he is to be able to get out from under the blanket and away to his internship. Mama... She doesn't mean anything. She's just so miserable. I know. I should be more forbearing. <laughs> who is this bird who's going to help feather our cushy nest, anyway? His name is Anton Gitano. Oh, it sounds so foreign and terribly romantic. Well, not really, child. As I understand it, his father was your father's Batman during the Crimea. Batman? The army's name for a valet, dear. We can't have our officers fighting wars without their boots shined. I shouldn't be so sarcastic, Barbara. If it hadn't been for Anton's father, you wouldn't be here. Or your brother, or your sister. He saved Blake's life at Gallipoli, and very nearly lost his own. He is, or, or, or was, just as English as we. Gitano? Isn't that Spanish? Well, Blake told me that's a gypsy name. But, of course, his family had lived here for generations. I never met him, but he had the most beautiful wife. I, I remember being quite jealous of... Excuse me, Mama, but they're here. 
I can hear the carriage. I can see it. It just came round by the poplars. Oh, he's the most beautiful thing you ever saw, Mama. Like a... Like a fawn. A fawn? Well, I don't mean he's half man, half... You know. He certainly is all man, I'll grant you. That aquiline face. That's what I meant. Like an ancient Roman. Or a Greek god. All right. That's quite enough nonsense from you both. Now, put yourself together. And for heaven's sakes, compose yourself and greet our guests like ladies. Just be kind and gentle women. After all, the boy's father's been dead for many years now, and he has just lost his mother. How long has he expected to stay? Only till he gets settled down here and finds some employment, I hope. I really don't know. Your father was so strange about him. What do you mean, Mama? Well, it's so unlike Blake, but I really couldn't pin him down. I'm not even quite sure if he's a guest or if your father means to give him some work about the grounds or something. Beatrice, I have our guest with me. Come in, Blake, dear. We heard you drive up, and we can't wait to meet him. Hello, my dear. Barbara, Belinda... Ladies, may I present the son of the man who made you all possible in my life, Mr. Anton Gitano. I'm charmed. Uh, my wife, Beatrice. How do you do? Your servant, madam. My older daughter, Barbara. A pleasure, Miss Cutler. Mrs. Trenholm, actually. Ex, since I'm no longer married. My condolences about your husband. Oh, he didn't die. I divorced him. The more fool he for deserving such a fate. And the world is a better place. Uh, yes. <clears throat> and my youngest, Belinda. Charmed. I hope I can be sure that you're still unattached and fancy free. Uh, Belinda isn't even 18 yet. <laughs> Anyone so beautiful would have to be. Although she seems so much more mature. You're very continental. You know just the right things to say. Do I? Then I am pleased. Because to tell you the truth, I'm shaking in my boots. You find her so formidable. Perhaps my butterflies come from being among such a bevy of delightful female companionship. Or that I feel dusty and travel-stained. Would you ladies excuse me if I change and freshen up? Of course, Anton. May I call you that? I wish you would. Very well, then, Anton. We're the ones at fault. We should have given you at least a moment to yourself before plunging you into the family circle. Blake. Shall I ring for Jarrett, or will you see Anton to his room? Uh, Jarrett's seeing to the unloading of his baggage right now. I'll show him. Where have you put him? Well, I thought with Bruce away and so many clucking hens on the second floor, he'd be happier with the third floor almost to himself. The maroon and gold room? I'll be happy whatever room you put me in. Wherever it is, I'm really in imposition. Oh, we don't feel that way at all. Please. I can only hope to repay you for your welcome. I'll see you up, Anton. Uh, Beatrice, ring down and tell Jarrett where to send his luggage. With your permission, ladies, I shall see you at dinner. And I hope to be a bit more presentable than now. Yes, I'd, I'd like to have a word with you, Beatrice, as soon as I see Anton settled. Of course, dear. In the library? Yes, dear. Oh, oh Mother, looks like you're in disfavor. Oh, did I know the young man would be as charming and educated as he turned out to be? What difference does that make? Oh, my dear innocent. Banished to the third floor, practically with the help. I'm afraid Father thinks Mother made a slight social gaffe. The help are on the fourth floor. And besides, I didn't, and I don't, think it appropriate for a single young man to be roaming a floor where two young single females... Oh, really, are... Mother? What do you expect him to be? Peeping Tom or Ralph the Raper? Barbara. I agree with Mother. You're really terrible. He's so polite. And so... So handsome. But I'll make a confession. I think Mother's instincts are right about this young man. For all his charm, I wouldn't trust him on the same corner with me, let alone around me. I never heard anything so unreasonable in all my life. I quite agree with you, Belinda. But you must remember your sister has been terribly hurt. I'm afraid for a while anything in trousers will look to her as though he had horns growing out of his head, hoofs instead of feet, and a long forked tail. Oh, thank goodness for you, Mama. You keep us all on an even keel. 
I don't know what we'd do without you. <laughs> well, you're going to have to do without me right now, Belinda. I have to go and face your father. Well, I don't see why he couldn't have been in the room next to Bruce's. Well, there's only one bathroom on the floor, dearest. And with both the girls home, I thought there might be some embarrassment about... Uh, well, you know, they're not used to a stranger around. And they're not... Then what? Well, I- I'm not quite sure of so many things, Blake. How long will he be here? Just what his position is exactly. Well, what does that mean? Well, is he a guest? Or do you expect to employ him? Well, I, I'm dashed if I know myself, B. It's all been so sudden and unexpected. The past rearing its head up like this. Well, you do owe the boy a great deal after all. What's that? Well, his father did save your life, didn't he? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, at Gallipoli. Carried me out of the water after I was wounded. I'd have drowned otherwise. I'm so sorry I never met the father to thank him. I do remember his lovely gypsy wife with her great, haunting dark eyes. Was he her only child? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I suppose she, uh, they went back to Spain so shortly after that. Uh-huh. How did her husband die? Well, apparently he just disappeared. I, I haven't got all the facts. Carla, Mrs. Gitano's letter was quite brief. Uh, <clears throat> he, he seems a fine boy. Mm, and very well-mannered. It's going to be a pleasure to put him up till he decides what he wants to do with himself, I'm sure. I'm sorry, I didn't mean any harm. Millie, isn't it? Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Egitano? It isn't difficult. Gitano. Uh, it means gypsy in Spanish. Oh, I knew when I saw you. I should have let the butler bring your things up. Why? You afraid of a little fun, Millie? <laughs> Not exactly, but I have my own steady, Alfred. And I'm a decent girl. Do you know, Millie? They're the very best sort. Uh, I have one of the men bring up the rest of your things. <laughs> a wonderful dinner, Mrs. Cutler. Thank you, Anton. Uh, I think you will understand. I'm exhausted from the journey. Would you excuse me if I just asked to go to bed? Not at all. As my mother was saying to me just before you arrived, nuestra casa es su casa. And I'm glad to be so welcome. I shall try to take advantage of it. But tonight I... Well, you get I... on to bed, youngster, like the rest of us. We can all use a good night's sleep. Well, B, have you tucked in your little chicks for the night? Long ago. Barbara and Belinda have been asleep for well over an hour. It's almost midnight. <sighs> well, it's high time for all law-abiding people to be abed. Come on, join me before I fall asleep. I'm sorry you're tucked away already. <laughs> it's such a beautiful night. A big, round, full moon. A lover's night. I came to get a sweater. I'm going to take a little stroll in the garden. Well, I'll get up and get dressed. Oh, no, darling, you're tired. I won't be long. Just a little turn as far as the court garden. Mm. That, that's good night. Because I know you'll be asleep like the rest of the house by the time I get back. Now, <laughs> Alfie, I'm still a decent girl, and that's what I'll stay till I'm married. Now, off you go, Alfie. <laughs> good night, Millie. Good night. <laughs> You'd waste a lover's moon just for convention's sake? Oh, no, Millie. Who's, who's that? Oh, 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 sweet Mary, protect me. Not against me. There is no protection against me. Ah! Anton? Mrs. Cutler, what are you doing here? I was just taking a stroll before... you done? Oh, my Lord. What kind of a man are you? Mm. 
what indeed has Anton done? And as our story progresses, more and more that question will be asked. What kind of man are you? Not alone by the people in our story, but by you who listen to the strange history that unfolds. I'll return shortly with Act Two. It is no moment for the squeamish, this midnight encounter in the court garden of the great manor named the Haven. The garden itself is surrounded by an eight-foot-high brick wall. The only entrance, the wrought iron gate at which Mrs. Cutler has stopped. The garden itself is evergreen, its paths moss and lichen-covered. By the light of day, it is quaint and inviting. By moonlight, it is macabre and forbidding. A fitting setting for the girl stretched limp on the ground. And the figure hunched over it. Anton, is this you? Unmasked, Mrs. Cutler. I'm afraid so. And... and Millie? She's dead. Dead? How? I suggest we go somewhere to talk in private. But Millie, I, I must see to her. She may not be... You may take my word for it that she is dead. It was an accident because she wasn't intelligent enough to listen to me. But you are going to be, aren't you? I, I don't know what you mean, Anton. Or, or whoever you are. I'm afraid you do, Mrs. Cutler. I mean, when the police come tomorrow, you're going to forget everything you saw, or thought you saw. After we have our little talk, that is. Otherwise, someone else, much nearer and dearer to you than Millie, will suddenly and unaccountably be just as dead as Millie. Oh, what are you? My mother's son. She was the gypsy. But your father... <laughs> what father? I never had a father. Just my mother and me. Well, then how did Blake... I mean, why did he take you in? My mother left me a rather special gift. Shall I show it to you? Oh, I, I, I don't want to see. I don't want to know anymore. I just want to go... You away. must! Oh, you're hurting me! You'll forget physical pain in a moment. Wait. Ah, there. The moon is out again. Let's see. Yes, he'll do. You see the owl sitting there in the tree? No, no, there. Straight ahead of you. Yes, I see him. Then watch. Owl perched high above my head. Hear you this. I wish you dead. Any living creature, any time I wish. Your husband, your son, your daughters. If you cross me, I wish them the same. That's why you will remain quiet about anything and everything you have seen in this garden. It's Blake, dear. Come in. What time is it? Well, it's nearly ten o'clock, B. Oh, good heavens. Now, how could you let me sleep so late? You seemed absolutely exhausted this morning. I, I couldn't manage to wake you. I know. I had a terrible dream. It must have been a dream. It kept me awake till dawn. What kind of a dream? Oh, it, it doesn't matter. I, I, I don't want to talk about it. Ten o'clock? What are you doing home from business? Well, there's been a... a terrible accident. A what? I'm afraid the police are here, and they wanted to ask you a question or two. Me? Why, why me? What, what sort of accident? Uh, one of the upstairs maids was found by the gardener in the court garden this morning. What do you mean, found? Dead? Yes, I'm afraid so. The cheeky, lively little one, uh, Millie, I think her name is... What did you say, B? I, I said, this is just like a, a bad dream. Poor little Millie. But why on earth would the police want to see me? Well, darling, I, I happened to mention that you took a stroll outside last night about midnight and that you mentioned you were going as far as the court garden. Uh, oh, but, but I, I didn't. It was chillier than I thought, so I turned back. 
What happened? Well, it's all so strange. Apparently, Millie nipped out of the house last night to, uh, well, to meet a boy she knew. Alfred Pinster. He's a local groom at the public stables. And they think he did it. Oh, no, no, he's in the clear. Fortunately for him, the ground in the court garden was damp. There wasn't a trace of his footsteps in there. Only the girls and... Uh, and what else? Well, what killed the poor child? That vicious billy goat of Tam Pierce's. Apparently it got loose last night and chased Millie into the court garden. I suppose she thought she could close the gates and keep him out, but he got in after her and... And what? Well, uh, his hoof marks were all over the place. Oh. Even on... Well, he must literally have trampled it. At oh, how terrible. Yeah. It's a lucky thing for young Alfie, though. Otherwise, it would have looked like a plain case of, uh, well, to be polite, assault. That, too. Well, let me get dressed. I really should talk to the police myself. Well, good morning, Mr. Gypsy. And to you, Mrs. Channel. A victory for accuracy. We both have each other's names correct. You speak Spanish? Not much, but I looked up Gitano. It rang a chord. A pleasant one, I hope. Nothing pleasant about this morning after what happened to poor Millie. I, I've got to get some fresh air. I'm going for a ride. Excuse me. Would you allow me to join you? Suit yourself. But I warn you, in my present mood, I'm somewhat restless. I accept the challenge. Challenge? It was more of that than an invitation, wasn't it? I'll leave you to make up your own mind about that. Come on, if you're going. I love the view from here. There's the haven away down there to the left. It's a very large estate. And so near town. It's a priceless property. I think so, too. But not in terms of money, which is obviously what you meant. Why don't you like me? I never said I didn't. You didn't have to. I can sense it. Maybe it's because I've been through a bad experience with Trevor. Maybe it's because you're just too charming and too beautiful a man to be quite true. And maybe it's because you're much too young. Too young for what? For me. If that's all that's worrying you... Oh, for heaven's sake, don't take me literally. I only... Mm. <gasps> Let me go, please, Anton. Not till I prove to you that I am not a boy. Very well. You are a man. A big, strong man. Not quite yet. Damn it, if you won't let me... Mm. Mm. You must be crazy. For you, yes. But a better word is hungry. Just as you are. Now, really, that's enough. Don't be silly. We both know it's only the beginning. Are you conceited enough to think that you, I... Oh, yes, I am. You see that blueberry bush over there? Yes. Watch it. I wish you dead. Oh, my God. You're very fond of your mayor, aren't you? Shall I wish her the same? No. Or your father. I can do it, you know. Who? Who are you? For the moment, Barbara. Your lover. You might as well have wished me dead. I doubt it. You'll get used to me as a surrogate husband. I'll kill myself if you ever touch me again. You do, and I promise your father will die as I killed that bush. Why us? Your power must be the same anywhere else in the world. Why do you come back to haunt us? Because my mother ordered me to when she... Why do you stop? You mean when she died? If you want to call it that... I mean, when her time had come. I don't understand. I don't understand anything. I still ask you, why us? We do not question the orders of our superiors. Come, let's get back to lunch. I'm ravenous. But you ride with him almost every day, Barbara. Why can't I go with you sometimes? Hush, Linda. Stay away from us. But it isn't fair. You're too old for him anyway. And you're too young for him. You stay away from him. 
You here? Why, you... You're jealous, Barbara. Never mind what I am. Just stay away from him. I understand, Mrs. Cutler. You've been suggesting to your daughter, Barbara, that she's seeing too much of me. Can you blame me? I also understand that you have even gone so far as to try to persuade Mr. Cutler to send her away. I... Please, Anton. Please. Barbara's heart was broken by her divorce. The girl has enough agony to cope with. Don't hurt her anymore. I have no intention to. In fact, my intentions are quite otherwise. But if you want to protect her, remember the power I have and leave us alone. Please, Papa, I'm begging you. Papa, you haven't called me that, Barbara, since you were a little girl. Well, I'm not that anymore. Can't you? Won't you please send him away? I can't. I, I can't do that. And you know, too. He's like a cancer. Spreading and spreading till he infects and destroys us all. And how can we stop it? We're like puppets. All he has to do is pull the strings and we have to dance to his command. We've got to stop him somehow. Or we'll all be as good as dead. Stunned and shocked, Blake Carter stares at a beloved daughter who is emotionally coming to pieces before his very eyes. And yet, in those eyes, can we detect a puzzlement, a bewilderment that suggests he doesn't fully comprehend exactly what she's talking about? We'll find that out when I return shortly with Act Three. It's a lovely English September afternoon. The sun, streaming down from a cloudless sky, throws a dappling of lacy shadows on the bright green lawns as it streams through the trees. From the outside, the great manor seems well-named, the Haven. But inside, something dark and insidious is growing, like a black, invisible mushroom, poisoning the atmosphere the cutlers breathe. Threatening their very lives, one by one. In the library, Barbara and her father remain as we left them, facing each other. Gripped by emotions not yet fully explained. What do you mean, as good as dead? Let's not fence with each other, Papa. Obviously, you know his power and are as helpless as we are. Power? I don't understand you. To kill anything he wants, just by wishing it. Barbara, I really don't understand what you're saying. What do you mean his power to kill anything he wants to? Didn't he show you? Did you just take him at his word? Barbara, come, sit, sit down for a minute. You're shaking all over. What is it, child? Oh, it's, it's just remembering those first terrible, awful moments. Oh, Papa, he scared me. He really scared me almost to death. All right, darling, darling. I, I won't let any, well, anything else hurt you if I possibly can. I couldn't help with Trevor. But I can with Anton, whatever it is. Tell me about it. And because of some trick with a bush, he forced you to... It wasn't any trick. I saw it die with my own eyes. Didn't he give you an example? Of what? Of how all he has to do is wish something dead. And it is. Oh, you're seeing things, dear. Imagining. You've always had too much of it. This wasn't imagination. It's cold, stark, brutal reality. But you didn't believe it when he showed you. You thought it was just some kind of trick. Showed me what, dear? He hasn't showed me anything like that. Then why did you say you... You can't send him away? <sighs> Darling, don't press it. it. It's because I have an old debt to repay. Let's leave it at that. But I certainly intend to have a talk with Anton. After what you've told me, I'm damned if I'll sit still for what's happened. I'll just take my chances unless he agrees to marry you. Marry me? Well, isn't that what you want? I wouldn't marry him if... Oh, Lord. I don't know what to do. Just leave it alone, Papa. Will you please? 
Let me try to work it out. But, Barbara... Yes, come in. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Am I interrupting anything? No, not a thing. Come in. If I'm breaking into family business or something... I was just leaving. I'll leave you two together. Papa? Yes? Leave it to me. There's nothing for you to worry about, Barbara. I know how to handle myself now. But I... Leave it to me, please, and close the door. I have a feeling I did interrupt something. I'm sorry if I came at a bad time. No, you didn't. I want to talk to you. Well, then I feel better. I wanted to have a talk with you, sir. Well, I should think it's about time. So Barbara has been telling tales out of school. Quite naturally. I wonder just how much she has revealed and what she expected to gain by it. Isn't that what you wanted to talk to me about? Not exactly, sir. The subject I wanted to discuss was money. I can't imagine why you insisted on dragging me all the way down to the court garden, Barbara. It's never been your favorite spot. I hate it more than ever now, Mama. Mama? You haven't called me that since you were... I need reassurance. I need help. I'm scared to death. I'm clutching at straws, and that's what Father said when I went back to calling him Papa. But if ever we need to stick together as a family, it's now. Barbara, what is it? It has to be all or nothing now. Mama, wasn't it right here they found Millie dead? Yes. And wasn't it Anton who killed her? What do you mean? You can't deceive me. What did he do? Just point his finger at Millie and say, I wish you dead. And weren't you out here that night walking in the gardens as you often do? And didn't you see it? And didn't he threaten you to keep you quiet? Or one or other of us would be as dead as Millie was. You're barking up the wrong tree, Anton. I haven't any money. Let's not be foolish, sir. I've looked down on the estate from Cheltenham Ridge, and I can see that it's worth a fortune. Well, that's true enough. But how far do you think you can stretch the repayment of an old debt? Your father saved my life. That's a lie. I had no father. I put it as you like. I was willing to open my home to you to try to find you a well-paying job. I don't want a job. I want the haven and all the land that goes with it. Impossible. What you already have is my daughter, and I will endow her with what dowry I can. I don't think you understand, Mr. Blake. I don't want your daughter. Barbara was just an extra bonus, a temporary necessity. What I want is the estate in toto. Well, then you are due to be disappointed. It isn't mine to give, even if I were so inclined. Then how can you live here? Because I did exactly what you want to do. Oh, perhaps not for the same selfish reasons. I married into money. The estate came from my wife's family. And then I'm wasting my time with you. I'll get it from her. You're an amazing young man. I can't quite credit you. You seem to be as hard and unprincipled and unyielding as Bertie herself. Bertie? A uh, nickname. And I assure you, not a fond one for Bella Chelton, my wife's mother, who willed this estate. Not to your wife? No, not to my wife. For reasons you perhaps know, she disapproved of our marriage. Nor to my son, Bruce. Barbara. Bertie didn't believe in divorce. Ah, then to Linda. To Belinda, a minor, in trust for three more years. So you see, your demands are impossible as well as unreasonable. But that isn't the point. Of course it is. She's an engaging and nubile youngster. And I know how she feels about me. We can get married right away. You'd need my consent. And the only way you'd get it is over my dead body. I'm past recognizing the cost of your threat to me and mine, and I... Hold up, old man. Whatever Barbara has told you, perhaps you don't recognize or refuse to accept the real cost. Very well. This is the moment of truth. Let's see. What's that? Uh, that's Scout, my retriever. It isn't important now. Oh, you'd be surprised how important. Down, boy, down. Sit. Now, why did you let Scout in? To wake you up to what you face. What are you after? Your promise that your rich little daughter shall be mine, body and <laughs> estate. 
or you start to lose everything you love most. Starting with, what was that asinine name of, oh yes, Scout. You must be mad. If you don't accept my proposition, so must you be. Now look here. Certainly I knuckled under to you and your mother to save my happiness. But there is an end to compromise. To hell with your cheap threats. I've had enough of you. I'm ready to make my own confession. To prove my mastery over your master, Scout. I wish you dead. What have you done? What I can do to you or yours, animal, vegetable, human, whatever I decide. Think it over, old man. I'll give you a reasonable time to make up your mind. Let's say till tomorrow night. You do understand, Papa, now. You do believe. Yes. But what can we do? Mother's involved, too. You know that. She is? He killed Millie. Mother stumbled on it that night. She went out for a walk. He's got us all involved, except Linda. (sighs) Your little sister is no longer immune. He knows the money goes to her. He wants to marry her. You can stop that. The one thing I can do. But it's only temporary. It isn't the only thing we can do. What else? Anton enjoys killing things. Whatever or whoever they may be. I've already promised to take him grouse hunting tomorrow. Why don't you join us? Oh, Barbara, I'm in no mood for sporting. There won't be any sport connected with this. While I keep his attention away from you, shoot him in the back. A hunting accident? Why not? Well, we'd never get away with it. Of course we can. He's nobody here, and everyone knows who we are, our family. Papa, it's the only way. You... You're more of a man than I am, Barbara. All right, we'll do it. Tomorrow morning is the execution. And nobody ever deserved it more. I've been looking forward to this. I'm very glad you made up your mind about Linda and me, sir. She's happy, too. Yes, the only thing to do. I haven't said anything to either of the girls, huh? No, better not. Might be a little difficult. When do we flush some birds? I miss old Scout. I am sorry about that. But I had to prove a point. I think we have some game. Where? This way. Towards me. Coming. Okay, Dad. Shoot. Shoot. But there are no birds. Oh. I can't. No matter what man he is, I, I can't kill him in cold blood. Not this man. So, it is all in the open. Then I will. Without compunction. In the back, where he deserves. Hold it. Don't turn. I'll even drop my gun. Fire if you want, Barbara. But I can wish faster than the shot can travel. Or you, Mr. Cutler. I can wish you all dead. But I'm sure one is enough. The innocent one. The one far away. Your son. Your firstborn. Now I offer you the challenge. Fire if you want. But if any of you wish to stay alive, let me prove my power now and forever. Wherever he is, your son, your firstborn, I wish him dead. What happened? He's... he's dead. But, But we didn't... We didn't have to... He killed himself. How? There never was a father that saved me at Gallipoli. Only an excuse to try to explain a black-eyed gypsy called Carla, who caught me in her spell and to whom I lost my head, my heart, and my honor. I should say your mother's honor. I've carried the shame of it all these years till he turned up with that letter from her. Apparently, she never told Anton the truth. But he was my firstborn. I didn't want your mother to know. There are a lot of things about all of us we don't want anyone to know, Papa. And when you said she cast a spell, perhaps you were right. (gasps) He said himself she was a witch. And look, now... Where he's lying. What do you mean? 
I've felt it. Edwin, help me. But maybe that's only in my mind. Still, I see him from the waist down, all hair and two cloven hooves. It was poor, innocent Linda who first called him a fawn. He was far more evil than that. Thank God he is without life. Because what I see lying there is a satyr. Illusion is belief. Belief is illusion. When the authorities picked up the body from the heath, there was nothing unusual about it. A hunting accident, most regrettable. But luckily, there were none to mourn save the cutlers. We have told you a gothic tale of ghoulery, which for once ended not in despair, nor perhaps in happiness, but at least in relief and freedom. I'll be back shortly. Mrs. Cutler never learned of her husband's ancient transgression. Barbara married soon after and was a woman who had learned how to make marriage work and thrive. And Belinda finally got her family to call her just simply Linda, which was enough for the moment. She spent a few tears over Anton, who might have been, but being her age was soon adjusted to whatever was to be, a state as long as it is expectant and hopeful, which is the best any of us at any age can ask for. Our cast included Anne Petoniak, Roberta Maxwell, Jada Rowland, Court Benson, and Michael Zaslow. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... G. Marshall. In his immortal comedy of manners, William Congreve wrote, Heaven hath no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned. That was over 200 years ago. Have matters changed in the intervening centuries? Judge for yourself in this story, which happens today. I thought you were sound asleep. All those pills. Something woke me for the moment. I don't know why I came alive so suddenly. Some alarm bell in me. Which will never ring. You're not going to be alive. What are you doing with that pillow? Playing Othello to your Desdemona, my love. No, Mark. You can't be serious. It's all just... Yet I'll not shed your blood, nor scar that whiter skin of yours than snow. Yet you must die. Put out the light. And then put out the light. If I can quench thee. Ah. No more moving. Still as the grave. My wife. My wife. Our mystery.
mystery drama, Hell Hath No Fury, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars William Redfield. Mark Stanton and Emily Lawrence. The Wedding of a Decade. The first, a shining light of the classical theater. The second, a new, fresh, and lovely star of the screen who transcended any picture she illuminated. A public romance shared avidly by the fans that ranks with Romeo and Juliet, Eloise and Abelard, Desdemona and Othello, and which is destined to end as tragically. But to start a story, one must have a beginning, not an ending. So let's go back a few days before Emily Lawrence's sudden and tragic death. Back to a meeting between Emily's half-sister, Elspeth Whitmore, and Mark Stanton. But who the devil... All right, Dodd, you better get your clothes on and be ready to scoot. I'll give you the high sign. Uh, hand me my gown, will you? Whoever it is, they aren't going to quit. Thanks, baby. You. Where did you get a key, Elspeth? One of the privileges of the family, even a half-sister. Well, come in. Why ring the bell when you have a key? I wanted to give you time to, uh, put your robe on. Uh, <laughs> well, I was just trying to snatch 40 winks. Oh, do I know her? Didn't you used to go under the name of Tiger Tilly the Jungle Cat? Funny, very funny. Not to me, or would it be to my sister? Now, get rid of her, Mark. I want to talk to you. I will be in the living room on the phone, my back to the door, pretending your matinee curtain isn't coming down early. But don't think I won't sneak a look at what's your style this month, brother-in-law. B, Elspeth. Anything stirring? Oh, how much? No, no, it's too low. They've got to come up with 700. Well... Well, let them stew on it. I'll be back in the office soon. Huh? Oh, wait a sec. Uh, uh no. Uh, no, I was just looking at a would-be rising star. Listen, if there's anything urgent, I'm at my sister's apartment. It's listed under Mark Stanton on the Rolodex, but it's still my sister's apartment. Bye. Well, Elspeth, to what do I owe this rather surprising early afternoon visit? I thought agents were always busy during lunch hours. Well, sorry to disappoint you. We take a breather now and then. Don't you ever? What does that mean? Well, didn't I surprise you hard at work? Now, look. Eleanor brought me a, a new treatment she wanted me to see. I'll bet she did. A screen treatment, a script. Okay, Casanova. That's enough banter. Are we alone in this joint now? Oh, don't tell me you want to open old books between us. No, this is a new one. We closed the other when you married my sister. Half-sister. Do you have to rub it in? I'm plain, flat-chested, and no hard hat ever whistled at my legs, but I still have brains. Uh, who needs them when you have Emily's 36, 24, 36, and even the members of the Union League Club look up from the Wall Street Journal when she moves by? Mark, sit down. I'm about to kick your feet from under you. What are you talking about? It's a pity you met me before Emily, isn't it, Mark? And needed me. I beg your pardon. Well, without an agent and one who cared, you were nothing but a stud. If I hadn't nursed and supported you through speech lessons, singing lessons, small parts, and nothing out of town... Now, theater, damn you, I may not have had much education, but I always had talent. Oh, I'll grant you that. But you're lazy. And once you met Emily and knew she had all the looks and all the money... It was time to drop me. But don't forget Emily's money comes from being a film star. And I made her that. Let's forget past history. Mark, since I came back from Europe, I've been going over Emily's financial position. But what right have you to... I happen to be her manager as well as her agent. And I don't like what I see. Emily has never made more in her life. You have never spent more. We have a front to keep up. As two reigning stars? Hogwash. 
You're a successful ham who draws suburban ladies with delusions of culture and dreams of vicarious God knows what to the theater. You make peanuts compared to Emily and spend the kind of money she makes. A temporary loan or two. I have some pictures in the works. Oh, come on, Mark. You couldn't draw flies to a movie theater even in an exploitation film. Huh. So, I have talked it over with Emily. And as uh, Harry Truman used to say, the buck stops here. <laughs> what does that mean? I'm putting Emily on an allowance, enough to take care of her needs. You can handle the apartment and the rest. But no more play money, little boy. And uh, that's only the beginning. The next thing I'm going after is her will. Uh, the one that leaves everything to you. If anything should ever happen to my sister, I can think of better causes for her estate to serve than Mark Stanton, the heel of ham. <laughs> In the elevator, all my efforts to stay calm and unruffled meeting Mark again dissipated into thin air. Thank heaven I was alone. And my knees turned to water thinking and dreaming of him as once it had been between us. By the time I reached the ground floor, I knew I needed another session with Madame Erexo. Why do you imagine you can ever fail? You are one of us. I have always thought one of the strongest in the coven. I never have doubts except... except in one area. <laughs> Every Achilles has his vulnerable heel. Every witch her own weakness. We must fight always against the world to hold the true faith. Come, daughter. Let us pray together. Draw the drapes while I light the candles. Now, step within the magic circle with me. Yes. Oh, great Erecto, mother of us all, who crouch in the black shadow of your wings. I conjure thee, form of the instrument, by Lucifer, prince of darkness, by all the stars which rule by the four elements, that we may obtain by thee the perfect issue of all our desires, which also we seek to perform without evil, without deception. We are answered. I know what I'm doing is right. Will it turn out that way? Will you read the tarot cards for me? I am your sister in Satan. I am at your command. Sit down while I shuffle the cards. You know what that means without asking. The king of coins... A sign of ill omen. Was the question asked for yourself? No. I will ask one for myself now. Then cut. The ace of cups. That is a promise of beauty and fertility. For me? Uh, why not? You are young. Uh, scarcely beautiful. One more question. One only. I'm asking it in my mind. Cut. The card of death. The nine of swords. No. Not my sister. Not my sister. I love you, Emily. I love you, Mark. Oh, now I feel relaxed and hungry. Good, good. Um, Elspeth was around this afternoon. Here? I... Oh, being the big business manager, saying we were spending too much money. <laughs> She's smarter than we are about things like that. Yes, but is she really putting you on a strict allowance? Well, I guess I'll have to go along with her. She says I'm starting to spend more than I make. Now, how is that possible? Maybe you need a new business manager. Oh, nobody would be better than Elspeth. Hmm. Besides, 
She's got to make a living, too. And who would I get? Well, how about me? Oh, darling, you. You have no idea of the value of money. No, well, I'm old and penniless. And if in his infinite mercy the man upstairs saves you from looking at me anymore and snatches you upstairs for himself, Elspeth tells me she'll be my guardian. Well, she does want me to make a new will. And it wouldn't be a bad idea. We're both so stupid about how to handle what we've got. And if anything ever should happen to me... Oh, darling, please. I was only kidding. Let's get off this. No. As long as we got on it, I think Elspeth has the right idea. She'd see you didn't throw it all away. So I agreed. I'm going to remake my will on Monday. Well... Now, I've got to wash up, and you go tell the cook to get that dinner on the table. I am famished. Well, that tears it. Elspeth, Emily, one of you has got to go. Now, let's see. Which shall it be? Which can I get away with? Charming fellow Mark Stanton. Matinee idol for a limited audience of aging women. His main role, Romeo. Although he has been seen with varying success critically as Orlando, Bassanio, Lysander, all Shakespearean lovers. Interesting casting when you think of it. Or as we learn about him. He might have made a better Claudius of whom his nephew Hamlet said that one may smile and smile again and be a villain. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. A famous epitaph on a child's grave reads, It is so soon that I am done for. I wonder what I was begun for. That might apply to this story of Emily Stanton, or at least the plan that is forming in the mind of her husband, Mark. The problem with murder is not to want to commit it, but how? How to commit it and not be caught? One thing I knew... It would have to be out of the city. And fortunately, we have a place up the Hudson Valley, suitably isolated. Also, by sheer luck, Emily's picture was not shooting that weekend. Oh, what time is it, Mark? Mark? Did you call, m'lady? Oh, what on earth are you doing up at 5.30 in the morning? Uh, bringing the woman I adore beyond reason her orange juice. And coffee's on the way. Oh, you angel. Thanks. Welcome. I'm so tired, I don't know how I'm going to make it to the studio today. I'll call them and tell them you're not well. No, no. Two more days and I have a whole long three-day weekend off. I'll bounce back then. Uh, speaking about the weekend, how about going up to the country? Mm-mm, no, thanks. I want to just slump down here in bed and sleep and rest and hold in like a bear for his winter sleep. Oh, but darling, it isn't winter, it's spring. And I want to get up to the house. <sighs> that long drive. Well, you see, I'm worried. You know, I've got the hole dug in the fall. I've got to get that sump pump into the cellar before the spring waters flood us again. You can rest up there just as well. I can rest here and we can get some men to do the job. Oh, where were they last fall when we needed them? Can't we make it next weekend? Well, it'd um, be too late by then, I'm afraid. <sighs> All right, darling. I never can refuse you anything. Everything I do is for you. Have is yours. Except for letting your sister run our lives. Oh, that's just money. Because neither of us know how to handle it. Well, what's it, it for except to buy things? Mm. Mm. Well, we can enjoy them. I mean, I'd feel like a fool having to run to Elspeth for the rent or something. Are you trying to get rid of me? Well, of course not, darling. How could you think a thing like that? <laughs> I don't. So stop talking about it. You'd only have to do that if I was dead, and I don't intend to be. I should hope not. Oh, <gasps> Look at the time. Whoop. I've got to shower and dress and get out of here. How about lunch? I can't, sweetie. I have a, a business appointment. <laughs> Shower a moment or two later, I wondered why I hadn't told Mark my lunch was with Elspeth. Then I decided it was better that I hadn't. And I wished I hadn't agreed to dragging up to the country house. 
But he's really so beautiful and so sexy and so persuasive. It's awfully hard to refuse Mark anything. If I'd only known I'd picked the wrong thing to ever refuse him, I'd never have let Elspeth talk me into what she called having more backbone, Emily. You can't give in to everything Mark wants or asks. He's a selfish child. That isn't true, Elspeth. Look, honey, take it from me. I found out the hard way. I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to bring all that up again. Oh, I'd forget it. I've forgotten Mark that way. Plant us two side by side and ask any man to choose. Which way would it go? Well, I'd never have come back from the coast a year ago if I'd known I was going to bust up a romance between you. Emily, we've been over this ground before. You didn't bust up the romance. There wasn't any to bust up except on my side. Mark needed a good agent, and he got me in more ways than one. So, beneath, period. I'm still sorry it hurts. I, I wish I could make up for it. Well, you can. Two ways. Draw that will making me executrix of your estate and let me budget your dough. <laughs> seems unfair to Mark. Listen, Emily, I don't want you to get your back up, but I get the word he has gambling debts, and if he thinks he has backing, he could go sky high. Now, just let me put the brakes on, okay? I suppose it's too much to hope that uh, your love for that muscle-bound Greek statue you married isn't letting up any. Mark? What would make you think a thing like that? Oh, I don't know, just uh, an irrational hope, I guess. You still love him, don't you? That isn't the point. I love you, and I'm very concerned about you. What do you mean? I don't know. You'd, you'd only laugh at me if I told you. <laughs> it's really funny, isn't it? I mean, uh, the genes. We both come from the same mother, but our fathers were so different. You, blonde, blue-eyed, open, uncomplicated, trusting. And me, dark, brooding, sharp-tongued, much of this world, and and yet not. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> I could never explain that to you in a millennium. But I am a psychic. You mean like those funny cards you used to read and foretelling what's going to happen and things like that? Yes, things like that. Emily, listen to me. This is a dangerous time for you. Be careful. Just be very careful. But I don't know what you mean. I can only see so far. I can only warn you. Just be very careful. Now, you are scaring me. I mean to. Well, it isn't only you. It's just that I... I have the weekend off, and Mark and I are going to the country. Ellie, I really don't want to. I'm scared of the drive. You mean because of Mom and your father? Yes. Emily, how many times have I told you it wasn't your fault? It was in the cards. I was driving when they were killed. And a drunken madman by fatal chance jumped the road divider and forced you off the road. What else could you have done? It was not your fault. I know, but I still have nightmares about it. You're not going to drive, are you? I'll never drive a car again. It's just... I'm afraid even to get into one. Now, excuse me for changing the subject, but you have to get back to the set soon. I want you to take a quick run up to my office. Why? Harry is there now. I had him draw up a new will for you, and I think we ought to get it signed right away. Well, I don't know. Mark is sort of hurt. The... Emily, if anything ever happens to you, I will take care of him the way he should be. You know you can trust me for that. <laughs> Emily? Yes? Oh, you had your eyes closed. I thought you were asleep. That's not why my eyes were closed. Oh, darling, come on. We've got to put things behind us. I try. It's just... <gasps> You're in the fast lane. Well, darling, it's late. I want to get us home. Move over. Move over. Never travel in this lane. All right, all right. I'm sorry. I'll cut right into the next lane as soon as the car behind me passes. Now, please, sweetheart, I want you to relax. Just forget everything this weekend. Just play possum. Play possum. Would I have the nerve to do it? And beyond that, could I really find the how? As the hum of the car soothed both of us, and Emily appeared really to drop off to sleep, other things came to my mind. That damn cellar. Flooding every spring when the surface water unfroze and coming down the hill defeated every trick we tried to keep it out. The sump pump was the only answer. And suddenly, at that moment, 
although it turned my stomach. There was the answer to my bigger problem. Elspeth, you are very early. I know. The coven does not meet until midnight. I had to come. I need a special reading. I have intimations of disaster. You remember our last... One of my gifts is total recall. The last question I asked turned up the nine of swords. I asked about my sister. Oh? Now I want to know how soon, when. That is not always divulged. But let us tell the cards and find out if we can. If you want. If I want? Remember... There is no way of stopping what has been decreed. Has it been a good weekend, darling? Oh, yes. <laughs> I feel so rested, so relaxed. Good. Maybe it's just as well I came. Did you get everything done in the cellar you want? Well, yes, I had to do some more digging, make the hole larger, but I have plenty of cement to finish up tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, that's Monday. Right. I thought you could drive down tonight. You know I won't think of ever driving again. All right, darling, all right. I'll drive you in the morning and then drive back up. Now, come on, sweetie. I've taken off the phone so we won't be disturbed. And I'm going to carry you up to bed and tuck you in for the best sleep you've ever had in your life. I was so tired I could hardly keep my eyes open. But some inner alarm, some nonsense voice kept jogging at me to stay awake until I thought it's only tension foolish to be afraid I am in my beloved husband's arms and how safe can I be is she still in danger the nine of swords still threatens but when how soon I cannot tell her from the cards maybe maybe I should call the country may I use your phone of course. What danger can she be in with her husband? Well, it's a very long drive. You know what those roads are like. Oh, damn. What? A busy signal. Well, at least it means they got there safely. Still. Wait for the mass tonight. Within this circle, more questions are answered than through the cards. Be patient. I'll try. But I can feel death in my bones. Yes, you must die. Put out the light, and then put out the light. If I can quench thee. No. No more moving. Still as the grave. My wife. My wife. I must have been mad, Emily, to have killed you. Because I do love you. Only that I love myself more. For money. For the need of it. What have I done? How do I cover it? A car. An accident. No, no. No. An accident with a car into the river at the devil's elbow. But the body must never be recovered. Then, who could prove anything? The grave is already made. Can I get away with it? Of course I can. I can get away with anything. Is it Elspeth? You interrupt the mass. Eric thought a death has occurred. A death you prophesied. I must leave. Give me permission to leave the magic circle. If the death is accomplished, what can you do? But go if you must. Well, try it again, operator. Or get me someone who can make the connection if it's out of order. This is a matter of life and death. Shame to 
to waste a car I love. On such a night, Troilus climbed the Athenian walls. <laughs> madness. The whole thing is madness. But there has to be a reason for Emily's death. The car smashing through the guardrail 500 feet to the river below. The car recovered, the body never. I will bury that five fathoms deep. And why should anyone question that Emily's body lies cemented in the well of a new sump pump planned over a year ago? So, goodbye, my favorite car. The die is cast. The adversaries established. A murderer and a witch. By whom is justice best served? Which will prevail? If a woman has loved not wisely but too well, who can best revenge her? The majesty and justice of the law or a kangaroo court beyond and outside the law? I'll return shortly with Act Three. Mark Stanton has deliberately murdered his wife. And he has had what seems to him a very practical means of disposing of body and suspicion. Which may work for normal authority, but possibly not for his sister-in-law. Since he has no idea that she is a modern witch. For the moment, he is involved with simple but furiously necessary occupations. Huh. That looks pretty good. Pump in its well, cellar floor replaced. Who'd ever find Emily or think to look for her here? What? What the devil? 3 a.m. in the morning, who? Damn. Lights are on upstairs. I better answer. Oh, Got to change first. Well, about time. Oh. I always seem to be surprising you in en déshabille. Well, what do you expect at this time of night? All right, come in. That's about the first polite thing you've said to me in months. Oh, let's cut the funny talk. What are you doing up here in the middle of the morning? <laughs> An interesting phrase. Shouldn't it be the middle of the night? All right, all right. Let's bury the New York smart talk. What do you want? To see my sister. She isn't here. Oh, why not? <sighs> she had a five o'clock call on location for sunrise shots. So she decided to drive back last night and have the limousine take her on location this morning. What made you take a two-hour drive out here at this time of night? I'll tell you half of it. I was scared, if that means anything to you. Well, it doesn't. What's the other half? I won't tell you that yet. Although someday you just might have to learn. I won't even pretend to understand that. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Yes, that's right. I'm, I'm Mark Stanton. What? Where? No, no, never mind all that. How is she? No, I'll be right down there. What was that? Emily, her car went out of control at, at Devil's Elbow. Oh, no. She went through the guardrail, plunged 500 feet down into the river. The, the car's a total wreck. Never mind the car. What about Emily? I... Well, they haven't found her yet. The car windows were open. If she got swept down the river and into the lake, they may never find her. You mean... She's dead. You, you don't have to. What else? A plunge like that? The, the car totaled? What else is there to think? Nothing. Emily is dead. What? That's a strange way to... Oh, Elspeth, I'm sorry. This must be terrible for you, too. It is terrible for me. But not too... Huh? What does that mean? I mean, you killed her. How could you... Think a thing like that. I don't think. I know. But it isn't going to do you any good. It was all for nothing. I don't know what you mean. You will. When I'm ready to tell you. Right now, let's go to the scene of the... What shall we call it, Mark? Let's just say... The tragedy. <laughs> 
Okay, boys, use the crowbars. Get those doors open. Go over the inside. Check the ignition key, huh? Oh. Uh, you Mr. Stanton? Yes. Yes, that's right. I'm Mrs. Stanton's sister. I do, ma'am. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry about this. My wife, you... You think she's dead? What can I say? A fall like that, and then, um... And... And what? Well, ma'am, this here shoe. One of my men found its mate washed ashore just before the river empties into Lake Cahokawa. Right down near where the car landed in the river, we found your sister's pocketbook. It don't look good. Can't her body be recovered from the lake? We'll try, but that lake bottom is soft mud or whatever you want to call it from all the leaves the trees have been dropping for millions of years. It's like like a quicksand. Nobody who ever drowned in that lake ever was seen again. Oh, my God. Look, uh, why don't you go on home, Mr. Stanton, and take Miss, uh, take your sister-in-law with you. As soon as I'm finished up here, I'll drive up. There are some questions I'll have to ask. But what do you mean, was Emily exceptionally tall? Well, for a woman, I meant. Actually, my sister was quite small. Two inches shorter than I am. And I'm only 5'4". Well, all right, yes, Emily was quite tiny, but what difference does that make? The driver's seat was adjusted for somebody as tall as, well, say you, sir. Oh, well, it could have been knocked back in the crash, couldn't it? Yes, sir. It could. Uh, was your wife wearing gloves when she left? Gloves? I... Why? Driver's wheel had no fingerprints on it. I just wondered. Oh, yes, yes, now I remember. Yes, uh, I think, yeah, yes, she did have gloves. Do you drive with gloves, Mr. Stanton? Well, yes, yes, usually, and the uh, car is on constant maintenance at the garage. Yes, sir. All right, just one more question for now. Were you alone in the house when the accident happened? Oh, well, I suppose I must have been. Well, I was just wondering if your sister-in-law was also here. I... I arrived shortly before Emily left. I had planned to drive her into town this morning. We had some business to discuss, but when she insisted on leaving last night, I was just too tired to make the trip, and I had brought Mark a new script. Since Emily was taking Mark's car, I decided to stay, let him read the script, and we could drive in tomorrow discussing it and return it on time. Uh, Well, I guess that closes things up for me. Sorry to have taken so much time. My condolences, Mr. Stanton. I, I, I... I hope we can find your wife. He is just as certain of it as I am. You murdered Emily. What are you saying? The truth. If you believe that, why did you alibi me? I wanted to spike the sergeant's suspicions, at least temporarily. What are you up to? Um, at the moment, not very much. I want to sleep on all of this. Oh, by the way, don't entertain any ideas of getting rid of me. You see, brother-in-law, dear, I happen to be exactly what you think of me. A witch. Only I am a real one. And because I am what I am, I can feel... Her presence in this house. If I told the police what I know, they'd search it from top to bottom. Because of someone who claims to have ESP, they'd write you off as a nut. Mark, you haven't a leg to stand on. On Wednesday, last Wednesday when we had lunch, I arranged for Emily to change her will. It was finalized before you drove up here Friday. I am executrix and control every penny. Ah. I'm too tired to talk about it now. After I've slept on it, I'll decide your future. I suggest you get some rest to prepare for it. I wouldn't have bet a plugged nickel I could get any sleep out of what was left of the night. But a bottle of brandy and sheer emotional exhaustion from fright put me to sleep in the library chair. The last thing I remember was a whirling confusion of surrealistic plots for disposing of Elspeth. 
before I even finally believed what I'd always thought of her. That she was a witch. I was sick with grief and desperately tired. But I couldn't go to sleep. Every time my eyes closed, I seemed to hear a voice. I couldn't stand it any longer. I got up, went downstairs... I saw Mark passed out in the library, a brandy bottle in his hand. And the voice was closer. The voice threw me to the cellar. And there, beside the furnace, I knew it at last. The fresh cement, still drying, beautifully blended and tapered into the old surface. Now I knew where my sister was. Now I knew exactly what I had to do. I now pronounce you, Elspeth Garrick Whitmore, and you, Mark Blaine Stanton, man and wife. You may kiss the bride. Ah, home sweet home. So, you got me at last, Elspeth. That's right, Mark. My dear husband. And no way out for you. One word from me and Sergeant Harkness would dig up that cellar and you'd spend the best part of your life in jail for murder. I'm grateful to you, of course. But some things I... I still don't understand. Oh, you will. Hubby, darling. Just give your bride a few minutes to slip into something fetching and we'll start to begin our married life. I promise you'll find me all I told you I really am. Bewitching. I damned her under my breath for what she claimed to be. I found a longing ache for Emily and what she'd been to me. I seethed at being emasculated, at having to act like a pet poodle at the hopelessness of my situation. I dreamed of the thousandth plot to get rid of Elspeth. Oh, an idle dream... I'd gotten away with it once, never again. And then... She called me into the bedroom. Come, lover boy. Oh, Oh, good Lord. No. (laughs) You didn't really believe I was a witch, did you? You're not Elspeth, you... You're Emily. I've borrowed her aspect. Does it please you? Yes, I... I... I love you, I... I want you. Oh, Emily, my beloved. Elspeth, Mark, not Emily. Only her aspect, which you will live with every moment we're at home. Oh. But you will not touch me, either as myself or my sister you killed. I... I don't understand. I want to be sure you can't get away with it. A good lawyer, your own natural charm, a long, bitter trial, the possibility of escape. And even if they found you guilty, there is no death penalty, so my way's better. No money. No freedom. And the remembrance every day of the crime you committed. The girl you murdered to haunt you fresh and lovely while you grow old and forgotten. This is your cell, Mark. Plush-lined, perhaps, but more confining than anything state or government could devise. And I am your jailer. Watching you die a little day by day, year by year. I've read it in your cards, traced it in your horoscope. You will have a long hell on earth before the spirit I worship welcomes you to the real hell for eternity. This is my revenge for my sister. And for myself. As it was in the beginning, so it is now and ever shall be. Heaven hath no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell no fury like a woman scorned. For this story, there is no ending. A man bought only what he deserved. I'll be back shortly. For a 
while, Mark Stanton's matinee ladies wondered about his abrupt retirement. But the Gorgon who guarded him fiercely finally discouraged their attentions. Not Elspeth alone. His good looks began to fade strangely, till by the time he was 35, his haunted, gaunt face and emaciated body looked more like a man in his 70s. He eventually was committed to a state institution for the insane and died there without even an obituary to mark his passing. Mysteriously and suddenly, Elspeth died on the same day. Our cast included William Redfield, Patricia Wheel, Terry Keene, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. We're about to embark on a dark journey. A journey through the terrifying passages of a distorted mind. Man's mind is filled with dark passages that lead through a labyrinth of horror, from which at times there is no return. Come with me as we probe the darkness for ghostly images. Come to the house of Cain. Here we will search out the secret as kept the old house shrouded in a mantle of fear. Who is Cain, you ask? He appears to be an ordinary man like most of us. But here at the old house, isolated from the 20th century, a strange turbulence swirls around him. Cain! Cain! Where are you? Here, Agatha. I'm here. I told you to stay in the house. You're not needed here. Where have you been? In the stone house. Horrible odor in the dungeon. One of the prisoners went mad, set fire to a cell. Ludwig and I dragged him out. We had to calm the others. We used... You tell me. I don't want to know what you do with them. Please. I don't want to know what you do. mystery drama, Them, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ralph Goodman and stars Alan Hewitt and Jordan Charney. Our story begins in a small, crowded courtroom. The jury is filing in. They have reached a decision on the charge of manslaughter. The defendant, Charles Schiller, darts a quick, apprehensive look at his frail wife, Karen, who has stood steadfastly by him during his ordeal. He then stands to face the twelve men and women who have been chosen to decide his fate. The murder, if it is to be called that, was accidental. Charles Schiller testified to this. The evidence seemed conclusive. Let's move in a little closer. The foreman of the jury has just risen. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, sir. How say you? Do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? 
Not guilty. <gasps> Come, Agatha. Once again, a mockery has been made of justice. Let's get out of here. Yes, King. As with the others, I find this man guilty. But if a jury found him innocent... I am not influenced by emotion, as are these incompetents chosen to serve on juries. Remember, Agatha, I have been both lawyer and judge. Who is better qualified to decide a man's guilt or innocence? Come. We must inform Ludwig. That man must pay for his crime, as did the others. But, Kay, I said, come, Agatha. We have listened to every bit of evidence presented in this trial. A murder has been committed. I have found the defendant guilty on all counts. It is up to us to see to it that justice will be served. you two. This is last call. Breakfast is served. We're coming, Mom. Dad's giving me a piggy ride on his back. <laughs> oh, more like a ride around the throat. <laughs> Easy, Jim. You're strangling. Oh, me. let's be careful with Daddy now that he's back from that awful courtroom. Home with us again. Well, now you two sit down. We've got toast and boiled eggs and... Boiled eggs? Mm-hmm. Ugh. Oh. I'll just take a piece of toast. In any ways, I'm not hungry, okay? <laughs> All right, then take a piece of toast. <gasps> Maybe you'd better take two. Okay, Dad. i got to run anyway. I'm supposed to meet the guys at the schoolyard. Toast is perfect for eating and running. <laughs> oh, it's so good to have you home. And I have that nightmare behind us. No, let's not think about that or talk about it again. All I'm interested in now is... is having that phone taken out so I can spend a quiet Saturday with my wife. Hello? No, 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 you didn't. Yes, yes, I'd like very much to be included. 12.15? Fine. Uh, where is it to be held? Oh, no, 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 that, that's not necessary. I have my own car. I can just... Well, all right, if you want to. I'll be ready at noon, yes. Goodbye. Who was that? Well, I don't know, really. I neglected to ask. A friend of Warren's, another lawyer. Some of his associates are giving Warren a surprise luncheon today to celebrate his winning my case. I wish I had thought of it. Well, you did call him to thank him, dear, twice last night. Oh, I know, I know, but a luncheon. What a wonderful idea. Mm, and they've asked you to come... It's almost the same as if you'd thought of it. Well, not quite. But I'm glad someone did. It must be a really fancy party. They're sending a limousine for me. Oh, how posh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I, I know we we planned the day together, darling. But well, after all the work Warren did for me, I'd like very much to go. Darling, of course you have to go. Where's it to be? Well, the man didn't say. Well, actually, it doesn't matter. They're sending the car. <laughs> I'll let the driver worry. I'd better shave. I thought you just did. True. But I've never been picked up by a limousine before. Oh, John. <laughs> oh, it's good to have you home again. Agatha, it's almost twelve. Yes, Kane. Oh, please stop pacing. They'll be here. Ludwig has always brought them. He has never failed you. The uh, transcripts, the murder trials we've judged thus far, where are the transcripts? Here, Kane, on the desk. There is no need to show the poor man the transcripts. Ludwig will bring him in as he has the others. I know you have told me over and over what we do is right. Ah, but in my heart... Sentimental claptrap. That's what got him off of the trial. One does not judge a case with a heart, but with the mind. Here, look at these transcripts. I've gone over them word by word, and in each case the jury has been wrong, I have been right. The limousine. You are right in one thing, Agatha. Ludwig does what he has to do and does it well. Yes, yes, he's brought us our honored guest. Let them in. I will join you presently. I have work. Yes, Kane. One moment, Ludwig. I am coming. Ah, good afternoon, young man. I am sorry to have kept you waiting. Uh, take his hat, Ludwig. 
And if you will please follow me, sir, to the study. I appreciate your hospitality. My name is Charles, Charles Schiller. Yes. Yes, I know. Now, if you will come this way. The halls are rather dark and dreary. What is this place? I mean, your chauffeur was not very talkative. I still don't know the gentleman's name who sent the car for me. Oh, it's Mr. Kane. This is his estate. Kane, Kane, I see. Is he a lawyer? He's a judge. Ah, Mr. Schiller. I see you've arrived safely. Allow me to welcome you. I'm Matthew Kane. Oh, how do you do? I must admit, when a luncheon was mentioned, uh, well, I was expecting... To be taken to a small restaurant or a banquet room? Oh, no, no, no. This is too important a moment to be held in mundane surroundings. Uh, You've met my sister, Miss Agatha Kane? Well, no, no, not not formally. How do you do, ma'am? If uh, you'll both excuse me... As I've told you, Agatha, this is Mr. Schiller. He's come to visit with us and have a bite of lunch. Would you do the honors, my dear? Ludwig will help. But give Mr. Schiller and me a chance to get acquainted first. Yes, Kane. I will go and find Ludwig. Ah, unfortunately, she's a little addled, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, since you're the first to arrive, may I suggest a little brandy to warm you from the dampness of the weather? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That'll be fine. I took the liberty of pouring as you arrived. Your drink is here. On the side table. Oh, I see you're admiring that magnificent old portrait over the mantel. My grandfather, sir. A man who gloried in our judicial system. Spent his life exacting justice. A godly man who believed in the holy words, an eye for an eye. He has a magnificent face. Yes. He's been dead for over 50 years now. But his presence is still felt in this house. Well, here's to you, sir. Thank you. Ah. Sit down, Mr. Schiller. The others will be here shortly. Sit down and tell me about your day in court. You had an able lawyer. Ah, one of the best. I can't speak highly enough of Warren Douglas. Clever. Yes, very clever. But then... Criminal lawyers must be exceptionally clever. Most of the time, they're paid to defend the guilty. (laughs) But I I meant no inference in your case, just a generalization. That's all right. I'm not sensitive. I was exonerated. Yes, yes, I heard. It was a murder case, was it not? Accidental manslaughter. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Forgive me. I'm sorry to say I don't follow all the cases I should. Uh, This was something about a fight in a bar room, wasn't it? Mm, The Carlton Lounge. Now, I was waiting for my wife. We were to have lunch that afternoon. There was this man, a complete stranger. He was annoying a woman at the bar. I intervened. One word led to another... I hardly remember the struggle that followed, but somehow he fell over backwards against a glass door and shattered it. One of the glass livers pierced his throat. He died almost instantly. Oh, how dreadful. Yes. Yes, it it was. One minute, sitting quietly, worrying about how much my wife spent on a shopping spree, and, well, the next... We are at the mercy of circumstances, are we not, Mr. Schiller? Oh, let me fill your glass again. I was just wondering about the others. It's getting rather late. The judicial system and its failings have become quite a passion with me. Several years ago, my sister and I had occasion to attend a criminal court trial. I'll never forget the sight of the man's face as he stood to receive the jury's verdict. He stood there, quivering with fear, awaiting the foreman's voice to pronounce him guilty... And suddenly, I suppose the strain was too much for him. The poor fellow pitched forward on his face, fell dead where he stood. Dead? Good Lord. Yes. Imagine that. And what do you suppose the jury's verdict was? Not guilty. The man lying dead at their feet there. Yeah. Well, retributive justice has a strange way of finding its mark sometimes. Well, I'd hardly call it justice if they found the man innocent, as you said. I found him guilty. Well, he was dead at any rate. You found him guilty? Yes, Mr. Schiller. We all judge our fellow man. 
You pick up a newspaper, read of a trial, decide a man's guilt or innocence over your morning coffee or toast. Don't deny it. Yeah, well, well, to some extent, I suppose we do. To some extent. Did you hear that, Agatha? Well, now, there is some reasonableness to you, certainly, if you can admit that. Now then, let me ask you this, Mr. Schiller. Do you think, with all the legions of lawyers, clever lawyers with silver tongues, that certain inequities of justice are sometimes meted out by juries? Do some innocent men hang? Unquestionably, sir. Then you would also admit that some of the guilty go free. Is that not so, Mr. Schiller? Uh, oh, uh, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel well. My, 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 my head. Uh, look, I, I was hoping the others would be here by now. Uh, do you think we should give Mr. Douglas a call? Perhaps there's been a misunderstanding. There's been no misunderstanding, Mr. Schiller. Mr. Douglas was never notified. There's no one else coming. Then the misunderstanding was mine. I, I, I thought you said there was to be a surprise luncheon for Mr. Douglas to celebrate. But, uh, did, did you put something in my drink? Yes, Mr. Schiller. Why? I, I, I don't understand. Why did you do it? Oh, oh, Mr. Kane, please, please, I... Sleep well, Mr. Schiller. Ludwig and I will attend to everything. Ludwig! Ludwig, come. We have work to do. Agatha, I'm here. Mr. Schiller, where is Mr. Schiller? Justice has been served. It is finished. Oh, Kane. Kane. Your coat. Your new coat. What have you stained it with? I think it's blood. I was attempting... Don't tell me. I don't want to know what you do with them. Please, Kane. I don't want to know. Don't want to know. Well, there is no doubt that justice in the minds of men can take many forms. Who is to say what is true justice? The charge against the defendant was manslaughter. Well, I guess each man has his own rationalization for justice as he sees it. But just as no man may place himself above the law, so no man may appoint himself the oracle of judgment and truth. It seems, however, that Matthew Kane has done so. I'll return shortly with Act Two. have passed since the disappearance of Charles Schiller. His wife, Karen, has been summoned to headquarters to discuss the incident with the police. The request is rather unusual, considering that over 3,000 cases of missing persons are reported in an average-sized metropolitan city each month. Police files bulge with triplicates of these reports. But the case of Charles Schiller has caught the eye of Detective Sergeant Steiner. Something about this case has activated the trail dog instinct. Steiner is sure he is on to something. I appreciate your checking into this, Sergeant. Of course I don't want to raise your hopes too high, Mrs. Schiller. I, I mean, around here, lots of times one and one comes out three. Yes, I understand, Sergeant. But how can I help? Well... As I understand it, according to our records, Mr. Schiller's lawyer was never informed of any testimonial luncheon in his honor or any meeting that day of yes, any I, kind. I spoke to Warren, Mr. Douglas, and, and he knew nothing about it, but I'm sure he told you that, too. Yes, uh, yes, he did. I have his statement right here. I'm sorry to put you through all this again, Mrs. Schiller, but you see, after your husband's disappearance, the facts related to it were run through our computer statistical department on a hunch of mine came through with something rather interesting. 
something I'd like to pursue with you, if I may. Certainly. What is it? Well, Mr. Schiller, it, it seems that the circumstances that surround your husband's disappearance have been repeated three other times, all within the last seven months. I'm afraid I don't, I don't follow. What I'm trying to say is, three men, three other men have vanished over the past seven months. And the one thing these three men had in common was they disappeared immediately after having stood trial for murder. Well, what does that have to do with... Wait a minute. Just a moment. More of a coincidence yet. Each of these men was found not guilty at his trial. Look here. David Swan, charge of first-degree murder seven months ago, October, not guilty. Man named Bates, manslaughter, not guilty. Collins, manslaughter, not guilty. (laughs) You see the pattern? Mm. Trial, exoneration, disappearance. Unusual, isn't it? And you think that my husband's disappearance has, has something to do with these other men? For now, let's just say he fits the pattern. You know, I've looked all through his file, this file here, dozens of times. Now, there's just one little piece missing. Did someone... Anyone see the man who picked your husband up that day on the limousine? No. I told the man who took the report. I was out shopping. Oh, yes, yes. Here it is. And Jimmy was out. Jimmy? That's my son. He's eight. He was at the schoolyard playing with his friends. Didn't I mention that? No. No, there's uh, no mention here of your son. Oh? Hmm. This uh, boy of yours, Jimmy, uh, could he have come home while you were out? Well, I suppose I... I never thought to ask. We have a treehouse in the backyard. He and his friends often play there. This uh, treehouse? Does it face the street? You mean the front driveway? Yes, but... Mrs. Schiller, where is your son now? He's in school. He'll be home at three. Uh. Do you think there's something that Jimmy might know that... Possible. Possible, Mrs. Schiller. You know, all we need is one lead. Mr. Schiller. Wake up, Mr. Schiller. It's time to rise and shine. Uh, Kane? Exactly, Mr. Schiller. Kane. Matthew Kane. Where am I? What is this place? Your room is high above the ground on the far side of the estate. Room? This isn't a room. It's a cage. So it is, Mr. Schiller. What is this? Barred window, steel door? It's like a prison cell. It is a prison cell, Mr. Schiller. But why? Why am I here? To serve your sentence. I've judged your case and found you guilty. No. Well, it's all very well and good to say no. But here you are, aren't you? Here they all are. And here they'll stay until their brains rot and their bodies decay. They? You mean there are others? Yes, Mr. Schiller, there are others. Others who have broken God's law and must pay for it. Here, Mr. Schiller, here are your rations for the day. You can't keep me here, Kane. My wife will go to the police. She's probably notified them already. Oh, I'm sure she has. I'm sure the others have wives and loved ones who have reported these unfortunate incidents to the police. You have disappeared, sir. Vanished into thin air. It's as simple as that. Not in this day and age. They'll find me. They have ways. Give it a year. Collins thought that way once. So did Swan. And the others. Give it time. We'll see. And now, if you'll excuse me, I must take these trays down the corridor. It's getting rather late. I'm due in court in an hour. There's an interesting case I must keep up with. When one is given the responsibility to judge his fellow man, one must be thorough in order to be fair. Cain! Come back! Cain! Someone, someone will come. They'll find me. They'll find me. Well, 
I'm glad you could bring Jimmy to see me, Mrs. Schiller. When he said that he was in the treehouse and saw his daddy leave in a big black car... This could be the lead we've been looking for. Now, are you uh, comfortable in that chair, Jimmy? Yes, sir. Ah, good. Now, you keep looking through this picture book. I don't understand how a children's book of cartoons... They're are... types, Mrs. Schiller. Tall, oh. thin, wiry, heavy, muscular. And the clothes they wear, all geared to pinpoint a suspect. Now, Jimmy, do you see anyone in there who looks like the man you saw from the treehouse? Um, not exactly, but he looks something like this one. Huh? Only he's wearing kind of a uniform, like a soldier. Tall, thin, in uniform. Now, let's see. Mm. Uniforms, uniforms. Ah, here we are. Now, Jimmy, was he a soldier like this one? Uh, no. Or, uh, wait a minute. Uh, how about this one? That's it. That's it. And he had a hat on. Like this one, right? Yeah, that's the one. But it, it wasn't black. It was gray, like Bobby's cat. Now, anything else you noticed about him, Jimmy? No, sir. Mrs. Schiller, we've got ourselves a suspect. Does that mean you can find my daddy? It means we have a better chance. At least we know one of the men we're looking for is a chauffeur. And we have some idea of what he looks like. Now, excuse me, Mrs. Schiller. Rodriguez, I want a composite made up of uh, the Schiller case. Get the artist in here. Oh, and I'll need two men from Homicide. We're going to stake out that courthouse. I want a careful surveillance on limousines that pull up. I'll be going along. I'm bringing Schiller's wife and boy with me. Oh, you uh, will allow Jimmy to come along, won't you? We'll see that he's kept out of danger. Of course, Lieutenant. Oh, I don't mind danger. If I can help find my daddy. Oh, Jimmy. Oh, good morning, Agatha. Good morning. There was hammering and pounding near my room this morning, Kane. Yes, we're building a new cell. A new cell? There's another court case today. Murder one. I don't want to hear about it. You can't shut out the world, Agatha. And please, get that dog of yours off the chair. I've told him over and over. I'll get him, Kane. You hurt him when you pick him up. He's so tiny. I hate small things. Small minds, small people. Take him out. And come right back. We'll be leaving for the courthouse as soon as Ludwig brings the limousine out front. Oh, I can't go today. There's a flower show at the Civic Auditorium. Mrs. Eustace is picking me up this afternoon. You've asked her to come here? Oh, I, I won't invite her in. I'll be ready when she arrives. Oh, Kane, when is all this going to stop? You loved Grandfather, Agatha. You know what he stood for. You know how I've worked and planned and dedicated my life. We won't stop. We'll never stop as long as there's breath left in me. Why do you do this to me? I don't like losing my temper. You know I don't. Ah, Ludwig's ready. Since you are going to be home, feed the prisoners. Prisoners? Oh, I, I, I don't know where they are. You know where they are, Agatha. I've seen you sneaking around, watching Ludwig and me go up the narrow stone steps of the gatehouse. But the keys, I, I don't know where you keep... You don't need keys. You'll find the trays in the kitchen. Fill them. Slide one under each cell. I'll expect it to be done when I return. Uh, yes, Kane. Well, I must hurry off to the courthouse. When a man's life is at stake, one must be fair. <laughs> That's the courthouse, Jimmy. Over there, across the street. Oh, gee, it's a big place. And there's so many people. Oh, just looking for one, Jimmy, the chauffeur, the man who took your daddy away. Do you think you can recognize him from here? Well, I'll try, Mom. Good, Jimmy. Now, we'll just sit here in the car and wait. This is a special murder trial. I think our suspect will be here. Now, you understand, Mrs. Schiller, I'm... I'm not making any predictions. We understand, Sergeant. The way things have been going, this may be our only chance. Mr. Schiller? Mr. Schiller? Uh, yes? Yes, who, who is that? I have brought you some food, Mr. Schiller. Miss Agatha, what are you, what are you doing Kane here? Kane left the house. He asked me to feed the... 
Uh, prisoners, I'll just slip your tray under the cell door. There. Can you reach it? Yes, but... Good. Then I'll just move on and... No, 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 wait. Wait, I must talk to you. No, I can't. I have the others to feed. I left my little dog downstairs. I told him, stay. But he never listens. Oh, see, there he comes. Oh, he's so naughty. Chin, chin, I told you not to follow me up here. Cain would be so angry if he knew. Oh, dear. He's crawled under your cell door, Mr. Schiller. He's going after your food. Oh, do grab him quickly, Mr. Schiller, please. Ah, that's it. Ah, thank you. I'll take him now. Oh, no. Oh, no, you can't do that, Miss Agatha. Oh, what? Now we're both prisoners here. Your dog and I. Both prisoners? Until you get the keys. Oh, Mr. Schiller, there's no need to do that. You see, you can just pass Chin Chin through the bars. He's all fluff. He'll pass through easily. Oh, Mr. Schiller, you're hurting him. May I have my little dog, please? Yes, yes, Miss Agatha. <sighs> Thank you. As soon as you get the keys. Well, I can't do that. You're Kane's prisoner. And your dog is my prisoner. Oh, please, give me my dog. He never did anything to you. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. But look around you. Look what your brother did to me and the others. Locked us in these stinking cells to satisfy his insanity. Mr. Schiller, you must understand. My brother is not insane. The reason he does what he does... But there's no is... time for that. Now, either you get those keys, or I'll snap this <gasps> little dog's neck. No, no, you, you wouldn't do that. I swear to you, no. I'll oh. kill him this no, instant please, unless you do as but I say. I don't know anything about the keys. Find them. Oh, please, Mr. Schiller, give me my dog. The keys, Miss Agatha. I'm running out of patience. Get the keys. <laughs> Yes, the mind of man is a fragile thing. There is little doubt that Charles Schiller has reached the breaking point. It has been said that desperate men are capable of desperate deeds. Will the frightened Miss Agatha find the courage to release her brother's prisoner in exchange for the life of her dog? I'll return shortly with Act Three. gone by since the arrival of the police stakeout at the courthouse entrance. Sergeant Steiner has been in constant touch with the unmarked cars he has strategically placed around the building. Sitting with him are Karen and Jimmy, who has been keeping a close watch on various limousines that have come and gone. So far, nothing. Steiner's face is grim. He has little hope to hold out to the anxious wife and child whose world has been darkened by the strange disappearance of Charles Schiller. I've just checked with Units 2 and 4. They've got the rear entrance under surveillance. No sign of a limousine or chauffeur back there. Well, we're doing what we can, but... I understand, Sergeant. But our real hope is Jimmy here. He, he saw the man before. He's the only one who can make a positive identification. Well... Anything new, Jimmy? He did see someone a little while ago that he thought could be the man. One of one of the chauffeurs waiting there across the street. Yeah, you were busy talking on the radio. Well, you should have cut in. Where? Which one? Well, he's gone now. No, wait. Huh? There he is over there at that big black car. The limousine? Yeah, he's helping that big fat man get into the back seat. Are you sure that's the man you saw from the treehouse? Well, I wasn't before, but, but I am now. You see how he bends over kind of stiff when he opens the door? Uh-huh. Well, that's how the man bent over when he helped Dad into the car at our house. Well, that's good enough for me. The car's starting up. They're going to leave. Well, let's hurry up and capture him. No, no, Jimmy. We're not going to capture him. Why not? We're going to follow him. He's the only link we have to your dad. Control one. To all stakeout units. Limousine. License number GNC918. Pulling away from curb in front of courthouse. Suspect at wheel. 
Heading east on third. Taylor. He's turning, sir. Heading for your grid, Unit 4. Pick up as he passes. Units 2 and 5. Follow on parallel course. Move it. 10 4. Miss Agatha? Miss Agatha! Uh, I'm here, Mr. Shipper. I'm looking for the key. Uh, well, keep looking. <laughs> oh, you, you, you shut up. I'm not going to hurt you. I just want to get out of this madhouse. <laughs> Miss Agatha! Oh, wait. Wait. Here they are. I found them. See? I found the keys. They were back there in this small storage room. You can have them. All of them. Oh, just give me my dog. No, no, not so fast. Try them in the lock first. Uh, all right. All right. But please, be careful. Chin Chin is so delicate. The lock, Miss Agatha. I'm trying, Mr. Schiller. But there are so many. They're all rusty. And most of them are too big. Oh, it's gone. Try, try that one. I, There's no rust on it at all. Oh, it, oh, it fits. Hurry. Oh. Now, you're sure it's right for me to do this? My brother will be back any minute. Damn and... your brother. Do you want your dog handed to you in one piece or don't you? Oh, oh, oh yes, yes. Now, please, don't hurt him. I, I'll do just as you say. There. You're free, Mr. Schiller. Thank the Lord. Now, release my dog. Here, take him. Careful. Don't drop him, Mr. Schiller. Oh, now look what you've done. He's getting away. Chin Chin, you come back here this instant. This very oh, instant. Forget about him. I've got to get out of here. Which way do I go? Oh, here, Chin Chin. Good little Chin Chin. Miss Agatha, wait. I can't. I'd better find poor Chin Chin right away. Oh, it's so easy to get lost in this endless maze of horror. Oh, damn you, Miss Agatha. Come back. Come back. I don't think we lost them. No, Mrs. Schiller, they're up ahead. Unit 4 is keeping them in sight. Uh, control to Unit 4. Control to Unit 4. I've got him. Suspect turning off onto the old Belmont Road, heading for private driveway. All units, all units, converge on driveway. Do not use sirens. We'll wait for you there. 10-4. Why are we stopping? I don't want to get too close. Well, we'll lose them. They just turned into the driveway. Can't we follow them? I'm afraid not, Jimmy. The driveway and that old estate back there is private property. Private property? But my husband may be there. We can't go any farther without a warrant. What's that? Permission, Jimmy, oh. to search the place. The other car should be along any minute. You flag them down, son. I'll take care of the red tape. Control one to central. Control one to central. Request for search warrant. Private residence. 1143. 1143 Belmont Road. Residence name unknown. Try through vehicle registration. License number GNC 918. Repeat. GNC 918. Agatha, will you please stop blubbering like a child and tell me what's happened? Well, it was just a few minutes ago, Kane. I'm sure you and Ludwig can find him and bring him back. Find who? Bring who back? Mr. Schiller. Schiller? <laughs> well, he he forced me to let him out of his cell. He what? Well, you see, he had Chin Chin. He said he would break the poor little dog's neck if I didn't get the keys. You so gave I... him the keys? Well, I, I opened his door... Then left them in the lock. I had to go after Chin Chin. Ludwig, and... quickly. The cells. I'll get the rifle. You fool, Agatha, you fool. Oh, fool. Sorry, Kane. I know I shouldn't have. The cells, Agatha. Where does Ludwig keep the shotgun shells? Uh, no, no, Kane. Put away the gun. Disobedience must be met with force. Justice, Agatha. Justice. Justice? I have seen your prison cells, Kane. Those poor, unfortunate men living like caged animals. You call that justice? No, get out of my way. Those men must not escape. Too late, Kane. Schiller, I've already released them. Do you realize what you've done? Those men are half-crazed. 
I suggest we all stay here. It's a lot safer than out there. I've warned you, brother. Stop before it is too late. I must stop them. I must. Oh! All right, everybody. The other prisoners are here. Run, Miss Anna. Run. Stop. All of you. You're breaking the law. I'll not stand for a breach of justice. Those noises we heard, Sergeant, I'm sure they're coming from the house. Sounds like a Mrs. Shatter. There's a shotgun blast. There's trouble up ahead. It sounds like it's moving this way. No need to wait for that warrant now. All right, move up, men. That gunfire is coming from the left. Rodriguez, Gordon, cover me. I'm going in. Mr. Schiller, you'd better wait back here with Jimmy. And keep down, out of range. We will, Sergeant. This way. Uh, Miss Agatha, uh, keep running. Uh, I can see the road uh, from here. I'm trying, Mr. Schiller. I don't know what got into my brother. He's never been a violent man. Oh, he's still out there uh, somewhere, uh, firing uh, wildly at anything uh, that moves. Oh, those men. Do, do you think he, he killed them? Look, there's no time uh, to think about anything uh, now. Just, just keep running. Uh, I can't. I I just can't go on any farther. It's all right, Miss Agatha. Uh, Look! Uh, Look up ahead! Uh, Uniformed men! Uh, it's the police! Hold your fire, men! There's someone up ahead! It looks like. Yeah, it is. It's Charles Schiller! Oh, thank God you found us. We couldn't have gone much further. You are Charles Schiller? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And this is Miss Agatha Kane. Yes. Her brother Matthew is back there, armed with a shotgun. You know, you better come with me. You'll both be safer back there on the road. Get away from that man! Kane! He's an escaped prisoner. I'll shoot the first man who touches him. Careful. He's deranged. He's been holding chained men captive at the house. Put down that shotgun, Mr. Kane. I am in charge here. Tell your men to back off. I'm warning you, sir, for the last time. Schiller, hands on your head. We're returning to the cell. It's no use, Kane. It's all over. If you pull that trigger, you'll be murdering an innocent man. I was innocent, Kane. They were all innocent. That's a lie. I judged you all fairly. I see now I was too lenient with my sentence. Now that you dare defy me, I change my verdict. Your sentence is no longer life. It's death. Shut up, look out! Oh! Oh! Gain! Oh! Gain! Oh! Oh! My. My poor brother. Oh! You've shot him! Oh! Sorry, ma'am. I, oh! I had no choice. Oh! Uh, yes, uh... yes Gain. I'm here. I. I was only trying. I know, Gain. I tried to warn you to stop before it was too late. Oh, you're too easy on them. Okay. Too quick to forgive. The people, the jurors, they're all like you. <coughs> Someone has to uphold the rightness of things. He's... He's gone. Cain. Oh, Cain. He put me through hell, Sergeant. <laughs> but you know something? I can't help feeling what he did was partly our fault. Our fault? Yes. Crazy as it may sound, there is some logic to his madness. <laughs> Matthew Kane is no longer with us. I, for one, am saddened by his untimely death. I was beginning to like him. I always did admire a man who is dedicated to his work. And talking about a man who is dedicated to his work, listen. We didn't frighten you with our story tonight. It's true, Matthew Kane was a psychopath. And he did have quite a successful prison franchise operating on his dark and dismal estate. But fortunately, Sergeant Steiner arrived on the scene in time to stop him from opening branch offices all over the country. So, dear listeners, you all will be safe in your beds. 
until I return. Our cast included Alan Hewitt, Jordan Sharney, Augusta Dabney, Evie Juster, and Jim Dukas. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Marshall. It's pleasant out with the moon riding high, bright enough almost to read by. The very opposite of the night that Julie Connor's story begins for us. A black and lowering night, the atmosphere heavy with the promise of rain. Dark. The dark, not being able to see only to imagine what surrounds us. For some, it is peopled with presences, things, and unimaginable horrors. Why? That's what our story is about. It begins as we listen to Julie move and moan in her sleep. Our mystery drama, The Dark Closet, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Fred Gwynn. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sign Off, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. For the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. No American kid of my generation escaped the dire prediction of little orphan Annie, for whom James Whitcomb Riley had begun his poem prophetically with the words, came to our house to stay. I know for me she did. I can still remember the little boy who went to bed, and when they turned the covers down, he wasn't there at all. Or the little girl who says, two great big black things are standing by her side who snatched her through the ceiling, for she knowed what she's about. For the goblins will get you if you don't. Watch out. I wonder what goblin holds Julie Connors in his thrall. Help me! Oh, help! Julie! What is it? The light, Pop. Put it on. The light, please. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Why didn't you turn on the light by the bed? Uh, Did you have to break that lamp? I didn't mean to. I was just so scared I reached out to turn it on and knocked it over by accident. That was one of your mother's favorites. Pop, don't blame me too much. Someone turned it off. Someone meaning me. (laughs) I told you time and time again, Julie. Waste not, want not. I looked in here when I got home and you were sound asleep. Lamp still lit. I only keep it that way this time of year when it gets dark so early. Just till I know you're home. Huh? Why? What are you afraid of? And you, you don't have to go to bed so early. I got nothing else to do. Oh. We're in town. You've got the television. I'm tired of that old tube living other people's lives. I want to live my own. Yeah, time enough for that. I'm 17, going on 18. All the more reason you don't need lights on when you're sleeping. And stop having those nightmares. I reckon that's what it was again. Huh? No one of them? Yes. I... What? Doesn't matter. Huh? Then I'll say it for you. The boogeyman again, I suppose. <laughs> I swear, I don't know what I'm going to do with you, child. Child! That's the trouble. That's what you ain't anymore. Except in half the time you act like it was one. 
Maybe it would help, Pop. If you stopped going to treat me like one. You think you're not? I'm in my last year of high school. And I've been keeping house for you ever since, Mama. No, I... We won't talk about your mother. Okay, Pop. All I meant to say was, if you can trust me to take care of the house, well, you could trust me to take care of myself. You work a four to midnight shift, I... I get lonely here nights. I could date, except... I don't want you dating when I'm not around to meet the kind of guy you're going with. Not these days. The riffraff that's abroad. <laughs> because maybe a guy has long hair and wears old jeans should make so much difference. On the farm, all we wore was jeans. No, I just don't want to see you running around with trash. You was always a rebel, Julie. Don't try to be one here in the city. Think of... Uh, think of your ma. That's the way you ought to turn out. Can't you ever forget, Ma? What? I mean, try to hide her away in the back of your mind. Like we all have to. And just think of today. I can... I can never shut your mother away. I just wish you could learn to live like it. Make your peace with the world. Then maybe you could shut out these dreams that hurt you. Yeah, yeah, and hurt me too. Maybe if I just had a little more freedom. In a couple of months, you'll be 18. I have no control over you then. But until you reach that birthday, I will not let you run wild like all the other kids. I promised your mother that before she died. Why don't you trust me, Pop? Leave me to make my own decisions. I can't. I promised Mary. She wanted only the best for you. She isn't here to find it for me anymore. Let me do my own finding. No, by heaven. I give my word, I keep it. Tim Sadler's asked me for a date tomorrow night. Yeah? I don't hear good things about him. You mean I can't go? I mean you better not. I have six months left to bring you to your mother's image. I will do everything I can to make you that. But about your dream... Forget it. It doesn't matter anymore. I was just being a child, and I know it. I can see that it's time for me to grow up. Good night, Pop. You need your sleep. Me too. Yeah. You sure you're okay? Don't worry about me. Sweet dreams. Yeah, well, I mean, left for me. <laughs> I just wish I could make sure that a whole lifetime I'm ahead for you. Well, I'll turn off the light. No, I, I mean, I, I'll get it. I, I have I have to go to the bathroom. All right, then. Pop. Huh? I love you. Sure. I... <laughs> you know how I try to feel, Julie. It's just since Mary, I... Yeah, there isn't much to give. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Even when she was alive, there wasn't much for you to give. Oh, God. Will the daylight never come? <laughs> hey, you look pretty freaked out there, my old lady. Thanks for the lift, and I'm not your old lady. Oh, these last few weeks, uh, I thought we were finally going to begin to make it. Oh, Tim, it's not you, it's... Uh, I know. Your father. No. No, not that so much. Something else. Well, what? Oh, something I can't explain. Maybe you ought to dump me. I'm not any good for you. Well, you have been stringing me along there. What's got you down? Sneaking out with me night spying your old dodo's back? I don't like it, but what other way is there? Still expect you to sit home and knit or something, huh? What's the way he was brought up? And Mom, they were fine people. Your mother's been dead for uh, six years, hasn't she? Yeah, that's a big hang-up, really. Pop goes overboard about trying to, you know, protect me like he thinks Mom would have. Oh, forget it. Look, we still got a date for tonight, right? Oh, sure. I even tried to tell Pop about going out with you when he came home. When he blew a gasket, I let it go. I didn't want to upset him. Upset him? He's got out of style, baby. He belongs to a wax museum. You should take a good look at yourself in the mirror. You got circles under your eyes like some old uh, broader 30. I told you, that isn't Pop. It's... It's just this crazy nightmare I have all the time. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. Listen, I tell you what. You're going to get a good sleep tonight. Old Doc Tim is going to guarantee it. Oh, how? I'm going to borrow us some wheels and take a little booze and you're going to take a couple of belts. See, what you need is to relax. Maybe you're right, Tim. I'm so uptight, I... You know something? 
last few weeks, I... <laughs> I'm really afraid I'm going to flip my lid. <laughs> well, tonight we're going to do better than that. You're going to blow your mind. Gee, where'd you get a car like this? Testo, presto, jingo, bingo, marvel the magician. I wave my magic wand and pow! Well, you've been drinking. <laughs> How could you tell? Hey, open the glove compartment. Oh, this a liquor. Where'd you get that? It's all in the family, kiddo. Where my old man puts it down, he'll never miss one bottle uh, here or there. And the car's my Uncle Joe's. Go ahead. Take the bottle out. But I don't want any. You shouldn't have any more. Oh, come on. I'm just putting you on. I only had one little drink. And as I remember, you promised you were going to join me. Okay. Why not? Right out of the bottle? I got no glasses. Okay. Here it goes. Hey, it's almost empty. Did you... No, no, no. I didn't dare sneak a full bottle. Go ahead. Come on. Kill it. No. I just want a small sip. Where are we going? <laughs> Starland. Live it up big. All the rides, the games, the disco. Fine liquor, Starland. What are you going to use for money? That is no problem. What are we slowing down for? There's a liquor store up ahead of you. Oh, why don't we forget it? I, I, I don't want any more. Baby, baby. Don't you remember tonight's the night we're going to open up your skull and let all those little men out? You just keep a run. I'll be right back. The street is so deserted. Oh, yeah. Turn on the radio. Keep your company. Okay. <gasps> Those are shot. They sounded like... Joey. Oh, my... Joey. Tim. Joey. Tim. Help me. Hey, Tim, what happened? What's Hold happened? me. Hold me. I can't stand. Yeah. You gotta get here. to the clock. Come here. All right, I've got you. Tim, let the gun. <sighs> You got a gun, tell me that. What are you doing with a gun? That's a gun. Oh, Tim. Oh, Tim, can you hear me? Oh, oh that's a gun. Give me the gun. Tim, how can I kill Okay, it? sister, oh, I just dropped your gun. It isn't mine, I'll... Drop it. I... Okay, Jake, get inside the liquor store and see what happened. I'll handle this end of it. I'll put your hand behind your back. But, officer, I... I do... do you want your sidekick here to bleed to death now behind the back? All right. Oh, no. I'm no, sorry. Please don't. I'm sorry. You play rough games. You've got to take what comes with them. Now, come on. Over to the car. I've got a radio emergency for an ambulance. Well, Dr. Sarah Browning, what are you doing here this time of night? Well, I'll tell you, Reverend Samuel Pryor. I've been called in as a special consultant on the shooting case that was brought in. Oh, you mean the boy killed the liquor shop owner? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, he doesn't need a psychiatrist, Sally. He's more apt to need me. They've had him in OR two and a half hours already. He's not my patient. The little girl who was with him. Yeah, well, they took her back to the station house for questioning. And to lock her up. Mm, only she didn't stay locked up. There's a Sergeant Lawrence on the way back here with her. Oh, oh I guess they're here go. now. Miss Connors, just you calm down now. If you'll only talk quiet. I'm not saying anything. It's just, oh, you're not going to lock me up again. This time I will bust my head wide open. I won't let him get me. Of course we won't let him get you, whoever he is, Julie. This is a hospital. You're perfectly safe. Now, aren't you being foolish? How do you know me? Who are you? I've been expecting you. I'm Dr. Browning. Oh, sure. The head doctor. Well, don't figure I'm putting me in any padded cell. Because if you do, you'll see the biggest wingding yet. No padded cell, no keys. You'll have to be confined to your room, but you don't have to close the door. And there are two big windows. All right. Honest. Well, then what? It's late. I want you to get undressed and get into bed. Then I'll give you something to help you sleep. And while we're waiting for it to work, we'll talk a little. Nurse, will you show Miss Connors to her room? Miss... Do I have to have these? Sergeant, does she have to be handcuffed? Uh, no, if you don't think she needs them now, Doctor. No, I don't. Okay. Oh, oh thank you, Doctor. You go with the nurse and the sergeant. I'll be up in a moment. I will. For you. Well, looks like you just made a friend. Yes, and I need you, Sam. 
Could we go to my office for a moment or two? Something's haunting that child. Something beyond tonight. You talked to her earlier. Maybe you can give me a clue to who her private boogeyman is. It's so easy for all of us, no matter how sure we think we are, to panic at what we don't understand. Terrors and strange noises that come to us from the dark outside. But when the nameless fright wells up from inside, creating our own boogeyman, call it what you want, then we are truly possessed. And the only last hope is to exorcise the unnamed thing within us. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Exorcism is a convenient, old-fashioned word. It conjures pictures of the damned or possessed writhing under the influence of some foul demon. It once was the sole province of the religious and even in modern terms, still is. But it is well established by now that the psychiatrist is equally important, and church and medicine work as partners, like the Reverend Sam Pryor and Dr. Sarah Browning. So the police want a psychiatric evaluation of Julie Connors. They were holding her for bail and locked her in a cell, and she went berserk. Did you see the bruises on her forehead? I did. Claustrophobia? Apparently. But that's for later. The point is that even if it is bona fide, it's only a symptom, not a disease. What worries me is less the girl than the father. Oh, what's the matter with Mr. Connors? What kind of father abandons a 17-year-old girl who's never been in in any real trouble to face Mm. jail before she's been found guilty? Well, she's a suspected accomplice in the murder of a liquor store holdup, or even the murder. Sam... Can you honestly believe that child could handle a heavy gun like the one that was used? There's no way of proving that until the boy she was with comes to. If he ever does. That bad, Sam? Um, he's young, but not so good, Sally. Uh, what was the bond on the girl? The police don't really suspect her as a principal. Only a few thousand. Mm. Except that her father refused to post it. Well, maybe he can't afford it. He can. I called him this morning. He refused to talk to me. Do you seriously imagine that my winning personality might succeed where yours failed, uh, doctor? You might apply a little occupational leverage. The father is a deacon at the Plainview's church. Oh. Of which the minister happens to be a close friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Sam. Hmm? I can't judge the girl without knowing something about her background, her history, her life. There isn't time for deep analysis. Her father is the only one who can tell me quickly. Oh, no mother or relatives? No mother, no relatives close enough to be of value. I know it's an imposition. (sighs) Well, not when you ask me, Sally. You give me the address and I'll go and beard your lion in his den. (laughs) Hello, Julie. Oh, it's you, Doctor. How's Tim? He's still in the recovery room. How are you? I don't know. I promised you a view from a window. Is it all right? Ever since the sun came up. Trees and shrubs. Flowers. And green rolling out as far as you can see. Just like the farm was. The farm? Where I grew up. Before we moved to the city. About a thousand years ago. Or maybe five thousand. Okay, Doc. What do we start with? The lie detector? Don't fight me, Julie. I'm on your side. Do me a favor. I guess I owe you one, getting those handcuffs off of me. So I'll trade. Just tell me the truth. About everything. Good, bad, and different. Just all the truth. That's what I'm after. You don't ask for much, huh? (laughs) When I was a little girl, my father used to say to me, Sally? Sally? Well, my name's really Sarah, but I always hated it, so I got to be called Sally. Anyway, Pop... Oh, that's what I call my father. (laughs) Anyway, Pop always said to me, Don't do a power of wishing, Sally, because the Lord's too busy to come through for everyone. 
But if you do wish, always wish big. So that's how it is with you and me, Julie. I'm wishing big. You'll tell me everything. Gee, Dot. Oh, what's the difference? What have I got to lose? So Tim was just like any other boy. I had to bust out of home for some kick some of the time. But you've known him for a while. Well, sure. We were in the same class at school. You weren't surprised when he picked you up in a car this time? Sure I was. Especially when he said we were heading to Starland Park. You know, the rides and all. And he wanted to go to the discotheque. I just didn't feel right. He never had money like that before. But you went. Yeah, I went. I was ready to go anywhere that night. I thought. I even had a drink. And I don't usually because it, it, it makes me feel kind of dizzy. But I thought it might chase away the, the guy that follows me. Go on. Tim had an almost empty bottle. He gave me a drink and... And he said he wanted to stop and get more. Tell me about the man you say follows you. I don't want to talk about that. Then don't. Tell me more about what happened. Well, we stopped at this liquor store, and Tim left me in the car. He told me to turn on the radio. I heard him throw away the empty because it broke and smashed in the street. I didn't like that. Why? Well, things should be tidy and neat. Mom always... Well, I, I was listening to the radio. And then, and these two noises, I just couldn't believe they were shots. When Tim came out, he was all bleeding. He could hardly stand up, and then, I don't know, the police came, and the ambulance, they took Tim away to the hospital, and he needed a station house. And booked you as an accessory. Yes. Do you know the charges? Well... Robbery and... Uh, you didn't know Tim was driving a stolen car. No. He said it was his uncle's and he lent it to him. Why are you asking me all these questions? Well, some of them I'm asking because I felt you'd rather have me do it than the police. Well, why doesn't Tim tell him the truth? Julie, dear, Tim is still unconscious. He can't talk. And Tim isn't my interest. You are. Tell me more about the police station. Oh, I don't know. Things took forever. They came, took my fingerprints, and then uh, they put me in a cell and uh, locked the door. Yes? Well, they turned out the light. I tried to tell them not to because my pop was coming. I asked them to call him. They just didn't pay any attention, and suddenly the wall, he was there. I knew he was going to get me. I just screamed and screamed. The police lady came. I told her to get my pop to get me out of there. And what did she say? She said he'd been there. And he wasn't going to let me out. And I have to spend the whole night. That's when I went bananas. I beat my head against the wall in the bar. And I don't know. Everything just went black. And when you woke up? They were bringing me in here to the hospital. I met you. All right, Julie. Just a few more questions. Sit on the bed. Okay, dear? Okay. Why don't you just lie back? That's right. Look, I know you've been through a bad time. A jail would scare the daylights out of me. But why would it drive you up the wall the way it did? Because it was just like... Like when I was a kid. And I'll... To punish you? Yes. Who? Who what? Who locked you up? My... My mother. And inside in the dark you were terrified? I always thought I'd choke. There wasn't any light. You couldn't see. The walls. You could just feel them. You could feel them moving in. I closed my eyes. I always hoped my own private dark wouldn't be as scary as the other. And the other would come. The other? First, first I could hear his breathing. 
Oh, his voice. Oh, terrible whistling sound. But how did you know that this this boogeyman wouldn't get you? Oh, I always knew Pop would come to set me free. And he always did. That's right, except this time. Oh, how could he do that to me? How could he leave me shut up when he loves me? Just the way I love him. How could he let me be there alone to be swallowed up by the dark forever? I, I, all right, all right, Julie. Um, it's going to be all right. Don't worry, we're going to get you all straightened out. Oh, Oh, don't you cry. I'm so afraid. We're all afraid, Julie, of so many things. If I asked you to call me Sally, as I called you Julie, would that make it easier? Oh, you're so kind. I, I do trust you. Whatever you say, but I just want my pop. I know you do. Sally, please, don't let him walk away from me. If he did, I, I couldn't live. You don't think you really will, do you? And Dr. Brownie isn't back in her office, but uh, she should be shortly. We can wait for her there. I don't know why I was talking into this, except that you and my past are good friends, Reverend Pye. Uh, a friend in need. Yeah? What does that mean? Well, something we all need on particular occasions, but uh, really all the time. Yes, this is Dr. Browning's office. <laughs> I can't imagine going to a woman psychiatrist. Well, neither can I. Huh? Why? Why, because you're a minister? Uh, no, no, because I don't need one, and uh, my collar, you must remember, makes sex immaterial. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Hey, whatever criminal aspects this case involves can scarcely touch your daughter. She was, by all evidence, she was an innocent bystander, except for the impetus that, well, drove her out of an empty house and involved her. What are you trying to say? I I'm not trying. You see, I've discussed this case with Dr. Browning, and we are both in agreement. Your daughter is possessed by uh, a malignant spirit, something beyond her comprehension or ability to handle, which has driven her into a, a horrendous situation. One innocent man's death and another possible one. See, the young man was the instrument of the first. But where does your daughter's guilt lie? Or has she any real guilt at all to bear on those young shaken shoulders? <laughs> up of a liquor store goes wrong. The owner is shot to death. A boy is the apparent murderer. A girl with him, a possible accomplice. What peculiar twist of fate put her there? What punishment or resolution should come from the circumstances? We will leave you to judge that after I return shortly with the third act. This is a story which wanders the fields of modern psychiatry and tries to plumb the depths of subjective terror grown from within rather than impressed from without. So we return to a minister who faces an anguished father and a history still buried in the shadows of the past. I don't know why I let myself get talked into this, Reverend. For your daughter's sake. Yeah, I told you. I'm through with her. Miss Connors, you cannot abandon your child. She's only been arrested, not sentenced. She hasn't been proven guilty. She was in a stolen car with a boy who had a record. Oh? Well, I don't know that. So isn't it just possible that Julie didn't either? Ah, oh, forget it. She, she'd lie to anyone and try and take him in. But this time she didn't get away with it. Except she managed to fake her way out of jail. I mean, why are you so bitter against her? I'm not bitter. Are you sure? And Dr. Browning doesn't think she's faking. She thinks Julie has real claustrophobia. Yeah? What do you mean? Uh, a, a terror of being shut away in a confined or narrow space. <laughs> so that's the story she's trying to sell. 
Well, we all have it, more or less. Now, uh, perhaps your daughter... Ha- I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but I just had a long talk with your daughter, Mr. Connors. I think it's true. Who are you? Oh, uh, this is Dr. Browning, the psychiatrist in charge of your daughter's case. A uh, psychiatrist? That's right. A profession, I gather, may not be too popular with you, Mr. Connors. But I'm going to be important in your life. Uh-huh. I want to be frank, and I don't want to sound arbitrary... But what happens in a few weeks until the trial, as far as Julie is concerned, is almost entirely up to me. <laughs> if you're trying to trick me into posting a bond for her, the answer is no. Let her stay in jail. Learn a lesson for once. That's just what your daughter shouldn't... Well, I'll amend that. Can't do. She's a very insecure and disturbed girl. Uh, am I supposed to be responsible for Julie? Am I to take the blame? I don't like the word blame. Let's say you might be a factor, along with others. What others? Julie's mother, for example. Don't you say one word against Julie's mother. Mary was a saint. From what Julie told me, a different picture could be imagined. Whatever she said was lies. Lies! Possibly. But if she's lying, I'd like to find out why. Now, Mr. Connors, won't you sit down and help me? I'm sorry, Doctor. I have a job to do. I don't see how I can help you. If you'll excuse me, I think I'm superfluous in this discussion. And also, I have work to do. Now, I promised to visit your daughter. Can I tell her you'll be up to see her, Mr. Connors? No. You can tell her I never want to see her again. Well, that's a message you'll have to convey by yourself. Excuse me. Uh, Reverend Pryor, is this intensive care? Uh, yes, I want to ask about Tim Sadler, the boy who was shot in the holdup. Ah, oh, I see. Well, if there's any change, I'll be on 450. Would you notify me, please, immediately? Yeah, thank you. Hello, Miss Connors. Hi. Oh, excuse me, Reverend. Well, for what? Well, you're a minister and all... I didn't mean to be rude. I I don't want to answer any more questions. Oh, who does? So we'll avoid them. Uh, leading ones, anyway. Ooh, it's a pretty nice view out of that window. Reminds me of the farm I was... Uh, well, where I grew up. You like being out there? Better in the city. Mm-hmm. At least Pop was happy out there. Nice. Well, he still seems pretty nice. He's here in the hospital. Talking to the shrink. The shrink? You know, Dr. Browning? Uh-huh. But he won't come and see me. You don't have to tell me, I know. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Don't give up hope, Julie. Oh, I gave it up soon after Mother died. When I got old enough to realize he never wanted me. I could never take her place. I ought to have died, too. Never been able to admit it. He hates me for being alive instead of her. Only why can't I even it up and hate him back? And I don't mean to pry, but you did love your wife very much, Mr. Connors. My life began and ended with her. She returned that love. Oh, yeah. Mary loved me. Is that why she resented it when Julie arrived? Um, Mary resent Julie? She loved her. And you? Of course. (laughs) Who doesn't want kids? Oh, sure, on a farm, maybe I was kind of disappointed it wasn't a boy. Farming needs a boy more than girls, but that was only at first. At first? Well, there was things went wrong. We weren't to have any more kids. That was the Lord's will. Then, after all the years we tried and found God set against us, uh, Julie was growing up and a bad streak was showing through. I told Mary she was too soft on her. What bad streak? The things she'd do. When she was eight, she climbed that big old maple behind the house and got treated like a cat. We had to get the county hook and ladder from the fire department to fetch her down. And then one summer she fooled us all. She was drowned in the river. And by the time she was ten, she ran away from home regular. Not so far she couldn't be found. Then at twelve, I swear I couldn't blame them. The boys came swarming around. i uh, tell you the truth, she was lovable and damnable to handle, Doc. And your wife tried to punish her somehow, or at least control her, so she took to locking her in the closet? Who told you that? Why, Julie. 
That was what she said? Yes. Damn. If now you don't see what a liar she is. Someone ought to punish her. Now, I was the one who locked her in the closet. Oh, I see. But you were always the one who came back to let her out. Up till now, Doctor. But I'm not bailing out anymore. As a father or a bailiff. This time she brought her whole problem. And she can stay in the closet for good. Mr. Connors, I want you to listen to me. No, ma'am. You can take up for Julie all you want, but you ain't going to change my mind. I'm not taking up for Julie. I'm taking up for both of you. Huh? And I'll thank you not to call me ma'am. I am doctor. Dr. Sarah Browning and a specialist in human relationships. Two minutes is all I ask. Yeah. Two minutes. Well, a reasonable time. No. <laughs> no. That isn't what I mean. It's just... That's what Mary always used to say to me when she wanted something good for us. I, I reckon I'll give you your two minutes, Doctor. For what? To try to get you to look at your lives clearly, yours and Julie's. To give you what you need, Mr. Connors. Love. I had that and lost it. Your wife's, but not your daughter's. Julie don't love me. Not like... Not... Not the way... You couldn't be more wrong. All her life she was set against me, trying to bedevil me, show me her own way, fight me. Because all her life you couldn't give her what she really wanted, a father's love. Try to see it from her point of view, Mr. Connors. She was a child who grew up in a house where her parents loved each other so much she felt excluded. An only child with nowhere else to reach for love. But Mary loved her. Well, of course, a girl takes her mother's love for granted. Except that she so often thinks of her as a rival for her father's affections. How much love did you offer her? Did she ever find from you? I was a farmer. I was up from dawn till sundown. Then there were still chores. Nights I was so tired of... Well, I never had much time for her. Exactly. And there was always the thought that had Julie been a boy, she could have worked with you, taken some of those chores off your shoulders... Been more of a companion. Listen here, don't make me out no ogre. Maybe some of the things you say are true, but Julie didn't have to act up the way she did. That's just the point. Of course she did. She was trying to win your love the only way she could. Or at least attention. She climbs a tree, pretends to drown, runs away from home. Anything to get you to come and rescue her. Even the punishment was worth it. The agony of the dark closet. Because she knows you'll be the one to come and save her. I ain't proud of that. Oh, we're human. We do what we do. But have you any idea what that child suffered for your love? What do you mean? Claustrophobia is the most common fear people have. Have you ever been locked up in the dark, Mr. Connors? Mm -hmm. Ever since my wife died, I shut myself in a closet. <laughs> I hide in it because I don't want to wake up and open the door to life again. I had such love that... You could have it again, a different way, from Julie. No, she doesn't love me. She, she hates me. She wants to love you. Do you want to love her? I don't know. Ms. Now, don't throw it away. I've talked to her, Mr. Connors. Do you know about the boogeyman? Oh, that childish nonsense. Yes, childish, perhaps, but not nonsense. Imagine, just shut your eyes and try to think back to your kid years. Thrust into inky blackness, the key turned, no escape, the gradual feeling that the air was getting too thick to breathe, above all, the dark, and the fear that you were locked in a coffin. And then, from somewhere, some fairy tale or ghost story, you begin to hear a voice. You know how wrong I was. Don't you see? No matter what she says, I know she hates me. But she doesn't. In spite of everything, you couldn't be better loved, and I can prove it to you. How? Whose voice do you think it was she heard? 
Because she wasn't a boy, but just a little girl. Because she felt unwanted. Whose voice, Mr. Connors? Oh. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Yours. God forgive me. He will. And Julie. It isn't too late. All her rebellion, everything she's ever done, even last night, if she has any guilt in what happened, has been a cry for your love. Can't you offer it to her at last? Pop. Julie. I... I thought you'd... I never thought you'd come. Well, about time. I didn't rob anybody, Pop. Honest, I didn't. I had no idea... It doesn't matter, hon. All, all I know is you're released from the hospital and you're getting dressed. And you and me are going to the police station to post that bond. And then we're going home. And no matter what happens, I'm going to fight to keep you there. Oh, Pop. Pop, I don't know what to say. No, no, no do I much. It ain't going to be easy. So many years to make up for. You could just one way. With one move. What? Could you... Could you just hold out your arms? Julie. Julie, my little girl. Oh, Pop. All my life. Just this. It's all I ever wanted. have closets in the mind where skeletons rattle and boogeymen breathe heavy in the dark. Thank the Lord for the people who open the doors for us. And pity all those who don't have the doors opened. I'll be back shortly. Julie and Seth Connors made their peace the hard way. Perhaps this time it will stick. At least there won't be any more dark closets. Life is too full of them. And the trick is to find out how to open them. The key is easy to find, of course. It's something very simple. Love. What the real trick is, however, is to be able to give it to the right person. Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Jada Rowland, Christopher Tabori, Francis Sternhagen, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Browns. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice and Anheuser Busch Incorporated Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. Tonight's WOR Mystery Theater was also brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program was furnished by the Columbia Broadcasting System. Your dial is set for news with John Scott, WR New York, and RKO General Station. Stay tuned for Mystery Theater. I'm E.G. Marshall. A gentleman named Frank Richard Stockton, whose name may not be familiar to you, as I must admit it wasn't to me, wrote one of the most famous short stories of all time. It was called The Lady or the Tiger. I mention it only because, in its own curious way, it reminded me of the story that Dr. Felix Brandt is about to reveal. Our mystery drama, The Doppelganger, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Howard Da Silva.
It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. go back to the lady and the tiger, you'll remember, I'm sure, that it was a story of a man who faced two doors. Behind one of them was a famished, raging, man-eating tiger who would devour and destroy. Behind the other was a love goddess, every man's desire. Now, I'm not suggesting that this story has anything to do with that story, except in the matter of choice. Something we do every day, select one alternative or the other. So, let's examine Dr. Felix Brandt's selection and judge him as you may. My name is Felix Brand. I have a doctorate in clinical psychology. I was married, have one daughter. As I've grown older, although it has been a passionate obsession of mine all my life, I've had quite the tendency to devote more time to my avocation than my vocation. Parapsychology. The exploration of the psychic, the world beyond the finite world. A hobby, or obsession, if you will, which led to my unspeakable crime. Worse. Far worse than murder. It was nice of you to meet me at the airport, Dr. Brandt. For reasons deeper than simple courtesy, Hank... I wanted to have a private chat with you about the woman we both love, that daughter of mine. That's why I'm letting you drive, so I can... Well, w- what is it? Is there something, something about Fran? No, not just at this moment. Quickly, Hank. Cut over to the right lane. Fast. Uh, yeah, yes, sir, but what... My God. Do- doctor, if, if you had told me to pull over, that maniac would have hit his head on. There's nothing more we can do, Hank. The police have it. Man. Let's drive on. Yes, sir. The man is dead. I don't know. Probably. He is dead. How do you know? I don't. I only sense it. He didn't want to live. I don't know why. Heart condition, terminal disease, some reason. Well, how, how could you know what kind? Well, how did you know to tell me to pull over so suddenly... As if you knew in advance there was going to be an accident. I'm an old man, Hank. An old man who meddles, perhaps, in too many things outside my province. I've been looking deeper and deeper in parapsychology, and some of the things I've come to believe in rub off. What things, sir? Oh, extrasensory perception, ESP, if you'd rather. Clairvoyance, telepathy, all sorts of psychic phenomena. I'm thinking of abandoning classic psychology and switching over to the other side. Matter of fact, I'm already teaching one course in it. And that's of little interest to a lawyer. Or even my prospective son of law. <laughs> Tell me, what brought you flying down from law school for the weekend? Well, didn't Fran, uh... Or uh, hasn't Fran said anything to you, Doc? About what? I don't know, just, uh... Well, her letters have been very strange lately, and... Not very frequent. I thought something might be wrong. I, I mean, I had a hunch. <laughs> the amateur outflanks the expert. I hope you're wrong. You you have me worried. There's everything in the world to me. If anything ever happened to her... She means as much to me, Dr. Brandt. Now, don't you worry. If anything is wrong between us, we can set it right. It was a relief to have Hank back again. I had been worried about my daughter, Fran, lately. Fran, the picture of her mother, whom I lost too soon. Bright, open, happy, reaching out both hands to the world. Full of love to give and expecting the same in return. And yet I knew, had been trying to conceal from myself, something that was very wrong. Something it took Hank, whom she had loved with all her heart since high school to bring out into the open. Hey, Fran. What you trying to do? Get pneumonia? Oh. 
Hi, Hank. I didn't think you'd be here so soon. I'm, I'm warm enough. Mm-hmm. Huddled out here in the gazebo with snow around and the wind whistling up icicles. I've got my pocket to keep me warm. How about your love? Uh, <laughs> don't I get a welcome kiss, even if it's a cold one? Oh, Hank. Oh, Hank, what am I going to say to you? Well, something a lot more straight from the shoulder than those weaseling letters I've been getting recently. I know. I'm not very proud of myself at the moment, Hank. Hey, you don't have to cut corners with me. There's another guy, right? Hank, please, listen to me and, and, and try to understand. You see, Dad has been teaching his regular survey course in basic psychology, and um, I met this, this this guy there, and I don't know, I, something crazy happened, something I wasn't prepared for or even thought about in my well-ordered life. You fell in love with him? Yes. Which lets me out, hmm? Please don't put it like that, Hank. It's just, it's something so sudden, so overwhelming. I, I don't Hey, even... don't I even get a chance to get up to bat for the ninth inning? It's too late, Hank. I'm going to have his baby. Ooh. Well, that's that's right between the eyes. When's the wedding? I don't know. I just found out about me. I mean, I could cheerfully wring that rabbit's neck. Do your your father know? Not yet. And this guy? I haven't even told him yet. Why not? Well, I. I, I, I just haven't had the chance. I... Okay. So it shouldn't be a total loss, and I don't waste the whole trip down here. We'll make a deal. I'll tell the doc about it, and you pin down your, your dream boy. Uh, what's his name, by the way? I won't tell you that. I, I'm afraid to. I... I do love you, Hank. Oh, why did something else like this turn up? Man... I'm no oracle. It's just what happens to people. Sort of thing that shakes faith and makes you wonder about God. But it's life. It's what we have to live. Come on, let's... Let's both go inside before we freeze to death. I can't believe what you're telling me, Hank. Well, you'd better, Pop. It's true. Pop. No, uh, sorry about that. Just slipped out. That's what I always wanted from Fran and you. And we can't legislate or play God. It's not the way it's going to be. But who's the man? Well, that's Fran's secret. It's her right to keep it that way. There's nothing either of us can do about it. I wouldn't agree with that. You'll give her up so easily? I never owned her. She's her own mistress. But you won't fight for her? Doc, have a heart. What can I do? I can't force her to love and accept me. The best I can do is be a good loser. <laughs> You gotta be kidding, Fran. So we were together a few times. You ought to know better than to get caught. That's all I mean to you? Oh, don't knock it. Look, you're a sweet chick. We we made great music. It was all for kicks, though. I mean, no ties, no paddocks. Look, don't get me wrong. I'll get you a right guy. I mean, it's all legal now. And I'll bear the freight. You, you want me to get rid of the baby? <laughs> well, what else? I mean, you want it, you have it. Just don't try to pin me down. I want to stay loose. That's my thing. I can't believe what you're saying. It's a whole new world. You want to live by old-fashioned boxes they shoved us in. That's your option. You can't push me in a sleeve, so don't ever try. I am today, baby. you got to take me as you find me. Or as I lose you. Well, that's the way it runs. Easy come, easy go. I was that easy. Oh, come on. I didn't say that. Oh, you don't say much. You really mean. So? Maybe it's best we just split. No, you please, please. Look, the kid is out. And don't try to hang it on me. I'll deny it. All you'll get is a nice story which will get your old man fired out of the university. Oh, I can't understand myself. How I could... How I can be in love with anyone as rotten as you. Oh, knock it off, Fran. If you... Look, if, if I did do something about the baby, would you 
go. All right, hey, hey. Now, that's, uh, that's more like my old woman talking. Sure, if you do. I mean, you and me are a thing again. I... I don't know if Dad would... I mean, I... I don't have any money. Yeah, well, don't look at me. I ain't got the bread. But I got something better. What? It'll be. Mid-student. Senior. And he owes me plenty. I mean, we'll do a little collecting from him. But, but he's not a doctor. He's the next thing to it. Well, don't get the whammies. He's done it before. It's a breeze. Leave it to me. I'll set the whole thing up. <laughs> What is it? Oh, the baby. Daddy, it's gone, but I'm... Oh, oh, I'm bleeding. Oh, good oh. Lord. Doc, Doc, anything I can do? Yes, thanks. Call oh. Dr. Montrose and get him here fast. The number's in my address book by the phone on my study desk. I'm on my way. Help me. Oh. Who did this to you, friend? The, the, the friend of... The man who made you pregnant. Oh. What's his name? Oh, I can't. I, I won't... Well, no, this isn't the time. But one way or another, I'll get it, friend. And when I do, I'll find a way to make him suffer for what he's done to you. There isn't much excuse for the man whose name Dr. Felix Brandt still doesn't know. Hugh Prentice. The sad thing about life is they usually get away with things. Being without a conscience makes life a lot easier... But is anyone really without a conscience? That's something Hugh Prentice is about to have to start exploring as a strange and eerie punishment creeps over him. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Of course, in the Gilbert and Sullivan tradition, the Mikado's object of making the punishment fit the crime was comic and light-hearted. Here, it is deathly serious. In point of fact, unearthly so. Dr. Montrose was able to bring the hemorrhage under control after he arrived, and once it had stopped and Fran was under sedation, he met with his old friend Felix in the study. Well, she's all right now, Felix. Nothing to worry about. You don't think we should get her to the hospital? Yeah, under ordinary circumstances, perhaps, but uh, I'd say she's out of danger. She'll have to be watched closely, but I can handle that. Uh, if I put her in a hospital, it's all out in the open. Uh, you, you don't want that, do you? What do you mean, Jim? This is a pretty hidebound community, Felix. You're a good friend, Jim. Well, of yours and little Fran. I don't want to see her hurt any. Why did she do it? I don't know. I mean, she and Hank are going to get married anyway, so it why... It wasn't Hank's baby. Oh. What would you do about the man who started all this, Jim? If it were my daughter? Yes. I don't know. We're, uh, <laughs> we're a little elderly for physical retribution, aren't we? Mm. And any other course in problematical probably hurt Fran more than the man. Do you know who he is? No. Fran won't tell me. Uh, I suppose the best thing to do is let it go. Come in. How are you feeling today, Fran? I'm all right, Daddy. I know. I mean, Dr. Monroe has given you a clean bill of health. Has he? Well, he says you can get up and go back to college or whatever you want. Whatever I want. There's one thing I want I may never have any more. Didn't Dr. Jim tell you? Yes. We can talk about it later. Friend, I was just wondering... What? Would you like to... Well, I mean, Hank is still here, and he would like to see you. No. I don't want to see Hank. I'm going back where I belong. If he'll have me. Are you ready to tell me his name yet? No. 
not till I find out where I stand. How can you make yourself so cheap? This man, whoever he is, has taken all the love and the joy and, and laughter out of you. How, how can you go crawling back to him? Because he's the only one who can give it back to me. And if he doesn't? Then I... I just don't want to live. I was helpless to aid her, to ease anything for her. All that burned in me was a rage for the man who had turned my happy child into a hurt and battered shell. A beggar dependent on a man who was not worthy of her. And at this moment, even though I still didn't know his name, I could curse him and wish him disaster. I could do better than that if I turned my back on a God that I felt had forsaken me and mine. And as an extension of all my psychic research, turned to black magic and called down a curse on the man who had ruined my child. But first I had to talk to Hank. I love Fran, and, and I want it. I, I always will, but just for her sake, I wish I could break it up somehow. Get her away from this this slimy crud that... It's as though he has her under some kind of spell. We both know he'll hurt her again, desert her, humble her. I think Fran herself knows it, but somehow she can't help herself. What are you going to do, Doctor? Just let her go back to him? Leave it alone? I can't stop Fran any more than you can, Hank. She's not a child. She's of age. Her life is in her own hands. I have no legal control. If we only knew who he was. Well, that won't be too hard to find out. I've thought of all kinds of things. Even though I'm not very rich, I could perhaps buy him off. I'm sure he has a price. But that wouldn't solve anything for Fran. She loves him. He's what she wants. He has only the crookest finger and she'll crawl to him. That's obvious enough after all she's gone through for him. So what can we do? You... Nothing. Go back and live your life. Uh, not quite. Without Fran. Well, maybe it won't have to be without Fran. First, we have to clean this man out of her mind and her blood. But you just said we couldn't. One way. If he doesn't exist anymore, if he's dead. But wait a minute. You you can't seriously mean... Oh, don't that. worry, son. Even if I had the means, a gun, a knife, a blunt weapon, I would have neither the strength nor the courage to use them to say nothing of my lack of know-how... No, but I can wish him dead, or worse, I might just have the power for that. Doctor, are, are you, are you all right? <laughs> I, I don't understand you. Of course you don't understand, and I'm quite all right. This is something you will have to leave to me. <laughs> to anyone who reads this, it might seem fantastic. But the right I prepared are solemn and real to more people around you than you might believe. The ceremonies of dark magic are very real to those who perform them. In the attic, I had found among friends childhood dolls, one in the image of a man. I turned my study into a chapel of the damned, burning sulfur and asafetida. Then I recited from my book of ceremonial magic. All ye ministers and companions, I direct, conjure, constrain, and command you to fulfill my bequest willingly and straight away to accomplish the destruction of this man, unnamed, who has beset my daughter and most grievously harmed her by whatever means best suited. Great to be swinging with you again, baby. Oh, I wasn't sure you'd want me back. I look so... I don't know. Ah, you look great, kid. I'm my old woman again. I'm sorry we got to ride the subway, but who's got bread for the hacks these days? Oh, I don't mind where I am. Just so long as it's with you. Yeah, stick with me, baby. You ride first class all the way. I like these types. Look at them. Long gone. You and me are special. Just waiting for the right break. The chosen, huh? If you choose me. I buy you all the way down the line. Take a look. I mean, who is there who could walk into... What is it, Jim? Yeah, 
half halfway down the car there. Look, you see that guy? Oh, which one? Are you nuts? What do you mean, which one? How could you miss him? He's a carbon copy of me. He's even wearing the same jeans, the embroidered jacket. I, no, I don't see anyone who... Come on, come on, come on. Let's go. Let, 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 i got to catch up with him. Look, take it easy. I don't see anyone like you said. He disappeared. He's gone, but he, uh... He's like... He's like my double. Come on, let's go upstairs. No, I, I've got to get home, Hugh. Look, this won't take a moment. Yeah, yeah, man. There he is, there he is. He's right at the top of the stairs, next to that fat dame. No, there's no one there. He's all alone. Oh, I, I am... He's gone. He's gone again. But he was looking right at me. Who the devil do you suppose he was? What did he want? Hello? Fran? Yes? Oh, it's you. Shh. Listen. I gotta see you right away. I need help. What's wrong? I, I can't talk on the phone. Meet me on the campus. By the phone. I was just turning in. I was reaching for the light to douse it when all of a sudden he's sitting right there in the chair facing me. Who? Him, the double, the guy we saw in the subway. I said, How the hell did you get in here? Who are you? I am your double ganger. My what? Your double. Or if you want, your inheritor. What does that mean? It's time for you to wander like me. It's time for me to return and die as I should have. I, I don't know what you're talking about. A long time ago, so long you can't even begin to imagine, I sinned. And because of my sin, I was not allowed to die in peace, but condemned to wander in infinity until I found a body I could be laid to rest in. My time is almost here. And in you, I will find a home again. I don't know what kind of a nut you are, Jack, but I'm going to kick your tail out of here so I can get him sleep. That won't be necessary. Sleep for you is all I'm waiting for. Huh? When you are safely asleep, you are at my mercy. The moment your eyes close, your body will be mine, and your soul will be left to wander through the ages alone. Waiting endlessly for peace and the blessing of eternal sleep. Get out! Get away from me! You're nothing but a... Nothing but a what, Hugh? Uh, he's a ghost. I mean, uh, I, I could see him plain as they see you, but I could see through him, too, like a lamp in back of him shining through his head. See, the pan of a chair he was sitting in is as clear as a, a bell through him. I mean, he wouldn't reel. See, so I, I threw on some clothes. I ran out of the house. I spent the night walking. I was afraid to go to sleep. To bed. Fran. But nothing like this ever happened. Even on the wildest trip, I, I never blew so wild as this. What am I going to do? Hugh? I think you should see my father. Yeah. Oh, sure. That, that'd be great after everything. I'd be lucky if he didn't try to have me arrested. He doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know you were the one. Yeah, but what could he do? He's a psychologist. He could help you. Look, you wouldn't want his lecture courses. All you have to do is go up to him and say you have a problem. He'd help you. Now, now the whole thing is crazy. I see some character on a and threads like me. I have a crazy dream. Right away, I blow my cool. There's nothing the matter with me. Now, come on, let's let's cut out. I, I ain't even going to see you home. I'm going back to bed and, and, and catch him shut up. Oh, you listen to me. Don't look at me that way. Don't you turn against me. Do you think I could, after all that's happened? Yeah. Right, you, you I could count on. Yeah. You're my woman no matter what I do to you, right? I love you, Hugh. And don't ever forget it, baby. Now, come on, blow. I gotta, I gotta hit the sack. <laughs> all right, back, back up, man. I got a knife. Get lost. No, you are the lost one. What are you talking? Who is it? Your double canker just waiting for you to get tired enough till your sleep is deep enough. For what? 
to take over your body so that with it I may bring myself to the peace of the grave. What is this wraith that dogs hues pass? A figment of a diseased imagination? A figure of retribution created by a conscience weighted with guilt? Or is it some ghastly nemesis conjured from the supernatural, the world outside our comprehension, summoned up by Dr. Felix Brandt through the agency of devil? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Hugh Prentice fled to his apartment as though the hounds of hell were his heels. Locked in securely, with every light blazing, riding high on Benzedrine to keep awake, he paced the two small rooms like a caged tiger. And everywhere he turned, he faced the doppelganger, watching him silently, waiting patiently, a twisted smile of anticipated triumph on his face. At last, he could stand it no longer and fled the apartment with the first light of morning, roaming the streets, afraid to turn his head, knowing his double still followed on his heels. At last, exhausted, he found a small rest open and sat there drinking coffee after coffee and watching the clock till nine o'clock came. Then he crossed to the public phone to make a call. Dr. Brandt speaking. It's a large class. I don't place you for the moment. Well, that doesn't matter. What does matter is, uh, look, uh, I'm in trouble. Can you help me? Help you? How? I can't. Not over the phone. It's, uh, it's like a... It's like a matter of life and death. Help me? Well, if you put it that way, of course. I'll try, Mr. Prentice, was it? Yeah. Prentice. You Prentice. Very well. So can you be here? Very well, I'll be waiting. I hung up with a strange feeling. My comprehensive basic psychology course has a large attendance, some 100. The name meant nothing to me. No, that isn't right. I, I didn't recognize it, but what I did recognize was a, a stifling feeling rising in my gorge of implacable hatred for this few princess. Why? The name filled me with revulsion. What connection could... And then suddenly... Oh, the pain struck again, sharper than ever. Oh, now, where... Where did... Come! Fine, Felix! I dropped by the... Uh, what is it? The, the, the pain? Yes. Uh, where are your morphine tablets? Draw. For uh, this morning. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, oh, I'll do better than that. Why must you be yeah. so pig-headed? Don't want to establish the habit. Yeah, the habit will hurt you less than the pain. Now, uh, uh, here, let, let get, one, get one arm out of the coat there. Uh, uh, that's better. Uh, can you roll back your sleeve while, while I prepare the syringe? Yes. Hurry. Just let me let me swab first. There. Oh. Now, now, hold steady. Hold oh. steady. Ah. Uh, so this will take hold in a minute. Oh, the, but getting worse, Jim, and more frequent. Well, I'm sorry, I can't help any more than I can. The only treatment medicine has to offer you, Felix, is palliative. I know. I also know I haven't got much longer. That's what worries me so about Fran. That guy, whoever he is, I don't want him to wreck the rest of her life. Oh, that'll be one of my students. Wants to see me about something. I have to run anyway. I, I just wanted to tell you some good news. I got the tests back on Fran, and I was maybe a little hasty on my first diagnosis. With care, there's no reason she can't have a child again. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad, as long as that skunk is still alive, whoever he is. I'll let your visitor in. Oh, I, I was looking yes, for... Yes, Dr. Brandt, you, you have the right office. I was only visiting. Shut the door and come in. You're Mr. Prentice? Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. That's right. Hugh Prentice. Sit down. Well, suppose you tell me what's troubling you. 
Have you ever had any delusions like this before? <laughs> Not on your life. Have you done anything recently that you're that you're sorry for, ashamed of? No. Like what? I don't know. That's why I asked. No. Why should I be ashamed of anything I do? I'm, I mean, like I free wheeled, you know? I give what I get. That's that's all evens with me. What does that mean? Like it's a tough world, Doc. I mean, uh, they're all against me, like most of them. See? Who are they? You know, people. Are your mother and father still alive? No. My old man took off before I was five. And my ma, well, she horsed around like, uh... Well, like she had to live, make the bread for me, like anyone, I guess. Uh, she liked a good time. What kind of a job did she have? Are you kidding? Bringing home uncles for me. Huh. I must have had a hundred or so uncles by the time I was 14. And then... Then what? Ah, then she left me with an aunt. An old dried-up stick. Ah, I shouldn't kick about her at that. When she died, she left me enough dough to go to college like now, and, uh... Hey, hey, look, what has this got to do with that, uh, that, that goon who's tracking me? I'm trying to get around to that. You don't like women very much, do you, Hugh? I don't know what you're getting at. You like to punish them because of what your mother did to you. Isn't that it? Look, I don't have to have you push me around like them. I mean, all I came here for was to ask for help. And I'm trying to give it to you. Well, can you just get this haunt, whatever the hell it is, off my back? I want to try, if you'll just help me. Look, anything, Doc, anything. I I, I, I got to get some sleep, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid to. You're quite safe here. What's that thing? It's a metronome. Some people use it to learn to keep time to music. I use it to calm people down. Now, just keep your eye on the needle as it swings back and forth. And try to relax. And answer my questions as honestly as you can. And maybe, together, we can get to the root of what's wrong with you. Tell me your name again. You. You what? You Prentice. Where were you born? Allentown, Pennsylvania. What was your father's name? Frank. And your mother's? Mary. I use hypnosis a lot in my work, but never more deliberately, and I'm ashamed to say, callously than today. Because suddenly, from some deep recess of my being, an electric wave was sending its knowledge to my brain. A second sight was born, and I was suddenly sure who Hugh Prentice really was. Can you hear me, Hugh? Yes. You know a girl named Fran Brand, don't you? Sure. She's my chick. You know she's my daughter? Yeah. And you made her pregnant? She was careless. You took her to someone to get rid of the child? Sure. The way it is. No sweat. Don't you know she loves you? Man, like their buses. Another one any minute. Yeah. Sure. That's how chicks are. Do you love her? What's with all this love, Jive? I ain't tying myself down no way. But like I told you, I free wheel. Nobody gonna cut down my style. Keep trying. All the squares, all of them, but I'll show them. Anyone ties me down, I stomp on them good. Especially chicks like my mother. All sweet words and cut your throat the first chance they get. Only me, I'm too smart. I cut them down to size first. Don't you worry about old Hugh. 
morphine was wearing off already. I sat back in my chair watching the boy whose secrets I had bared. A schizophrenic, classic, already paranoid. Possibly he could be saved through analysis, chemotherapy, new treatments which are being reached every day. Treatments I would never live to see. Treatments he would never willingly seek as he had sought me. Because out of the dark side of my studies and my learning, I had raised a doppelganger. Then for a moment, the pain hit me so wildly, so acutely, agonizingly, that I must have blacked out a moment because... Don't bring him out of his hypnosis. He doesn't deserve to live. I cannot condemn him to the death in limbo like you live. Let me tell you something, old man. You are about to die. Two doors face you. Open one. And you let the scourge out to destroy your daughter as well as himself. Open the other. And I take his body and your daughter has her chance to live her life. Her chance to find happiness. Instead of despair and degradation. Which will it be? Which will you choose? Choose. 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 Only in sleep can a doppelganger take possession of another body. Looking at the boy frozen in deep hypnosis across my desk. Around him... Was it my own pain? A shadowy figure hovered. I knew I could banish the shadow if I willed. But I had chosen my door. I rose and left the office to go home to my study. Two days after he smashed into the rock wall at Highgate Turn, popularly known as Satan's Trap in our neighborhood. What soul possessed it? I will know very soon. I am about to die and leave this manuscript transcribed through those two days in exquisite paint for my daughter and Hank to read. I know it will bring them their own pain. But I hope it will bring them peace. And if I am condemned, too, for my sins, to wander as a doppelganger, I can only pray that what I have done may be worth it and will have brought my daughter happiness. This manuscript was read by Hank as executor of the estate. And in that position... He exercised a humane decision, perhaps beyond his powers. He did not let Fran read her father's letter. He buried it in a safe deposit vault until the time was ripe, long after they were married and had children of their own. I'll be back shortly. Inside your free, inside your free after all, you hear freedom spirit. Like a wild bird call Inside your free Inside your free After all Living free Living free The urge hits You know you have to hit the road So with Buick Skylark SR firmly in hand You do just that Quickly, confidently you're on your way Skylark SR's touring car cockpit. Its bold stance and spirited V6 engine make exhilarating excursions a daily occurrence. Find out at your Buick dealer now. Inside your free. Inside your free after all. Living free. Living free. Living free. This is William B. Williams. Manja. What's a guy with a name like Williams doing telling you to manja? Manja means eat well. And I'm telling you to eat well with Progresso home-styled chicken soup. But why not check it out for yourself? Pick up a can of Progresso's thick chicken soup, hold it in your hand, and weigh the real value for yourself. Then take a can home and open it. See for yourself how the rich broth is packed with food, chunks of chicken, 
garden vegetables, and noodle chariot wheels. Now heat up a can of this full-strength soup. You add no water. And let your family taste for themselves why Progresso Chicken Soup is extra special chicken soup. Great flavor, great food, and lots of it. But look, don't take my word for it. Check Progresso Chicken Soup out for yourself. It's a lot of food for the money. Eat Manja Soups a la Progresso. The current issue of TV Guide magazine profiles a new type of personality who has been gaining status on television news shows. These journalists are called consumer reporters, and it's their job to help you save money and point out fraud. A look at how a couple of consumer reporters are getting their jobs done. In the same issue, TV Guide provides some interesting insights into Huck Finn. A little less than a century ago, Mark Twain penned his literary classic, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. As the book is adapted for a television special, TV Guide examines Twain's message about a white boy and a black man finding their moment of friendship. This week, TV Guide's cover story talks to Carl Malden, who emerged from the steel town of Gary, Indiana, during the Depression to pound the pavements in the streets of San Francisco. His thoughts make interesting reading in TV Guide, America's biggest selling magazine. TV Guide, on sale everywhere. Greetings, this is Arlene Francis with a program note. My guest tomorrow morning is the well-known Reform Rabbi, Balfour Brickner. And among the subjects that we are going to cover is, does a theologian have to have a sense of civic responsibility, even if it involves politics? So tune in at 10.15 here on WOR, the talk of New York. This story came to me through accidental channels, long after the principles were gone. I cannot vouch for the truth of it any more than I suppose any of the principles involved could. It's a story, I suppose, of retribution, and at the same time, a frightening lesson to all of us who stretch the human relationship beyond normal demands. If we sin deep enough, in some form, in some way, I suppose there is a doppelganger who will vie with us for retribution. The only way to avoid that is to deny him the chance. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Rosemary Rice, Tony Roberts, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice and Anheuser Busch Incorporated Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. WOR Mystery Theater was also brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program was furnished by the Columbia Broadcasting System. Your dial is set for news with John Scott reporting. This is WOR New York, an RKO general station. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Are you familiar with the old expression, when they made you, they threw away the mold, or there's nobody else like you in the whole world? What is it? inside every human being that makes him or her unique, one of a kind. Our mystery drama, The Deadly Double, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Vicki Dan and stars Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Her name is Anita Gregory, 
and she leads a quiet life, an almost solitary life, except for a single casual friendship. It isn't that she likes being alone. She has her painting to keep her occupied and a considerable sum of money in the bank to ensure her independence. It's just that she prefers a peaceful existence. For there are certain things, things that happened long ago that uh, she would prefer to forget. She has no way of knowing, however, that tonight those certain things are about to intrude unexpectedly from the past and totally disrupt the serenity of the present. Look, Anita, th- there's this great old flick on, on Channel 9. I don't I- care, Max. Now, why don't you go home? Well, it's not even one o'clock. Not even one o'clock. Max, I want to go to sleep. Why are you mad at me? I'm not mad at you. You're using me as an excuse. What are you talking about? You haven't written so much as a sentence in the past month. Anita, I've explained that to you. There comes a time in every writer's creative life when he reaches a, an impasse, what you might call a, a writer's <laughs> block. Get off it, Max. You like the idea of being a writer, but deep inside, you are basically a Bum. Huh? I'm your friend, so I can tell you. Why do you delude yourself? Well, I need fresh ideas. I, I need fresh ideas to rejuvenate me. Good night, Max. Well, it's not like you and your painting. All you have to do is look out the window at some tree and you're inspired. My pictures are good, Max, because I don't sit around waiting to be inspired. I paint what I see, a face, a tree in the wind, a leaf. Anita, you don't understand. Who would call this late? Hello? What? But, but how, how? Now? Well, I... Yes, where? Yes. All right. Yes, I promise, I promise. Anita, you okay? Who was that? I can't believe it. Who was that on the phone? My sister. Your sister? Susan. Susan, the nut? Oh, don't call her that. She's just disturbed. Well, she's in an institution, isn't she? It's a rest home, Max. How many times do I have to tell you? It's a a rest home. Well, call it what you want. You're the one who pays the bill. Hey, you really look shook up. What's the matter? I haven't... I haven't seen Susan. It's been five years. And now she... she, Now she... She... What? She's out. She's out? When did they release her? They didn't. They didn't? Wait a minute. You mean she escaped? She left. I'll call the police. No, no, don't do that. What? No, police. No, no, there can't be anybody else. I I know where she is, and I'll take care of this in my own way. Uh, Anita, I I don't want to be difficult, but you're the one who signed the commitment papers. You're the one who had her declared insane. I never even went up there to Westbrook. I couldn't. But five years is a long time. People change. Anita. A lot of things can happen in five years. She said she was trying to get in touch with me for a long time. They wouldn't let her write or phone or anything. Anita, where are you going? Lock the door when you leave, Max. Uh, let me come with you? No, I have to go alone. It'll be all right. I know what I'm doing. Uh, call me when you get back? Sure. I'll be waiting up for you. Remember, I'm just down the I've hall. I've got to go. Anita. What? I hope you know what you're doing. So do I. <laughs> be a phone booth. God, where is she? Susan? Susan? It's me, Anita. Where are you? Susan? Is that you? Who's there? Susan, is that you? (gasps) Yes, Anita, it's me. Susan? Thanks for being stupid enough to come. (laughs) 
miss? Taking a nap, miss? Mm-hmm. What? Where am I? Well, you're a mile off Highway 25 at 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh. Oh, she must have knocked me off. Oh, where's my car? Huh? What car? Say, you better get into my car. You must be freezing in that thin dress. Dress? Could have sworn I was wearing... That she changed clothes with me on top of everything. What are you talking about, Miss? My sister, she took my car, my wallet. She even changed into. Wait, are, are you a policeman? No, no, we don't have policemen here, Miss. I'm the sheriff. Uh, my name's Tom Wiley. Oh, I'm Anita Gregory. Well, pleased to meet you, Miss Gregory. Well, now why don't you get in my car before you get pneumonia? <laughs> are you taking me down to the station? Or... Uh, whatever it is that you call it around here? Well, actually, we call it the sheriff's office. Well, I don't mean to inconvenience you or anything. Oh, no, no, it's my job. Now, suppose you start all over again and, and tell me exactly what happened. Now, you, you say Susan is your sister? Twin sister. Oh, oh, twin sister. Uh, Miss Gregory, I... I still don't understand how you could agree to meet her on a deserted highway. Didn't you know she was dangerous? No. Well, I... I wasn't sure. I, you weren't sure? Well, you see, she sounded so upset. And I was so surprised to hear from her in the first place. It's been five years. Well, how, how did I know she'd gotten better or not? Now, Miss Gregory, don't Call you think... Call me that... Anita. I hate Miss Gregory. That sounds so hard. <laughs> No, I never liked formality myself. Wait a minute, this... This doesn't look like a sheriff's... That sign says Westbrook. Why are we stopping here? Hey, Doc. Sheriff, where'd you find it? Well, you know where that phone booth is off exit 11? Well, she was... She was practically lying in the road. Lucky I came by when I did. Susan, you... Might have gotten killed. My name is Anita Gregory. I don't think we've met. And I don't see why it's any of your Susan, business. Susan, do you realize that because of your little escapade, everybody's been up half the night trying to find you? Wait a minute. <laughs> I don't think you heard me. I'm not... I heard what you said. Eric, take Susan Gregory back to her room. Sure. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I had to bring you back. Bring me back? We really appreciate it, Sheriff. Thank back? you. Back? This is all a mistake. I think you need a sedative. Need a what? Well, who do you think you are? Uh, that's not our problem. The problem is, who do you think you are, Susan? You think that I'm Susan? Eric? And you, Sheriff? You brought me here deliberately. You don't believe me either. That whole time in the car, you were playing along with me. All the time thinking I'm somebody else. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, but... You might have gotten hurt. This is insane. <laughs> it isn't really happening. Tomorrow I'll wake up and... It... Let go of me. Take her to her room, Eric. Restrain her if necessary. Doctor, please, this is all a mistake. It's a horrible mistake. <laughs> if I'm here, then Susan is out there somewhere. Miles away now in my car. Susan, you must Wait a stop. minute. No, now look. Find her before she hurts somebody, please. Sheriff, listen. Listen to me. My name is Anita Gregory. I live at 420 Oakleaf Terrace. Look, if you don't believe me, ask Max. That's right, Max knows. He was there when Susan called. Max will tell you. Please believe me. Please, please. Yeah, that poor girl. It's really a shame about people like her. In the car, she seemed so normal. Uh, she's schizoid now. I think she's two people. You mean this Anita character? Oh, that's the sad part. She does have a sister, a sister, Anita, who put her here. There is a sister? That's right. A twin sister. As a matter of fact, I think that's part of the reason she has such a serious identity problem. Twin? Uh, is, it, is it remotely possible that the girl I brought back is the other sister? Sheriff, you're not serious. Well, I know I'm no psychiatrist, but but looking back on it, she she didn't seem that crazy to me. That girl was Susan. She couldn't fool me for a minute. A perfect.
perfect example of being in the wrong place at the right time. As far as Dr. Cooper is concerned, Susan is back where she can't harm anybody. As far as Sheriff Wiley is concerned, he has just apprehended a dangerous lunatic. But what about Anita? She is about to discover that while it is relatively easy to prove a person is insane, it is quite a different matter to prove that a person is sane. I'll be back in a moment with Act Two. By all physical appearances, Anita Gregory is identical to her sister Susan. Same eyes, same hair, same voice, but the similarity ends there because no two minds can ever be the same. It is merely logical that Dr. Cooper will presently recognize her for what she really is. Or is it? Good morning, Susan. Uh, How do you feel? What? Oh, is it morning? Yes, morning, more or less. It's 11.30, but you had a rather late night. Oh, no. Oh, I thought I'd dreamt all this. Oh. No, Susan. And that's why after last night, we must make an even more determined effort to face reality. Call me, Susan, her. once more, and I'm going to scream. Good. Go right ahead. It's good therapy. Let out all your hostility. Isn't it at all conceivable to you that being identical twins, Susan and I might have changed places? Well, yes, there is that possibility. Good. We're getting somewhere. Now, what about a phone call? I'm afraid that's our question. We could clear this matter up entirely with a single phone call. Ah, oh, you know the rules about phone calls. Besides, after last night's escapade, you've had all privileges suspended. Doctor, when I get out of here, I'll make sure you never practice again. Oh, that's excellent. Redirected hostility. I must be calm. I must <laughs> maintain my cool. Doctor... <clears throat> Explain to me about my case. Do you know all about your case? Please, humor me. Yeah, very well. Your name is Susan Gregory. Five years ago, following a series of incidents where you repeatedly attempted to kill your sister, Anita, you were declared legally insane. Now, those incidents, couldn't they have been merely frustration or anger of the moment? Unfortunately, no. You see, it's been inside you since you were a child. No matter what you did, your sister did it better. The years went on and you watched as Anita became a successful artist. You grew more and more resentful. Your jealousy became an obsession. Even now, you're often jealous enough to try to be her. In this way, you can have what she's always had. All right. Now, taking this a step further, just pretend, pretend now, that the real Susan Gregory is out there, living in Anita's apartment and driving her car, pretending to be her. How long do you suppose she'll be able to carry it off before she gets caught? Not very long, of course. Little things, traits unique to Anita would be missing. Close friends notice these things. That is, if... Anita has any close friends? Oh, she has. Uh, we'll discuss it all later. It's time for your treatment. What kind of treatment? Eric is waiting outside to take you to therapy three. I asked you, what kind of treatment? Eric, would you take her, please? I'll be down in a few minutes. Look, I'm not stupid. I took psychology in college. I know a little bit about behavior modification and the things they do in places like this. Now, what is it? Is it electric shock therapy? No, I, I don't know why you're so upset. You'll feel much better. You always do afterwards. It is. Now, listen. Staying here for a few days is, is one thing. Now, I've tried discussing the whole thing rationally with you, and what happens? You aren't going to give me any shock treatment. Eric. You call yourself a doctor. You're a charlatan. You're a quack. Now, you see, Susan, it's just a matter of time before your true nature comes through. You're his Just wait till I get out of here. I'm going to sue you. I'll, I'll sue this hospital. I'll sue everybody. Well, Sister Anita, you've done all right for 
for yourself. Hmm. This is a nice little apartment. <laughs> I think I'm going to like it here. I can get excited. I can pull this off. Just remember. I'm Anita now. Yes? Well, uh, aren't you going to let me in? Look, don't be mad. I can explain why I didn't wait up for you. I fell asleep. I just went out like a light the minute I hit the couch. Well, anyhow, tell me what happened. With what? Well, Anita, don't keep me in suspense like this. What happened with your crazy sister? I... I sent her back to Westbrook. We had a long chat, and then I drove her back. And that was it? Yeah. She just wanted to talk. So, everything's all right now? Everything's fine. Hey, this is your old friend Max. If something's bothering you, you, you can tell me. Max, of course not. I'm just tired. You sure nothing's bothering you? You're not mad at me? Oh, of course not. Come here. Here? Closer. Anita. See? I'm not mad at you. Why? Why did, did you kiss me? Why? You never kissed me before. You said I wasn't ready for a serious relationship. You wanted to keep it platonic. I did? Oh. Well, uh, sorry, Max. If you don't like it, I... I won't do it again. Oh, well, no, I'm... I'm not sorry. Oh, and Max, I have a, a headache. You asking me to leave, Anita? Yes, do you mind? No. No, sure, I... Sure, I understand. Maybe some other time, okay? Sure. Bye now. Bye. Oh, that was close. I hope that dummy swallowed it. Susan, how do we feel today? We? How do we feel? <laughs> I only wish you could feel like I feel right now. I have a surprise for you. You have a visitor. What did you say? Mm -hmm. Someone's here to see you. He says he's an old friend. Max Hogan. Max? Max is here? Do you want to see him? Max! Oh, wonderful, beautiful Max! <laughs> I'll send him in. You can come in, Mr. Hogan. I'll be right outside. Max. Anita. Oh, so glad you came. I thought I was going crazy. Anita, it is you. Well, of course it's me. Well, I, I wasn't sure. Max, I've got to get out of this place. Don't worry. Never fear. Max is here. <laughs> uh, wow, this is wild. But it isn't funny. Now, how did you figure I was here? Ah, uh, give me credit, honey. I had her pegged for Susan the minute she opened the door. She's in my apartment? Well, sure. Making like she's you. But she didn't fool me for a minute. No? What really did it was when she kissed me. She what? Now, you see, you'd never do that. I mean, she assumed I was your... Boyfriend. Oh, I can't wait to see the look on that doctor's face when you tell him. Max, would you get Dr. Cooper and tell him who I really am? Hey, what an idea for a story. Two sisters, twin sisters, who change places. Yes, you have my permission to write the story. Now get Dr. Cooper and we can discuss it on the way home. Sure, of course. I, I have to go into greater depth, take more time to evolve my characters. You are thinking what I think you're thinking. I could come up a couple of times a week with a tape recorder. Oh, no, you can't be thinking that. Anita, please, just give me a few weeks. That's all I need. No! But can't you see? It's perfect. I haven't been inspired for months. You said so yourself. Absolutely not. And the story would practically write itself. It's a bestseller. We ripped the facade off mental institutions. What an expose. I said no. Oh, how can you be so selfish? Selfish? I'm being selfish? Can't you see? I'm 36 years old and I've never been published. You don't seem to understand that every day I'm in this place, I lose a little bit more of my grip. There's drugs, there's shock therapy. Do you know what that can do to a person? Oh, come on now. It can't be that what bad. Can do to you? 
This place can drive anybody crazy. I thought that I could live through anything. Nothing ever really moved me or excited me. Well, that's just why you could pull it off. Yeah, but even if my mind was made of concrete, this place would erode it. We'd be rich, both of us. Hey, well, I'll tell you what. I'll give you 50%. And you're forgetting something else. Susan! All right. She'll get a percentage, too. Well, listen, Max. Forget about me for a minute. You can't let an insane person loose in the normal world. Why not? It's all relative, isn't it? <laughs> isn't the whole world going crazy? Who, who, who are we to say what is and what isn't normal? What a thief! Listen, hey. you don't know Susan. She's dangerous. She seemed all right. Besides, weren't you the one who said that maybe the doctors were well, wrong? I made a mistake. She hasn't changed at all. She's vicious. She could even kill. Don't try to talk me out of it. Listen, take me seriously for once. When we were little, even then, she did vicious things. She broke the heads off all my dolls. She took the goldfish out of the bowl and she watched them die. Typical healthy tomboy. I don't want to discuss it anymore. Now get me out of here, please. All right, Anita. Sure. That's how you want it. Doctor, I'm ready to go now. All right, now tell him, Max. Tell the doctor. Tell him what? Who I am. Doctor, Max knows. I think this has been too much of a strain for her. <laughs> You'd better go immediately. Of course. Max! Goodbye, Max! doctor. Goodbye, no, Susan. Oh, no, Max, she'll kill you. When she finds out that you know, she'll kill you. <laughs> We live in a world ravaged with fear. A world where the voices of logic and common sense seldom find a sympathetic listener. It is not so very unlike the purgatory in which Anita Gregory is now imprisoned. Today, into that dim world, a candle of hope has briefly flickered and finally been extinguished. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Je pense, donc je suis. I think, therefore I am. So said the great philosopher René Descartes. It was this brilliant Frenchman who logically demonstrated that there is only one thing of which a man can be sure of, and that is his own existence. After all, most people accept what they see as truth. They do not question the obvious. They leave that for the philosophers. Hello, doctor. Hey, what brings you here? Well, you know what happened was I I was typing up the week's report and I, I suddenly realized that I never got you to sign this release for that Gregory girl. I, it, it was such a hectic night. It, it totally slipped my mind. Of course. Also, could you fill in her sister's full name and address? I, I need it for the records. I'm glad you stopped by. She was asking for you. For me? Well, she says there's something she'd like to tell you. Now, you don't have to see her if you don't want to. Hmm? I'm sure it isn't anything important. Oh, well, as long as I'm here, I... Well, I'd like to see how she's doing. Hello, Susan. Sheriff? Yeah. Uh, how you been? Just wonderful, can't you tell? Uh, Doc Cooper said you, you wanted to see me. I did? Hmm. What was it you wanted to tell me? I forget. I think there was something. Oh, I can't I remember. Oh, now, now take your time. I, I you... want to tell you. Uh, oh. Nice paintings on the wall. Oh, that's the doctor's idea. <laughs> he feels by giving us a creative outlet, it's releasing hostility. They're very good. Well, I'm a professional yeah. artist. I mean, Anita's a professional artist. I'm supposed to be Susan. Susan can't paint. Susan cooks. Anita paints. It's always been that way. Well, I, I, I'm sure no art critic, but I think you're very good. Yes, you know, I am. Look at that wall. Hmm? Look at the girl in the picture there. Her hands. Her arms there, there by her neck. Do you know how many years of training it takes? The discipline, 
anatomy classes, live models to get the bones, the muscles, the skin tones just right to understand the shading. Well, like I said, it's, it's, it's very good. Would you say I have a, a style? Style? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd say so. See, it takes years to develop a style. I spent two years in Paris. That's heaven for an artist. And that's what influenced me, those early impressionists. But but Max says I still have a distinctive style. Oh, Max, Max, Max. That's what I wanted to tell you. What about Max? She's going to kill Max. Who's going to kill Max? That's right. Now, Max is writing a book about us, how we changed places. And I warned him. I said... Max, Susan hates to be tricked, and she hates people fooling her, and when she finds out that you know who she is, she's going to get really mad, and she'll kill you. That's that's very interesting. You think I'm crazy, don't you? No, no, I didn't say that. That's all right. (laughs) It's quite all right. I tried. I did my best. I warned him. And he didn't believe me either. (laughs) When Max is found dead, maybe then you'll believe me. That's all I wanted to tell you. Thanks for coming. Oh, there's no trouble. I, uh, I, I wanted to see how you were doing. No, if you'll excuse me. I'm very tired. Sure, sure. I, I was just leaving. Oh, uh, bye, Susan. Uh, Sheriff, hmm? uh, well, wait a minute. Don't you want this back? Huh? Oh, the release form. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. I, I don't know what's with me these days. Look, I, I, uh, I want to ask you about Susan's sister, uh, Nita Gregory. What about her? I was wondering when you saw her last. Last? Hmm. Oh, well, I you don't think that's very important. Well, what is your impression of the sister, uh, Nita? Oh, I hear she's an excellent artist. You hear? Yeah, well, naturally, I've never met her. You what? There really wasn't any need to. I mean, she pays the bills on time, and she never comes to visit. When did Susan start painting? Just recently. How recently? Well, I don't see why. Well, about a week ago. She isn't bad for a beginner. Matter of fact, she's pretty good. Did it occur to you that maybe she was too good? Chapter Two, the second week. Oh, that's good. Now, let's see what we've got so far. Meanwhile, Susan Gregory, in the guise of Anita, continued more and more to assume the identity of her sister. The door wasn't locked, so I just thought I'd come in. Ah, uh, I never lock my door. What are you writing? Uh, nothing. Just. The usual junk. Can I see? No. I never show an unfinished work to anybody. It just isn't done. Why not? Well, it's bad luck. Hey, hey, give me that back. <laughs> I just want to see. Come on, don't be such a... Give it back. Come uh, on, Max. Just let me see a Give it to me. <laughs> oh, oh, now look what you've done. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry, Max. I'm really sorry. Sure. I mean, you're so funny. You get so excited about a silly piece of paper. No, I wouldn't expect you to understand. Why not? Well, it's very personal. When a writer writes, what you did just now was almost like... like tearing me in half physically. (laughs) I don't don't see what's so funny. (laughs) You don't... It's very funny. (laughs) It's a scream. (laughs) It's a scream. No, I... You're a scream. You know that? As a matter of fact, you're plain crazy. Me? Crazy? You look so shocked. Don't fight it. It's no crime to be crazy. It happens to the best of us. Yeah, I, I know. Hey, you're not taking me seriously, are you, Max? I'm only kidding. Can't you take a joke? 
Oh, sure, sure, sure. I tell you what. You come over about six, and I'll make you some chili. You'd like that, wouldn't you? I, yes, I would. Okay. Six, then. Max? Just a minute. Max, I told you I... Oh. Miss, uh... Anita Gregory? Yes. Oh, it, it, it's amazing. I beg your pardon? Oh, the, the, the resemblance. It's, it, it's fantastic. Oh, between you and your sister, I mean. My sister? Susan Gregory. I, I, I'm an acquaintance of hers. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Let me introduce myself. I wish you I, would. The name's Wiley. Tom Wiley. I'm sheriff up in Clay County. Uh, near Westbrook, where your sister is... Uh, Staying. Sheriff? Huh. Uh, could I come in for a minute? Oh, well, of course. Please. Thank you. Well, you have a very nice apartment, Miss Gregory. Well, thank you. Well, what can I do for you, Sheriff? You see, I, I'm the officer who apprehended your sister after she escaped from Westbrook, and I, uh... Well, she was really nice and, uh... and likable, and, uh... Well, I... To be perfectly honest, I... Uh, yes, be perfectly honest. Well, I have to admit, there was a... a remote possibility that... well, she might have been a victim of mistaken identity. Oh. You know, you're... you're not at all what I expected you to be. Oh, what were you expecting, an ogre? Oh, <laughs> I, I don't know, Are really. Are you disappointed? I, well, kind of, I... Oh. Something wrong? Well, these paintings. Yes. Are you, uh... Oh, well, I almost hate to admit it, but... Look, I can't expect everyone to love my work. Oh, I, I, I didn't say that I didn't like them. It's just the... Well, uh, you, uh, have a style. It's, it's very distinctive. Oh, 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 here it comes. Everyone's a critic. I, I honestly like your work, uh, Anita. Uh, well, I... I really better get back. Thanks. Uh, thanks for everything. Yes, sure. Oh, oh, by the way, uh, you wouldn't happen to know a guy named Max? Max? Hmm. Oh, sure. He lives down the hall. I thought it was him at the door before. Why? Well, I'm wondering if, uh... It's the same Max. The same Max? Hmm. Your sister had a visitor the other day, a guy named Max, and I... Well, I was just wondering if it could be this... No, same... I... Uh, well, uh, no. <laughs> the Max that I know uh, never met Susan. You see, I don't... I don't like to let new friends know that my sister... Uh, you understand. I mean... It... Oh, sure, sure. I, I understand, sure. Well, it was just a thought. Thanks, anyway. Bye. Goodbye. So, Max does know. All this time I trusted that idiot. And he knew all along. That must have been what he was writing about, wanted to hide from me. It all fits. All this time he made a fool of me. He tricked me. Hey, Anita. Why'd you lock your door? It's only old Max. <laughs> Low Max, just a minute. Hello, Max. Why'd you lock me out? Here, I, I brought some wine. I thought we'd have a nice evening. Thank you, Max. I guarantee you this is going to be an evening you'll never forget. Oh, I must say, Anita, you... Oh, you really outdid yourself. <laughs> that chili was fantastic. Well, you certainly ate enough. Yeah, oh, I'm positively stuffed. <laughs> uh, let's have some more wine. But you finished it all. Oh. <laughs> By the way, Max, 
How's your book coming? My book? Yeah. Your book. You never did tell me what it was about. Well, it's uh, just Tell about... me something, Max. Did you put me in it? You? Yeah, me. I'm your inspiration, aren't I? What's gotten into you, Anita? Don't call me Anita. I hate that name. You know very well I'm Susan. What? Oh, don't play dumb, Max. You knew all the time, didn't you? Didn't you? I I don't know what you're talking about. I'm Susan and you knew all about it. Oh, quit playing dumb. I happen to know all about your little visit to Westbrook. Oh, look, I can explain. I don't want to hear it. I'm not interested. I'm more interested in this bookend. Did you know, Max? That there are only two like it in the whole world, that they belong to my grandfather, that they came all the way from Spain. They're made of mahogany. They're hand-carved. But look, notice the base. That's solid bronze. Hey, what are you doing? I really I... thought you liked me, but you were just using me, making a fool of me. You tricked me. Susan, and I wait a second, let me explain. I get mad when people fool me. I get really mad. Susan! No, put, put that down. You, you, you could kill somebody with that. I intend to kill you. Oh, no, no. Ah. See, Max, you're such an easy target. Hey, you're crazy. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Please. Kill you. Please. Kill you. Kill you. Kill you. Kill you. Kill you. Kill you. Stand still. Don't move. You're too late. Uh, he's dead. I killed him. No, he's not dead. He just fainted. No, he's dead. He's alive, Susan. Not that I really care after what he did to your sister. I wanted to kill him. I'm not sorry. He tricked me, you know. I know, I know. Now, are you ready to go back now, Susan? <clears throat> Susan. But you... You... No... You told me with your paintings. You see, your sister has a distinctive style. She tried to tell me that in Westbrook. She duplicated from memory those three paintings on that wall. Exactly. (laughs) And and is the artist. But I don't care. Max... I didn't really mean to hurt him. I understand. But I'm I'm still not sorry. I'm not sorry about anything. You can take me back now. All right, all right, Susan. Susan. <laughs> Susan. <laughs> that's that's a nice name. <laughs> The sheriff took Susan home to Westbrook. And Anita, after many embarrassed apologies, is back at work. I understand she's been commissioned to do a mural inside the sheriff's office. For those of you wondering about the unfortunate Max, it seems Dr. Cooper was very interested to learn of his book. So interested, in fact, that he's made Max a permanent fixture up at Westbrook. You could call him the resident author. I'll be right back. To any of you who are asking if there is a moral, a lesson to be learned from our little story, let me assure you, we do not attempt to moralize. We do not presume to teach. However, if you happen to be close friends with a writer who is hard up for a story... I would just say, be prepared for anything. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Robert Dryden, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... Dream. 
Tonight's W.R. Mystery Theater was brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program is furnished by the Columbia Broadcast. I'm E.G. Marshall, ready if you are to probe once again into the depths of imagination and the heights of illusion. Illusion. What is life? A philosopher asked. And to answer his own question, he replied, life is an illusion, a shadow, a story. And this may well be. But in that event, we may well ask, whose illusions? Whose shadow? Whose story? Is this life only a dream? Are we characters in our own reverie? If that is true, and it may well be, who and what are we when we awake? Our mystery drama, Death is a Dream, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little world is rounded with a sleep. So said William Shakespeare, and so lives Mary Catherine Collins. Mary Catherine lives in a world of never-ending nightmare. It's a world of heart-stabbing terror and apprehension. Every night, there's the dream, the same dream. It refuses to leave her. She can only fight off sleep for so long, and then... The dream once again overwhelms her. And each night, the dream is exactly the same in every minute detail. It's just the way it was when she dreamed it for the first time on that night of August the 14th. That night is seared in her memory forever. I see Joe. My brother Joe. And he's walking, walking his beat. The night's dark. And a soft rain is falling. And drops of water glisten on his black policeman's raincoat. And he's whistling that tune, the tune I never heard anywhere else. And he always said, one day I'll tell you the name of it. And he's walking down that street, that old, tired, run-down street, alone. All alone. And because it's my dream, he doesn't see what I see. Just around the corner. A man. It's too hard to make out his face in the dark. But he carries a box in one hand and a pistol in the other. And he's climbing out of the window of a warehouse just as my brother's about to turn the corner. And I scream, look out, Joe. Look out, he's got a gun. Joe! Uh, uh, But he didn't hear me. He didn't hear me. My brother never heard me. a dream. Yes. Hold. Uh, yes, just a minute. Who? Who is it? Mary? It's Frank Miller. Oh. Uh, guess what? What is it, Frank? Come on in. Mary, I, uh... You... You're here because of Joe... Y- yes, Mary. I, uh... Something has happened to Joe, and you've come to tell me yourself. Mary. Joe is dead. <laughs> He's dead, isn't he? Why else would you be here at this time of the night? Joe's dead. Yes, Mary. He was killed by some hoodlum who was robbing a warehouse at the end of Water Street. Mary, who told you? I saw it happen. I saw it happen. Now, Mary, you must get a hold of yourself. He was shot just as he turned the corner. His revolver was still in his holster. He never had a chance. Joe never had a chance. I know how hard it is, Mary. I saw it happen. Oh, why? 
Why did I see it happen? I saw it happen as if I were sitting in a theater. And it was all taking place on a giant screen. And from that night on, I saw it happen. Every night. Every night I was condemned to relive it again. And again. And again. Lieutenant Miller. Who? Oh, look. uh, Tell her... uh... No, tell her to come in. Mary. It's good to see you. Is it? Good to see me, Frank. Mary, how can you say that? I'm becoming a pest. Admit it, Frank. Oh, I'll admit no such thing. I haunt you day and night. I pester you with phone calls every hour on the hour. Well, it's it's understandable. I I know how much your brother Joe meant to you. No, you don't. Nobody could ever hope to understand how much Joe meant to me. Mary, I'm sorry. We're all sorry. But sorrow gets us nowhere. It's been six weeks now since Joe was killed. Mary, we've had every available man out on this case. I know. It isn't your fault. But I know how the department works. And little by little, my brother is going to become a statistic. Just another police officer killed in the line of duty by an unknown assailant. Mary, we're doing our best. I didn't say you weren't. What I'm saying is that your best isn't good enough. That's not fair. Fair? Oh, What's fair? Was it fair for my brother to be gunned down without warning? His revolver still in his holster? Oh, why did he have to be killed? Joe was a good cop. He gave everybody a break, and he liked to help people. Why did he... Look, Mary, we'll get the killer. No, I don't think so. And so that's why... That's why what? That's why... I'm going to get him myself. Well, just what exactly does that mean? It means I'll have to get him myself. Well, how can you... I plan to spend a great deal of time in that neighborhood. Doing... Doing what? Teaching school. Teaching school? Why not? I'm a school teacher. (laughs) But you're teaching uptown. I've asked for a transfer. Do you know what those kids are like? What that area is like? It was where my brother worked and was murdered. What can you possibly hope to... I intend to become a part of that neighborhood. (laughs) You mean you'll poke around and ask questions? You can put it any way you like. You realize you can get yourself killed? I have a job to do. I'd taken step one. I'd made the decision to leave the soft and delightful job at North Crescent High School, known and with good reason as the country club. My principal was completely at a loss to understand why I'd want to leave his pleasant, well-ordered school for what he could only describe as the witch's cauldron at Southern District. Of course, there was no way I could... And now, step two. To be accepted, judge's principal at Southern District. I realized it wasn't going to be automatic. You thought we were so desperate for teachers here we'd grab anybody who walks in? Well, truthfully, I didn't think there'd be... Well, the first part of your assumption is correct. We are desperate for teachers. Teachers. That's why we have to be very particular. But I... Yes, Miss Collins. I have a good record. Miss Collins, tell me. What are you doing here? Oh, isn't that obvious? I want to teach English at your school. Why? Because... Uh, because I'm an English teacher. I've done more fencing in the five minutes you've been in this office than all the three musketeers put together. You have had the plum of the system. A job at North Crescent, mostly motivated kids from comfortably situated families. Ninety percent of them go on to college. Do you know what we... Oh, I think so. You think so? Miss Collins... I know. Are difficult children. Difficult? <laughs> yes. Children? No. These are only... Adolescents chronologically. Well, I felt that there was no challenge at North Crescent. I see. And that here I would be tested to the utmost of my ability. I want to see if I can measure up. Well, Mr. Hodges, won't you say something? Miss Collins, I am seldom, if ever, at a loss for words. But I simply cannot figure you out. You mean you don't believe me? 
I need teachers. Cavalier as I may sound, I need teachers. I work with seniors. Do you? Yes, especially with the advanced lit courses. Do you think you can... Shakespeare? I've done it. Okay. Good luck. We'll set up a program for you. Thank you, Mr. Hodges. And I know that I'll be successful. I'm sure you will. Provided you survive. And so the time arrived for me to report for my first class. And I paused at the doorway and looked into the room. My heart did more than sink. I died within me. That classroom was a madhouse. They were tough kids. I almost regretted my transfer, but I remembered my brother Joe. And I knew I'd have to go through with this somehow. I needed a reason to be in that neighborhood. And I had to start with a nucleus of friends. In acquaintances. Hey, look at hey, that. Hey, 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 Mr. Tinker. Oh, come on. Hey, what you hey, Chase, oh, what are you doing? Class, doing now? Huh? This uh, class. Hey, Chase, what are you doing tonight? Please. Hey, look at her. Hey, please, 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 please. This class will come to order. Please. Oh, I'm going to order a couple of beers. Hey, what are you going to have? Chuck, <laughs> who's got the dice? Let's get the game going. Now you. Oh, yeah, no. You in the blue shirt. Yeah. You report to the principal's office. Oh, how about oh, that? Yeah. And you, you there with the red hair, will you please sit down? Oh, that's a wig. I'll take it off. The dumb lady near the window. <laughs> yeah, but she ain't no lady. Hey, hey, there ain't no action around here. Let's What's that? Down. What's that? Yeah. Now, let's move it. All right, now. Turn off that radio. Yeah, hey, teach. Can I have the pleasure of this man? I've now, seen her fight. Will you oh, please turn off that radio? Now, put that off. I'm sorry, Mr. Hodges. It was a fiasco. I know. I was just across the hall. I saw it all. You saw it? And you permitted it? We have to find out if you can control these kids. You can empty the room by sending everyone to my office for discipline, but that's not teaching. I'm afraid you'd better go back to North... Oh, no, please, please, please give me another chance. Why? Because I could understand if you liked these kids, but... But you don't. Oh, I, I, I do, really. No. And they said the minute you walked in. They saw it. They, they felt it. They felt what? Your hostility. Your contempt. Oh, that's not true. It isn't. You are repelled by these youngsters, and it shows. Now, Collins, you'd better go back to the well-ordered world of North Crescent. Oh, please, Mr. Hodges, you must give another chance. I'm sorry, Miss Collins, it won't work. No, you can't turn me down. Miss Collins, I will give you another chance on one condition. You must tell me the real reason you want to work here. But I told you... No, you'd... And now I insist. Very well, Mr. Hodges. I'll tell you. Well, what will Mary tell him? The real reason? If she does, how will he take it? If not the real one, then she needs a reason that sounds convincing. And can she make one up on the spur of the moment? One thing we know... Mary must have the job if she's to have any chance of finding her brother Joe's killer. Well, fortunately, she has a few moments to think about before I return with Act Two. Things are seldom what they seem. Skilk masquerades as cream. It's one of Catherine Collins' favorite verses. And now, it's going to form a pattern for the next portion of her life. She is attempting to masquerade as a dedicated teacher in a slum district school in order to find out, if she can, the identity of her brother's killer. But her first problem is to get the job. And John Hodges, principal, has very grave doubts indeed. Mr. Hodges, I agree. It's time we told each other the truth. Uh, let's say it's time you told me the truth. Uh... My name, Collins. Does that mean anything to you? Collins. Collins. No, I don't think so. Well, almost two weeks ago, a police officer was killed in this neighborhood. Yes. Yes, I, I knew him. Officer Collins. I even knew his last name. Everyone called him Joe. He was my brother. Oh. Oh, I am sorry. And then you know that he was an unusual man. Yes. Yeah. He 
could have risen high. He could have gone far in the department, but he chose not to. He felt that good cops were needed in places like this. And I feel that if I could take his place somehow, if I could be the kind of influence in the classroom that he tried to be out on the street. Well, I won't be the one to refuse you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Hodges. Miss Combs, why... Why do you think your brother was so successful with the people in our neighborhood? Well, I guess... I suppose... He had a gift. He sure did. And do you know what that gift was? Like the people. That's 90% of what you need, Miss Collins. I had told him a half-truth, but it was enough to nail down the job. And now, in order to get it, I'd have to like those kids. But how? Okay, round one. Hey, what Come is fighting. That? Oh, oh, come on, fight. Yeah. All right, now. Yeah, fight now, now, calm down. Now. Class, today I am going to introduce you to a man named William Shakespeare. Uh, yeah, where is he? He's right here in this, in my hand. Well, why should I want to meet him? What's in it for me? Uh-huh. <laughs> Very good question. What is your name? Charlie, I believe, huh? Oh, yeah, good, 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 good. Well, you should become acquainted with Mr. Shakespeare, because as soon as you go back to reform school... Uh, to all the reform school. Again, again. I go up to the big joint on my next rap. Well, either way, you're going to have a lot of time on your hands. And Mr. Shakespeare can make it pass very quickly. Hello? Mary, I finally cracked you down. Oh, hello, Frank. I didn't know you were going to live down there, too. Well, see, I found this little uh, apartment. It's uh, convenient to the school. Mary, the neighborhood. Oh, I know. Believe me, I know. But people do live here. Mary, what are you doing? You can't go around asking people... Know who killed police officer Collins. Yes, I understand. Well, then what are you doing? I don't know, Frank. It's just being here. I mean, I, I could hear something or see something. The department is working on it. You can get hurt. Oh, oh Frank. Well, what is it? Well, what's the matter? Frank, I, I... Mary, is something wrong? I can have a cop over just a second. No. No, I'm all right. Are you sure? <laughs> What's the matter? You think everybody's deaf? What do you want? Listen, I, I, I live upstairs in apartment 4F. Oh, oh, yeah, you're the school teacher. Yes, I, I have to see the superintendent. Uh, honey, down here we don't have no superintendents. We got got to see him immediately. You can't do it. Why not? Because he's drunk. Look for yourself. You see? Sprawled all over the couch. Well, somebody has to do something about what? There's a rat in my apartment. Only one? Oh, <laughs> you're lucky. I just saw him. How do you know it's for him? I was sitting at the telephone and I saw this enormous rat. You sure it wasn't a mouth hole? Well, what's going to be done about it? You got a gun? Shoot him. Now, please. Okay. When Straw out here wakes up, I'll send him to your place. He'll bring up a broom handle or a trap. I don't know what he does. And what am I going to do in the meantime? About what? About the rat. I don't know. Try to make friends with him. I am friends with him. Well, the days passed and I couldn't make friends with anybody. In the class, I'd reached a point where I was being tolerated, but surely. And in the neighborhood, I was obviously alien clay. There was something different about me. My clothes, my accent. I had the look of somebody who didn't have to live there. And that made me suspect. And another thing, I was a teacher. I worked for the government, and the government always meant trouble. There were police, parole officers, and... Welfare investigators, I was beginning to feel very foolish. How was I ever going to get anywhere in finding Joe's killer? To whom could I talk? Well, hiya, Mary. Well, good morning, child. Ah, uh, you saw because I called you Mary. Now, it ain't as if we were in class. Hey, where'd you get the car? I didn't get it. I bought it. I earned the money and I bought it. Oh, why do you always have to make a lesson out of everything? You're trying to tell me get a job, Charlie, be a good little boy, work hard, save your money, and one day you'll have enough to yes, buy... Yes, I suppose that is what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, work is for suckers. There's a quicker, easier way. And the jails are filled with people who took it. Now, listen, Charles, you like this car. Well, I worked to put the money in the bank. The idea is not to put dough in the bank. 
but to take it out. Ah, but you have to deposit it first. No, you don't. Not if you walk in with a gun. But that's stealing. What about all the smooth, dignified, white-haired guys who steal millions and get away with it? Well, if you want to be a crook, why not be the best? Get yourself a good education so you can become one of the smooth, dignified, white-haired boys yourself. Will you mind? Why? I mean, is your way better? Do you want to spend your life in jail or be gunned down? Well, Mary, what are you doing here? Making a living. Oh, come on, come on. You, you don't have to work here. You're a class dame. What's your angle? Angle? Everybody's got an angle. Unless... Unless what? Unless you like it down here. But then you'd have to be nuts. <laughs> All right, a minute. All right, everybody, that's it. Yeah. Now, for tomorrow, we have pages 30 through 45. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, what the heck is this? It's so much. Uh, Miss Collins? Yes, yes, Tony, what is it? Uh, uh it, it ain't nothing. No, no, it isn't anything. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It isn't anything. Uh, I... You have know, well? Well, uh, like I said, it ain't... Uh, it isn't nothing. Uh, anything. But, uh... I want to tell you something. Yes? About Shakespeare. Oh? I used to think, uh, you know, Shakespeare, what gives was Shakespeare, you know? But uh, all of a sudden, I, I, I seen it. I mean, I seen the guys for real. Is that so? Yeah, like you was reading. And you said, uh, neither a borrower nor a lender be. Remember? That's Shakespeare, right? <laughs> yes, it's Hamlet. Yeah, this guy, uh, Polonius, says that, but... But, but that's what my old man, he, he should rest in peace. Yeah, that's what, that's what my old man always used to say to me. He'd say, Tony, don't borrow money off in a guy. Don't lend money off in a guy. And you'll be friends with everybody, you see? Yes, I see. This, uh, Polonius, I, I hear what he says. Uh, okay, he knows some fancy words my old man never heard of, but, uh, this Polonius, he's, uh, he's my old man. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, I... I kind of missed the old man, you know. Uh, and now I come across this guy and, uh, well, uh, w what I want to say is, um, uh, thanks. Well, I'm sure you're welcome, Tony. Look, uh, if there's something I can do for you, I, I mean, you name it, is there something I can do for you? How could I ask him? How could I say, do you know who killed Officer Joe Collins? kind of a question would that be? And where would it lead? And why would he know? But I finally promised that I would call on him if ever I needed help. I don't know how long I'd been sitting there when... Mary. What? Oh, I was walking down the hall. Your classroom door was open. I saw you sitting there. There was something very strange about you. Oh, really? Yes. For the first time since you've come here, I saw you smiling. Oh, I always smile. No, no. This was truly a smile, as if it came from the basic meaning of the word itself, which means to be astonished. What happened? Well, I think I just taught somebody something. And you're starting to get an inkling of the reason why your brother Joe worked down here. Hmm. I think so. Hey, Mary. Oh, hello, Dora. Uh, did you tell your husband about the leaky faucet? Oh, yeah, yeah. He'll get around to it one of these weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, listen. Now, now, tell me if I'm talking out of turn. Uh, are you on the lam? <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, you know what I mean, kid? Do the cops want you? Well, what makes you think the cops want me? Because huh? a cop has been around asking for you. A plain clothes guy. Well, then how did you know he was a cop? Oh, kid, I can smell him. He's in the hallway now. He is. Well, uh, thanks. Ah, so you are on the land. I didn't say that. Then what are you going back to your car for? Well, I just remembered. I uh, have a date. Listen, kid. I'm glad to help. Now, before you come back, give me a ring, huh? I'll tell you if the coast is clear. <laughs> But I acted on the spur of the moment and acted is exactly the right word for it. 
And Dora spread the word. The implication was that I was sort of hiding out down here. And instantly, my status changed. People no longer stopped talking when I passed by. I was no longer given guarded attention when I walked into a shop. Evidently, now I belonged. But I was getting no closer to my objective. How could I come out with the direct questions? I was becoming a part of the neighborhood, but I still wasn't getting anywhere. Give it up, Mary. Frank, I can't. I've got to get that murder. I know, I know, but it will have to be done in the usual way. And maybe it won't be done at all. That could happen. And the killer goes free, is that right? What am I going to do? Come home, to where you belong. No, I belong where I can find Joe's clerk. But it hasn't worked. Help me, Frank. How? Tell me how I should go about it. I, I don't know what moves to make. There are no moves you can make. I mean, if you were in my place, you are a trained detective, what would you do? Well, I'd have stool pigeons out. We did, you know, but nobody picked up the slightest rumble. Very well, the informer angle has been covered. Then what? Well, the truth is we're doing what you're doing and with no more success. What's got us licked is if we could only get a description, any kind of description, then we could ask definite questions. We could ask, do you know a guy who codes like this or that? But there are no witnesses. But what did you say, Frank? I said, there are no witnesses. But that isn't true. Well, what isn't true? There was a witness. <laughs> Mary, what are you saying? There was a witness. There was a witness. Was there? I've been following the story very carefully and closely, and I'm not aware of any witness. After all, Joe was killed on a lonely street. No one was there what had happened. Yet Mary says there was a witness. Oh, oh, yes, of course there was. Can you figure out who? It should take you more than a few moments, and by that time, I shall return with Act Three. Joe Collins was killed in the line of duty. He was walking along a deserted street late one rainy night, doing his job, walking his beat. Someone shot him down and fled, and two months have gone by, and the police are no nearer to catching the killer than they were the night it happened. Only his sister has discovered the one element that is absolutely vital to the successful capture of the criminal. Or so she says. Mary, there were no witnesses. No one saw it happen. That isn't true. Someone did see it happen. Who? Me. What? I saw it happen. Mary, you weren't there. I didn't say I was there. I said I saw it happen. But how could you possibly... Because I dreamed about it. Oh, Mary. That night you came to my apartment to tell me yourself, remember? I remember. And you will also remember that I knew, I knew it before you even told me. Yes, I remember. Well, how did it happen that I could even tell you where? At the end of Water Street. And remember you were shocked. Remember you said, Mary, who told you? At the time I was upset and nervous. How would I know that it was Water Street? I saw Joe turn that corner. And I saw the man coming out of the window of the warehouse. And I saw that he had a gun. And he fired as soon as he saw my brother. I am the witness because I saw the whole thing. All right, Mary. Fine, tell me. What does the killer look like? What? Well, you say you saw the killing. Describe the killer. Is that an unfair question? Oh, no, but I... Oh, but what? Well, I didn't... Get a good look at him. Oh. See, I... I was so terrified... And I was so afraid for Joe that I... I and besides, the man was in the shadow. I couldn't see him. Uh, I hate to say this, Mary, but your dream really doesn't do us any good. From a practical point of view, that is. Yes, but next time I'll... Next time I'll concentrate on the killer. Next time? Yes, next time. Tonight. Every night I dream this dream, Frank. Every night. And this time I'm not going to fight it. I'll wait for it gladly. I'll welcome it. And this time I won't look at my brother... I look at the killer. Joe! Joe, look out. He's got a gun. Joe! Joe! 
I tried to look at the man in the shadowy darkness, but I couldn't take my eyes off my brother. And it's in that darkness that the killer exists. And I've got to find him there. I must remember to look there, to look again. You sent for me, John? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know there was anyone here with you. Hi, Teach. Well, what's the trouble? You'll have to go to the police station and identify your car. Why? Well, it seems uh, Charles here and a few of his buddies took your car and went joyriding and then piled it up against a telephone pole. They would have abandoned it except for the fact that a police cruiser happened along. The rest got away. Charles was caught. Oh? Uh-huh. Preliminary estimates on the damage run about $900. Oh, what's everybody running a fee for the insurance pays, don't it? That's a great attitude. I'm glad you like it. It's time I'm afraid it's jail. I've given up on you, Charles. Now you're breaking my heart. Oh, uh, why does Charles have to go to jail? Stealing a car is against the law. Who says he stole the car? What? Who says he stole the car? The truth is I gave him permission to use the car. Mary. Mary, it's wrong for you. No, you see, I don't use it very much. And I understand if you don't run a car regularly, you get carbon deposits, isn't that so? This is not the way to do things. Well, that's the truth. I won't permit it. John, it's the way it happened. Okay. Okay, I'll hold still. But on one condition. This one and his pals... I've got to get jobs and cover the insurance bill. Oh, that sounds reasonable. The foreman at Jackson's warehouse. You fellas can all work there after school. And now, if you'll excuse me. Thanks. I, uh... I said you were a class name. What's been done is done, Charles. And you will have to pay to have it fixed. Oh, listen, me and the guys can steal you better one. Oh, no, no, no. I don't think so. Listen, you're smart, Charles. Why be a cheap crook? How about becoming one of those smooth, dignified guys? <laughs> For that, you got to go to college. So? Huh? Me? Yes, you. Oh, you got to have rocks in your skull. Me go to college? Why not? Yeah, why not? That's it. Say why not. Say it and keep saying it and say it all the time. And after a while, you won't find a single reason against it. Why are you doing this? Because as a teacher, it's my job to inspire you to get all the education you can handle. And you are bright enough to handle a great deal. Yeah, 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 but... Why'd you get me off that stolen car, Rep? Oh, that? Yeah, I can't figure it. Nobody ever done nothing for me before. I mean, zilch, zero, nada. Well, isn't it a better world when people try to help each other? Yeah, sure. All right, what can I do to help you? Someday I might ask you some questions. Questions? Like what? Well, like, would you know a certain person? So ask, what do you want to know? Well, I don't know yet. But when you find out, you'll ask, won't you? Oh, yes. I'll ask. dream, I saw the man. Clearly. For the first time. Not his face. I didn't get the chance. But I saw his body. I saw his body clearly defined in the shadow. He was young. Young even as some of the kids in my own classes. And he was slim. Almost thin. And he was tall. And tomorrow night... Tomorrow night I'll concentrate on his face. Suppose I could give you a description of the killer. That'd be great. But where would you get it? Well, every night in my nightmare, I see him more and more clearly. You mean you want a jury to believe that a man you see in a dream is... Well, why killer? not? I've seen all the rest of the crime. Can you imagine what a defense attorney would do with you on the stand? Frank, the man I see in the dream is the killer. We'll need more than a dream to convict. Well, maybe you do, but I don't. And what does that mean? That means that I can handle all of it myself. Mary, you're not saying what I think you're saying. 
the murderer who killed my brother will be dealt with, if not by the law, then by me. Harry! I must sleep. I must fall asleep. Right now. Now, while I'm still calm and relaxed, I need all my energy to look into that shadow along the wall of the warehouse. I've got to see his face tonight. I must see his face, the face of the killer. And then I shall hunt him down tonight. Tonight I will see. Joe! Look out, he's got a gun! Look out, Joe! That tall kid with the blonde hair in the scar across his... Oh, my God! It's... Charles, Charles, I wonder, could you stay after class for a few minutes? Yeah, right on, Chief. Hey, what are you going to stay after, Charlie? Ah, knock it off. Charles, Charles, Hmm? Charles. Uh, I need some help. Any time? Well, I have to drive out into the country uh, to pick up an antique, and I need someone to... To lift? Carry? Oh, well, I'm your pigeon. Uh, but we're going to get back early. It's just that I got a date. Dad, who cares? If she don't like it, I can get somebody else. I've always been independent with names. And I'm sure you can afford to be with that blonde hair. And even that scar makes you look handsome. Well, are you ready? Sure. Oh, listen, oh, I'm glad I found you, Mary. You, uh, you have a telephone call in my office. His name is Frank. He said it's of vital importance. What? What is it, Frank? We got him, Mary. We got him. You got who? Well, who do you think? The killer. The man who murdered your brother. But that's... That's what, Mary? Do you realize what I've just told you? I... We got him. Are are you sure? It's ice cold. He was arrested in a stick-up at Larson City, just north of here. We checked his gun, and ballistics says it's the same one that fired the slugs that killed Joe. But... But what? To ice the cake, he even confessed. He did? Yes, funny. You know, if we'd only known what he looked like, he would have been a cinch to pick up. If only there'd been a witness. He's tall, thin, long blonde hair, and a funny little scar. Oh, Frank. Frank. What is it? Oh, thank you, Frank. Oh, thank you. Well, I suppose you'll be leaving us now. Leaving you? Why do you say that? Well, I spoke to Lieutenant Miller. He, He told me everything. Oh, And so, now that the killer has been caught, I suppose it's back to North Crescent High for you. I don't know, John. You see, I'm not at all sure that they caught the killer. But they say the man's confessed. Well, they may have caught the man who pulled the trigger, but the killer is still here. The killer is here in these streets. The killer is what you and my brother Joe kept fighting against day and night. The poverty and the hopelessness and the feeling that nobody gives a damn. Hey, Miss Collins, uh, are we gone? Oh, no, Charles, no. I, um, uh, I changed my mind. Oh, okay. Uh, but look, any time I can help. Oh, you've already helped me. Yeah? How? Oh, you'll never know. Well, I'll, uh, I'll see you in class tomorrow. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps on in this petty pace from day to day. Ah, Shakespeare. Right, Teach? Right. Tomorrow. That's the greatest gift of all gifts. A tomorrow. And Mary Catherine Collins will make sure of that by working today and every day with the kids that Joe loved so much. How fortunate a man Joe was. All the love and care that he had lavished on his sister returned to all the children. And I shall return with some love and a warning in just a few moments. If you're a bargain hunter, art buff, gold lover, gambler, archaeologist, girl watcher, or just plain sun worshiper, you should be in South America right now. 
Granite International will fly you to the land where the American dollar is still worth a dollar. And where, like the opposite of a King Midas, everything you touch seems to be half the price you'd expect to pay. Braniff to South America on an intercontinental DC-862 jet. From there, it's up to you. The thick green jungles of the Amazon, the thin blue mountain air of the Andes, noisy Indian markets, or the noisy Rio Festival, tranquil monasteries, or even more tranquil stretches of palm-fringed beach. Ask your travel agent about Braniff's South America, an adventure and a bargain in flying colors. extension of reality? Who can say? It was given to Mary to dream of her brother's death. Why? And to see the face of his killer, the true face, not the visage of a man, but the entire countenance of society, the crucible wherein the killers are formed. Here is also a crucible, and we form one of these stories for you seven times a week. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Michael Wager, Bob Caliban, Jack Grimes, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tonight's WORM Mystery Theater was also brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program was furnished by the Columbia Broadcasting System. Your dial is set for news with John Scott reporting. This is WOR New York, an RKO General Station. I'm E.G. Marshall. At the beginning of the 16th century, in what we now call Mexico, one of the world's most remarkable civilizations came to flower. The Aztecs were artists, architects, engineers, remarkable administrators, handsome, sensitive, and imaginative. Only one thing marred this great people, their cruel religion which demanded and exacted the most terrifying sacrifices to the gods. Imagine, if you will, a time 400 years ago in the season for pleasing the god Tlaloc, the rain god, who must be kept from pouring down torrents which would destroy the corn crop. We are in the house of Atox. Our mystery drama, The Altar of Blood, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars... Fred Gwynn. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The sudden death of Professor J. Hollington Wells' wife drove him in despair from the halls of Ivy, where he was a professor of archaeology, back into the field, back to Mexico. What had brought Professor Wells to Mexico City and Lake Texcoco was his wife's ancestry. Although a second-generation American herself, her forebears could be traced back to the Aztecs and their great city of Tenochtitlan. And on the ground of her ancestors, he tried to bury his grief in an intimate and deep study of the Aztecs, a contact that surprisingly led him far afield and his daughter into incredible and terrifying danger. What is it, Maria, dear? Oh, I had this terrible dream. I, I thought I had been held on the sacrificial altar and the high priest had torn out my heart. Oh, it's it's my fault. I should have never dragged you down. Oh, don't blame yourself. Ah, but I do. Echoes of the past, perhaps. Oh, 
Heaven knows what pervading waves swirl around us from that great civilization which died too soon. Even I, who have no roots in them, couldn't sleep tonight, thinking of all their prowess and their grandeur. Were you dreaming of sacrifices, too? <laughs> Half awake. But yes, hard to understand the contradiction. <laughs> A people so intellectually awake to life, and yet so tied to fear of the future. Maybe I can understand them a little. Hmm? What do you mean? I don't quite know. I am descended from them. I was thinking of Mother. <laughs> of Carlotta? Why? Why did she have to die so young? What sacrifice would you have made to save her if you could have? No, oh, this is this is night talk, darling. No melancholy maunderings by me. <laughs> you, you, you can't change what has happened. We came away to try and write off a personal tragedy. Well, except that you didn't pick the best place to forget. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Yeah. Mexico, particularly Tecnoctitlan, was the last place to run to. Where shall we pick up to leave for tomorrow? Madagascar? Carcassonne? Tahiti? New Zealand? Or back to the good old USA? No, I like Mexico. And no wild nightmare is going to change anything. But I would like to get away from the valley for a while. Why not? My notes are all complete. I can write my book anywhere. Besides, I'd like to see the other coast. Ah, I've got an idea. What? I've never seen nor traveled the Pacific side. We'll rent a car and drive through Guadalajara to Puerto Vallarta and down to Playa, Colorado for a real vacation. Playa, Colorado? It's one of those new clubs that provide a total vacation, which are opening up all over the world. Inexpensive, good food, scads of young people for you to meet instead of hanging around with an old fogey like me. But that is the way I think of you. Yeah, well, I'll accept the compliment, but then insist the wiser head must prevail. What you need is someone your own age to blow the past right out of your head. And that's just what I'm going to arrange to have happen to you. Now, go back to sleep. And no more dreams. We're really leaving the past behind now. Good night. I love you, Father. I am sleepy. Good night. <laughs> Mexico has as many faces as the U.S. Oh, I wouldn't agree to that all the way. But compared to the Yucatan and the valley, oh, this is marvelous. Oh, those craggy mountains to the left, and how wonderful to look out to the sea on the right. It's a little like the uh, Amalfi Drive in Italy. Huh, since I'm driving, I'm glad this road is better. Although I guess by now they've widened that old terror. <laughs> they have. But I remember that first year after high school and before college... That you drove Mom and me down the Italian coast? No, I'd rather forget it. I'm sorry. Oh, not because of your mother. Just how scared I was driving. <laughs> Damn! What is it? Blow out. Oh, thank heaven it was a rear tire. Well, why don't you stop? On this road? I'm trying to find some place I can pull over and be out of traffic. You can't go to the right. It's a hundred... It's a hundred foot drop. Cut over to the left. You do a sheer cliff? Oh, no. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold your hat. What are you going to do? Uh, there's a little spot over there. I can drive the car off the road. But it'll be rough going for a moment, too. I hope no one comes around the pendant week. Of course. Uh, here goes. Oh, damn. Another tire? Uh, I'm afraid so. Huh. Now we're really stuck. Okay, Professor. Which way do we start walking? Uh, <laughs> well, not back anyway. We must be a good 15 to 20 miles outside Puerto Vallarta. And the other way? There's a village, Tomatian. I wonder if we'd find a mechanic there. It's quite a hike. Well, we can't just sit here. It'll be dark in a few hours. We're not exactly in the wilderness, you know. There is a bus route along this road, and we have passed a few other cars. All of them headed the opposite way, and few and far between. Well, at least we can speak the language. Socorro! Hey, senor, uh, socorro. Uh, por favor, senor. Uh, nuestro automobile has no trabajo. Sir, uh, say me the Spanish. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. My, uh, my French is great, my German is passable, and in six months I hope my Spanish will be at least as good, but right now I'm happy to find it's Americans in trouble. Oh, I didn't mean it the way it sounds. Oh, I know you didn't. Oh, uh, this is my daughter, Maria, and my name is Wells, Hallington Wells. 
hell of a name when it comes down to it. I don't think so. Not if you're the J. Allington Wells, the archaeologist. That's who he is. Well, then, this is an unexpected honor and pleasure, Miss Wells. Uh, I'm Bill Hallam. Oh, you're interested in archaeology? If my major in college. I'm pleased to meet you. As we are you, for more reasons than one. I'll second that. But uh, we'd better get a move on before some crazy Mexican comes one way or the other or both and finds my Jeep in the way. They drive this road like it was the Indy 500. I'm afraid my car's grounded. Yes, I can see that. Unless you have two spares. But I can give you a lift. Where were you headed? Playa, Colorado. Well, that's just great. It's where I work. Come on, the chariot awaits. I'll help you with your bags and we can make all of the arrangements to have your car taken care of there. What do you do at the club? I am what they call a G.O. I'll uh, get the big one, Professor. No, what's a G.O.? A general organizator. Polite name for beach boy, guide, companion. And then all of us have our own specialties. Have we got everything? I think so. What's your specialty, Bill? A uh, sailing instructor. Oh, great. I'd love to go for a sail with you. You know something? So would I. I don't normally get knocked off my feet by the body beautiful. My parents, background, natural affinity has been more for brains than brawn. But it was obvious Bill had both. And Playa, Colorado was just what the doctor might have ordered for Dad and me. Glorious meals, a hacienda type bungalow hanging on the mountainside over the sea. Complete informality. And most of all, a return to the present. A cutting of a link with the past that obsessed me all my life. My Aztec heritage. And my father's absorption in yesterday rather than today. And the best part of all was my daily sail with Bill. All right. Heaven. Stand by to come about. Oh, do we have to? Oh, on this tack, if we go any further, we're committed to go right out of the bay into the Pacific. I can't be. It got a bit rough out there. Well, I don't get seasick. Yeah, we're not supposed to. Oh, come on. You know the clubs between turnovers. There are plenty of other boats. And we have the kicker if we get in real trouble. <laughs> I can't think of anyone I'd rather get in trouble with. Well, then hold your course, matey. There's a little cove out there beyond this big island or whatever it is. Can we fetch that cove? If the wind doesn't shift, I'd reckon. And we've plenty of gas to get home if it picks up and we have to sail back in it. Then take me there. Lady, I will kid you not. I will take you to the end of the earth if you ask me and care not a whit if I ever return. That's very really nice. You're quite a poet, sir. So is every man in love. Oh, oh, oh. Look out for those summer romances. Now, it's a lot deeper than that, Maria. I know. But let's give it a little time to grow up. I have the funniest feeling about that little cold thing. Did you like it? Who knocks paradise? I think it's just what Dad's been looking for since Mother died. You know that big mound that juts out from the mountain with a sort of mesa on top? Yeah. It'd be the perfect place for a small house. There's water from the stream above. You, you could cut a driveway down from the main road. There's electricity and, and phone lines there. I wonder who owns the property. I think it's state land. The alcalde in Manzanillo would know. Could you take Dad over there tomorrow to see? Sure. But, you know, building there wouldn't be all that easy. That's practically jungle, matted with mesquite and cactus and vines. And there's only a thin layer of soil over sheer volcanic rock. I know, Bill, I know, but... I don't know how to say it. Something, something calls me there, tells me to go there. Insists that I come back to see it. I've got to go back. No matter what, I have got to take care to see it. We did go back, and Dad's reaction was just as strong as mine. It was like coming home. So two days later, we found ourselves discussing the possibility of buying the property with the mayor of Montanillo. And does I say, senor, it can be bought for a very fair price, I hope. Oh, well, yes, the price is cheap, but uh, I am aware of your prominence, Dr. Wells, and I'm also well aware that your daughter is of our people historically. I feel it, it would be unfair not to tell you that it, this place has, how do you say, it has a bad name. Why? It is a forest, a jungle, no? 
Out on the road, yes. There is much wildlife, more than is usual in this part of Mexico. I don't need the snakes, the iguana. I mean the jaguar, perhaps the puma even. In this area, there have been many unexplained deaths. You mean man-eating jaguars? Uh, something like that. What do you mean, something like that? If we lived in the valley or the Yucatan, one might worry about ancient ghosts. Ghosts? The men and occasional animals who have been found dead all died the same way. How? The, uh, the senorita will forgive me. I try not to be too, how do you say, graphic. But the chest has been torn apart and the heart removed and taken away. The rest of the body has been untouched. Why would a carnivorous animal who kills to eat select only the heart? Or is this just legend which can be created and believed so easily by peasants who live in constant daily superstition? Or does the alcalde have some ulterior motive to protect this piece of mountain shoreline we do not yet understand? I'll return shortly with Act Two. Whatever the alcalde's doubts may have been about Vista de la Laguna, as the property turned out to be called, Maria and her father brushed them aside. They were impelled, almost driven to buy. The transaction was simple. And within a week, mestizos were hacking and grading a rough road down from the main one. In less than a month, the foundation had been dug. And late one afternoon, Bill had come down to visit them at the temporary trailer in which they were living. Hey, your building crew cuts out pretty early. <laughs> <laughs> one cloud over the sun, even a hint of darkness on the way, and they are over the hill. Vista de Laguna doesn't enjoy much reputation except between Maria and me. You see no signs of jaguar or puma? No. I had the bush beaten pretty thoroughly before we bought, and there was no sign of track of them. Well, how do you suppose the legend built up? Yeah, search me. This isn't land for those creatures anyway. You don't suppose... Suppose what? Well... You know, the business of the heart being torn out, that's so Aztec or Mayan or... No, oh, the Mayans never spread west beyond Oaxaca, as far as we know. And the Aztecs were concentrated in the middle of the country. Although, we know after Cortes and the invasion, they scattered and were driven west. Mm. There is some belief that they may have occupied a small strip of the Pacific coast. Not here, Daddy. Please, not here. Oh, unlikely. Oh. And yet... Hey, look, I didn't want to throw a damper on the evening. I brought a big picnic hamper from Louis Pierre, the chef du village, and some champagne. Ah, oh, that's nice of him. What's the special occasion? Well... Uh, I meant to speak to you sooner, Daddy, but... Well, the days are so full, and we haven't had much chance to talk about anything except... Well, except all this. Ah, uh, getting the old ball and chain settled. Hmm. So you young folk can be free to enjoy each other and a life together. I love him, Daddy. Well, even the myopic old daughter like me can see that. Oh, what's that? Oh, sounds like thunder. Oh, no, not yet. Too early. It could ruin the corn crop if the rains come, and we have a moat instead of a foundation ditch, which reminds me. What? I'm going to grab me a shovel. I want to dig at least a couple of shovelfuls of earth out of the foundation I'm building for the rest of my life. Me too. Well, while you ants are busy digging, I'll haul the picnic out of the jeep. Sounds like some storm. You could feel the earth tremble. I'll lug the basket under the trailer canopy just in case. Mm, getting dark. I don't like it. Oh, it's just a thunderstorm. It'll blow over. Want a hand down? Oh, I'm not that old. Look out. Yeah. See? Spies a 20-year-old. Okay, let's dig our marks into posterity. Shovel's ready. Aim. Go.
one moment they were there digging, then a flash of lightning came on thunder, and they just... They just disappeared. Was it still light enough to see? Yes, yes, then. I dropped into the foundation, and I grabbed a shovel, and I tried to dig. And it hit something solid like lava. After I cleared away the loose earth, I could see that it was a great flat stone, like... Well, I found an edge, and I tried to pry it, but you couldn't budge it. It must weigh tons. We've got to get a backhoe or a crane up there and try to find them. Hey, we will do what we can, but I am afraid when we find them, it will be like the others. What do you mean? The gossip of the viejos has always been that some of the Aztecs fled through the pass in the mountains from the valley Manzanillo and made a colony. That is why Vista de la Laguna bears la maladicion del diablo. I think the professor and his daughter have been stolen as a sacrifice against the early rain. I hadn't taken more than my shovel full of earth, scraping it off the hard surface below, before I knew what I was uncovering. An Aztec sacrificial stone. And at my next stroke, never mind the elements and the pyrotechnics around us, I must have struck some concealed spot that controlled a balance mechanism. For in a moment, both Maria and myself were flipped by the great stone into a chamber below. No sooner were we deposited there than the five or six ton slab reversed itself on some complex counterweight system and sealed us in this tomb. You all right, Maria? Oh, yes. A a few scrapes and bruises. You? Well, nothing I can't live with if we're going to live. Wait a minute. What is it? My lighter. Where are we? Mm. In a chamber under the sacrificial stone. What sacrificial stone? Hmm. Our lovely mountain eerie looking out over the cove was obviously an Aztec pyramid, covered centuries ago by either lava from an erupting volcano or just possibly the encroachment of hundreds of years of jungle growth growing in wind-blown earth. Well, if the stone tipped one way, it can tip the other, can't it? Yeah. If we can find out how to do it while there's oxygen or light enough left. Hmm. Look for some counterweight. Maybe we can trace what operates them. Well, maybe Bill can do something from up above. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. This light won't last long. Yeah, but there's one good sign. What? We're not sealed in. There's air coming from someplace. Wait. Here it is. A staircase. Going down. Where would that take us? Uh, Perhaps to the burial vault. Perhaps to ground level. And the way the Aztec priests used to climb unseen to the temple. Yeah, and the air smells fresh enough. Huh? Shall we try it? Why not? Just a... Yeah, just a curious feeling I have. You're trying to hold something back from me. What is it? No, I don't know how to tell you. It's a ridiculous, superstitious feeling. But I have this inescapable certainty that if we do descend these stairs again and come out into the world again, it won't be the same one we know. You don't have to put it into words. I have the same feeling that it won't be back into the 20th century, but somehow through some time warp we'll be thrown back 400 years. Is that it? Yes. To a civilization you've studied most of your life. Isn't that what you want? <laughs> There are two of us, darling. It certainly isn't what you want. No. We stay here and wait and see if Bill can't exhume us. Now, 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 boy. In it, old cowboy. The la grua is... What? What do you call it? The, the, the crane is falling off the road. Oh, Lord. The rain has made the edges soft. Now we must send for another one to pull this one back up again. If that trapped under that stone, they could smother it death. It is unfortunate, Senor Ville, but case it will have said for a clear and Well, God or somebody had better get a move on. Daddy. Yes? Is, is it hard to breathe? Yes. What time is it? I can't see without my glasses. Yeah. Can you read my wristwatch? Mm, look, looks like a, a little after half past five. Uh, should be daylight pretty soon. That means we've been trapped here for over eight hours. Oh, it is hard to breathe. And I'm cold. No, I guess neither of us would dress for an adventure like this. <laughs> Me in shorts and a thin Mexican cotton shirt and you in that 
Perea, you bought at the club? Mm, lovely for Tahitian shores, but not made for catacombs. One way or another, as we're dressed, we could pass for ancient Aztecs, or Toltecs, or some related tribe. Oh. One way or the other, we, we may be joining my ancestors if we don't get somewhere warmer and with more air. I think you're right, darling. I've, I guess we'll have to try the steps. If we only had some light. Oh, I, I have a match folder in my bra. I left my cigarettes on the bank when I jumped into the fountain ditch. Ah, if there was only something we could just make a torch out of. We don't need one. What? We'll light a match when we need one. But we can feel our way. It isn't that far down. How do you know that? I don't know. I just know. There's the start of it. Keep your hand on my shoulder. I'll lead the way. You sound as if you know it. I feel as though I'm beginning to remember. Remember what? Oh, the match went out. Where I came from. What I was meant for. Where I must go. Come, Father. They are waiting. Light a match, Maria. None left. It doesn't matter. I know the way. This is the last step. Except one. The step to open the great stone. Watch, Father. You have returned again, great princess Hitzlakan. I heard you call, High Prince Kalkun. I heard my people's cry for help. Lalok, the rain god, hurls down his spears of driving water to destroy the corn. The life of our people. What sacrifice can we offer him to spare us all? Who else but the morning star? Come. Come, make me ready for what must be done. No, Maria. He's no, the old man. No, you Keep must be quiet. Mad. You must be mad or we must be. This is the 20th century. What? 1975. What is this? 1975. The date on your calendar. The Aztec calendar. What day is this? Why... Any fool know that? This is the ninth cycle. Seven rabbit, two crocodile. Seven rabbit, nine type of fifty-two man. Oh, oh my God! What is it, Father? We've walked down those stairs and out into the past. Four hundred years ago, in fifteen seventy-five. From the moment the great stone ground open and let them out into the light at the base of a great pyramid. They have spoken in Nahuatl, the speech of the Aztec. The professor haltingly, as with a foreign tongue, but Maria fluently and confidently, as though it were her own. Is she the reincarnation of some ancient princess, dead for over 400 years? I'll return shortly with Act Three. The sun was barely over the mountains as they walked away from the base of the great pyramid towering between them and the sea. The professor, looking about it, was transfixed with mingled disbelief and wonder. All around him, scattered in the foothills, surrounding the pyramids on three sides, were the woven thatched huts of a complete Aztec settlement. High above, where he and his daughter had stood last night, planning to build a house, were the temples and the sacrificial stone. Maria. Yes, Father, what is it? Can you believe what we're seeing? I believe because I remember and speak in Nahuatl. It is not seemly to talk in a foreign language before the high priest. No, oh, the devil with him for the moment. I'm more concerned about you. What's happening to you? Maria, this is a dream. A fantasy. It can't be real. But it is real. Darling, it's impossible. Look. Only last night, you and Bill and I were standing on top of this great pyramid here. Only it was buried in the debris of centuries. And we were planning... Bill? Sure. Bill, the boy you're in love with. No, don't try to kid me that you're not... Bill, I can't quite remember. Look up there. He must be going frantic trying to find a way to get us out of the trap we fell into. I see no one there but the temples and the stones. Do you? Well, no, not at the moment. What do you and the old one talk of in these strange words? 
princess is stuck on. It is of no matter, Kalkumu. He speaks our tongue less smoothly. The rain clouds are gathering again. The smoking mirror god frowns on us. And Quetzalcoatl, the plume serpent, has deserted us in our need. Last year there was a drought. We lost a third of our people. If the corn is lost this year, we perish. I will go to my place to make ready. Take my father and make him drink of Oxley. So his spirit is prepared for what must be. It shall be as you say, princess. Father, you stay here. There's something I have to do. No, Maria. No, I'm not letting them separate. Oh, no, old man, you will do as you are told. Here you mean nothing. Listen. No, no. You shall not harm him. He will not be harmed. You have my word. I will see you, my father. Pray for me and the God of the sun to keep the rain from us. No, Maria. No. Don't go. There is nothing you or any man can do. It is written in the stars. Come. Drink of Oxley and look for forgetfulness. Okay. Back her up slowly. Easy, easy she goes. Lord, I hope that cable holds. Okay, she's starting to come. Watch it! Is anyone hurt? No, senor, he's okay. Is this the only crane in the county? Si, senor. Oh, the best we can do is a bulldoze. Okay, we'll rig another cable and try again. At least the rain is stopped. Senor, don't you think by now it's too late? It can't be too late. I must do everything to save Maria, even if it means giving my own life. <laughs> As they dragged me away from my daughter, a sudden lassitude seized me. I felt old and useless and out of my depth. <laughs> it was incredible that facing me, about me, around me, everywhere I turned was the dream of an archaeologist's life. To see an Aztec village in full operation. In its own time. <laughs> but that's where the madness lay. I'm no believer in time warps, nor fourth and fifth dimensions. Now, I could not accept this moment as the 16th century. But the, but the horrible gnawing fear was that my daughter could. And did. And, and somehow belonged. Calcamon. Yes, old man. How came you here? Were no other Aztec clan has come? After the fall of Montezuma, we were either made slaves or scattered to the wind. Some of us found a pass through the mountains here and found the place by the sea to the west. And we found it good. And the white man and Cortez did not know to follow. So we were safe. But the Aztecs were not sea people. No. And here cannot grow our chinampas and our milpas. The cornfields do not produce so well. So we must try to make the best of it. That is why we must make so many sacrifices to the gods. Is that what you expect my daughter to do? It is not what I ask. It is why she is sent. What do you mean? You do not know that many years ago, when first we came here and would have died for food... But she mounted the 114 steps to the temple and by her sacrifice saved the corn and the village. You do not know, you who bring her here again. Are you not from the gods too? In a way. I don't know how to explain it to you, Kalkamul, but we are from nine, nearly ten sheaves ahead in time from a world you will never live to see. Or your children are their children. Or their children after them. Ah, you come to destroy us. If you must have a sacrifice, take me. Not my daughter. You are not a royal princess. Or from a royal house. I am her father. So you say, of you, I know nothing. Of the princess, I have seen with my own eyes the living pictures. The Toltec's trace of her inside the temples. We must put our faith in her. I, I won't let you harm her. What can you do? You are old and weak. See that he is made to drink of Oxley, so he loses himself in dream. Why, damn, we did it! Okay, now, come on. Let's get the crane down to the mesa and get that stone block lifted. Why are 
are you not dressed and ready as I am, princess? I don't know. I... I you are not as you were before. Before? The other time. Ah, no. No, this time I wear one of the dreaded conqueror's helmets. A metal we do not know called iron. It is a symbol of great power. The drums have begun. It is time. No more waiting. Kakamu, listen to me. Do you believe I come from the gods? Yes, princess, but the clouds are gathering about the sun already. Then if you believe I do, will you not listen to me? To hear what? That our gods are false gods. That sacrifice brings nothing in return. This was the message I was sent to bring back to you. I do not accept it. You speak with the fourth tongue of the strangers from across the eastern sea. I go now to the temple and the stone. If you do not follow me by yourself, I will first offer up the old one who came with you. No. Then I give you time to make your peace with the gods. By the time the sun is one more hand's breadth over the mountains, if you do not stop to mount the steps, the old one will be dead. Have you ever tried to wake yourself from a nightmare beyond belief and failed? I can't explain the feeling that I was part of this ancient culture, that something like this had happened before, that perhaps I was facing destiny. But other things had begun to flood back into my consciousness. A modern world, a very sweet guy named Bill that I thought I... And then the only person in my mind's eye was my father, already stricken by my mother's early death, being dragged up that inside flight of stairs to the sacrificial stone, his chest bared to the plunge of the obsidian knife, and... No! Listen to me who can hear. All things on earth have their term. And in the most joyous career of their vanity and splendor, their strength fails and they sink into the dust. The things of yesterday are no more today. And the things of yesterday shall cease, perhaps on the morrow. Let us cast aside the horrors of the tomb and reach only for the brilliance of the sun. The shadow's cast of death brings the stars no brilliance. Let us, everyone... Seek and make his own future and his own heaven. No one else can make it for you. The rain is on us upon us. Forget the old fool. Seize the princess. Throw her upon the storm. Spread eagle her. Bear her chest. Oh, smoking mirror god, whose breath and heat we quail from in fear. Oh, Tlaloc, god of the rain, hear us. And accept this sacrifice we offer you. As now I raise the knife on high. Ready to offer you the gift of the Princess Ishtakhan's pulsing heart. Offer us thy blessing in the moment before I strike. A bolt of lightning went straight to Calcimo's iron helmet as though he were a lightning rod. Oh, but the explosion. Uh, a volcanic eruption. <laughs> Probably what buried this civilization four centuries ago. You mean... You mean we're back in the present? Uh, locked in. Uh, yeah, in our own tomb. Oh, I can't. I can't breathe. Uh, Maria... And the oxygen almost gone. The stairs, the stairs. But there are no, no stairs. Blocked by the rubble of centuries. <laughs> Even if there were, would you dare go down them again? Oh, Daddy. Daddy, hold me. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Uh, then perhaps we, perhaps we could offer a prayer. Not the false god. But to the true one. Almighty God. Almighty Father, I ask. This. 
not for myself who have lived long enough, but uh, only for my daughter. I ask for her the gift of life. Maria! Professor! Are you all right? Uh, yes, Bill, yes. They're all right. They're alive. Gracias a Dios. Oh, Daddy. Oh, Daddy, we're alive. Yes. Yes, thanks to... Did you hear what the Alcade said? Thanks to the blessing of God. Did Professor Wells and his daughter walk down those steep stairs into an ancient world to find they were the reincarnation of 400-year-old Aztecs? Or was it all an illusion? A haunting thought to live with. But what is far more important to both of them is just to be alive. I'll be back shortly. Heavy into glasses, they can be a real drag. Doesn't it seem they get heavier and heavier as the day wears on until they feel like a 10-pound weight sitting there on your nose? Time you went to see Hillman Cohan Vision Center. They've got new half weights, super tough lenses that are also super light. In fact, they're only half the weight of glass lenses. You can feel the difference. After all, who needs all that extra weight where it hurts? So if the weight of the world is resting on the bridge of your nose, ask Hillman Cohan Vision Center to take out your glass lenses and put in half weights. They can copy the prescription right from your present glasses. Half weights. They make wearing glasses an enlightening experience. Put on a happy face at your vision center. Lucky to have weights at Hillman Cohen Vision Centers in New Jersey, like the one in West Orange in the Essex Serene Shopping Center. Open daily, 10 to 9, Saturdays till 5. Bank AmeriCard and Master Charge accepted. Sail away from New York on the Vista Fjord April 10th and we'll pay your coach airfare home from Port Everglades, Florida after 16 glorious days of Caribbean cruising. Or join this cruise in Port Everglades and we'll pay half your round-trip coach airfare. Or again, we'll pay half your round-trip coach airfare for the Vista Fjords two-week cruise April 26th from Port Everglades. That's Norwegian America Line's sensational offer on the spacious and luxurious Vista Fjords newly scheduled Spring West Indies cruises. You've always wanted to take a Norwegian America Line cruise, so don't miss this remarkable bonus offer. And a warm welcome from the Vista Fjords European crew. See your travel agent or call Norwegian America Line 212-944-6900. The Vista Fjord is registered in Norway with 65 years of world cruising experience behind her. Vista Fjord, welcome aboard. Oh, just one further note before I leave you. Excavations now in progress at Vista de la Laguna prove beyond a doubt that there was an Aztec village there some 400 years ago that was buried in tons upon tons of lava and ashes from a volcanic explosion. And in one of the temples, there is a painting of the Princess Itlaca, which bears a remarkable resemblance to Mrs. William Hallam, nay, Maria Wells. It's a tantalizing thought that maybe, well, it's only speculation. We'll have to let it go at that. Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Jennifer Harmon, Mason Adams, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tonight's WOR Mystery Theater was also brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program was furnished by the Columbia Broadcasting System. Your dial is set for 15 minutes of late news with John Scott reporting from the 710 Newsroom. WOR New York, an RKO General Station. Come in.
Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. New York is a city of subways. Old, new, in construction, and projected. And of the masses of people who ride them daily, commuting to and from work. This is the story of an old and battle-scarred subway user. And a new spur line opened at last. And as usual, too late to achieve its objective, relieve congestion. But it did bring Alvin Freiberg a strange and wonderful freedom from the grinding daily tragedy of a life not worth living. Our mystery drama, The Phantom Stop, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Al Freiberg and Marvin Schreiber shared the same treadmill. They both worked for Goldman Incorporated. Al is a pattern maker, Marv is a cutter. They both rode the subway morning and night. They both shared the same two-family house in Flushing, owned by Marvin. But of the two, Marv was the lucky one. When he came home, he came back to love and affection. What Al came home to was, uh, well... That was something else again. Is that you at last, Alvin? Yes, Esther, I'm home. You're late. I'm late. That's all you got to say? What else should I say? I was making hanky-panky with one of the models. Who give you even a look? Models I don't worry about, but you and that mob downstairs could have stopped maybe for a beer. Let me smell your breath. <laughs> I wouldn't advise it. I had a garlic pickle with lunch. <laughs> a comedian I married. So why are you late? Oh, Esther, have a heart. We're behind the fall deadline. We've got to get out the garments. Oh, don't give me a story that Fink Goldman's running you into overtime. He'd have a heart attack if he had to pay a dime over take-home pay. Uh, give a little, take a little. A few minutes overtime isn't going to make me run to the shop steward. Give a little, sure. That's the story of your life. When did you take? A person makes his own choices. Oh, I want to sit down. I've been on my feet all day. It was just uh, the subway was late. Now the subway don't run on time. I mean, me and Marv, we missed the regular train. Oh, he was working overtime too, huh? No, no. He, uh, he stopped to uh, buy a present for his wife. Mm, it's a pity you couldn't have the same excuse. It's her birthday. You had yours. Don't talk about birthdays and don't sit down. I want you to fix Rebecca's hair dryer. What's the matter with it? Would I ask you if I knew it doesn't work? Well, couldn't she let her hair dry with God's own air for once? What, in curlers? Well, she don't mind in the morning. Every time I eat a shredded wheat, I look up at her and think, what am I doing eating one of your sister's curlers? Hey, how come she don't wear her hair straight all the time? Eh, nothing helps. Tonight is special. She's going to the community center. She's wasting her time. There isn't a nice boy who isn't already taken. Essie! Is that Alvin at last? Yeah, he just walked in. Well, tell him to run down to the drugstore and get me some glow prunes. Couldn't she go down to get it herself all day? All she does is sit. A lumbago is bothering her. Maybe she's just waking up to what she is, a big pain in the... Is he going? I've run out of hair set and I'm only half curled. Half boiled is more like it. Is that any way to talk about your own flesh and blood? He's your sister. Are you going down to the drugstore or not? Yes. Yes. Glow prune, right? Yeah, you might as well get the giant can. Then you can fix the hair dryer. Should have been a barber. The things I could do with a razor. Come on, come on. Rebecca's waiting. When I get home, can we eat? Oh, just like a man. The only thing on his mind is his stomach. Oh. To tell the truth, limping down the drugstore... The only thing on my mind was my sister-in-law. Except maybe my wife. And the razor. <laughs> the things that go through a man's mind, it would frighten you. What you could settle with one simple stroke. All day long at the shop, the boss screams at me. And then at night and weekends, I got my wife and her sister yelling at me. Oh, it's not like it used to be in the old days. With Sarah, my first wife. Sarah, when I got home, it was altogether different. Hello, Shotzi. Hello, sweetheart. <laughs> Come into the living room, sit down. I got your slippers and the paper and a nice glass of tea with a little you-know-what. <laughs> Come on, rest up a little before dinner. Oh, you're such a good wife, Sarah. Oh, what's so hard? I got a good man. 
Here, darling. Sit. Oh, give me your shoes. Uh, uh. Oh, how's business? Uh. <laughs> well, we'll talk later after we eat. What's for dinner? A favorite. Yes. Ah, uh, what's the difference? Anything you cook is my favorite. I never really realized how much Sarah meant to me until she died. And I married Esther. If Sarah had lived, it would have been... But well, it would have been just like Marvin and Rachel downstairs. Love, warmth, kids, a real family. I made more money, but he was the one with a life. Oh, Marv was a lucky guy with his Rachel. Say goodnight to the kids, Marv. Yeah. <laughs> They're growing like weeds. Thank God they both look like you. <laughs> oh, go on. Well, sit already and drink your coffee. Where's yours? Right over here. Well, bring it to the sofa and sit with me. Uh, I got to do the dishes. Come on. The dishes can wait. I'll help later. You got anything in mind, Marvin? The kids aren't that much asleep. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I look at you, I got something in mind. <laughs> but don't worry. It's not that. It's something else. So what's the matter? Oh, you didn't get laid no, off? No, no, no. Nothing like that. Hey, <laughs> told you not now. That's just for love. What did I do to deserve that, huh? Just for being you. Boy, what a lucky guy I am. All right, I wouldn't deny it. Mm. But how come you know it? <laughs> the way we are. And the way Alvin and Sarah used to be before. <sighs> ah, why do some guys get all the breaks and the rest get a kick in the pants? Oh, it was a terrible thing that happened to Sarah. Bad enough to lose your first child. But a wife as well. Remember how it used to be with the four of us when we first moved into this house? Sure, it was a whole family. Two family house, but one family living in it. Yeah, you, me, Sarah, mm -hmm. Alvin. Dinner every Sunday. One week their turn, next one ours. Times were good. Mm -hmm. Remember the picnics at Jones Beach? Oh, do I? Sarah's potato salad. Nobody could make potato salad like that. Oh, Sarah. boy. And your pot roast, <laughs> the best. And what a cut-off that Al used to be. He could have been on the stage. What laughs we had. Oh, especially that last time, I remember, with Sarah and me both out here with our kids, and you wanted to take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I miss Sarah. You know, I, I try to get on with Esther. Ah, but... that loudmouth. She'd burn your ear off with nothing good to say about anybody. And the sister's worse. Well, she can't help it if she's got a face that'd stop a horse. She could keep a big nose out of everybody's business. What's the matter, Marvin? There's no heat in the house. You want us all to get pneumonia? Mm, she's always sick with something. If it wasn't for Al, I'd find some way to kick him out and get new tenants. Oh, you couldn't do that to Al? No, no. Uh, he's the one who ought to get rid of them. God forgive me for saying it. Well, why shouldn't he? I mean, they deserve it. Not what I was thinking. And what sometimes I think lately Al could have on his mind. So what do you mean? You know, knocking off either one of those two old crows... Or to be justifiable homicide. Marvin, what are you saying? There never was a kinder or more gentle person than Alvin Freiberg. But you put a mouse in a bowl with a lid on and let him run around trapped. He ever gets that lid off, out comes a raging tiger. I don't know. Maybe it's all the violence, but uh, the Al worries me these days. How come? He, he daydreams a lot. Gets behind on his work. He drives Goldman frantic. And every so often, I'll see him pick up my cutting shears and just, you know, kind of weigh them in his hand like they would, I don't know, like, 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 like a weapon. What are you suggesting? He's going to turn into a murderer or something? Al Freitag? Ah, don't make me laugh. But it wasn't something to laugh at. Only Rachel could have known. And Marv was right, though I didn't know he'd said it. These last years, like a hamster in a cage, that was me. Running around and around, going nowhere. I wouldn't mind so much, but... Esther wouldn't have children. Not even a son to carry my name. There are times lately, like when Abe Goldman is trying to chisel on the patterns. When... When I, I, I find myself grabbing up Marv's shears and... Oh, I... I get such a... A pain in my chest. Everything goes black. By the time I see straight again, I'm I'm worried what I might have done. Or like mornings. I shave with a with a straight razor, which was my father's, and sometimes 
Like the morning after Rebecca needed her hair dressing. Uh, yeah. You plan to spend all day in there? I'm shaving. How come you're up so early? The noise you make getting out of bed. Who could sleep? Listen, could you spare the powder room a moment? Well, can't you wait till I'm finished? It isn't me. It's Rebecca. Oh, what's with Rebecca? She sticks to her stomach. Okay, okay. I'll shave in the kitchen. How come you're up so early? Well, well today... Today, Marv and I are trying the new subway, which just opened. Just to be on the safe side, we're leaving early. I bet you come home early one of these evenings. Now, yeah, what's in it for me? Oh. All right, all right, Esther, don't get mad. Can't I make a joke? Uh, look, you, you want to have a cup of coffee with me before I leave? What for? As soon as I get Rebecca straightened out, I need my beauty sleep. Have your coffee at the office. You used to make it for me when we were first married. I used to do a lot of things before I discovered what a nothing I married. Go into the kitchen, shave, will you? And let Rebecca use the ladies' room. The ladies' room. That's what it comes down to now. I'm a stranger in my own house. I finish shaving, nicking myself twice without a mirror. Then I clean the razor and I... I thought about it. How quick it would be. And as long as it was sharp enough, how painless. And then... With a gasp, I thought to myself, for whom? What am I thinking? Me? Them? All three of us? And then all of a sudden, I... All of a sudden, I, I had the pain in my chest, and I... I wonder... Indigestion. Yes. Ah, take a bio seltzer. Finish shaving and get to work, Alvin. So, how do you like it? What? The new subway. Ah, who knows yet? Same sardines packed in a new can. Ah, here you got more room to breathe. Still the same air. You want to call it that? You know, I thought maybe there'd be less people. The guy could have one wish. What did it say? I said, if a guy could have one wish, it would be not to travel Queens to New York and back in the rush hour. Eh, not so bad. Count everything else in. The you, maybe. What else have I got to look forward to either end? Al... I've been meaning to talk to you. No, look, not here. You couldn't hear yourself, but everybody else could. Hey. What? Hey, here's a station we're passing. Uh, 35th and Neely Avenue. Hey, how come the train doesn't stop? Express, I guess. I didn't see the station. Clear as the nose on your face. I wasn't looking. What's the difference? What could it matter in your life, anyway? What could it matter in Alvin Freiberg's life? Not a thing. Just another subway station passed by an express train that didn't stop there. 35th and Neely. From the first moment he read the designation, he knew that sometime he had to get off the subway there. I'll return with Act Two shortly. It wasn't a good day in Alvin Freiberg's life. The patterns for the new styles were hard to work out. Seventy yards of cloth on a bolt. You have to lay out the patterns so that you waste the least amount of material. If you're a first-rate firm, you don't cut corners. But if you're just an ordinary firm and times are hard, there's a little temptation to short change. I can't do it, Mr. Goldman. Are you telling me? I brought you up in the business. So we'll be a little tight with the seams. We'll still make up. A little tight? Look, here under the arms and on the sides. A woman buys the wrong size, so she takes a deep breath and the seams go... That's her problem. She should buy the right size to begin with. Why, you know, women, that's what always made our line. They could, they could breathe a little buying undersize. Are you telling me how to merchandise? Look, I make patterns. That's all I know. I made them before you were out of public school. I ask you to cut a few corners, and you have to give me an argument. I want only the best for us, Mr. Goldman. The same for me, but we got to go with the time. I don't like to cheat. Who's cheating? We cut a corner here and there. What are you? A conscience for the world? You're better than anyone else? Ah, maybe he was right. What was I? I sat there piecing the jigsaw patterns on a bolt of cloth, and I I wondered myself. Let some customer lift her arm and split a seam or eat too much and have the zipper split. Why should I care? What did I have left? No pride at home. Why try to have any at work? 
Even Marv couldn't shake me while we waited for the subway home. Why'd you knuckle under? Ah, what's the difference, Marv? He wants to cut short, how can I stop him? It never pays off. And what you lay out, I gotta cut. You know, once you'd have made me mad saying that. But now, what's the fight for? These days, we're lucky to have a job. That's all the business means to you? Tell you the truth, nothing means much to me. I'm tired. You? Well, you got something to protect there's a seat. Grab it. Come on. Ah, I'll stand. You need it more than me. Now sit down, will you? Uh, okay. Maybe I do. But I, I wanted to ask the conductor or one of the guards about that station. What station? You know, the one we don't stop at. The, uh, uh 30 the Ah, who cares? Me? Why? I don't know. Just, just something crazy. You wouldn't remember. What wouldn't I remember? Well, I could tell you, but what do I want to do? Broadcast a secret at the top of my lungs? Wait till we're home. Okay, okay. It's hard to hear you anyway. Read your paper. I sat a little while, then my eyes closed. The pain was in my chest again. Right through the back. The racket of the subway seemed very far away. And then I, I glanced at the paper in my lap, just to skip over the headlines. General Charles de Gaulle takes over premiership of France. Huh? So let him, what do I care? What? De Gaulle? But he's dead. He's long dead. I look again at the newspaper. The date. June 1st, 1958. I, I, I started to get Marvin's attention, but just then I realized that we were slowing down, ready to stop. I, I twisted to look out the window. 35th and nearly. I, I had to push and shove to get off. I was the only one. I went through the gate. There was a... A long flight of steps to the street. But my pain was gone. My legs, they felt 20 years younger. So did all of me. I could feel my heart lift, reach out expecting something. I was right. I came out to the street. And, well, it was... It was just before sunset. Everything was bathed in a rosy glow, a color you couldn't forget. And waiting for me was... Alvin! Two subways I waited. I thought maybe you'd missed your train. You know the rush hour, Sarah. But why should you wait for me? <laughs> why does any woman wait for her man? <laughs> Love. Besides, I was shopping near here at the market, so why not give you a surprise? <laughs> here, let me have the bag. Yes, sir. I'll carry it. <laughs> hey. This is... This is the old neighborhood. <laughs> why so surprised? 35th. All right. But, uh... Neely, that's not near us. Oh, it's a new subway. So it's a little longer walk than the old stop. What's the difference when a person is young? The way I feel. So, why do we have to stand talking so much? Come on, let's go home. Yeah, home. Yeah. Uh, give me your hand. Let's just walk like we used to. You know, I don't know what's so good tonight. It, it, it seems so special. Huh? It is special. <laughs> what's for dinner? Mm, I shouldn't tell you. I should just surprise you. So? Surprise me. Um, maybe I won't if you sound so indifferent. Who's indifferent? Oh, you'll find out anyway. It's strawberry blintzes with sour cream. <laughs> you want to leave me for another woman? I want to take you in my arms right here on 33rd Street and hug you. Oh, you better not. I'll call the cops. No, don't. Just wait till we get home. You want coffee or, or a glass of tea? I just want you. Come on, sit by me on the couch. Oh, I'm not sure I could trust you. There's more than one kind of love, Sarah. <laughs> this is just old people, quiet, just to touch, to know, to feel that you're there. And and I'm next to you. Come on, sit. Maybe just a little. Because... You have to go. What do you mean? How come I have to go? Don't ask questions, Alvin. Take what we got. But this is my home. I'm not leaving. You have to leave. Answer me one thing first. Anything. You won't let whatever happens change you? You'll stay the way you are? Why should I change? Supposing I wasn't alive. Oh, Sarah, then I wouldn't be alive either. It isn't always that easy to die. Sarah? What are you talking about? Promise me, darling. If anything happens, just... Just keep on being my same loving, 
kind, gentle Alvin. What crazy talk is this? I'm I'm Alvin Freiberg. I'm I'm thirty years old. If I don't know what I am now, I'm in sad condition. I'm only thinking of the future. Oh, the devil with the future. We're living now. That's just the trouble, my darling. We're not. And I beg you, whatever happens, don't let anything change you between now and... Wake up, Alvin. Hmm? What? I'll stop. Uh, uh, we got to get what, off the what, subway. What, what, but I already did. I mean... I mean, when we stopped at 35th. Come on, come on, Alvin. You've been sound asleep since we left Manhattan. Let's get it out of the sling and on the way. What are you talking about? You got off the subway on the way home. I did. At 35th and Neely. You got a hole in the head. You were asleep by 57th Street, Manhattan, and you never woke up till we hit Flushing. I, I didn't... I didn't get off and see Sarah. Sarah? My wife, she... It was a dream, oh. It was a dream. You were tired, you went to sleep, and you had a dream. Oh, such a dream, Ma. You know, it was so real. Just like it used to be. But, hey, listen, I, I didn't get off at that station. The train doesn't stop there, Al. It did. In my dream. If it could only be like that. Uh-huh. Uh, could I say something to you which is none of my business? What, a friend like you? You could say anything. I'm worried about you. Yeah. That makes the two of us. I think you should see a doctor. What could a head shrinker tell me that I don't know already? I didn't mean a psychiatrist. I meant a doctor, doctor. Who needs him? I'm healthy. I could be if I had the chance. I was thinking about, you should excuse the expression, your home life. Yeah, you should excuse the expression, all right. Alvin, you ever hear the French painter called Gauguin? Yeah, sure. You know what he did? Uh, he went to Tahiti or somewhere and he, well, he painted pictures. Yeah, but first off, he was a banker and he was unhappy. So he separated from his wife and just took off. Are you trying to tell me something? Yeah. Who likes Esther? Are you? I'm married to her. You were married to Sarah. Yeah. Uh, that was different. Sure it was. Everybody loved Sarah. But Esther... Who likes Esther? you got to say it out loud. Not even me. I wish she was dead. You don't have to go that far. Why don't you just walk out on her? What would happen to Rebecca? That's your problem? They're driving you crazy, the two of them. Rachel and me, we only live downstairs, and they're driving us around the corner. Why don't we all get up from under? You're not going to renew our lease. Al, Al, I ain't talking as a landlord, but as a friend. Rachel and me, we can make out. But we want to save you. From what? Uh, we're almost home now. Take a good look at yourself. Do a little thinking. You got a dingling hung around your neck. I'm your buddy. Well, what else can I say? Ma, I don't know what to answer you. I don't blame you. I don't know how I had the guts to say all I said to you. Yeah, see you at 7.30 in the morning. We'll walk to the subway. After Ma went in, I waited a moment in the dark. Sarah... Or was it a dream? I had a crazy notion that that grew more real as the pain in my chest started up again. That I could go back there. All I had to do was stop the train and get off at 35th and Neely. Except, except, I had to fix everything right to leave behind. A man can't just walk out on everything like that, that fellow Gogan. He was a genius. I'm just a schlep. Yeah. Alvin, you in there again? What are you doing? I'm shaving. Ten o'clock in the night and you're shaving? I'm coming in. So come in. The door's open. Why are you shaving this time of night? Well, uh, the morning traffic uh, gets so heavy, I thought maybe I'd take a load off of it. I don't understand you, Alvin Freiberg. Well, say something. What am I to say? I don't think you ever did. What? You asked me to say something, I said it. I didn't ask to be insulted. Who insulted? You said I didn't understand you. Well... You think you do? No, oh, I certainly don't understand a man shaving 10 o'clock at night and tying up the only bathroom in the house. I shave in the morning. I'm in the way, too. What should I do? Shave at the garment house? You don't have to make a thing. Who is making a thing? You are. I was just trying to make things easy. Don't give me that, Alvin. You just try to make things a problem because me and Rebecca haven't ever been good enough for you. Did, did I ever say that? Well, it's what you think. 
Sarah. She was so great. Your first wife, nobody could live up to her. You leave Sarah out of it. Who brought her in? I didn't. Don't try to fool me. Ever since we were married, you compared the two of us. Esther, that honestly is not true. Don't try to pull the wool over my eyes. I know what I know. And let me tell you something, Alvin Freiberg. Your first wife was a nothing. If you had stayed with her, you'd still be a gopher for Mr. Goldman running errands, getting coffee, pushing dress racks, a a 40-year-old office boy without my connections and my family, so don't you ever forget it. That isn't true. I was a cutter before you were... Don't make me laugh. That Sarah, soft in the head about how great you'd be, she couldn't see a future in any dress... Alvin. Alvin, don't hold that razor like that. Alvin, what are you thinking about? Don't you... Ever mention Sarah's name to me again? Don't you ever... Alvin, are you crazy or something? I was just trying to bring you to your senses. Now, don't take offense about Sarah. Sarah's been dead for 16 years. Get out. Get out. Get out! You, you leave me alone. You and Rebecca, you leave me alone. I don't know what I'm going to do. What are you, a you... crazy man or something? Right at the moment, I'm yes. Yes. Well, well, what made you... You, 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 you and your nagging sister, you get out! the first time in her life, Esther knuckled under to me. She fled from the bathroom in terror, and as she slammed the door shut behind her, I, I, I stopped in terror myself because I realized that I had advanced on her with the razor in my hand held like a weapon. I couldn't kid myself that I didn't want to use it against her and her sister. Suddenly, all alone, I, I started to, to shake from head to foot. What had I become? Because I knew that I I knew that I was near the end of control. And if something didn't happen, I would lose my mind. My mind. And destroy both of these women as surely as they had been destroying me day by day for the last 15 years. Oh! The Wrong Marriage. Two selfish women driving against a quiet and simple man. The day-by-day deterioration of what had once been a human relationship is as devastating as the Chinese water torture and as inescapable without violent reaction or some miracle to end it. Which is the deciding factor? I'll be back with that solution shortly. definition of tragedy is the downfall or destruction of some great or noble figure because of some flaw or fatal weakness. But surely the fate of a simple man living a life of quiet and utter despair, misunderstood, unappreciated, and starved for a kind of love he had once known is just as tragic. And when he finds himself with his back to the wall, how desperate might he become? Let's watch Alvin Freiberg, who might be you, or I, or any of us who sees no hope of escape. Let's watch him face his problem and find its solution. The next day, I woke up early, even earlier than usual, with a gut feeling that I'd reached the end of my rope. Just like any other morning, Esther snoring like a walrus beside me. Same heavy feeling in my chest. Why should it surprise me? My heart was dead already 15 years. I turned off the alarm clock, checked the time automatically, and went into the bathroom. Half an hour early, I reached for my razor. All of a sudden, I'm thinking, what kind of a fool are you? You shaved already last night. Then I said to myself, Alvin, you know that. So what are you doing with a razor in your hand? I knew I didn't have to ask that question. I was desperate. Who was I kidding? I couldn't face another day the way I lived. Even without hearing the master's snores were sounding in my ears, I could hear Rebecca's whine. What would she have today? 
An ulcer, arthritis, indigestion, a something which wouldn't have a name, anything to drive her to a doctor so he could reassure her, or try to. And the razor. The razor would end all this. I was like a, like a man walking in his sleep. With the razor in my hand, I walked into the bedroom. Calvin, it's six o'clock. What are you doing now? I, uh, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. What, what's the razor for? You got five o'clock shadow in the morning? <laughs> oh, oh, that's the, you know, that's the first joke you ever made. Who cares about jokes this hour? What, what's the razor for? Huh? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I forgot. I, I shaved last night, I guess. I, well, put it away and come back yeah, to bed, huh? Yeah, yes, 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 that's true. I don't know. I don't know what came over me all of a sudden. No, well, just come back to bed and don't wake up the whole house. I don't huh? feel sleepy. Maybe I, I'll make a cup of coffee, I huh? don't understand you. But do what you want. As long as you don't wake up Rebecca and me, I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less. I don't understand you. It was all there in those two sentences. And the coffee was bitter, no matter how much sugar I dumped in, and so was my life. It's the way a good half of the world maybe more live. An hour and a half later, walking to the subway, how different could I feel? Except that Marv was a friend. And with him, I could talk a little. Hey, nice brisk morning, huh? Well, what's a good word? You should know me by now. I wonder you even bother to walk to the subway with me. <laughs> what are you giving me, Al Freiberg? 25 years, we're friends. Why would I walk out on you, huh? I ain't the same man I once was. Look, when was the last time you saw a doctor? I don't know, three, maybe four years. You ought to have a checkup. What for? Who cares? Anyway, my regular doctor died a couple of years ago. A person our age should have a checkup once a year. Stay alive? What else? Supposing you get to the point... Well, you don't care, huh? Oh, that pins it. I'm going to make an appointment with my doctor to see you. Don't waste the time. I'm ready to waste more than that. You'll see him if I have to drag you there. We'll go at lunchtime. Don't give me any arguments. I'll pay just for my own peace of mind. Look, Marv. Marv, you're a good friend, okay? Okay. I'll see your doctor, but, you know, he can't help me. And we got one thing straight. I pay. I pay. Come on. Come on with the subway. You get the ants out of your pants, Al, so we changed the Roddy Plaza to a local. What are you going to do when you get the 35th and Neely? I'm going to get off. Go upstairs. We get off, we could be late for work. You don't have to come. Listen, the way you're acting, as a friend, I wouldn't leave you for a minute. I ain't got enough moxie to argue. Anyway, here it comes. How do you know? I can't see. I know. There. Hey, see? Ah, we're coming into the station. Yeah, okay, but we're not slowing down. Huh? We've got to slow down. This is a local. Some train has got to stop here. Maybe there's some other local, but this one isn't going to stop. Mark, there is a station there, isn't there? Sure, sure. It says, it says 35th and nearly, don't it? Yeah, that's what it says. Or said. We're already past it. For some reason, trains just don't stop there. But I told you last night. That I... was a dream now. I was standing right over you and we passed right through as usual. You didn't get off. Nobody got off. Whatever this station is, there just isn't a train that stops here. <laughs> I didn't feel well that morning. My mind wasn't working properly. I, I might have thought of calling the transit authority. But everything I did was automatic. I laid out my patterns. And then at lunch, I went to the doctor with Marvin leading me by the hand like I was a baby. It was nearly quitting time before I got back from the doctor. And Goldman was fit to be tied. So, oh, what are you going to claim now, Alvin? Seniority? You take almost the whole afternoon off without a word? Well, I, I was to the doctor. Doctor! You couldn't see him on your own time? Maybe it was your head that needed examining. Look what you did here. And your friend Marv already cut, so what can we do? I'm in the factor's hands already. But, but what is it? Mr. Mr. Goldman expected three more dresses out of these bolts of cloth. Didn't I tell you to skimp on the pattern? Oh, I forgot. You forgot. How could you forget with that? Look, I'm sorry. I went to the doctor. I don't need a doctor. You'll give me heart failure. The poor line is a disaster before we even cut one dress. I might as well end up in bankruptcy. Freiburg, you're fired. I don't want to see you again. You're lucky I don't fire your friend Schreiber. Mr. Here. Gold. Don't give me any argument. All right. It's quitting time. I'm in enough trouble with the union to begin with, so let's close up. Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, we won't open again. 
That's the way things are. Uh, Mom. Mom, I'm sorry. Forget I... it. Forget it. Let's have a fling. Never knows we need a lift. Come on. I'll buy you a drink at Levin's before we take the subway home. Well, look, I am. Look, I am. I don't know what I'm wishing you good luck for, the way it goes. That don't matter. I'll get the severance pay, some pension. <laughs> and the beauty part, the insurance. What insurance? The life insurance. That should take care of Esther and Rebecca. What are you talking about, life insurance? You made me see the doctor, huh? So? What did he say? Yeah. I got a, uh, a something I ain't sure I know how to tell you. Ventricular celebration. Uh-huh. The doctor wondered I should go in the hospital right away. So why didn't you? Well, I eat up all the money in hospital bills. I'll go home. I'll rest. I haven't got a job anymore. Rest? With Esther and Rebecca? <sighs> Give it a try. <laughs> Thanks for the drink. You wouldn't believe, Marvin, a glass of whiskey could make me feel so good. <laughs> Come on, let's go home. <laughs> Over Marv's protests, we got into the subway. I did feel good. Like I was young again. Like I didn't care. And I had this crazy idea I was going to try. Because the possibility to find out would never come around again. I'm not going to pass it ever again. The subway don't stop at this station. Why not? Um, what do I know why not? There's got to be a reason. So how come the conductor doesn't it's know? It's a brand new subway, Al. Call the transit system. I never had the chance. Just the same. Here it comes. 35th and nearly. This time I got to know. Alvin, wait. I got to know. Why don't the doors open? You can't open these. I'll, I'll get out between the doors. Oh, wait, wait. Wait, Alvin, wait. Hold it, Alvin, hold it. Uh, just a minute, mister. What's going on here? You pulled the emergency brake? No, no, it, it was my friend. He wanted to get off here. Why? I I don't exactly know. Why doesn't the train stop anyway? Well, there's nothing up there but mud flats and an old city dump. Then what's the point of this station? The city is filling in the dump. There's a big housing project going to go up there. Won't be finished in a couple of years, but they'll need to stop then. Come on, we got to pick up your kooky friend. He can't get out of here. It's all blocked up. You're going to arrest him? Sure. He could have caused a panic. I got a lot of people hurt. What's the matter with him anyway? I don't think I could explain to you, officer. Except, uh, it's his heart. Hello, Alvin. Sarah, you were waiting again. So this time I knew what subway you'd be on. Come, my darling. Let's go home. That's all I want. That's what you got. This time, for good. See? I told you there was no way out. Oh, what's he... What's he lying there for? He get fits or something? Uh, no, no. He, uh, just hasn't been well lately. What? Hey, you ain't just whistling, Dixie. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you, mister, but your friend is dead. Heart attack, huh? Yeah, something like that. I wonder. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, just... I hope he found what he wanted. And, uh, for the record, God, there's no doubt. It was his heart. Tragedy, or something nearer to all of our lives, escape. Death, of course, is always tragic. But if you have belief in something beyond, Alvin Freiberg, slippers on his feet, Sarah by his side, and something too delectable to name, cooking in the kitchen for dinner, is a happier man dead than alive. I'll be back shortly. It was Elizabeth Barrett Browning who wrote, I love you with the breath, smiles, tears, of all my life. Alvin Freiberg could never have expressed himself so well, but beyond question, he felt as deeply for his Sarah as Elizabeth Barrett felt for Robert Browning. 
the quiet, unnoticed ones love as deeply and perhaps more securely than the great or famous. Let this be Alvin's epitaph and the end of his story. Our cast included Norman Rose, Nat Pullen, Carol Titel, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. W.O.R. Mystery Theater was brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program is furnished by... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. This time, a mystery, a puzzle, if you will, which I challenge you to solve. As with all mysteries worthy of the name, each clue will be honestly and plainly presented to you. And yet, unless I miss my guess, the answer to the puzzle will elude you till the very end. We'll play a game of wits, you and I, just for the fun of it, and see who wins. Unhappily, one of the characters you'll meet, lost. I, I found the shrunken head on the pillow of my bed. And that clock points to 12. That means I, I die at 12. Question is, Elizabeth, dear, 12 what? 12 what? 12 noon or 12 midnight. <gasps> the drum clock. 12 o'clock. Noon. Maybe you'll be dead on the stroke of 12, Elizabeth. <laughs> and maybe you have to wait till midnight. Our mystery drama, Sting of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars William Prince. My first move is to describe the huge barn-like living room of the country home of Trevor Costain, explorer, adventurer, author. And the living room reflects the trophies of his travels. On the north wall, headdresses of native tribal chiefs from all over the world. The south wall is covered with awards, trophies. The west wall is hung with native spears, shields, primitive weapons. And on the east wall, above the huge fireplace, hangs a clock. A most bizarre clock. The face is made of a Tugari war shield. Headhunters, you know, the Tugari. The hands of the clock are made of, uh, well, human thigh bones. And the hours from 1 to 12, are marked by shrunken human heads. Well, don't look so horrified. I told you the Tugari were headhunters. And when I told you that, I gave you your first important clue. See what you can do with it. Liz, give me another drink. Trevor, the doctor... I know, I know, but if I'm going to die, I'm going to die happy. Dad, the disease, you know what alcohol does to you because of it? I'm in enough pain, Furry. Stop calling me Dad. He is your son-in-law, Father. Don't remind me, Jackie. Liz, that drink, please. Some son-in-law. 
some husband. An alcoholic who's put you through purgatory since the day you married him. That's ended now. I haven't had a drink since I joined AA five weeks ago. I wish I could believe that. You can. Oh, Fari, here's your drink, Trevor. Thanks. Oh, Father, you're not going to smoke, too. Did I say I was going to smoke? Well, every time you pick up one of your pipes, Oh, don't I'm... worry, Jackie. Whatever disease hit me in Borneo years ago, just a whiff of tobacco sickens me. Give my right arm to be able to smoke these pipes again, but all I can do is polish them, clean them, puff on them, never light them. It's a terrible way to live. I'll be glad when I'm dead. Oh, don't say that, Trevor. You sound as if you'll be sorry when I'm gone, Liz. I will be. Why lie to me, Liz? Our marriage has been anything but a happy one. We put each other through the ringer the way our long-haired son-in-law put Jackie through one. Different kind of ringer, that's all. Oh, well, that's over now. Everything's over. For me. Oh, Father, please don't get up if you want anything. Got just... to get up and ease the pain. Just want to get those pipe cleaners on the mantle and... Oh, blast. You dropped your drink. All over me, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, Spasm of pain. I'll make you another. I'll have to change these pants. Father, sit down. I'll get the pipe cleaners. <sighs> oh, I can't do a thing for myself anymore. Not a thing. <sighs> Jackie, what about the divorce? Well, I've given Fari... Here. Here, the pipe cleaners. Mm. I've given Fari another chance. It's a waste of time. You know that. It's probably hopeless, but... In common decency, I can't let him down. He depends on me, Father. A weakling. He's a weakling. Well, some men are. Not Rod Champion. He was a man for you. I told you that. Your drink. Thanks. Rod will be here tomorrow, Jackie. Going to spend a few days helping me straighten out my affairs. Why don't you and he try to get together? See if you can still oh, hit it off. Father. He's the... What the devil? What? The clock. That headhunter clock over the fireplace. Look at it. That's strange. One of those awful shrunken heads is missing. The one that marked the hour of seven. Oh, Father, what happened to I it? I don't know. I just noticed it was missing this minute. Look around. See if it's on the floor. Oh, if it is, I'd just as soon... Not... Look around, I said. I can't. All right, dear. All right. Jackie, you look and see if... <gasps> Was Fari? Something's happened. Good heavens! What could have... I don't know. I do... look, look at this. Look at this. Look. The head off the clock. Oh. What are you doing with it? It was on the pillow of my bed. Your pillow? It was just lying there, smack in the middle of the pillow. Fari, this some kind of gag? Did you take it off the clock? Oh, why would I do a thing like that? I don't know. But then I don't know why you've done a lot of things you've done. Dad, I tell you, I. All right, all right. Put it back on the clock. The hour of seven. Yeah. Sure. Somebody's playing games. Somebody with a sick sense of humor. And I... Oh. Oh! Fari, what? Uh, Father! Catch him, he's uh, falling! Oh, oh, sorry! Get away, Jackie! L let me see. Is he... Is he... Dead? Yes. Drum clock in the hall. It's seven o'clock. The shrunken head. The hour of seven. Fari found it in his room. On his pillow. And now he's dead. What does it mean? What? <laughs> Yes? Well, this is Trevor Castine. Uh, oh, I see. Oh, uh, yes. Well, I want to be informed the minute you find out. Fine. Goodbye. Who was that? At the coroner's office. I've been bugging them all through the night to tell me what killed that husband of yours. And? We just wanted to let me know they're starting the autopsy now. Oh. Jackie? Yes, Father. 
We've never pulled any punches with each other, you and me, so don't let's pull any now. You really sorry for he's dead? What a thing to ask. What's the answer? I... I don't know. Marriage to Fari was purgatory, as you said last night, but he... He was starting a new life, joining AA, and... Uh, oh, it isn't fair somehow. Not to him, maybe. But it's very fair to you. What do you mean? You can do what you should have done in the first place. You can marry Roger. Oh, Father, you're taking an awful lot for granted. You love him, don't you? Yes, I... I guess I do, but... No buts about it. When Roger gets here... Hey, sounds like he's here. Come on. Let's meet him at the door. Are you strong enough to walk? Sure, sure. Having a good day. Come on. Can't wait to see him. Best safari manager I ever had. <laughs> Never took any guff from me either. Didn't have to. He's a fine man, Jackie. Fine man. <clears throat> hey, Trevor. It's Jackie. Good to see you. Rod, you old son of a gun. I can't tell you how good it is to... Who's this? Trevor? Jackie? Meet Virginia. My wife. <laughs> You've no idea. No idea at all what killed Forrick? Well, they're doing the autopsy now, Raj. Uh, coroner, uh, Dr. Dodd is a friend of mine. You'll let me know what they come up with as soon as they know... Help yourself to a drink, Raj. Oh, thanks. You? No, no, almost lunchtime. I have to limit myself. Can't even smoke. And with three months or less to live. Hell of a way to go out. Oh, hand me those pipe cleaners, will you? Yeah. Here you are. At least you get some satisfaction from fooling around with these old pipes of yours. Yes, Kind of makes not smoking a little easier. You know, Raj, you shocked me when you arrived with a wife. How come? I had plans for you and Jackie. I was in love with Jackie, yes, but when she married Fari, well, that was that. Ginny's a, a wonderful girl, and she'll be a wonderful wife. Oh, I'm sure. Speaking of Jackie and Virginia, they ought to be back from their walk soon. It's almost... Now, what in blazes? What is it? The clock. Look at the clock. A head's missing. From 12. Now, what does this mean? Well, probably nothing at all. It probably just fell off. It didn't just fall off. And don't bother looking for it on the floor. Someone took that head off the clock, Raj. And unless I miss my guess, it means someone else is going to die. Well, I can't believe that there's any significance. Oh, Father, Roger, is something wrong? Jackie, your mother's still asleep in her room, worn out after last night. Better get her down here. Why? What's happened? A head is missing from the clock again, this time from the hour of twelve. Oh, no. Oh. If it means another death... Well, never mind. Wake your mother up and tell her to come down here. What? No, Liz, no, stay here. No, All of you, I'll handle this. Father, when did you discover this head missing? Just now. Seconds before you and Virginia came back from your walk. But, Father, you don't think it me? You, it can't mean another... I'm afraid it could. Uh, easy, easy, Elizabeth. Oh. Trev... She woke up a minute ago to find this beside her on the pillow. The shrunken head. Oh, Mother. Oh, am I going to die? Is that what it means? That I, I, I'm going to die the way Fari did? Oh, of course not. Twelve o'clock. My head is missing from twelve o'clock. I'm going to die at twelve. I know I'm going to die at twelve. The question is, twelve noon or twelve midnight? Oh, I didn't think of that. Well, you'd better. Oh, how can you be so callous at that head? 
That shrunken head. You put it on my pillow. What? It would be just like you to do something crazy like this. Because you're... You're sick, Trevor. Mother, sick. Mother, he is please. sick. I don't know how he killed Barry. Before our eyes, yours and mine, killed him. But he did. And he's going to do it again. This time to me. Take it, take it easy, Elizabeth. You, uh... When? When is he going to do it? That's the only question now. The only question that interests me. When, Trevor? Twelve noon? Twelve midnight? <laughs> I don't mind dying. But I can't bear not knowing when. Tell me, Trevor. A dramatic scene And an intriguing one, don't you think? If I were you, I wouldn't at this moment be asking Was Forey murdered? And will Elizabeth meet the same fate? But if Forey was And she does How? I'll return in a minute for Act Two. At this moment, you have all the clues you need. In fact, all the clues you're going to get, because that's all there are to answer the riddle of how Forey Prescott died. And, oh, let's face it, it is murder, and who killed him? If it comes to that, who will murder Elizabeth and how? For surely she too is going to die. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Oh, catch her. She's falling. I've got her. Elizabeth? Oh, oh I, I, I... I'm all right. Oh, Mother, thank heaven you're alive. So you see, oh. my dear Elizabeth, I didn't murder you after all. Oh. <sighs> Only because you mean to prolong the agony, Trevor. Now I must wait till midnight. Why? What do you mean, why? You can simply leave. Get out of here now. Yes, Mother, you can do that. I'll drive you to town. You could stay at the motel. Or if you want, I'll take you to New York. You could... No. But, Elizabeth, if you're afraid of being murdered at midnight... Then let it be at midnight. Get it over with. This... This, it's, it's crazy. You know, all this talk about murder. You, all of you. You're assuming Forey was murdered when you don't even know what he died of. For all you know, he could simply have dropped dead. A heart attack. Cerebral hemorrhage. Why have you assumed, the three of you, you, Jackie, you, Trev, you, Elizabeth, why have you assumed from the start that Forry was murdered? But if he wasn't, Raj, what's the meaning behind the shrunken head? We discovered the head was missing from the hour of seven on that... that awful clock above the fireplace. And then Forry found it on the pillow of his bed, and Forry died at exactly seven o'clock. This time a head is missing from twelve, and it's on the pillow of my bed. Where I found it when I woke up my neck. Hello? Oh, hello, Ed. Dr. Dodd, the coroner. I see. Mm-hmm. Well, how long will that take? Will you let me know? Thanks, Ed. Thanks very much. What, what did Dr. Dodd say, Father? Forey was murdered. <gasps> no. The autopsy revealed poison in the body tissues. What oh. kind of poison? Well, they uh, don't know yet. Ed's sending a tissue sample to the New York police lab to find out. No doubt uh, about it now, though. Forey was murdered. As you will murder me at midnight. <laughs> Darling, let's sit down a few minutes before we go back. Oh, Raj, I just had to get away from that 
awful atmosphere in that house. <laughs> Look, sweetheart, I'll be more than happy to take you back to New York. And then come back by yourself? Oh, no. Oh, I'd be safe enough, I think. From whom? What? I'm not thinking of the murderer, sweetheart. I, I'm thinking of the danger you'd be in. And, and I'd be in from the very attractive and decidedly sexy Jacqueline. Oh, I owe it to Trevor to help him all I can with his records, papers, Lord knows what. Help him get them in order before he dies. Rog, what do you make of all this? I, who do you think murdered Trevor's son-in-law? I don't know. Could be Trevor. He hated Fari, but then it... It could be Jackie. She hated him, too. What about Mrs. Costain? Elizabeth? Hmm. I know what you mean. With that shrunken head on her pillow, she could have put it there. Yeah. A red herring, a blind. Hmm. Something to throw the police off the scent when they get here. The police will come again, you think? Well, sure. I'd say all they're waiting for is a toxicology report on whatever poison killed Fari, and that can come any minute, any hour. It's it's almost five. I guess we, we've been gone at least a couple of hours. I guess we'd better think of getting back. Ginny, you sure now? You don't want me to take you back to New York? Uh-uh. You're a brave little girl who deserves a kiss. I'm a scared little girl. But, but don't let that stop you. Don't tell me what to do, Jackie. If I want to change my will, I'll change it. In fact, my attorneys are changing it right now. Well, damn it, don't look at me as if I'd done some terrible thing to you. Or maybe you misunderstood me. No, I, I didn't misunderstand. You're cutting Mother off and leaving your fortune to me. Why? Plain enough. I want to be sure you're financially safe and secure. Oh, no, Father. There's more behind it than that. You know as well as I do, Mother would take good care of me, share what she has with me. <laughs> you don't know her like I know her. Oh, I know her better than you. I've spent my life with her. You've spent yours elsewhere. Well, I'm an explorer, or I was. Oh, you could have spent more time with her. I don't tolerate fools easily. Well, we've got off the subject. What's your real reason for changing the will? All right. Let me tell you. You're still hoping I'll marry Roger Campion. You're hoping that if I'm an heiress, the money will help induce him to divorce Virginia and marry me. You said it, not me. Well, you think it. You must. I can't think of any other reason for changing your will. Oh, Father, Roger and I are through with each other. If only you hadn't married Fari. Damn. Well, if you'd put a break on your temper, you wouldn't break so many of those pipe stems. One of my best pipes, too. Well, I have to send it for repair. I wish I could repair the mess you've made of your life as easily. All right, I made a mess of my life, but that's over now. Barry's dead, and that's over. And I mean to keep you from making another. Now, you listen to me. Roger's the man for you. He always has been. And why you didn't marry him oh, years ago. you know ago. why? I wanted a husband I could live with, be with. Not a wanderer like you. I saw what happened to Mother because of you. The emptiness, loneliness. And I made up my mind it would never happen to me. <laughs> Fari was no bargain, as it turned out, but he stayed at home. So does Roger now. He runs his safaris from an office in New York. <laughs> that... That disease you picked up in Borneo, it's just making you see things in a warped way, a distorted way. You're not yourself. You think it's crazy of me to change my will? It's crazy of me to hope that you'll persuade Roger to get a divorce and marry you. That what I want so much, the two people I love most in this world, should make it together. If I haven't got a prayer, it'll happen. Well, it won't. I'm sorry. But it won't. It will. I want... You can't always have what you want. You're wrong. I always have and always will. Till the day I die. Midnight. It's nearly midnight. Jackie, where's your mother? 
I told you. She's locked herself in her room. And I told you I want her here in this living room at midnight. Go get her. She won't unlock the door. She feels safer locked in her room. If you won't go and get her, I will. Weak as I am, I'll go up there and break the door down. I want her here. Give it another try, Jackie. All right. And tell her I'll come up and break the door down. And you go get that piece of fluff you married. I want her here, too. That little piece of fluff I married is probably fast asleep. And Trev, I'm not waking her. You will do as I She's say. She's had a rough time since we got here this morning. If I'd known what we were heading into, I wouldn't have come, let alone bring Ginny. She went to bed after dinner, and that's where she's going to stay. All right. Now, that's the one thing I always liked about you, Raj. You never failed to stand up to me. You take a lot of standing up, too. Not anymore. Hand me that rack of pipes, will you? The, the one with the church wardens. Church wardens? Oh, the ones with the long stamp. Yes. They're beautiful, Trev. They really are. Any practical reason for the extra long stems? Well, sure, they cool and filter the smoke. The longer the stem, the better... Th oh, you finally decided to join us. You decided, Trevor. Why are you so determined to have me here, in this room at midnight? Elizabeth, why were you so determined to stay in yours? To put it plainly, so you couldn't kill me. You've eaten no dinner. You've had nothing to drink all day. To cut day. down the chances of your poisoning me the way you poisoned Fari. I locked myself in my room to cut the chances down even further. But, well, here I am. You wanted me here, in this room, so you could murder me. And I'm sure... That when the drum clock strikes at midnight, you will. Oh, I don't know, but you will. It's never occurred to you, I suppose, that I want you here so I can protect you. Protect me? <laughs> Is that so hard to believe? Oh, very hard. In fact, impossible. Well... Less than a minute now to midnight. Roger. Yes, Elizabeth? Goodbye. I, I want you to know that, like Trevor, I too have always been very fond of you. Respected you. Hoped you and Jackie would marry. But I also want you to know that you, you couldn't have done better when you married Virginia. She's a fine girl, Roger. Just the kind of wife you need. Goodbye, Roger. Elizabeth, you're sounding as if you were going to your execution. In a way, that's what it would be. Nonsense. You're not going to die. You're standing here in this room as healthy a woman as I've ever seen. You, we, we've let Fari's death overshadow everything, warp our thinking, make us expect death. But look around you, Elizabeth. Where could you possibly find a more, a more home-like scene? A scene that ought to reflect contentment rather than anything else. Contentment? I mean, look around. The fire blazing in the fireplace. Trev polishing his pipe. The friendly warmth of an old house where... Midnight. Jackie. Mother. Let me hold you. Mother, you're not going to die. You can't. I am, I know it. I... Elizabeth, this is nonsense. It's ridiculous. Trevor, I'm waiting. What do you mean, waiting? For you to kill me. Murder me. If I murder you, Elizabeth, it'll be the neatest trick of the week. I couldn't agree with you more. Oh, mother. Oh, mother. I tried to catch her, but... No, no. Jackie, stand back. Let me... She's dead. But how? How? One moment she was alive and the next... 
dead. Raj, what killed her? What killed Fari? What? What? How? Do you know? Have you figured it all out? As I told you, you have all the clues I have, and I've figured it out. Well, uh, I think I have. I'll be back shortly for Act Three. Now Elizabeth Costain is dead. Mysteriously struck down. Instantly killed as her son-in-law Forrest Prescott was. Only the day before. Now the following morning in the guest room occupied by Roger and Virginia Campion... No, no, Virginia, I've made up my mind. We're leaving. Not if you plan to take me to New York and then return here. I won't be coming back. I never expected anything like this when I agreed to help Trevor straighten out his affairs. Oh, but, Roger, you're such old friends. I'm not so sure of that, Jenny. To be Trevor Costain's friend, you have to be friends on his terms. Oh, he likes me, sure. He values my friendship up to a point. But that's because I always did the job he wanted done, and I never crossed him. He must have been a hard man to live with. He hasn't changed any, even with a... Well, even with his death only a few weeks, months away. He's still demanding and getting what he wants. He's still riding roughshod over everyone in his path. I have got a strong suspicion that that's why Fari and Elizabeth were murdered. They got in Trevor's way. Then you really think... That I'm almost he... sure of it. Now, there are only four of us left in this house now. There's you and me and Jackie and Trevor. Now, you and I certainly aren't murderers, and Jackie wouldn't kill a gnat if she could avoid it. No, no. It's got to be Trevor. What I can't figure out is how he killed them. What's that? Well, I, I thought all the police had left. Oh, it's the last car heading out of the driveway now. Come on, Ginny, let's get these bags packed. I want to be heading out of that driveway, too. And just as soon as possible. Father. Father, will you please stop polishing that damn pipe and listen to me? Well, what do you want, Jackie? The police have just left. I... I wondered if you'd like a cup of coffee. Give me a drink. No, you're not supposed to drink. I know what I'm not supposed to do. All right. Whatever you say. And hand me those pipe cleaners. Here you are. Here's your drink. Thanks. <sighs> Good. Good. I'll miss this fine old scotch when I'm gone. <laughs> One consolation, though. Roger always enjoyed it, too. And it'll all be his when I've kicked the bucket. You... You willed it to him? Your supply of scotch? No, no, of course not. I meant all of this will be his. I don't, I, I don't understand. You said you willed everything to me. Well, I did. Maybe I shouldn't have said this will all be Roger's. I should have said yours and Roger's. Naturally, after you're married... Married? Father, I to... I told you yesterday I'm not marrying Roger. For one thing, I don't love him anymore, and he doesn't love me. And for another, he's happily married to Virginia. For as long as she lives. As long as she lives? As long as... Oh, come in, Raj. Come in. Trev, Jackie... Did you and Jenny get any sleep? Not much. Dozed an hour or so. How about some coffee? It's a good idea. And what would you like for breakfast? Just uh, coffee. You'll be okay. And what about Jenny? Coffee will be enough for her, too. We, uh, we want to get an early start back to New York. Back to New York? We haven't even started on my paper, my record. I know, old Trev, but... Uh, but? but what? Trev... Uh, if I'd known what I was walking into when I came here, and uh, kn known what I was walking Ginny into, I'd never have come. Oh, yes, you would. You never disobeyed me. Stood up to me, yes. But when the chips were down, you did what you were told. 
I was your second in command then, and that was years ago. Oh, not so many. Uh, Two, three. But busy, busy years, Trev. I've got my own business now, my own life to live, and to be plain, I don't take orders from anybody anymore. Why, you ungrateful... Now, just a minute, Trev. I was more than willing to come here and spend as much time as it took to straighten out your affairs. I felt I owed you that. The least you owed me, the least. Maybe. But what I don't owe you is putting my life, or Ginny's, on the line for you. You mean Fari's death? Mother's? Yeah, and who's and... next? I've got a feeling that no one is safe in this house. A feeling or a suspicion? Same thing, Trev. Not exactly. Feeling there may be another death is one thing. Suspecting who might be behind the deaths is another. You suspect me, don't you? Yes, Trev, I do. Well, I guess the time has come to tell you that your suspicion is correct. One hundred percent correct. You did kill. Oh, you suspected me too, did you? But it's impossible. You hardly have strength enough left to stand on your feet, to walk a few steps. Wrong. Oh, I'm weak, all right, but not as weak as I pretended. See? Then you... You were able to take the shrunken heads from that clock. And put one on Fari's pillow? And the other on Elizabeth's? But even so, I, I still don't see how you... How you kill them exactly on the hour. Foray at seven, mother at midnight. How did you manage that, Trev? My little secret. Some sort of slow-acting poison? A, a poison that you were able to time to the minute? No, but oh, a small matter. All that matters to me now is that you and Roger marry. You're out of your head. Father, father. You're sick. Right now, you're overly tired. You're exhausted. You're a, a little mi mixed up. Crazy. When you... Say it. You said it yesterday. Say it again. Crazy. But sane or crazy, the two of you will do as I wish. Obey my final order. No way, Trevor. I love Virginia. I'm married to Virginia. I'll stay married to Virginia. You can't very well stay married to a corpse, Raj. Now, what do you mean by that? Why, no more than what is stated in the marriage vows. Uh, Till death do us part. And death is going to do just that in a few short minutes. When I kill Virginia, as I kill Forey... And Elizabeth. Trev, you've gone crazy. Ginny and I are getting out of here and fast. Don't move. What? I said don't move. Try. And I'll kill you where you stand. And be warned, Raj. I can do it. Jackie? Yes? Get Virginia. Bring her here. Father, I... Do as I order you. But I... Do you but... want him to die now? Before your eyes? Jackie, no. I'd better do what he wants, or he will kill you, Raj. Get her in here, Jackie. No need. I'm here. Ginny. I heard every word he said. He will kill you, Raj, unless you let him kill me. Let me kill you? He can't prevent me. What I mean is it's my death you want, not his. I don't know how you do it, but go ahead. And do it. Kill me. Ginny, you're out of your mind. I love you, Raj. Too much to see you die. Answer that, Jackie. Hello? Yes, Dr. Dodd. It's for you, Father. You talk to him. I uh, can't at the moment. Oh, if Father can't come to the phone, Dr. Dodd, could you give me... Oh, I see. Yes. Yes, I'll tell him. Well? The poison that killed Fari and Mother, too, I guess. 
The New York police identified it. Carrare. Carrare? So, that's how you did it. Hmm? What is Carrare? It's a poison used by New Guinea headhunters to kill their victims, kill them instantly. How? With darts, thorns, dipped in the stuff, and shot through blowguns. Yes, but how could Father... Oh, good Lord. Oh, Lord. The pipes. The pipes. You've sat there polishing and cleaning. Blowing through the stems to clear them, you said. But blowing a poison dart through them when you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> the stem of a pipe makes an excellent blowgun. Especially the very long stem of a church warden like this one. And the thorn inside this stem, a thorn dipped in curare, kills instantly. Virginia? Yes. Doesn't hurt, Virginia. Uh, All you feel is a little sting uh, when the thorn pricks the skin. Second later, you'll be dead. Roger? I warned you. Drop it, Trev. Drop that pipe stem or blow gun or whatever you call it. I don't see anything funny. You standing there holding that Maasai war spear over your head, ready to throw it. You look a little silly, Raj. You're not exactly the Maasai warrior type. I know how to throw one of these things, and you know I do. You've seen me do it. In Africa, yes. Those Maasai spears fascinated you. But you practiced every day. Got quite good, too. But not good enough to put that spear through me before I blow this dart into your wife. Not you. I'm not going to throw it into you. I'm going to throw it into her. Me? Kill Jackie? You leave me no choice, Trev. You love your daughter. You love her more than anything, anyone on this earth. Kill Jenny and I'll kill her. You haven't the guts. Yeah, try me. Jackie, take that pipe stem away from him. Give it to me, Father. Take it. Oh. I know when I'm licked. What are you doing? I'm calling the police. All things considered, Trev, the quicker you're taken into custody, the better. If you want to move really fast, call the morgue. The morgue? I gave Jackie the pipe stem. I kept the thorn. Father, no! Oh, father. Father. Police headquarters, this is Roger Campion. I'm calling from the home of Trevor Costain. You better send someone out here. What? No, it's not another murder. It's suicide. You'll admit I did play fair with you. From the very beginning of this mystery, you had all the clues, all of them, including the shrunken heads, the New Guinea headhunters, who you might have known use Kirari, and a clue that gave everything away. Trevor Costain's absorbing interest in his pipes. When E.G. Marshall plays fair, he plays fair. I'll be back shortly. Hope you enjoyed our mystery. I certainly enjoyed playing a little game with you. Because that's what all mysteries are, you know. A game of wits. Oh, sure. I have the advantage. I know the answer before I start. But in fairness to you, whenever I bring you a mystery, I'll make sure you have all the clues from the start. After that, it's up to you. Entirely. Our cast included William Prince, Tony Roberts, Marion Seldes, and Martha Greenhouse. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Not many people, I suppose, remember the name of the writer Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. Yet among fans of the Gothic tale, he is considered by many as the equal of the great masters such as Poe, Stevenson, and de Maupassant. Judge for yourself as you listen to perhaps his greatest short story, grisly, ghoulish, and inexpressibly haunting... not in the bed. Hold the lamp higher. She's not in the room. The window. Could she have fallen or jumped? The shutters are closed. The, the last still thrown. There. Can you see anything, Shalkin? No, Herr Bookman. The street is empty. The canal is smooth as glass. She's gone. Rose is gone. As if she'd never returned. <laughs> mystery drama, Till Death Do Us Join, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Don Scardino and Roberta Maxwell. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Of all the painting he must have done in his solitary lifetime, there exists today, in remarkable condition, only one canvas of Godfrey Shalkins, pupil of Gerard Bookman, who in turn was a pupil of the great Rembrandt. The picture represents a chamber in some antique religious building. Its foreground is occupied by a young woman of startling beauty, her face illuminated by a strange smile half lovely, half evil. In the background is the shadowy form of a man dressed in the old Flemish fashion, propped up in a coffin, as though in a bed. A fascinating picture, and a chilling one. No one who views it can repress a shudder. Why? On the back of the canvas is a legend, written in cramped longhand by the painter, which may serve to explain why. They think me boorish, rude, and laugh at my slovenly ways and filthy habits. But they buy my pictures, for I am an artist beyond peer. My whole life I have devoted to trying to forget what I once was. The only life I have had is canvas and pigments, and a search for escape in the only fashion I can accomplish it. Once I was young as other men, with a bright future in my chosen profession, full of laughter and joy and madly in love. Oh, there were barriers to overcome, impossible heights to scale, but with the hope and optimism of youth, I knew I could win out. How could I know that a force beyond any human strength would strangle my spirit, twist and deform my soul, and doom me to a lifetime of despair. Rose. Shh. We are alone, beloved. All the other students are gone. And Herr Bookman? He he left the studio for home less than five minutes ago. I know. I only wanted to be sure I had made no mistake. How do you know? I had Jacob, the groom, drive me into Amsterdam today to shop for some silks. On the way back, I had him stop at his favorite beer stub to have a beer and groom the horses whilst I took a stroll along the canal. 
I was hoping to catch you alone at the studio, and my prayers were answered when I saw my uncle climb into his carriage and drive off. My dearest one, if only I could declare my love for you openly. Oh, you will be famous very soon, and we are still young. We have time. Every moment spent away from you is an eternity. It is just as bad for me, but for the moment we must live with it. Come, let me see what you have been working on, my genius. No, no, it is in no shape. I, I cannot make it come right, and it is still only a sketch. But, Godfrey, you are wrong. The conception is beautiful, and even the freehand outline tells all the world you are a master, or to become one. Tells all the world. Well, perhaps you are right, for you are all my world. If whatever I do satisfies you, it would be reward enough. Oh, no. We must do better than that so that we can have each other. Finish this one as you have started, and I will see that Uncle Gerard gets the canvas to the right places. Once someone buys you, you will become a vogue. I know it. I feel it in my... in my bones. Not in your heart? In my heart, what I feel is my love for a man named Godfrey Shalkin. Will I ever be rich enough to make you my wife? Hold me, Godfrey. Hold me very tight. Rose. Rose. I want to believe. Help me to. In every way I can. Oh. But what happened? I don't know. A sudden chill as if... The time. I must go. I would do nothing to set Manea Bookman against us. Why can't I just go to him? No, no, I beg you. I know my uncle. He would only send you away and then you would have lost everything. Me, his teaching, your future. Hush, my darling. Trust in God. And let us hope. I love you. I shall always love you. God give you grace. What grace has a God who keeps two lovers apart? Heaven forgive me. I meant it not. But the words had been said and could not be taken back. I turned to my sketch, one of the temptations of St. Anthony by the devil. I set to work and was so busily engaged that an hour or so must have passed. The light was gone. As I sat back, I heard a sort of sniff behind me. A few feet behind me stood the figure of an elderly man in a cloak and a broad-brimmed conical hat. The room was so dark by now that the shadow from his hat obscured his features entirely. But I was impressed, awed at the perfect stone-like stillness of the figure. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you come in. This is the studio of Gerard Bookman. It is. Will you sit, my dear? No. I wish to talk to him. He has returned to his home some hours past. If you would wish to seek him there... No. Will you see him before tomorrow evening? Oh, yes, sir. I am one of his pupils, and he will be here by late morning to commence his classes. Are you to be trusted with a message? I hope so. Fail to deliver it at your peril... Tell Gerard Bookman that Minerva van der Hausen of Rotterdam wishes to speak to him here tomorrow evening at exactly seven in this room on matters of weight. He turned abruptly and with a quick but utterly silent step quit the room. Some strange premonition drew me to the window through which I could see the exit door to the street bordering the canal. I waited in vain for him to appear. The darkness was now gathering in earnest. Leaving the studio and locking the door, I half expected to find him lurking in the halls below. But he had vanished as mysteriously and completely as he had first appeared. Nor was the mysterious stranger further identified when I reported him to my near bookman the following noon. Van der Hausen? Van der Hausen. <clears throat> no. Me, name means nothing to me. From Rotterdam, you say? He said. Yes. 
Well, we shall wait for the appointed hour, and in the meanwhile, to work. I have looked at your sketches on the temptation of St. Anthony. The line, the chiaroscuro, the coloration are acceptable, well done and conceived. But the expressions... It's as if St. Anthony were the devil and the devil the saints. What is your conception? Why? Your Honor, I, I... I cannot answer. I do not know. Well, uh, the other pupils are arriving. Now let's see if your conception can improve during class studies. So, my poor Shalkin... The others are all gone, and I had little time for you today. Ah, I want the canvas. I don't know, Master. I found it hard to concentrate. <laughs> and so did I. Let's forget pigment and brushes a while and join me in a glass of brandy. It's been a long, hard day, and I have some strange premonition. This visitor you tell me to expect bears some... Ill tidings. Well, at all events, let's fortify ourselves against ill chance. Your health. Your health. At seven, you said. He said. Bunderhausen. <laughs> Never heard of the man. What can he want of me? A portrait? A poor relation to be apprenticed? A collection to be evaluated? Well, you should soon learn. The stud house is sounding the hour. I should leave. No. Stay with me, Godfrey. You're young and strong. And for some reason, I have a foreboding about this mysterious appointment. No. The clock has ceased. I shall not wait too long for... He seems to be here, sir. I'll go. Let him in. By your leave, young sir. You are Gerard Bookman? I am. I have the honor to address Mynheer Vanderhausen of Rotterdam. The same. I understand your worship wished to meet with me, and I'm here, as you see, by your appointment. It is well. Is that a man of trust? Well, he's my prized pupil, of course. Yes. Well, then, let him take this box of leather and get the nearest jeweler or goldsmith to value its contents. Why? That I will explain to you alone. But I wish him to return with a certificate of the value of the contents. That is a strange request, Minir. May I ask the reason? When we are alone... And I think Jan Spurton in the next street will still be open. Godfrey, will you gratify the gentleman's wish? Your wish, sir. I will take as little time as I can. I had in my hands a small leather case, about nine inches square, surprisingly heavy for its size. I was less curious about its contents than the conversation I was about to miss. If I could even have dreamed of its subject and the consequences... But how could I? Instead of clairvoyance, I reacted normally to my master's order and sought the information I had been asked to get. Who is it? Godfrey Shalkin, pupil of Master Gerard Bookman. Uh, Were it not for your master's good offices and the designs he presents me with, neither God nor the devil would persuade me to open up at this late hour. Well... What is it, young sir? My master bid me bring the contents of this leather case to you for evaluation. <laughs> that scuffed and crumbling jewel box? <laughs> what nonsense. Still, by its antiquity, it's curious and challenging. But come in, come in, by all means. <laughs> the wind makes enemies of my old bones. Now, what is the... Urgency that prompts this haste? I know not, Mynheer Spyton. Well, then let me see. Give me the case. Good Lord. What is it? A moment. 
my loop and my scale so I can examine and weigh. Gold ingots. If they say it true, this is a king's ransom, young man. <laughs> If Godfrey Shalkin had only known, or guessed, he might have been tempted to seize the fortune in gold ingots and bury it in Amsterdam's deepest canal. For the contents of that scuffed, scraped case, soiled with age, were to turn his life about and transform him from a young, carefree man to the bitter, hating wretch who painted with the flair of the gods. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. While Godfrey Shalkin was learning from the goldsmith the incredible value of the contents of the leather case, a conversation was taking place between the mysterious stranger and his master. A conversation concerned with the girl he loved, Rose Welderkraust, Bookman's niece. A conversation that established those golden ingots not as a king's ransom, but a queen's. Herr Bookman, I will be free with you. I cannot buy limitations I dare not discuss. Tarry with you long. Well, surely I can offer you a drink? No. Oh, some refreshment, food? No. Well, at least let me raise the lights. No. Oh, 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 divest you of your outer garments. No. Well, I can feed the fire more logs to warm you. I have no need of your offers, nor desire of them. I come to make you an offer. Well, will you come to the fire and sit? I prefer to stand where I am. The shadows suit me well. I, I don't understand. Some time ago, I saw you in the church of St. Lawrence in Rotterdam. With you was a young girl of exceptional beauty whom I later ascertained was your niece. I desire to marry her. Without meeting her, conversing with her, just from one glimpse? That was enough to convince me she was the woman I desire to share my future with. But, Rose... If I can satisfy you that I am wealthier than any husband you could ever dream for her, I expect that you, Herr Buckman, will forward my suit with your authority. And I must add... That if you are to approve my proposal, it must be here and now. For I can brook no delays. You're extremely arbitrary, Minea. I am constrained to be. I offer no apology. I did not ask for one. You might reasonably have. My circumstances are such that I have none to offer. You must be aware that my niece has a will of her own. And may not acquiesce in what we may design for her advantage. The young man I sent out with a packet will return shortly. That will prove the evidence of my wealth and uh, security for your niece's life. I promise you it will be ten times the fortune she could expect. All of it in the interest that a cruise shall be hers as long as she lives. Can I be more liberal? Well, if what you tell me is true, of course not. As to my respectability, you must take that for granted, at least for the present. I buy my name and reputation with what you're about to discover about me. My wealth. You, you must give me a moment to think. I remind you again, my time is limited. I will not pledge myself unnecessarily. But you will, if it is necessary, and I consider it so. A testy old gentleman determined to have his own way. Eh? Why, those were the very words that, that you were thinking, I know. You also thought to yourself, all things considered, I'm not justified in declining the offer if the gold involved is satisfactory. Am I correct? You read my mind correctly. Please forgive the intrusion and my abruptness. 
But we are both men of sense as well as sensibility. Your niece is penniless. I shall make her as rich or richer than a queen. When your young man returns with a valuation, if you don't wish the proposal withdrawn, you must immediately sign this engagement. Andra. Master, I have brought Mynheer Spyton's valuation of the contents of the case. Give them to Mynheer Vanderhausen. Oh, no. No, no, no. Give them to Mynheer Bookman. Yes, sir. Here they are, Master. <gasps> Gold ingots? The value? I, I, I can't believe it. Neither could Jan Spyton or myself. I fled back through the streets, searching every shadow... I have never seen so much wealth. Ten thousand guilders. A token only. My wealth is limitless. Will you sign the contract now? Uh, a moment. My eyes are, are tired and the light is dim. This youth must witness the contract. Let him read it to you. Will you, Godfrey? Yes, master. This document represents an irrevocable agreement by Gerard Bookman as guardian at law to give Wilkin Vanderhausen the hand of his niece, Rose Velderkaus. Uh, go on, boy, go on. Of his niece, Rose Velderkaus, in marriage within one week of the date of this document. In exchange for this covenant, the said Wilkin Vanderhausen agrees to provide as a marriage settlement a package of gold ingots... I you... don't think it's necessary to read the rest. It's only the jargon of advocates. Mania Buckman, I have not tried in any way to stint in my offer. Now, are you, for your niece's sake as well as for your own, content? Well, I would dearly like perhaps... Uh, another day to consider... Not one hour. Very well. I am content. I can scarcely deny my niece her good fortune. Nay, eh, Godfrey? Uh, how, how can I presume to offer an opinion? E except that Rose... I mean, your Frau Velderkaus... Should she not be consulted? A young girl is not the best judge of her future. Rose is my responsibility. Lovely as she is, when could she have such a chance again? Mynheer van der Huysen, I'm content. It is a bargain. Mm -hmm. Then sign at once, I implore you, for I am weary. Very well. And now, the witness. I can't. I won't. What's this, Godfrey? I've taken you into my studio, supported you, taught you, reared you. How can you refuse me one simple request in return? I can't. Well, surely, Rose... There is only one answer, Mania Buckman. That young man is as taken with your niece as I am. Very well. Now, would you choose between us? Must we find another witness, or do I take my document and vanish from your life? Godfrey... How can you think of Rose? You, a, a painter, an artist. You have your own dedication in a field which may leave you penniless for the rest of your life. If you do truly love Rose, how can you deny her this opportunity? I love her more than life itself. I want only her happiness. Then sign. Master, I... There is Rose herself. Rose is not yet ready to know her own mind. I am her guardian. It's my duty to secure her future. If you love my niece, you'll realize it's in her own best interests. Because I love her, then, I sign. Mm. Mm. It is well. I will take the contract, and you keep the gold. I shall visit you at your house tomorrow night at nine o'clock, my good Mynheer Buckman, to meet formally with the object of the contract. Again, stiffly, but with the same rapid movement, the shadowed figure was gone so swiftly I had no time to open the door for him. 
Again, the same unnamed fear drove me to the window to watch for his exit down below. And again, his movement must have been so rapid that I failed to see him leave and enter the street. Godfrey? Yes, Master. I'm sorry. I didn't know that you'd formed an attachment to my niece. I have no right to. And I'm glad you're sensible of that. A painter, it's an uneasy life of sacrifice and most of the time, poverty. So I shall hold my peace till the appointment a week from now. And uh, you will join us at dinner. Must I? It will be better for all of us to face and accept the future. It's striking nine, Rose. Is all arranged? As you see, Uncle. You're a perfect hostess. The fire shines like burnished gold and the table is set immaculately. Godfrey, a glass of wine? No. Thank you, Master Bookman. You seem nervous. I am. I hope you're not going to lose control of your feelings. Uh, it isn't that, Master. Then what? I can't quite explain. A strange foreboding. Hmm. You feel it too. Does Rose know what the occasion is? No. Then it is not too late. I have signed the contract. My word alone is its bond. But the paper is the final arbiter. Then there is no escape. Escape from what? A marriage settlement beyond my wildest dreams for my brother's daughter? I commend you to control your foolish dreams. I've done what must be done. And our guest is here. Rose? Yes, Uncle? Come stand by me to greet our visitor. Yes, Uncle. This time the room was brightly lighted. This time the mynheer had to shed his outer garments. This time we could see his features for the first time. His undersuit was a rich sable garment, his stockings of dark purple, his feet enclosed in shoes adorned with roses of the same color. His hands were enclosed in gauntlets, his hair long enough to rest on a plaited ruff. So far, all was well. But the face was a bluish, leaden hue, such as metallic medicines sometimes produce. The eyes muddy white and startlingly prominent with the glaze of insanity. And the lips a deep purple, almost black, twisted in a sensual, malignant, almost satanic fashion, such as my unwilling fingers had wanted to trace on the face of my Saint Anthony. The effect was so startling that for a long moment no one could speak. It was as though some devilish humor had dressed a corpse from the grave and invigorated it far enough to walk and talk and enter a room with the living. One must admit, of course, that Shulkin could scarcely see his rival, or to be more truthful, the man who had stolen his beloved from him, in the best light. The painter's eye tends to exaggerate, or at least translate the human figure into his own design. And jealousy is a poor measure for judgment. When we return shortly with Act Three, we will be able to make our own assessment of this strange and devious story. The stranger spoke little during the half hour or so he stayed. Nor could his host manage many more words. Such, indeed, was the nervous terror that Vanderhausen inspired that it was an effort not to fly in panic from the room. Something indescribably odd was about him. His movements, as if directed by a spirit unused to managing the machinery of the body. And two things were remarked by all. The fact that his eyelids never closed 
and that his chest was motionless, unstirred by the process of respiration. It was with a feeling of infinite relief for all when the door finally closed behind him. Oh, thank God. Are you all right, Rose? No. I feel as chilled as someone with fever. My dear, don't exaggerate. I don't. He's a frightful man. I wouldn't see him ever again for all the wealth in the world. Don't be a foolish girl. A man may be as ugly as the devil, but if his heart is good and his actions match it, he's worth more than some handsome puppy with neither brains nor prospects. I don't want to talk about him anymore. But we must. The man is wealthy, liberal, and withal good-hearted. He has sued for you as his bride... His bride? It is my duty to see you well bestowed. I promised your father on his deathbed that I would make sure of that. Uncle, not that man. Enough for tonight. There are no decisions to make beyond the fact that it is time to retire. Godfrey, I shall see you in the morning. Yes, Master. Good night, Jufrau Veldekost. No need to be so formal. Rose. And good night, Godfrey. Don't look so troubled. Nothing has changed. My walk home will be lighted by that knowledge. Good night, Master Bookman. Good night, my boy. And remember, you're an apprentice painter. That is your first and most important loyalty. I am acutely aware of where I stand here, Bookman. Good night. Why were you so severe with him, Uncle? Because we live in a world of reality. What do you mean? Do you realize that Mynheer van der Housen, who visited us tonight, has guaranteed you 10,000 guilders of your own as an earnest of his love and admiration for you? I have them here. 10,000 guilders? It's his way of saying how much he loves you. Love, for all its charms, is not the most important thing in the world. You will marry Mynheer van der Housen according to the contract. The mood of hope that my beloved had kindled in me barely lasted till my return home to the bare and cheerless garret I lived in. Even if in my sleepless bed-tossed night I might have held to some grain of hope, the next day would have dispelled them forever had I been at the Bookman house. Another tradesman's wagon? What can it be now? I can't wait to see... Oh, Uncle, did you ever see such riches? Never. Look at this scarlet domino. How could he know it would be just the right length? Feel the richness of the velvet. And trimmed in white ermine, even to the hood. Oh, I'd love to paint you in that. The hood framing your face. (laughs) You're all beauty. What woman would not be in such a cloak? If only Menea Vanderhausen... Hush, hush. Leave his appearance alone. You'll soon accustom yourself to it. Slippers in every color. A casket of jewels fit for an empress. This white, pure silk for my wedding gown. And the lace for my veil and train. Oh, Uncle, was any man ever so generous? Only the beginning, Rose. Whatever doubts I might have had, I think I've chosen your future well. And I too, dear Uncle. I will put Godfrey from my mind. In fact, he is already fading. Look at this necklace, this emerald pin. Oh, thanks to you, dear uncle. I may be the luckiest girl in the world. And so, one week later, I had to swallow my pride and watch my repulsive rival carry off my beloved Rose in solemn pomp in a carriage and four out of my life to Rotterdam. But I was mistaken. Rose Velderkost, now Rose Vanderhausen, was not out of my life yet. And I brought you home, my boy, to sup with me because I'm worried. And I've no one else to turn to. You may always count on me, Master. In all things, I know. In particular, this one. Contrary to all promises freely exchanged, it's four months since I've heard of my niece. Not one word. I'm 
too old to travel. Will you then be my emissary and take this letter to the Boom Key to inquire after my niece? If you desire me to. I do. You shall stay the night and take the coach for Rotterdam on the morn. I will issue you such funds as you need, and I pray you return post-haste with what word of comfort you can bring me. I will waste no time. I promise you. I left not a house in the boom key untried, Master, but no one had ever heard of my near Vanderhausen. Well, then where is my niece? I cannot tell. One thing I did when I returned to Amsterdam, I went to the establishment from which the coach and four was hired to take Rose and her bridegroom to Rotterdam. It's clever of you. And yes? The driver reported that late in the evening before they entered the city, a small party of men dressed in the old fashion with peaked beards and pointed mustaches standing in the center of the road stopped the coach. Highway robbers? Apparently not. Mynheer Vanderhausen seemed to have expected them, and he handed Rose down from the carriage and into an ornate, hand-carved but ancient litter, which the men lifted and bore off into the night. The driver making no attempt to stop them? No, since there was threat of force. All was as if it had been arranged, except... Except what? Except that Rose was weeping bitterly. Oh, dear Lord. What have I done? What can I do to reach her or help her? Jacob has already retired. See who that is, boy. At once, master. Rose. Oh. Dearest Rose. What is it? Wine. Wine quickly or I am lost. Master, she is distraught. Oh, Rose, my dearest, here. Here, drink. Oh, oh, no food. Please, God, at once or I perish. Uh, I'll cut some meat. Give it all to me. Send for a priest with all haste. Or in spite of all, I am not safe until he comes. Send for him speedily or I am lost forever. The dead and the living can never be one. God has forbid it. Up the stairs, quickly, Father. She is in terrible straits. Help me! Forgive me! Ah! No! No! He's here! Godfrey, throw your sword! Protect me! Where, Rose? Right? Where? In the anteroom with you and the priest. Stand aside, Father. Hold the lamp high. Let me see in the shadow. Ah! Not leave my bedside. Only to bring you the priest. Don't be afraid. Father Dowsell, myself, and Godfrey are only a few steps from your bed. Oh, God, help me. Whom I have no right to ask. Oh, the candle is out. It is too late. He has come for me. Don't leave her alone in there. The door. I can't budge it. We will break it down. No, 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 Dowsell, help me. No. She's not in the bed. Hold the lamp higher. She's not in the room. The window. Could she have jumped or fallen? They're shut fast. The latch is still thrown. There. Can you see anything? The street is empty. The canal is smooth as glass. She's gone. Rose is gone. As if she'd never returned. The days that followed are shady and insubstantial in my mind half crazed with grief and at Herr Bookman's remorseful request I returned to Rotterdam to the chapel of St. Anthony where Vanderhausen had first seen Rose it was after evening vespers and I was travel worn and soul weary when the worshippers left I remained alone in the church and I must have fallen asleep. I was awakened by a soft touch on my shoulder and awakened to see Rose. Rose. Shh. I want you to forget me, Godfrey, and know that I am content and free from sin at last. She led me by the hand, a lamp in her hand, down a flight of steps into the vaults below. The music faded, and there was only the sound of our footsteps 
echoing on the stone. Where are you taking me? To where I have found rest. Enter. The room was a bedroom, richly furnished. Its main feature, a great four-poster bed. The curtains drawn. She crossed to them, smiling, and said, You see? We are united at last, my husband and I. Sitting bolt upright on the bed, held in its position by the pillows, was Meinier Vanderhausen. The costume I recognized, the face, what was left of it, was still livid as I had first seen it. But by now the bones showed through the decayed flesh. The hands were little more than the claws of a skeleton. Exhausted as I was, overcome by emotion, the room suddenly swayed, and I lost consciousness. I was found the following morning by the sexton. The room in which I lay was the same, except that all the furnishings were gone, save one. In the place of the four-poster bed was nothing but a large and ornate coffin. I rubbed the dust from the nameplate, which read, My near Winkle Vanderhausen, 1606 to 1669. The man had been dead long before Rose Velderkaust or myself were born. Her uncle and I allowed her to marry herself to a corpse. sad and terrifying story, not calculated to make sleep any easier tonight, and yet a fascinating and absorbing one, as all of us are drawn irresistibly to the macabre. Besides, of course, it wasn't true, or was it? To Godfrey Shalkin's dying day, it was for him, so who is to say that it couldn't have happened? Not I. As I said in the beginning, you make your own judgment. I'll be back shortly. Schalken became a kind of living corpse who lived only through his paintings. But in spite of his success, he was recluse enough to insist on mixing his own pigments, which, alas, were not stable enough to stand the wear of time. So only the one canvas I mentioned remains. They say because he used his own blood to dilute the pigment. I don't know. There's no proof. It's just a part of the legend. Our cast included Don Scardino, Roberta Maxwell, Guy Sorrell, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Marvelous how you can get around when you've got no body, isn't it? See it? Little white dog, curly tail. Oh, silly little thing. And see that big blue station wagon? It's going to hit him. Got him. Got him, Cynthia. I've saved him. He'll probably get run over anyhow one of these days. No, he won't. No, he won't. I'm going to keep my eye on him. What about all the others? Them too. And cats and people and everybody. Oh, Cynthia. Why did it take me so long to find out what I was born to do? I could have spent my whole life doing this. Cynthia, my afterlife is going to be a hundred times more exciting than my life ever was. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division.
This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Blackmail is an ugly word. And when one of the blackmailer's victims sincerely insists that he's an angel, while another swears he's a devil, and still others are convinced he's a ghost, the problem of dealing with him becomes Herculean. My name is Robert Grand. I'm a 38-year-old bachelor... Music is my life and my love. And it was all I needed until now. Now I'm driven to tell this story, which happened exactly as I will describe it to you. It started on the day when I took over the management of the great Paris Opera House from the elderly and famous René Castellot. And last, Robert, but certainly not least, is this contract. A contract in a memorandum book? Why, René? Because that's the way the ghost wants it. <laughs> I, I never knew that the revered opera manager, René Castelot, had such a delightful sense of humor. Contract with a ghost? <laughs> Surely you're not serious. The opera ghost professes to be primarily concerned that the management give to every performance the splendor that belongs on what he calls the premier lyric stage of France. And, of course, this ghost will be the sole judge of the artistic splendor of a performance? Of course. However, there are two other conditions on which he places equal importance. Any attempt to perform an opera will meet with disaster if my allowance of 20,000 francs a month is more than 10 days late. Well, let me see. That monthly figure would amount to 240,000 francs a year. And this joker has further conditions? No, oh, yes. Uh, if you'll allow me. Box five on the Grand Tier shall be placed at my disposal for every performance. Oh, surely you don't mean to tell me that you took these ridiculous demands seriously? I observed them scrupulously. You never defied him or threatened to have him arrested? How does one arrest a ghost? Well, when he comes to take his seat in box five. He never occupied box five. And you still kept it vacant? Certainly. Well... You won't find me wasting a box that way. I intend to sell it. Well, that's your privilege as the new manager. But if you will take my advice, you'll never sell box five. I didn't know whether to laugh at Castello's foolishness or to cry because such a brilliant impresario had obviously fallen victim to some hoax. However, more immediate problems were demanding my attention. My soprano sent word that she was too ill to appear that evening in the role of Marguerite in Faust. I replaced her with a young girl named Christine Donat, who to mine and everyone else's amazement gave a performance which brought down the house. Bravo! I thought you were in charge with your brother. I was until I heard that Christine was to sing tonight, and then I rushed to Paris. Forgive my rudeness. I <laughs> mean to congratulate you upon your appointment as the manager of the opera. Now I must congratulate you on choosing Christine. I uh -huh. never heard her sing like this before. So have I. What a triumph. Look at her. She seems quite overcome. Uh, overcome? Nothing. She, she's ill. She's, she's fainted. led Paul Duran quickly backstage to Christine Donat's dressing room. A crowd had gathered outside her door. I made my way through with Paul by my side. I opened the door and saw that the house physician was by her side. To my surprise, Paul Duran walked swiftly to the couch on which Christine was lying and knelt down beside her. She turned her head, opened her eyes, and said, Monsieur, 
Who are you? Mademoiselle, when we were little children playing together at Perrault, I was the little boy who went into the sea to rescue your scarf. Well, how amusing, monsieur. Mademoiselle, since it pleases you not to recognize me, I should like to say something to you in private. Something very important. When I'm better, please. And now I should very much like to be alone. I want all of you to go away. Please. I wasn't aware that you knew Christine. Oh, I've known her for a long time, Robert. Ever since we were children. But we are no longer children, my friend. So why should we hang about outside her dressing room door like a pair of... And I know her well enough to understand that she asked to be alone because she wanted the chance to talk to me privately. <laughs> I didn't get that impression. But if you're convinced... Look, I'll prove it to you. Come on, let's go back and knock at her door, and you'll see. I don't know what you want of me. Oh, she seems to have someone in there with her. But that's impossible. We saw everyone leave when we did. Christine, you must love me. I do, I do. You know I sing only for you. Nevertheless, someone must have stayed behind. Maybe we can learn something. I do not listen at doors. I'm going in. No, no, no. Wait, wait. For my sake. Are you very tired? Tonight I gave you my soul and I am exhausted. Your soul is beautiful, child, and I thank you. The angels wept tonight. I must go home. Of course. They're sure to catch us each. No, 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 no. Come here. Quickly. They'll never see us in this corner. She's, she's, she's alone. There's no one with her. He must have remained in her dressing room. And she didn't lock her door. I'm going in and find out who was with her. Are you with me? Of course, Paul. Come on. But there's no light in here. He must be hiding. Strike a match, please. Hiding isn't going to help you. We know you're here. We heard you. Now come out. Can you see anyone? No. He must be here somewhere. And we'll find him wherever he's hiding. You may as well come out now and, and save us trouble. I intend to find out who you are. There's no one here. And no place to hide. We're talking to the walls. Robert, you know my family goes back to the days of Napoleon. And I'm sure you feel I lied to you when I said I knew Christine Donat. Certainly you had every What's right... What's about Donat? Well, this letter will prove to you that I wasn't lying. You see, she says right here, I have not forgotten the little boy who went into the sea to rescue my scarf. Then you know where she is. Of course. She is in Peru, And she is inviting me there, too, because it is the anniversary of her father's death. Uh, her father and I were friends. Do you mind if I go with you? How do you know I am going? Oh, don't talk nonsense. You're going because you're in love. And I'm going to bring back a singing sensation who hasn't been heard since the night of her triumph. So you came after all. I was thinking while I was at Mass, will he come and will he remember the end of the setting sun? You knew I would come. And you knew I would remember, Christine. Oh, I also brought Monsieur Grand. Well, how nice, but why did you... I am here to ask you to return to the opera, mademoiselle, and to ask you to sing other roles. Well, you will have to excuse me, Monsieur Grand, but I cannot talk of singing other roles now. But I have come all this way, mademoiselle, just to... I did not ask you to come. Or you either, Paul. You asked me to come, Christine. You knew your letter would bring me here to Perrault as surely as the sun shines. Well, that may have been a mistake on my part. There was no point in my remaining, as it was obvious that there was a lover's quarrel brewing. So I told Paul he could find me in my room. What you hear now is what Paul told me happened after I left them in the sitting room. Why do you say mistake, Christine? I don't know. When I wrote the letter, I was thinking of my childhood and my father and and the games we played as children. I, I think I wrote to you as the little girl I was then and, and not the woman I am now. When I came to you in your dressing room the other night, was that the first time you noticed me? No. I'd seen you in your box. I, I knew you were in the audience. Oh, good. 
Then why, when you saw me in the dressing room and I reminded you about the scarf, why did you pretend not to know me and laugh at me? Huh. Oh, all right, all right. I know it was because there was someone in your dressing room, Christine. What are you talking about? The man to whom you said I sing only for you tonight. I give you my soul and I am exhausted. You were listening at the door. That's the most... I listened, Christine, because I love you. Yes. Yes, I heard everything. All right, Paul. Tell me what else you heard. I heard him reply that... Your soul is beautiful, child, and I thank you. The angels wept tonight. Oh, Paul, you should not have heard that. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. And where is Christine now? Oh, I assume she went to her room. She ran from me, Robert. Why would she run from me? Oh. Don't ask me to explain why women do the things they do. Why would she flee the opera after the triumph she had? There must be some explanation. There must be. Uh, I can give you one you won't like. The voice we heard was the voice of Christine's lover. He didn't know about you, nor were you aware of his existence. She ran away to try to get things straightened out. That's why she wrote you. She knew you'd come here, and she'd be able to speak to you away from her lover. I won't believe it. Uh, don't forget, we checked, and there was no one in her dressing room. And don't forget, we both distinctly heard a man's voice. He had to be her lover. Or... Or someone who's been giving you problems, Monsieur Manager. Someone who calls himself the Opera Ghost. <laughs> At this point, I think I can say that I've become an authority on ghosts and their habits. Now, I've heard of ghosts who clank, ghosts who moan, ghosts who scream, wail, and even gnash their teeth. But this is the first time I've encountered a lovesick ghost who's also an opera lover. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. From time immemorial, out-of-the-way places have been favorite meeting spots for young lovers. And when a quarrel interrupts the course of true love, it's a common occurrence to find one of the unhappy pair sitting and waiting at their favorite trysting place, certain that the other must turn up. A cemetery, however, would seem a most unlikely place for a girl to expect to find her lover. Christine... I knew you'd come to pay your respects to my father at his grave, Paul. And I waited here to tell you something very serious. Paul, do you remember the angel of music? Oh, yes. Your father never told a story without mentioning him. I remember him saying that at least once in every great musician's life, the artist receives a visit from the angel. Yes. And sometimes, Paul... The angel leans over an infant's cradle, and that infant then has heard the angel, and the infant becomes a child prodigy. I remember. And when I asked Father if he had ever heard the angel of music himself, he, he shook his head sadly. But Paul, he told me that I would hear the angel one day. He said, when I'm in heaven, I shall send him to you. Paul... I have been visited by the angel of music. I don't doubt it. How is it that today you understand so well? You forget that I've heard you sing many times. And I never heard you sing the way you sang the other night. You were touched by genius. Yes. The angel of music. He comes every day to give me lessons in my dressing room. In your dressing room? The, the angel of music. What does he look like? You should know better than to ask that, Paul. I, I've never seen him. I only hear his voice. He speaks to me, and it, it's it, it's like in a dream. Are you sure you didn't dream all of this, Christine? How could I? I'm not the only one who heard the voice of the angel. Someone else has heard this voice? 
You, Paul. It was his voice you heard when you listened outside my dressing room door. Oh, Christine. You needn't have gone to such an elaborate lie to try to deceive me about the voice I heard. You think I lied? After all, I know what I heard. I'm beginning to understand. You think that that was a real man's voice. Well, if you had opened the door, you would have seen that there was no one in my dressing room. After you left, I did open the door, and there was no one there. And you still don't believe... I do not. Oh, how could I have ever loved you? Go away. I never want to see you again. The return trip to Paris wasn't pleasant. Paul Duren wanted so desperately to believe that his darling Christine was the victim of some cruel hoax. While I was convinced that Christine was an artful minx who was trying to keep two men on the string. This belief was strengthened by a telephone call I received the following day at my office. Grand speaking. Carlotta Sorelli. Oh, good day, madame. What can I do today for my beautiful prima donna? First, my dear Monsieur Grand, you must learn that I am not a woman easily intimidated. I'm sure you're not. But why do you call I me? I intend to sing the role of Marguerite in Faust Thursday night. Well, of course you do. Why would you call and tell me what has already been announced? Because of a note I received this morning. It reads, if you dare to appear as Marguerite next Thursday evening, be prepared for a gigantic misfortune. Oh, a prank, a jokester. Surely you're not going to take that seriously. That's exactly what I called to tell you. And I'm pleased you're taking it so well. Even if I were dying, I would sing the role of Marguerite next Thursday night. Before that Thursday night, I had to face the problem of the first masked ball to be held in the opera house under my direction. This was to be a truly gala affair with everyone in fancy dress. I knew from experience that every artist would be there, hoping to meet and fascinate a masked member of the upper crust. I, of course, attended unmasked. <laughs> Robert! Robert! Oh, Paul! Is that you behind this black domino? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I suppose you're seeking Christine, hoping to discover what masquerade she uses tonight. Huh? I don't have to hope. My Christine is behind that white domino over there, and we have a tryst in box 17 on the Grand Tier at midnight. Ah, and you're no longer concerned about that voice you heard in her dressing room? In her note, making this assignation, she as much as admitted that you'd made a dreadful mistake about that voice. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Monsieur Director. What? What? When Sorelli fails to appear for Faust next Thursday, you replace her with the magnificent Christine. Who said that? It came from the white domino. Nonsense. Christine is wearing the white domino. Then Christine is using some trick to make sure she sings Marguerite again. Uh, there's where it came from. Uh, from the center of that crowd. Uh, the man in the scarlet cape and the death's head mask. You think so? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's almost positive. Come, let's unmask him. Read what it says on his cloak. Don't touch me, for I am the Red Death stalking abroad. He's leaving. Hold that man Stop in the scarlet cloak. Quickly, after him. Stop no, 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 don't touch him. He wears the mask of death. Was that man? Why did you tell everyone not to touch him? Please, Paul. Please keep your voice down. You shouldn't have come here. All right. All right, but you were the one who asked me to meet you here in this box on the Grand Tier, remember? I know. But that was before you started to chase the Red Death Mask. And why did you stop us? What is that masquerader to you? Maybe nothing, maybe everything. Oh, Paul, you were right. The voice I hear is not an angel, but a human voice. Belonging to... I don't know. I still haven't seen him. But what made you change? your mind about the angel of music. Because he forbade me to see you. How did he know about me? I told him. The first time I saw you in your box, I rushed back to my dressing room. The voice immediately noticed that I was elated, and and, and when he asked me why, I, I saw no reason not to tell him about you. Yes, and? Well, the voice spoke to me with great sadness and said that if I were to give my heart on earth, there was nothing for the angel of music to do but... Go back to heaven and leave me. Leave me without any more lessons. And that was a thought I couldn't bear. 
I knew what the lessons had done for me in a few weeks' time. But how did the voice do this? What is the secret? Believe me when I tell you I wondered myself. I, I even thought perhaps there might be witchcraft involved. Oh, ridiculous. You could never be caught up with the forces of evil. Well, then what is the voice? A man. Someone who... Yes. I confess, I am jealous. That's why I stopped... There is no angel of music, but there is a man. A man who must love you and, and want you as I want you. And I mean to find out who he is. No, no, you mustn't. That's why I had to see you tonight, to warn you. Promise me that you... I'll promise nothing. I am not afraid of this voice, even if you are. Paul, you must listen and, and try to hear how I discovered the voice was human. Listen... And if I have any power to transmit emotion, you will hear him as I heard him, and you will know why I'm frightened. You have lied to me, my child, because you love Paul Durand. Why should my love for Paul distress you so? I have already told you. If you love him, then you do not believe in me. Believe in me, my child. Whoso believes in me shall live and sing. Whoso believeth in me shall also reach the heights. But I shall bring down those who oppose me. All of them. And don't think Eric cannot do that. Eric? That's your name, then. You're, you're not... Your angel of music? Most certainly, my child, I have proven that to you. I am your angel, Christine, but I warn you that I have an evil side, and I have power. How is it that Sorelli fell ill the other night? How does it happen that all the directors of the opera have taken orders from me? Who are you, and why did you choose me as a pupil? Because of your purity, child. And your beauty, your gracious beauty. Where are you? Here. This is a, a childish game you're playing. Let me see. Never. The day you see my face will be doomsday for you, me, and everyone connected with the opera. And let me repeat my warning. If you want Paul Durand to live... You'll be very careful about seeing him. Who are you to give me orders? I rule here. The opera house is my kingdom. Kingdom. And all of you are my subjects. Paul, dearest, did I succeed at all in recreating the power of that voice and the terror he inspired in me? Whoever... Or whatever he is, he, he must be completely mad. Perhaps. But nevertheless, he does have power. What does it matter? You've told me that you love me, and, and now all you have to do is leave the opera, marry me, and we'll go away together. I cannot. I dare not. <laughs> That's the most fantastic tale I've ever heard, Paul. And you believe it? Every word. It's obvious that someone doesn't want Sorelli to sing Marguerite tonight. This whole rigmarole of not seeing the voice. This nonsense I don't believe. Then what do you intend to do about that note? It was Sorelli's decision to ignore this second threat. And my decision to ignore the opera ghost. I ask you to join me tonight in Box 5 on the Grand Tier where we will both enjoy a marvelous performance of Faust. The first act of Faust went very well, and as the curtain fell for the intermission, I allowed myself to relax in box five where I was sitting with Paul. Well, Paul, what do you say now? Do you still think we could have used the police? The police would have been useless, Monsieur Grand. Did you say that, Paul? I didn't say a word. But you heard it. Tell me you heard it. Yes, I did hear it. Where is that voice coming from? Not from this box. We're alone in it. You are not alone. 
This is Box 5, my box. Show yourself, whoever you are. I must leave now because the house lights are dimming for the second act. And there will be a terrible calamity. Now listen, you... Raise your eyes to heaven and see and pray. The voice is coming from our left. Two boxes down. No, no, no. I thought it was on the right. Uh, The lights are dimming. The chandelier. Look, Robert. Robert. What's swaying? It's going to fall right into the orchestra. Oh, no. No, no, no. no. A natural accompaniment of any catastrophe is an attempt to discover the cause. And so it was with the collapse of the chandelier in the Paris Opera House. The newspapers speculated wildly as to the possible cause of the fall. But strangely, there was not one word printed about the opera ghost. I'll be back with Act Three shortly. No opera manager ever faced the problems that beset Robert Grand, newly appointed director of the Paris Opera House. How does one deal with something that no one has ever seen, but whose voice has been heard and whose presence has been accepted as a fact by opera workers and by your predecessor? A thing that called itself the opera ghost and who took credit for the catastrophic fall of the great chandelier which took the lives of three people and injured many more. Robert Grand made his decision. If I can have your attention, ladies and gentlemen, please, I will explain the reason I summoned you to my office. I have decided to make my peace with the opera ghost. This envelope on my desk will be placed in box five on the grand tier at tonight's performance. It contains the 20,000 francs which the ghost, or whatever he is, demands monthly. But I intend to reassign your locations so that box five will not be unwatched by less than three pairs of eyes for one single second. And I insist... On an immediate report to me when and if you see anyone entering or leaving Box 5. Robert Grand. Where have you been, Robert? I've called your home, your club, even the Café de l'Opéra, and I could not reach you. Is it something important? <laughs> your ghost bleeds, Robert. <laughs> your opera ghost bleeds. Real blood. Are you drunk? Or just raving. And if he bleeds, as I know he does, then he's no ghost at all, but real flesh and blood. Isn't that so, Robert? What are you talking about? What makes you so certain that he bleeds? Because I've shot him. Yes. Come to my apartment. I'll show you the blood stain. Uh, Robert, you're here. And now I will free you from your ghost forever. I've already called the police. Here, come, let me show you the balcony. I don't want to see anything until you calm down and explain what happened. His eyes. You have to see those eyes to understand, Robert. You have to see them. Are you trying to tell me the ghost was here? Exactly. And I know how to get him here. I played on his weakness, Robert. His human weakness. His love for Christine. I told you that, but you wouldn't listen. I can't make head or tail out of what you're trying to tell me. Now, I'm willing to listen, but only if you calm down. All right. All right, Robert. Everything I suspected is true. Now, I'll try to give you an exact picture of what happened. It started when I saw Christine yesterday. Where? At her mother's. Mm. She didn't go to the opera. I went to tell her mother that I wanted to marry her and take her away. Uh, what did Christine think about this? Yes, she was frightened, terrified by this this man posing as a ghost. Well, I, I left after telling her I would expose him. And I came home here and it was very late and prepared to go to bed. Uh, come, let me show you. Uh, let, let, let me show you my bedroom. Oh, I'll admit. I'll admit that my mind was filled with wild thoughts that night. Well, I turned out the light and as I climbed into bed, suddenly, at the foot of my bed, I saw two eyes, red and glowing like coals, just the eyes. 
I switched on the light, leapt out of bed. The room was empty, but I saw a shadow on the balcony. I ran to the bureau, opened the drawer, and took out this revolver. And I fired twice. You see? Look, here. There are two empty chambers in my gun. Huh? Now, come. Come to the balcony, and I'll show you... I'll show you the blood. Where the door's open? Yes, yes, of course. Here. Here. Now, look. Is that blood? Yes. Yes, it is blood. Yes, of course. Now, a ghost who bleeds can be found. A wounded ghost can be traced, huh? Huh? Well? I see the blood. I also see a cat. No, there was no cat. Not on the balcony, but limping along the roof, trying to find a gutter to climb down. Oh, my dear Paul, I don't know about the eyes you think you saw glaring at you. But I'm afraid you've shot a cat. The next 48 hours will live forever in my memory. I expected that the envelope containing the 20,000 francs which I had left in the well-guarded box five would somehow disappear. It did. But as I also feared, all three persons assigned to watch the box swore no one had entered or left the box. Far more disturbing was an unannounced visit from a dangerously quiet Paul Duren on the following day. Robert, I need your help. Of course, Paul, I'll do anything in my power. But uh, don't you think that you'd better see a physician? Christine Dona will be appearing tonight in Faust. Yes, but not in the leading role. I've decided... No, that's not important. I think you should know, Robert, that she's agreed to go away with me. My carriage and coachman will be at the stage door promptly at 11. What I need from you is a way that she can slip out unobserved. Well, the whole backstage is honeycombed with trap doors, but... I don't know any that would lead out of the opera house itself. Perhaps René Castello might. He was the manager for 17 years before he retired. I'd appreciate it if you check with him and... And also one other favor. I don't want to be seen myself. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to let me use your office tonight while the performance is in progress? Certainly. But isn't this flight a sudden decision? It's the only way. I've spoken with Christine, and she agrees that our only hope lies in getting out of Paris, even out of France. Mm, that may be wisest, but why leave from here? Christine absolutely refuses to give up tonight's performance. Not only does she feel obligated to you, but she also believes that Eric would somehow find out that she wasn't going to appear. Oh, yes, she may have a point. The opera ghost, or Eric, as you call him... Seems to know more about what goes on than I do. We'll meet back here in my office at 8 sharp. May I thank you, Monsieur Castelot, for taking the trouble to come here to tell me about the special exit. Uh, it hasn't been used in years, but, but I think the door still works. What time is it? Oh, relax. It's only 9.40. Plenty of time. She's disappeared. What? Uh, what's happened? Uh, I'd better get out and see what's happening. I'll be right back. Something. By God, there must have been another accident. Uh, from my experience, it sounds like something's happened on stage. Oh, oh. I have terrible news, Paul. Christine has disappeared. Oh, no, that's impossible. That was the reason for the commotion. In the middle of a scene, she seemed to be lifted straight up into the air and then disappeared as the lights went out. <laughs> Christine, oh. my love, oh. please tell me you're not hurt. Oh. Well, who are you? And why are you... why are you mad? Oh. I'm sorry that I was so clumsy and made you strike your head when I... Eric! Eric, what have you done? Only what you made me do, Christine. I told you that if you'd continue to see Paul Durand, things would end badly. Where am I? In my house. It's my dearest wish that you'll grow to like it. 
you intend to keep me here? I cannot allow you to run off with Paul Duran as you planned. But they will look for me. And they will not find you. <sighs> Have they ever found me? <laughs> Why do you cry? You know it pains me to see you cry. <laughs> I would never keep you here against your will, but I warn you, if you leave, you'll sign Paul Duran's death you, warrant. You're afraid even to let me look at your face. Careful, Christine. But I shall... I will tear that mask off. I... <laughs> you're in no danger, Christine. I will not hurt you. So long as you do not touch the mask. And you expect me to believe that? You have no better friend in the world than myself. It took all the strength that both I and René Castello possessed to hold Paul Duren in his chair in my office after he learned of Christine's disappearance. This would never have happened if I hadn't asked her to come away with me. I, I'm convinced she's still in the opera house. I've seen the thing, uh, whatever it is that calls itself the opera ghost. Where? When? Why didn't you tell us before? Well, I, I, I tried to warn well, you. Well, never mind that. Where is he and where is Christine? Well, I can tell you what I suspect. About a year ago, I worked late and I decided to go backstage. There was only a work light. And as I stumbled around in the dark, I suddenly felt myself falling. And I landed in... Well, in, in some sort of tunnel under the stage. Someone caught my arm and broke my fall, and a voice said, Careful. I looked around and saw only two fiery red eyes glaring at me out of the mask. The same eyes I saw. Although I was afraid, I, I asked the apparition his name, and he laughed and said, I am Eric, and you've invaded my domain. But since it was an accident, there will be no punishment this time. But, Mr. Manager, I warn you, Eric's secrets must remain Eric's secrets. Whatever that may have meant. Well, after the meeting, I was convinced that Eric, or the opera ghost, lived or haunted the subterranean cellars and caverns beneath the opera. Incredible. Well, I investigated all the trapdoors, looking for the one through which I'd fallen. And one day, I found it. Uh, I'll show you where it is. And here is the key to Eric's house, where I believe you'll find Christine Donner. <laughs> I see something. It, it's a door. Robert, we found it. We found his house. Uh, What's the matter? I just remembered what René said about the key and opening the door. Well, you can do as you like, but I am going in. What's the matter? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's tricky. Maybe it's the wrong key. No, no, it fits, but, but the tumblers seem to be stuck. Oh, is that you? Yes, yes, Christine, it's me. I, I must be dreaming. No, it's no dream. Can you help me open the door? He's tied me up. Damn him. Uh, oh, Christine, oh, my darling, what has he done to you? I'm all right, but untie me quickly. Yes. We must get out of here before he comes back. Where are we going? As high up as we can get. Faster, Paul, faster. Shouldn't we have tried to get out? We don't have time. He's due back at 11. We're trapped. Oh, no. No, push this door. It opens onto the roof. Uh, 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 the, the sky. The blessed sky. And the stars. It is only up there on the stars that you can escape me. Eric! Show your face, you coward. Where are you? Look for me. Behind all the smokestacks, but you won't find me. You're a coward. You're a liar. You think so? Then I show myself. Here. Here I am. At last. Here. I raise my mask a little. Only a little, but you can see my lips. Such lips as I have. And let you hear my voice. You are a coward. Show your full face. My face. You shall see my face. 
And then you shall die. No, no, Eric, I beg you. My face that even the mother who bore me wouldn't bear to look at. Here. Uh, now, look at my face. Uh, Good Lord in heaven. You uh, wanted to see it. You wanted to see a face without a nose. With dead eyes. And the lips of a corpse. Now, look, as I come closer, the horror that is my face will drive you over the edge. Oh, my poor Eric. My poor, poor Eric. Christine, <laughs> you're crying. You're weeping. And for me... A woman, a beautiful woman, weeps for me. If it were tears you wanted, you could have showed your face, and the world would have wept for you. I set you free, and in freeing you, I free myself. Here, I leave you my mask. Eric! Eric, don't show! I love you, Christine, as no other man could ever have loved you! Even today, there are those people who say that the phantom of the opera was a ghost. But the story of Eric was manufactured to appease a frightened public. There are others who say it never happened. And perhaps it didn't. But to those who say it never happened, I say... Perhaps not. But it could have. I'll be back shortly. In looking back over the story of the opera Ghost, I think I've made a discovery of some importance. If you recall, Eric, or the Ghost wrote threatening letters to the manager of the opera house when he felt slighted. He also wrote contracts in red ink in a memorandum book. Now, if he really were a ghost, and he did write these documents, could we say that he was the first ghost writer? Our cast included Gordon Gould, Court Benson, Carol Titel, and Paul Hecht. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Marshall. Most of us laugh off the existence of witches, today or ever, particularly today. Yet, even so casual a research source as a daily newspaper would provide us with knowledge that there are covens all over the country and the world, and that witchcraft is on the rise again. Of course, all of them, in their minds, are dedicated to good works, as the following tale will illustrate. It does seem terrible to refuse the Sister Witch's check, but we don't deal with banks, you see. Very wise, Mrs. Warlock. And fortunately, you and your husband can manufacture the elixir by yourselves. Mm-hmm. Except the main ingredient, Dr. Callios. Of course. That cannot be made. We hope by tomorrow to find a new source. A pity. I'm in the wrong of medical specialty to help. Well... It was a most fruitful and rewarding service. I'm sure we all feel cleansed. And may Asmodeus shower his grace upon you, and Satan be with you. I pronounce this coven disbanded until it reconvenes the next witch's Sabbath, two weeks from this night. mystery drama, 
The Witch's Almanac was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Virginia Payne and Robert Dryden. I have in my hand a curious little book called The Witch's Almanac. I'm looking at a page which contains a recipe for a witch's broth. Rendered eye of newt, pressed gall of goat, extract of lizard's liver, garnish with fur of bat and minced tail of a poisoned rat, boil in alcohol, and lace with the blood of one virgin. Ludicrous or horrifying? The date of the book is 17th century. But witches still live, believe it or not, and are busy casting spells. Well, that's the last of them. Mm, and just on time. Huh, it's the witching hour. <laughs> there you are. 23... 24... And all is silence. Twelve midnight on the nose. What are you up to? Oh, just checking over tonight's sales while I wait for the kettle to boil. <laughs> we gotta have our own special toddy before we go to bed. Oh, I'd have made that. I always do. All right, lovey. I got to get a particularly good night's sleep tonight. Why, hon? It's gonna be a real busy day tomorrow. Oh, now we've got most of the supplies in, I've got to start on a brand new batch of the elixir first thing tomorrow. At least get to preparing the mash. Mm -hmm. We did land office business tonight. Pretty near cleaned us out. <laughs> Was it that good? No, well, we're going to be able to do to meet the demand. Only one that's troubled me is that Connecticut crowd. They're real backsliders. Oh, who needs them? We get more and more from Staten Island and New Jersey. Oh, it's the back fur, mother. Connecticut's our best source for it. Hmm. I sometimes think I'm not a very good witch. You know, I've never really seen a bat that I remember. Well, I've often wondered if we couldn't substitute mice, but I don't know. Oh, no, no, no. You got a good receipt. Don't make any changes. I learned that from my mother. Well, maybe so. She was a fine witch in her own right. I'm proud of her and her heritage. Yeah, no more than I am of yours. Now, there's the kettle. You get the toddy made. I need a good rest. A lot of work tomorrow. I sure hope we find a nice young boarder. Read me the ad again, darling. Uh -huh. uh, elderly couple in choice location, Brooklyn Heights. Wishes to replace last boarder who is like a daughter. Oh, yes. Desire a nice young girl of quiet habits and religious persuasion. Denomination, no object. <laughs> Lovely sunny room, full kitchen privileges, right, box 13, etc., etc. Uh, here's your toddy. Oh. Which of the answers did you like best? I don't know. It's hard to tell. We'll find out tomorrow. It's a pity we just can't come right out and ask the question directly. I just hope we don't make another awful mistake the way we did with the Godfrey girl. I'd have sworn that she was as untouched as a mm, lily. Not only untouched, but what she finally have? Quadruplets, wasn't it? Well, triplets, actually. One of them died before it was born. <laughs> Jason? What? Oh. Land sakes, what a racket. It's Sunday. It won't bother the neighbors. I waited till they got off the church or mass. <gasps> don't say words like that in front of me. You know I don't like that kind of language. Oh, I'm sorry. Just slipped out. Well, that's what they call it. The way other people talk and think is their way of life. It doesn't affect us. Except in the business day, of course. That's what brought me out to the forge. It's about time for the, uh, um... You know what? To be arriving. Yeah, well, I'll just finish off this andine here and be right with you. Did you start up the still? There's no point till we get the blood. But the mass is all ready for it to be added. Suppose we don't find the right girl. No, we'll find her sooner or later. Uh, why don't you get on back and maybe start some weeding out? 
You're the one with the eye for them. <laughs> and I got to finish these here hand irons. And then I got two sets of fire tools and a weather vane I got to get out. And the stable needs some new horseshoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, jangle the old bell there three times. If you think you have a live one, I'll come right over. You know I'd like to have you with me. Yeah, well, I'll tell you. At least give me till after midday mass. <gasps> uh, uh, I mean, till the midday services are over and I'll be over by one. Uh, looks like the first of our hope for maidens has arrived. Won't you just come right in, my dear? I'm Mrs. Warlock. And I'm Kathy Pryor. I hope I'm not late. Oh, no. As you can hear, right on time. One o'clock, as we agreed on the phone. What a lovely old clock. But doesn't it stop striking? Well, it's very old. It was left to me by my father. How strange. It has 24 numbers instead of just 12. Just like the army. The, the, the army? Well, my father was a captain. Uh, he died in Vietnam. Oh, I'm so sorry. It was at the beginning of the war, I mean. Oh, now I see. One o'clock is 1,300 hours, like Dad would say, just like your clock. Yes. For 1 p.m., it strikes 13. How unusual. Come now, I'll show you the room. It's upstairs. And as we go, you must tell me about yourself. You're very young. Yes, I guess so. 18. Not so young these days, but... Uh, uh, But? Well, after Father was killed, Mother was... Well, she wasn't very well, so since I was the only child, I had to take care of her until she died recently. I've lived a kind of sheltered life. It's uh, that door over there. Here in the city? Oh, no, I'm from a little town in Ohio. You wouldn't even know the name of it. Um, Do you uh, have more family? No, I'm the last of the priors. Oh, how lovely. And the sun streaming in the window. <laughs> All chintz. Dotted Swiss curtains. A big four-poster bed, just like home. There, there, Kathy. Uh, I'm just going to call you that. Maybe you found a new home here. Oh, I just love all of it. I just... Well, what does your husband do? He's a forger. A what? <laughs> I'm, I'm just teasing you. Although he really is, that's the name for it. Here, come to the window. You see our other building in the backyard? Yes, with the, with the smoke coming out of the chimney. Oh, it won't bother you. We have a fan that blows it off toward the river and away from the house. That's Jason Smithy. He's an iron worker. And still, occasionally, a blacksmith. How fascinating. Ah, there, there's my husband, Jason, coming now. Tell you what, dear, you look about, and I'll go down and bring him up to meet you. Pretty as a picture, and I'm certain quite perfect for our purpose. You sure she's a virgin? Well, I can tell you one thing. None of the others were. You could tell that at a glance. That's why I didn't ring the bell. Let's hope this one does. Uh, ring the bell, I mean. <laughs> of course, by tonight, I can tell for sure when I get a blood sample. Uh, any more coming? No, no, this was the last. Oh, honey bee, weren't we lucky. Mm. You see, Satan smiles on us. Uh, come on, let's go upstairs and see if we can't seal the pact. Oh, no, Mr. and Mrs. Warlock. I do love it here. Especially being able to see a little of the water in the bridge. But... But what, my dear? Well, I... I'm sort of embarrassed. You see, I had no idea how expensive New York would be. Or how hard it would be to find a job. I have so little money left now. And you've been so sweet. I just hate to take advantage of you. Because the way things are, I'm not even sure I can afford to stay a whole month. What sort of work do you do, Miss Pryor? Well, back home. Because I couldn't leave Mama alone too much, you see. I did part-time work for Mr. Jeffrey at his hardware store. See, we lived right over it. A lot of the typing and bookkeeping I could do at home with Mama. You can type and keep books? Oh, yes. Take dictation and file. 
You know, anything a secretary has to do. Mm. I took a secretarial course after I finished high school. Land sakes, if you aren't the one... Uh, didn't give you much chance to see much of the boys, did it? No, but that's all right. I'm not ready to be married yet, and I wouldn't want to date too much till I am. Boys today take, well, a lot too much for granted. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to handle that. I, Godfrey, if I had a daughter, I'd want... uh, No, sir, we're not going to let you get away from us. Tell you what, make your proposition. You be my secretary, straighten out my accounts for a half a day in exchange for room and board here. The rest of the days you can spend looking for a job in New York. Oh, Mr. Warlock, that's too much. I I couldn't. Oh, of course you could, Kathy, dear. We want you to. I only want one promise from you in return. What's that? That till you find that, that Mr. Wright, you keep on making this your home. Oh, you're wonderful. Of course I want to, but... No, 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 that's the end of buts. You're going to come with me. We'll drive over to New York to your hotel, pick up your stuff, and by the time we get back, Mother here will have a good home-cooked meal that'll not only melt in your mouth, but tell you better than any words, you found a new home. Since we had coffee after dinner, I just can't keep my eyes open. Now, now, what you need is a good night's sleep. Good night now, dear. And sweet dreams. Good night, both of you. You're absolute loves. I know I'm going to sleep like the dead. Well... She asleep yet? I just peeped in. She's asleep, but tossing and turning and moaning a little. Oh, dear me. I suppose I didn't use quite enough of the sleeping draft. I didn't want to risk too much till I found out how well she tolerated it. Oh, yes, quite right, dear. You remember, it did make the Elliot girl very sick. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Oh, well, then I suppose we'll just have to use the gas. Will you walk into my parlor, said a spider to a fly. It's the prettiest little parlor that ever you did spy. Well, we all know what happened to the trusting fly. But Kathy, what is in store for her? I'll return shortly with Act Two. Jason and Sarah Warlock were born, brought up, and married in Brooklyn Heights. Their home, a leftover gem in an overgrown city, at the end of a quiet, dead-end street. No neighbors save small manufacturers and warehouses on the street, for the Warlock house was originally a stable, a quiet place for quiet people who lived a quiet life, unsuspected and unholy. (sighs) Is she all right? Fine. Sound asleep. Had better close the window now. The gas is all gone. Yes, Jason. It's closed. Put the rubber tourniquet on her arm now. There. (laughs) Not too tight. Oh, I wouldn't hurt her for the world. This is the only part I never feel quite right about. Now, she won't feel a thing. And think about what she's going to do for so many of our finest... Our youth and strength and vitality is going to spread among our faithful. Hush, hush, little one. That's all. By tomorrow, you'll never know what our coven owes you and will owe you in the vast unwinding of eternity. Sleep well, pretty. Sarah. Yes, Jason. If she's all she seems to be... She may turn the key in the door for all of us for everlasting life. Breakfast just about ready, Jason. How were the tests? 
Where is our Vestal Virgin? Still asleep. Then then the tests were... As pure as any alchemist can devise. Oh. I've already added what was needed to the mash and started the distillery. <laughs> this will be the most powerful batch of Panpharmacon Vitae I have ever concocted. You should raise the price. Oh, hush, woman. This is the devil's work. Would he or I seek to profit by it? Scrambled or straight up? Scrambled this morning. With perhaps just a lacing of the elixir. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's coming downstairs. Yeah, you're right. Uh, put some more eggs on for her. She may feel the need of a little extra protein this morning. Ah, hmm. I'll serve the juice. Well, good morning, Kathy. Sleep well? Oh, yes, Mr. Warlock. E- except for... For... What, dear? It's silly. Somewhere in the middle of the night, I thought I felt a pain in my arm as if something had bitten me. Oh, let me see. Oh, yes. There is a little bit of a mark there. Well, there's nothing to worry about. Sometimes the wind blows a Jersey mosquito. (laughs) I'll fix that in no time. Oh, please don't worry, Mr. Warlock. No, 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 no. I want your stay here to be a completely happy one. And please, not Mr. Warlock. Can't we make it, uh, say, Uncle Jason? And Aunt Sarah. I mean, we really feel, Mother and I, that we're virtually blood relations already. (laughs) Of course, if you want. No, no, only if you want. Of course I do. You're both the sweetest people I know. Uncle Jason and Aunt Sarah. Ah, uh, now that's settled, Kathy. And how do you like your eggs? Oh, just any way that you want. Any other morning, but today is special. Then, can I have them fried and once over lightly? And how about some orange juice? I'd love it. But let me tend to myself. I know you're busy already this morning, Uncle Jason. What? Well, I see from my window that the chimney is smoking away. What wonderful thing are you creating this morning? Uh... Oh, just some horseshoes for a stable near Prospect Park. Well, don't let me keep you. Why, child, I just came in to have breakfast myself. We'll all have it together. Good. Then right after breakfast, I'll come over to the forge and start helping get things in order. Oh, no, no, no. I... Well, you see, I, I, I think that this morning I'm so busy with the, uh, the forge and so on. Uh, why don't you take today off and... Go over to New York and start hunting for that job you hope to find. Well, I promised I'd get you straightened up. Oh. Oh, my goodness, I forgot. Forgot what, dear? In all the excitement, I, I forgot I have a luncheon appointment and I can't cancel it. Uh, about a job? Oh, no. It's just an old, old friend of my mother's. You know, I, I wrote him after she died to tell him. Just like I wrote all the people in her address book. And then when I came to New York, I called him at his office, but he was out of town. I suppose his secretary must have given him the message, because she called me back with a lunch invitation for today. You want to cancel it? I can't. His office is closed on Mondays, so I have no way of reaching him. And I'd hate to put the old gentleman out. Uh, 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 old gentleman? Well, he's... I mean, he was once a beau of my mother's. And then when she married Dad, he moved to New York. He was quite old even then, I guess. Oh, well, then it's all settled. You can whisk off to New York in the subway, Kathy. And I'll get after this old reprobate here to get his papers together so you can put them in order. (laughs) Meanwhile, I'm going to have Jason put up a screen on your window, just in case any of those mosquitoes come your way again. Oh, I don't want to be a bother. Bother? Bother? My dear little girl, you don't know how happy we are to have you with us. Yes, mademoiselle, may I help you? Yes, I'm having lunch with a Mr. Patrick Trent. I I don't know if he's here yet. Uh, No, not yet, but uh, let me take you to his table. Uh, This way, mademoiselle. Oi, a chair for the lady. Oh, thank you. Oh, pardon, mademoiselle. Monsieur Trent just arrived. That's Mr. Trent? Yes. Excuse me? Uh, Miss Pryor? Yes, Mr... Mr. Patrick Trent? Junior. Uh, I guess not that anymore. My father died in Florida four days ago. Oh. I just came back from his funeral. Oh, I'm so sorry. What can I say? Oh, please don't. Mind if I sit? Of course not. Dad was 
Oh, he knew it was coming. Not so soon, of course. And he, well, he wasn't all that young. But he was meticulous about everything. And he told me he had this appointment with you. So I'm trying to fulfill all his promises and round things off. Uh, can I order us a drink before lunch? Oh, I... I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not a drinker. I, I wouldn't know what to order. Well, why not leave that to me? I'll take it easy. But we really ought to celebrate. Or at least me. You know, uh, in a period of absolute despair, suddenly uh, you were there, one bright, shining light through the murk. <laughs> In the lowest period of my life, I walk into my father's favorite restaurant, and instead of a nice, aging old lady, I find you. <laughs> well, I was looking for a nice, kindly old father figure. Sorry, I can't fill the bill. Well, that's all right. I found another one. Who? Oh, that isn't important for the moment. You know, I feel a little woozy. Shouldn't we order something to eat? <laughs> Sarah, hey, what are you doing here? You scared me. <laughs> How's our life force coming? Uh, and never better. Forge still burning outside? Oh, yes. Have to watch that. It's our excuse for this other and more important work of ours. Oh, of course, Father dear. You know I don't like you coming through the secret door by daytime. What is it? I've had quite a few calls. The Bronx, Queens, and Mascoth can recycle bottles for us if we pick them up. Oh, and you better stop by Mrs. Ferngrass right here in Columbia Heights. Fine. I can leave this cooking for the rest of the day and take the panel truck to pick them up. We need them. Uh, did our little pigeon and our Kathy come back? No, not yet. Why? Are you worried? Oh, no, not worried. Concerned. Purest blood we ever had. Oh, I wouldn't want to lose her for any reason whatsoever. So, now you've seen the lady herself, the Statue of Liberty. Feeling more unfettered and free? <laughs> I guess I would, if I didn't feel so guilty. Well, what do you have to feel guilty about? Well, I should have been looking for a job. Well, you told me you kind of have one. Oh, that's just part-time. And also, I... Yeah? Well, I feel a little woozy from whatever you talked me into drinking before lunch. A daiquiri? Well, and we just had a bottle of beer. You know, I think I'm a little half seasick. No, couldn't be. We're just coming into the slip. So it has to be nothing. Or all. Mm -hmm. What did you mean there on the boat? Or all? Oh, it's just a feeling I have about us. Come on. Let's get the subway for Brooklyn. You don't have to take me home. I can manage. I know, but I have to go to work. I'm not a lawyer like my dad. Just a reporter. Lowly police precinct duty at that. Come on. We both have to get off at the same station. Uh, Clark Street, right? Well, that's my stop. But for you? Before I get there, I get your phone number and address, I hope. For future reference. Then I go to work. Hey, Pat. What do you say, boy? How's world treating you? Oh, great, Sergeant. I just met a girl. Do they make them anymore? I thought they threw away the old mold when they created mess. You better believe this one is no mess. She's miss all the way, Jim. Well, she sure seems to have made a hit with you. Oh, bullseye. I'm kind of late, sir. So before I have my editor on my tail, what's new on the blotter? Well, you didn't miss a thing. Just the usual. Woman receiving obscene phone calls, three minor muggings. Nobody hurt, thank heavens. An old booze hound overdid it and kicked off from alcohol poisoning. All the run-of-the-mill stuff, not worth a slug of type. Oh, uh, uh just one, uh... A social note, you might say. What's that, Sarge? I'm not a sergeant anymore, buddy. You're talking to a lieutenant. Hey, Jim, that's great. Now, we got to find you a headline case to bust wide open. That the last case? Yeah. It's not even half full. Did you go by Mrs. Ferngrass? Right on by. Hmm? There were cops and an ambulance there. 
One of the neighbors told me they found her dead. Oh, the poor old thing. She must not have been taking the elixir. Mm. Well, the devil take her. He must have wanted her home. Yes. Uh, Sure wish I'd gotten the bottles first, though. We're getting awful low. It's a shame how careless people are. So are we. What? You left the door open and Kathy's caught us. I hope I'm not butting in. There was no one in the house, so I... Oh, no, no, that's all right, Kathy. No secrets here. I never realized you had a room behind the forge. Oh, what lovely old bottles. What are they for? Oh, they, uh, uh, they're they're just decorative. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. For for windows and bottle glass door panels. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful idea. And what's that thing that's bubbling away there? Oh, that, uh... Well, that makes the grout, he said. Uh, you know, the cement that holds the bottles together after they're cut. Well, how do you cut them? <laughs> That's my secret. How is your day and your lunch? Now, now, Jason. That's Kathy's secret. Well, I was just interested, that's all. <laughs> then why shouldn't you know? I'm dying to tell you about it. Well, why don't you go in the house and freshen up for dinner? We'll be having it soon. And you can tell us all about it then. All right. But someday soon, I want to watch you making one of those windows. You think Kathy suspected anything? I doubt it. I hope not. I hope not, too. But if she does, she'll have to go. Just like Vera Blythen. You know that, dear. I know. Satan's work must be done. Mm. And nothing or no one can stand in the way. Double, double, toil and trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. The ingredients are gathered and the witch's broth is fermenting. Pan Pharmacon Vitae, the elixir of life. They all believe they must drink. Has Kathy learned too much to be safe? And who is there to protect her if she has? I'll return shortly with Act Three. There is nothing more inexplicable than an obsession. Otherwise charming and sensible people can do the most outlandish things in the name of some irrational belief. And the terrible danger of witchcraft is that it is a hidden belief, secret and unknown. In their wildest dreams, no one who knew that dear old couple, the warlocks, could have suspected the havoc they are capable of. Least of all, Kathy, as she prattles away about her day in town with her newfound aunt and uncle. Now, you're sure you won't have some more cherry cobbler, Kathy? Oh, no, thanks. It was yummy, but I couldn't hold another thing. Tell me, dear, are you going to see this young man of yours again? I don't know. He... He did take my address and phone number before he went to the police station. What? Uh, the police station? Yes. He's a reporter for the Brooklyn Journal. Oh. I, uh... I would be a little careful of those reporters. They're a wild lot, they say. Oh, not Pat. He's very kind and, and quiet and thoughtful. Uh, still, the ones that work the police beat get pretty hardened by the things they see. Yes. I'd be very careful about a young fellow like that. Why, you two dears. You're protecting me like I was your own flesh and blood. Uh, so you are. Now we got you. Go. Yeah. I uh, couldn't wait to show off your new office, huh, Lieutenant? That what you had to call me? Forget it, Pat. This is strictly business. I have a story for you. I'd like you to get it on the front page of tomorrow's paper. Oh, oh Brother Jim, you're not asking much. I don't think I can beat the deadline. Uh, let me it... talk first. Ever see anything like this? Uh, no. Old-fashioned bottle. Strange shape. Read the label. Panpharmacon Vitae. What's that supposed to mean? Well, you got the college education, Pat. You tell me. Well, it's, uh, it's a gobbledygook. I mean, it's part half-baked uh, Greek, half-Latin, roughly, oh, I guess you'd say all the medicine of life. Or like maybe um, all the drugs you need to sustain life. What is it, some kind of patent medicine? Unlicensed. I sent the rest of the bottles to food and drug to have them analyzed. But meantime, all I need is my nose to tell me what it's mostly made of. Smell it. 
Phew, smoke, right, Jim? Loaded with wood or alcohol, I guess. Alcohol, anyways. Uh, where'd you get this? Remember I mentioned earlier today some old booze hound got knocked off from alcohol poisoning? Uh, no, not particularly. Oh, yeah, 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 I guess. Well, she was poisoned, all right. But she wasn't any booze hound. When we followed up on the story, we found she was a Mrs. Ferngless, local librarian, very well respected, but very quiet and kept very much to herself. And we found a whole case of this gook, most of the bottles empty. Now, some lousy con talked an old lady afraid of dying into buying her own death. And I want him. How do I help? First of all, get me a story in the papers so anyone else who has this stuff doesn't also knock themselves off. Build it up so maybe we can get someone who bought it to tell why, how, and where. There's no instruction on this label. It's homemade. Now, whoever makes or sells this stuff is a ghoul. Paper come, Sarah? Just brought it in. Here you are, dearie. Thank you, sweetheart. Eh? By God. Jason, you're swearing. Never mind, eh? Come out to the forge with me. But I'm getting breakfast and can't be done. Come on. Yes, yes, but Jason, I never heard you. Don't talk, just follow me. Morning, Aunt Sarah, Uncle Jason. My God. Uncle Jason? Must be out in the forge. <gasps> Maybe it's for me. Hello? Kenny? Yes? Pat? True Blue. Oh, I well, I thought you weren't going to call me when you... Well, when you didn't call last night. Oh, I'm sorry. I got tied up with a, a big story. But forget that for the moment. When do I see you again? Tonight? Oh, well, yes. Matter of fact... How'd you like to come and meet these two gorgeous old people who are taking such good care of me? No wonder the police were at Mrs. Fern Glasses yesterday. Oh, poor old thing. If she had only been taking the pan pharmacon. Now she took too much. You know, I always warn everyone against that. Mm. Now this, this witch hunt is on. I may have to get rid of all the bottles I filled. But why, dear? We're not doing any wrong. Yeah, we know that. But the rest of of them, they, outside, the unbelievers, they want to persecute us. But how can they find us? Nobody in the coven will come forward. No, but Kathy might. It's a chance we can't afford to take. She's got to disappear. Oh, Oh, do we have to, Jason, darling? She doesn't have to see the paper. It's on every newsstand with that big headline. How can she miss it? Well, we just have to keep her home. Uh, it's dangerous. I'd have to be sure there was some way she'd never get wind of this story. What are you doing here, Jason? I had to come, Dr. Callius. I have a problem. I can't fit you in today. I'm booked solidly. Not a psychiatric problem. This affects you directly as high priest of the coven. There's somebody I'm afraid will have to be removed. Oh, I don't see how it could... How it could happen so suddenly. Hit me right after breakfast. No, no, dear. Just let me make you comfortable oh, in bed. And I want to... I want to see a doctor. Oh, yes, baby. Oh. Jason has gone to see about one for you right oh. now. You just try to drink this nice medicine I oh. made for you. It'll settle your stomach. All right, Jason. That will do the job, all right. Just inject it in the vein. If you feel it has to be done. I don't want to hurt the poor child. Besides, she was such a perfect subject. But we must protect the coven at all times. I asked her out, yes. But how can you dispose of the... Uh... The body? Oh, for a smithy, that doesn't present any problems. Or a witch. Isn't cremation what we all want afterwards? <laughs> Jason? Yeah, it's me. Where's the girl? Upstairs, sound asleep. I gave her something in this glass as well as the small dose of arsenic. When the young man calls, we'll tell him she suddenly left. And if he doesn't believe us? Well, what can he do? 
We open no doors, and he can't break his way in. Now, as soon as it's dark, I'll do what has to be done, and by midnight there'll be nothing left of our poor little girl but ashes. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, dear. Pat Trent speaking. Who? Oh, yeah. Put her on. Hi, Kathy. What? The story? Oh, look, I told you. I... All right. It was just an old lady who was buying some kind of phony patent medicine that killed her. It was loaded with alcohol and... Ha... Huh? What shape was the bottle? Well, it was old-fashioned, sort of octagonal and... What? Look, honey, I'm at work. I, I can't just walk out on... No. No, wait a minute, Kathy. Wait a minute. Kathy? Kathy? Damn. Is she crazy or something? <laughs> Kathy's still asleep? Yes. Uh, I, I'd better answer that. Hello? Oh, yes, Miss Dredd. Oh, well, I'm I'm sorry to tell you this, but Kathy walked out on us this morning. No, 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 she's gone. No forwarding address. Well, I'm sorry. I, I really don't want to discuss it. She left without paying her rent. Jim, you've got to help me. You say you went to the house and no one asked. Yeah, but I am sure someone was there. Jim, this kid's in danger. Well, what can I do, Pat? I can't enter a search without a warrant. So how do we get one? I don't know. Wait a minute. You want to square out a complaint against Kathy Pryor? For what? Stealing your wallet will do. Oh, hey, if that will get us in, you got it. Open up. This is the police. Open up or we're coming in. Oh, dear me. What is it? I'm looking for Kathy Pryor. Charge robbery. Oh, well, she's not here. She left. I have a search warrant here. Open up and I'll decide for myself. Police! Help! help. Okay, that does it. Open up or do you want me to kick the door in? It was all just too much. I never get sick or sleep that heavy. I couldn't face that last drink, so I poured it down the sink and just lay there pretending to be asleep. Lying there, a lot of little funny things started to add up. And then, when I heard what they planned... Hey, take it easy, Kathy. You're okay from here in. But I thought they were so sweet. But they're ghouls. Absolute ghouls. You're right, Miss Pryor. But they don't think so. They think they're right. But don't worry. We have enough on them and the doctor to put them away for a long time. They confessed? We bore down a bit on the old man and the old lady came to his defense like a tiger. Mm -hmm. She blurted enough of it out for us to get the rest. But what's the matter with them? They're witches, Miss Pryor. And in their world, that means they're good. That's the way they feel. I'll tell you how I feel. To hell with them. To which I can only add, from ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties and things that go bump in the night, good Lord, deliver us. As he did, Kathy Pryor. I'll be back shortly. State Farm is there with a discount for drivers 50 and older. Millions of drivers 50 and older are saving important money with the State Farm discount. They're getting the personal agent service and great claims handling State Farm is famous for and saving too. If you're 50 or older with no unmarried drivers under 25 living at home, be a State Farm agent now. And like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. The discount's not available in every state. Other restrictions apply. If you have not yet prepared your will, please listen carefully. Without a will, the laws of the state and not you will determine who receives your property and in what amounts. Who manages the affairs of your estate? 
your choice as guardian of your minor children may never be known. Your loved ones could face unnecessary legal costs and needless court delays. Now, for only $12.95, you can make your own will quickly and safely with the American Will Kit. You'll receive simple fill-in-the-blank will forms with easy-to-follow directions. The forms were prepared by lawyers to be valid in all 50 states. Order now, and you'll also receive free of charge our easy-reading personal protection guide, giving you important tips and special information that can save you money. Now is the time to take advantage of this special mail order opportunity. To order, call toll-free 1-800-542-1212. Only $12.95 plus shipping. That's 1-800-542-1212. Money back if not satisfied. Call now, 1-800-542-1212. Sarah and Jason were put away for life. And all existing bottles of Panpharmacon Vitae were located and destroyed. And the coven dispersed. Incidentally, the analysis by the FDA confirmed a small quantity of blood in each bottle. Human blood. And, of course, alcohol. Other ingredients defied analysis. Kathy, who married Pat, sleeps deeper but more tranquilly these nights. The coven was broken up, but it's only one of many. And witches are still abroad. Always be on your guard. Our cast included Virginia Payne, Robert Dryden, Jada Rowland, Marshall Borden, and Dan Ako. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. <laughs> I've been teaching math here for 16 years. And you know what I expect of my students? Everything. You want to stay in my class, you show up every day. And do your homework every night. Like logarithms, calculus. You've got to know your stuff better than anyone else. Think it's tough? Next to real life, it's a picnic. The world doesn't want to hear excuses about why you failed. Neither do I. I only pushed them so hard because I promised them that if they paid their dues, did all their work, then they'd get to go to college and make something of themselves. Now, now please, don't make a liar out of me. Support the United Negro College Fund. A mind 